Good evening, good morning, good midday in Germany. It's uh, nearly 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Welcome to the second day of the Azurstack HDI 2012 days. Uh, we have a packed program today. Uh, we will start in one, three, four minutes with Jaromir and his MS lab. But uh, first, let's talk about some things, a little bit cleanup. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide. Uh, Manfred, a little pause. <laughs> a little <laughs> pause. <laughs> um, first, I want to uh, thank our sponsors again and remind you we will we will have a raffle. Every sponsor uh, has offered a Amazon gift card and I will raffle the cards tomorrow because I think in the evening I'm too tired to raffle them and we have one caveat. Uh, um, you are only eligible to win the prize if you agreed to that we can give your data to the sponsors and if you didn't do that when you sign up to the to the conference you can still go to the website and sign up again and then tick the checkbox. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm agreeing to giving my data to the sponsors and tomorrow I will collect all the people who agreed to give the data to the sponsors and then raffle the four prizes between those people. So if you want to have the chance to win one of the three uh, Amazon 500 euro gift cards, uh, please do so and also I will raffle one free um, course participant in my Azure Stack HCI five day course and that's, uh, that's a Teams course or you can participate on site in Hallenberg. Okay, um, Manfred, you also want to uh, uh, tell us something about uh, you, something you start on the 1st of October. Oh yes, <laughs> uh, I prepared this. I, I was yes. wondering if we have some uh, time left for it. Of yes, course. On the 1st course. of October. Jaromir, are you there by the way? Yes, I, I see Jaromir. Okay. On 1st of October, the Azure Stack HCI show starts and the Azure Stack HCI show is a new format where Sven Langenfeld, he's a Microsoft employee and he's Azure Stack HCI commercial sales spe specialist and myself, I'm an Microsoft MVP, as you know, in the uh, cloud and data center, yeah, um, special uh, specialization, and um, yeah, we are starting the so show all about Azure Stack HCI, and we have great guests. One of our first guests is Karsten, who is. Uh, also here is in the show on 1st of October. Uh, Eric Berg is here on 1st of October and in the second or third show also in October we will have Cosmos Darwin with some insights uh, on the roadmap. Maybe you have been yesterday in the session. He told us yeah, there will happen a lot of things. Um, in two months, right? In in about two months. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it matches to to uh, in less than two months, he said. So um, hopefully uh, these uh, clear announcements can be in the show. So if you are interested in Azure Stack HCI, um, keep the date first of October, um, twelve to one p.m. And uh, youtubecom slash Taylor is the URL. You don't have to register; just go to the YouTube channel, and then you can watch. Yeah, but show. we we do, we will do the the show in German, right? Yeah, uh, important information. The show will be in German language, so the guest speakers that are uh, in the show um, and uh, coming from the corp, they will speak in English. But the the main language in the show will be German, so it's for the audience that um, will be. Um, fine with the German language. Um, for sure, you can use the YouTube translation, then you have the written text there. Yeah. Okay, well, regarding the organization, Karsten, we had already a question in the uh, chat why the live, uh, live event wasn't started. The question was at uh, half past uh, 12, so uh, 30 minutes before the event starts. The event starts now, we have 1 p.m. And so now you should hear us, you should see us, you should have audio and video, and it would be a good uh, yeah, point to give us some feedback. If you can hear us, if uh, the video is fine, if the audio is fine, and you can use the Q&A section where you can also ask your questions. So if you have any questions, then write them in the Q&A. Yesterday we had more than 200 questions 
questions. More than 100 answered via chat and the rest uh, via audio. So um, use this opportunity to um, have your questions live answered here. And for us, it would be great to have some feedback from the audience because the speakers have a different channel. So for sure, the other speakers can hear us, can see us, but it's a different client. It's a different channel in the Teams uh, live event. So if Anybody from you will use the Q&A and give us some feedback. It would be great. And yesterday we mentioned we have a delay between what we are doing and what you are seeing. It's about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So um, I spoke about please give us feedback. And for sure, I cannot have any feedback actually because you didn't hear this message. Uh, <laughs> but now you have heard it. Um, so uh, please keep this in mind. Um, be patient. Uh, we will need some time to answer your questions because of this delay. Okay, so, okay. now we switch over to uh, Jaromir because yes. we already stole five minutes of sorry of his, for the uh, time. So Jaromir, can you hear us? Oh yeah, I can hear you. Fine, then go ahead with your presentation. I'm looking forward to new stuff from MS Lab, uh, uh, all about Azure Stack 21H2, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We will talk about uh, we will talk about how to uh, la run it in MS Labs, but also we will talk about how to run it in the real servers because now I have an access to real servers, right? Not only my laptop, but I can also uh, deploy a real servers that are running in a data center. So um, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jaromir. I'm based in Czech Republic in Prague. And I worked for nine years, nine and something, nine and a half years for Microsoft as a PFE slash CE. It stands for uh, Premier Field Engineer slash Customer Engineer. We were rebranded. And now I join a different company. <laughs> can I can I name the company or it's restricted because we paid only for one but, session? But this is the first and the last time you name it, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, it's the it. first time. And okay, I now work for the Dell with my colleagues you heard yesterday. So they are my direct colleagues. Um, so I'm now principal engineering technologist. And I'm not only the engineer, I have also family. A lot of people actually ask me that, hey, what are you doing? You have to, you cannot sleep, right? You are doing so many things that you don't sleep. <laughs> like, no, I have a family, I have my personal life. So so this is my personal life. I have four kids. Uh, seven horses, two dogs, cats, and everything. So this is at the weekend house. So every weekend I grab a family, we go for the weekend house, we grab the dogs, uh, go there, and kids are riding horses. I sometimes ride horses too, but not often. <laughs> okay, so this is my personal life. So yeah, let's talk now about MS Lab. And by the way, Karsten, if there will be any question, it would be really awesome if you can just jump in and, uh, you know, say that, hey, there was a question like, uh, is it easy to run it or how do you run it? Because maybe sometimes I will, I will just, um, you know, be too fast or maybe something is too obvious for me. And um, sometimes, you know, it's not clear to the audience how to start with the MS Labs. So if there will be anything I didn't correctly describe, just stop me and ask a question by, uh, for yourself, Carsten, or just from the audience. I, I don't mind. It would be even better to you know, have some feedback. Okay, so let's start with MS Lab. So MS Lab is a GitHub project. Uh, it's hosted on Microsoft GitHub. Um, uh, if you just search for it, uh, the first thing you will find is this page. Uh, and uh, what it does is just a bunch of scripts. If you scroll down on this web page, there will be a, just a button that you can download a zip file. And with this zip file, it's pretty easy. You have four or five scripts there. Uh, first script is one something, second is two something. So first of all, you will just run the first one. It will ask you for ISO file and it will create some basic infrastructure. I will not cover this, right? You can uh, read the documentation here or you know, you can search for the videos. Uh, I already created some videos on uh, on YouTube, or you can just ping me, right? If you go to labconfig, there's my email. You can just ping me. And if you have Teams Federation, you can just ping me, ping me on a Teams. Just feel free, right? I, I would love to help you. Because I think that just like HCI is awesome. Uh, and I think it's the future for uh, everyone here, right? So this is MS Lab, right? It's open source. You can contribute. If you don't like something, you can just, you know, create an issue. If there's a problem, just create an issue and uh, I will reply. I, I can see that there are nine open issues because I didn't close it because there are some like of known errors 
Um, so I just kind of keep it there. Um, anyway, what you would like to do is to click on the folder. It's here actually uh, called scenarios. And if you click here, you'll find that there's so many scripts and so many folders. And the idea was uh, to provide you a consistent way to deploy some virtual machines that are domain joined. So you can then start with something I call scenario. So every scenario contains a config file that basically says what you want to have in your lab. Like I would like to have a one DC, which is always there, but maybe you would like to have um, you know, one machine for the Windows Admin Center, and then maybe one Windows 11, a Windows 10 machine for I don't know, management, then uh, four machines for STD with this and that configuration of the disks, uh, maybe connected to this and that VLAN uh, with this IP configuration. Uh, all is possible, right? But for the starters, it's better just to start with the basic one, which is for node STD based on Windows Server. You can provide during the deployment 2019 media, or you can just provide 2022, and you will have 2022 server. Anyway, uh, we'll be talking about two uh, scenarios. First is Azure Stack HCI and MDT, and second is exploring new features in 21H2. I know the session is called exploring new features in 21H2, but to explore it, it would be also, I think, cool if you could deploy. Uh, if you could deploy the lab to the real servers. So this is something we will talk about now. So um, the idea is to have um, consistent deployment because if you just do some kind of deployment with click next next, you may or may not do something different every time. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is so much faster if you just you know drink coffee, watch it doing its things and you can you know open up the Netflix or Facebook or whatever and do nothing. Just, you know, watching the servers doing its thing. Uh, the, the, the second reason is also that um, if you run into an issue, it will be so much easier just to redeploy operating system and do everything from the scratch to validate if it's your issue or if it's an issue with the platform. Like yesterday, uh, I was using Windows 11 to deploy um, uh, I just take ETI cluster, like you know, at a start from Windows 11 uh, with PowerShell command to you know create a new cluster with the nodes. I was like always failing. I was like, oh, maybe it's something wrong with the nodes, right? So let me let me rebuild the nodes. Hmm, it's still an issue. Okay, let me rebuild the MS lab plus the nodes. Hmm, still the issue. Hmm, what to do now? And yeah, it took me some time, but it's, it is in Windows 11. So yeah. I will show you Windows 11 how you can manage everything, but maybe not a great idea. Um, what it will do, I uh, will show you how to simulate deployment also in the VMs, maybe, maybe not. I'll show you just the portions of the code that can do this, but definitely if you have hardware, it would be awesome if you could use it to deploy your hardware consistently. And also it's probably the fastest way because in 11 minutes you will have operating system and it's domain joined, it's consistent, so always the same, right? So how does it look like? Um, so in a picture, you can see that there is a DC, MDT, and Windows 11. So this is the MS Lab VMs that you specify that you want to get deployed. So you have a DC, a Microsoft Deployment Toolkit based on the same operating system. Uh, it's probably Windows Server 2022. If you use this parent disk, I'm using Windows Server 2022. And then one a Windows 11 machine, which is optional. You don't have to have it, right? You can run the code from the DC too. But I wanted to demonstrate everything from Windows 11. Anyway, uh, it looks like this. So you have your uh, server, which is physical, where you are running the MS Lab. Uh, there is uh, one virtual switch, MS Lab switch. But the difference is that this switch is enabled to uh, use physical NICs. And these two physical NICs are connected to two switches. And from here, you can connect your physical service. Right? I'll talk about virtual switch and how it's connected on the next slide. But the idea was that you can in the lab config specify what physical NICs you want to use together with MS Lab. And it will use it and in, it will create a virtual switch that is physically connected to uh, physical adapters that you can connect to the physical switches and have there your infrastructure that you want to deploy. So basically, I'm expanding the MS Lab with the machines uh, that are somewhere physically connected. 
And the good thing is about this um, networking uh, is that it's completely isolated. So there are two switches. One is, I call it external here, uh, which connects you to internet. Uh, it will be automatically created by MS Labs if you say that you want to have internet. If you say that you don't want to have an internet, it will not create it. Um, it will connect to the physical NIC or if it's a laptop, it will, and if it's Windows 10 machine, there is already a default switch, so it will use default switch. Uh, you can specify specific uh, switch that you already have deployed to use it for the internet. And this will be connected for the DC. So the DC will be connected using this NIC to the internet. And then the net will be uh, deployed here. This is something that was already there in the MS Labs. Um, and you will connect to the uh, MS Lab switch, which is uh, here, right? The difference now is that you can specify physical NICs. As you can see here, it's connected to external network. And as you can see in a PowerShell, uh, it's connected to two physical NICs. In this case, um, two TNG NICs that are connected uh, to a physical switch. And uh, from this physical switch, you can connect your nodes. So this opens a brand new scenario, right? Imagine that uh, you go to customer and you would like to uh, demonstrate the solution to him. So what you can do, you can grab two servers. Oh yeah, I removed the branding, sorry, Carsten. Um, uh, you can grab a laptop uh, connected to whatever switch you'll find. It can be any switch, you know, it can be normal, small robot switch. And you can then connect your AX nodes or any nodes or Lenovo data on whatever nodes um, to the switch and deploy it. You know, in, you can interact it with. So um, because I'm running MDT and I will show you how to deploy the MDT using the scenario, uh, you can deploy anything you want, right? And you can scale up and you can scale up a big way. You can scale up to multiple racks easily. But this is the smallest uh, footprint. You can have two nodes directly connected, so no extra switch. You can have, yeah, you probably not have this server in your backpack, but you get an idea. You can, for example, provision the demos if you are doing some trainings, um, whatever. So let's go for the demo now. Um, I'll be RDPing into the uh, physical server where I'm running the where I'm running uh, my machine. So I will show you the Hyper-V console where the machines are running. So I have here two labs uh, because today I will be demonstrating two things. One is just like HCI with MDT uh, and one is exploring the new features in 21H2. So the first lab is, uh, look, is uh, you know, you can have multiple labs with MS labs. Uh, the way I do it, I have different folders where the labs are sitting and you can easily uh, do it the way that you have a disk where you have your MS labs. As you can see, it's just a folder with, uh, oh, sorry. It's a folder with uh, three scripts, clean up, deploy, lab config. You can copy this folder multiple times, rename the folder where it's sitting. And in the lab config, you can spot specify that you don't want to use any prefix. So it will fail back to the name of the folder. So I can know that my lab, new features in 21H2, is sitting in this folder, while my uh, Azure Stack HCI and MDT lab is sitting in this folder. And you can distinguish between using this prefix, right? And as you can see, the lab is pretty small, or should be pretty small. Uh, yeah, it's it's this one is larger, 100 gigs, uh, because I have multiple parent disks. I have parent disk for Windows 11, Windows Server 2019, Azure Stack HCI 2021. Um, yeah. Okay, so you define the lab config. You'll say what machines you want to have. In this case, I also have physical NICs names. So if I'll go to, um, okay, if I'll do, go to uh, adapter options, you can see that I'll have. Uh, two physical NICs. These two physical NICs are now connected to MS Lab. And I can now expand my lab with the physical machines, right? These two physical machines are uh, uh, Dell servers. Sorry for the naming, but some servers. And I can interact with these switches using Redfish protocol. Um, and any vendor can do Redfish. It's uh, industry standard, so you can just invoke against uh, the ILO or iDrag or 
any other uh, VMC device and say what you want to do. Um, in this case, uh, I'll be interacting with these devices to say that I want you to boot from Pixie. Anyway, so I have this infrastructure. I'm, I'm now connected to Windows 11 from where I was configuring everything. So if I'll go to MS Lab, to the scenarios, to Azure Stack HCI and MDT, there is a script called scenario.ps1. If you copy everything from the script, put it into the PowerShell ISE, I have it in here, you can then collapse the region by pressing Ctrl plus M, right? So the code will immediately will be so much nicer because it's no longer a code, it's more or less uh, uh, headlines of what you will do. So what I did already is that I copied this uh, script, just you know, right click copy, and what I did, I pasted it here just by right clicking it into the PowerShell. I'm not about to pasting it here, what it will what it will do is that it will set up the lab. You don't have to do it like this. It's better to sometimes go region by region or just copy portions of the code to learn how the things are done if you want to document it properly. I, I'm not automating it. This is not automation, right? This is documentation. This is like documentation if you download the files, where the files are downloaded from, right? Uh, what is it for the file? So you can put this into the notepad and say, this is how I install my MDT. So this is how I install my MDT. So uh, the MDT is located on a different server. It's on the MDT server. So I wanted to demonstrate how to deploy MDT to this different server than you are logged into. This is the best practice for the security. You you heard Dave Kavula yesterday, and most of the these breaches are happening because administrators are using RDP to connect to any server, right? This is just wrong. In this case, I have an MDT deployed. You can see it's running on a different server. There's also deployed a database that is also running on a different server. On this database, what I do have is I have a computers already. That's in this case are my AX nodes. I was provisioning it using the script. It was everything super easy. The way it works is that you paste this configuration script. Let me just collapse the regions again to configure your MDT. And you can then go and deploy virtual machines if you want. So you will create some dummy virtual machines that are connected to the same switch. They are just empty and are able to boot from Pixie. You will collect the information from the uh, MDT server from the WDS who was trying to boot last five minutes and because you know that the first machine booted uh, the first machine booted uh, you know as first you know the first machine was you know let's say let's call it now it's just the KCI one with this MAC address and GUID you can grab the GUID and MAC address from the logs so you will create basically a hash table and then create a reservation for the machines and add the object into the MDT database I already have it here right so this is something I done I'm not hiding anything. I in this hash table you can see what I was actually adding. I was just too lazy to remove it. It doesn't make sense to remove it. You can copy this information, adjust it to your servers, use different MAC addresses, different GUIs. You get an idea. You can have 20 of these hosts, for example. Or you can just collect this machine that attempted to boot last five minutes and create your the hash, ta hash table out of there. I updated the task sequence with the drivers, so if you will be able to see it, um, there's a task sequence for Azure Stack HCI deploy. There is a one step, one more step. First thing is that um, I do uh, run a PowerShell script that will identify the OS disk index, right? So this will be either the smallest disk, or in this case, it will be uh, boss card and uh, AX nodes. Uh, so you will get an idea how to run PowerShell script in MDT task sequence. Plus also what I'm doing is I'm running a drivers. So there, there is actually an application that will install drivers and firmware into the real servers. So what I will do now, it's easy. I'll just reinstall these servers. And the, th the way I do it is just running a script, right? So I'll restart my nodes just by copying these scripts and just pasting it here because you know you can do it right what it actually does uh the ip addresses for the ilos and oh, oh sorry idrax and i'm calling a web request against these so the machine will reboot 
and also what uh, and also it will be configured to boot from the pixie so the next reboot will happen from the pixie and uh, i just forcibly restarted the machines imagine like a cvmm in a cvmm you could do the same but a cvmm would go to uh, bmc and uh, just issue the reboot right it doesn't configure the machine to boot from pixie so you have to configure it first to boot from the pixie and then you know the only thing you do from the cvmm is just to reboot it what you will see is that the machine will request the information from the wds it will get an ip address it will uh, um um, it will boot to Windows PE. It will automatically find in a database uh, its assignments, its role. So it will deploy a just a KCI operating system. It will join domain and it will also deploy the drivers. So this will just give you an idea how to prepare MDT for your environment. So you can adjust it. You can pull request my um, uh, my project to you know add more functionality. You know expand it with other vendors whatever you want right we just wanted to do this to demonstrate how it can be in your labs or in our labs um, to uh, deploy as many machines you want consistently so you can then continue with deploying operating system or you can just leave it at this and provide windows 11 to the customer you know install here uh, install here windows admin center and uh, you know let customer to play with the infrastructure to, for example with, with the deployment or you can deploy it with the, for the customer and let customer play with vm fleet or anything like that or you can do testing of the hardware so this would be the first uh, uh, lab you would probably see uh, in the monitoring here that once it will get into the pe you will see the status from the last uh, time it took 17 minutes including the drivers if there is any firmware, it will take up to 40 minutes, depending. So you can see it's now booting. Once it will be in the Windows PE, we will see uh, in which steps we are now. OK, let's go back to the slides. Uh, you can see it's booting, so it's probably working. In five minutes, 10 minutes, you will see that the OS is already there, maybe. OK, um, so this was demo. Let's go back to the slides and let's introduce the second lab, and it's um, and it's uh, exploring new features in 21H2. Uh, there's a different screenshots about uh, of the machines. Uh, you can also have, and this is also really good practice, uh, to name your lab with the version of the Windows that's running inside. So in this case, it's uh, 2384.169, means that this is Windows Server 2022 with cumulative update from, I don't know, September probably. So in this scenario, we'll test new features. We will uh, do uh, uh, we will do deployment into the VMs. It doesn't have to be as many VMs as you can see on the screenshot. It can be only two node clusters. In this case, it's four node clusters, and it can be only one cluster. So in case you are testing, for example, network ATC, you will just deploy two node network ATC plus DC, and in this case, you will consume around let's say five gigs of memory plus you know around 50 gigabytes of the storage so almost any laptop can do this so it's really great to demonstrate new features to anyone especially this is really great for the partners or technical sales who would like to demonstrate the value or the real systems to the customers so the first lab will be rolling cluster upgrade well where we will roll from the 20h2 to 21h2 and uh, there's uh, script is divided so let me just go back uh, to the to the uh, uh, to the demo and I will show you the, the script for the exploring new features as you can see the OS is now in, being installed this is the, the, the one with the MDT and the elapsed time you can see what the current step is and how what is the elapsed time anyway we will not talk about MDT anymore we will now talk about uh, exploring new features. So we will now talk about the rest of the labs, the rest of the VMs. Again, you don't have to deploy as many VMs. You can just start with two VMs. You can easily go to the lab config um, here. Lab config looks like this, and you can just simply comment the lines for the clusters you don't want to have, or reduce the number of the nodes just by simply modifying one number. Um, this this config is also a little bit unique. You can see that there are more allowed VLANs 
Uh, this is because of network ATC, or if you want to test your configurations within uh, VLANs that are required for the network ATC, in this case, 7.11 uh, till 7.19. Um, um, and um, yeah, um, here is, uh, yeah, and everything else is the same. Actually, there's a telemetry uh, level specified full. Um, you, we, you can, um, send uh, some uh, telemetry to the Microsoft. It's just about, yeah, and you can see it in the code, it's just about how long does it take to deploy the VMs and what VMs you are deploying. So uh, and the Microsoft colleague knows how, what and how many customers are using MS Labs. Anyway, I'll not save this one. Um, I will do um, explore new features it's this script and as you can see there are regions called prereqs and regions called the lab so if i'll be talking about rolling cluster upgrade i already did run the prereqs so if i'll go into the um, if i'll go into here into my dc that's for new features lab you can see that I have I have already failover cluster with my failover clusters. So in case I would like to continue with raw cluster, rolling cluster update, I'll just open the PowerShell. Right. And I will expand rolling cluster upgrade scenario. I'll just simply paste it. So let's see what it will do. So first of all, you will run uh, updates to make sure that you are on the latest uh, update. You'll validate if everything is okay, and then you'll start rolling cluster upgrade. It's really good if you'll just you know read through the comments. Like for example, here, if you are not running uh, your cluster from Windows Server 2022, there's uh, I would say small hack to just you know grab the uh, rolling uh, rolling upgrade plugin uh, to your machine, so you'll be able to run the invoke cow scan against the cluster, right? Um, and then we will uh, validate the version after the rolling, rolling upgrade, and then I will validate the version of the cluster and also upgrade pool of the cluster. And uh, I think there are also VMs. Right. So this is all steps that you would normally need to do also in the real world cross cluster. But what you can do is that you can simply try it out in the virtual environment where you are not able to break anything. And if you break something, you don't mind, right? Okay, this is different window. Um, you don't mind because you can rebuild easily. So I will do the thing that I will open up the PowerShell. I copy the script, the lab for the rolling cluster upgrade, and I will just simply paste it. The same way you can continue with all other labs like Azure Arc. So the thing what I will do is that I will just highlight what you will be doing in the lab itself. In this case, I'll be mm -hmm. rolling cluster upgrade. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Reinhard. Why should I copy the script from the easy to the console? To run the script in easy is much easier. It we is easier. We don't have an easy on Azure Stack HCI, right? It's easy, I know, but I'm doing it on purpose because if you run it here, you don't know what step you are in. So it will just run and you don't know anything where it is, where the script is located, what it's doing. If you just simply paste it into the PowerShell window, you can see that uh, now it's restarting the machines to apply uh, apply uh, the set preview channel, right? So I'm now invoking command to configure preview channel, right? And I'm now restarting machines to apply. So you can grab a coffee, watch the script, what he's doing. And from here, you can learn how to do things in real world. If you may want to make it more complicated, you can, you know, change the uh, names. You can de de deploy the lab with your customer domain, and you know, try to, you know, uh, copy your customer domain and try to simulate everything in the lab like you would be doing it for the customer. But you can practice. See, so now I'm performing the update. So it configured uh, the. It configured uh, uh, the preview channel. You, I was validating if the preview channel was there. You can see it's release preview channel. Uh, here you can see the list of the updates that will be applied. It's quite big. I think it's a bug, isn't it? 48.8 uh, gigs would be probably too much. And now it's doing its work. So you can grab a coffee, 
watch the script doing your things and this way you can learn and then, then you can ask really good questions to anyone to me to Carsten, to pms and if the customer will have a question like how do i do upgrade from 20 h2 to 21 h2 and you will be able to do and show him this script or just you know create a screenshot create a presentation that's it let's talk about the next uh, lab we have um it's azure arc it's more or less a deep dive on uh, how Azure Arc works because um, I'm on purpose breaking it. Actually, there's a bug in uh, Azure Stack HCI module that registers Azure Stack HCI to Azure. Um, because if you will deploy a cluster with um, a dynamic domain name, is it? Yeah, so you don't have IP address for the cluster, but you are basically using the each IP address of each node and you register it into the DNS. Um, the problem with the script is that it's invoking command against a cluster and inside the command is cluster again mentioned. So it, there is a double hop, so it will fail and it will, you will explore it with this scenario. So in this case, I already have um, cluster deployed. The only thing I will do is to register it to local analytics workspace and um, the workspace you will create and register it also to Azure. So you will again go copy the script for the lab and paste it into the PowerShell. That's it, super simple. And you will again learn how it works and how it you know, doesn't work. Okay, this, this is what I can close, sorry. Different window. Um, let me just maximize it. I will open it up here. This is my VM. You can see rolling cluster upgrade, uh, upgrade, upgrade is working. I'll open up. A new PowerShell window to work with uh, uh, Azure Arc. This one is more complicated, so you may want to explore, exp expand it, and then you know just run section by section. You, you know, you can first register it just by copying like this. You can this way you can learn how to easily register your clusters because what you can do you can easily modify the variable, and then um, then uh, you know use it against your cluster. Uh, it's supposed to be universal, so it checks for the modules that are being used. Um, it checks for um, any case the modules are missing, it will install it. Um, so in this case, I'll, it will show you how you can log in in customer's environment without providing credentials in uh, Windows Server, because if you are doing it from the Windows Server, there might be IE configured and it will pop up and it will ask for allowing all the scripts and everything. Sometimes it's just much more easier to use device authentication. So all of these small things are documented in the scripts and you can learn it this way, you know. So you can go and authenticate on the separate web page where you will log in into the Azure. Let me just open up my port. Uh, my device login page. So I will just you know, paste this uh, script, login in into the window where I'm already enrolled uh, and I'm already uh, logged in um, into Azure. So I'll click on another window, OK, 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 and the script will just continue. It will give you, for example, an option to uh, choose where you want to deploy uh, uh, Azure Stack HCI 2 or where you want to register it. So it will also grab available available uh, locations, as you can see here. It will go out grid view. So as you can see, it's now asking me what um, uh, uh, what subscription I would like to add it to, and then it will grab a location where I would like to. And it's doing many things like uh, enable debug logging if something goes wrong. So you can then go into the log and see what was actually happening. I'll be re registering it, in, in, it into the East US, okay? And now I'm using, for example, piece of script that will not ask you again for the script, for the credentials. The registration will fail, so we will explore what was wrong. And this is the lab. You will be exploring what was wrong and everything is described already in a GitHub. There is a readme file where you already have all of the screenshots, what's expected, and this way you can easily learn. So, it's almost 40, so we have probably only one more uh, 
uh, lab to uh, demonstrate. So is there any feature you would like to see and you would like to do a little bit deep dive? Uh, Karsten, what is your favorite? Theme provisioning or network ATC or you know, kernel soft reboot or? Yeah, I mean, first we have uh, we have one question. Can we onboard VS 2022 HCE cluster? Yeah. TI equals O arc. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, there is one scenario with Windows 7 and Azure Arc, right? So Azure Arc can manage a service, Windows servers. That's a known fact, right? And you can have extensions. Uh, what you cannot do is that if you go to portal, uh, let me just open up the portal and put it on the screen. Yeah, right? And uh, to add more from the from the same uh, um, from the same user, uh, Azure Stack HG iOS is hybrid by design and Arc enabled. Can we have the same Arc experience with Windows Server 2022 HCI cluster? OK, so it's very similar question. Um, so yeah. if I'll go to Azure Arc, uh, you have multiple uh, uh, infrastructure options here. One is Azure Stack HCI and, and here you will see only Azure Stack HCI cluster, right? You will not see any Windows Server cluster here. On the other hand, if you register, for example, this one, this cluster, um, you will see that it what it actually does, it, it will deploy, and, but this one is the 20H2, it, it's not 21H2, but with 21H2, it will also deploy, um, as you can see here, um, uh, it will deploy um, um, agent, uh, uh, ARC agent, uh, that that's, can do many other things. Uh, you have extensions and it will deploy by default none extension. They will be probably just this dependency agent. But if you, for example, want to have monitoring, it will deploy monitoring extensions. But these extensions can be deployed to any server. So you will probably not see your Azure Stack ACI cl cluster based on Windows Server here, but you will see your servers from Azure Stack ACI here. So what it means, you are not able to do cluster aware actions. So you are not able to do cluster aware updating because I'm not sure if in, you are not uh, not able probably to do it yet from here, uh, but it will be probably enabled in some future. That's something what would be expected. But these servers are not, I would say, cluster aware. So you are not able to do any cluster reactions, but you can deploy extensions, you can enable monitoring, you can do anything else. And I'm demonstrating this with the one MS Lab scenario. So if you just search for MS Lab scenarios, uh, there will be one with um, uh, Arc, 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 something. Azure Arc for servers is one. Yeah, it will be probably the one. Azure Arc for servers. So in this case, what I'm demonstrating is that you have three normal servers: 2019, 2020, 2022, whatever. And I'm. Uh, I'm, a, I'm demonstrating how to onboard the, the cluster, um, how to register it to the cluster at scale. So you will see your servers here and then enable extensions. And in this case, the extension will first, the first extension will enable monitoring. So you will go to and register to log analytics workspace where you will send the data and you will be able to update your machines with Windows update, but not cluster aware. Um, so, and then uh, um, there will be key vault extension, so you will be able to uh, deploy certificates to your service and just demonstration how to deploy certificates to the service. Yeah, and I, uh, I want I want to add, we have Thomas Maurer later in a session about uh, Azure Arc and uh, maybe he, we can ask him uh, again about uh, um, an ARC enabled non Azure Stack HCI cluster. So that cluster way updating and something like that. Yeah. Thomas Maurer is coming up, I think, at, let me see, um, uh, in the, at uh, uh, 3 p.m. So after this session is Helmut Otto, and after that session, we have Thomas Maurer, Azure ARC overview. Learn about Ooh. hybrid and multi cloud management with Azure. So maybe a good question there. So I will only highlight the the, uh, the labs here. So for example, network ATC is supposed to fail. It will not complete because the way network ATC works, it just tries to set up everything. And the one mandatory thing is that uh, it will try to deploy DCB. 
and you are not able to deploy DCP in a virtual machine, so it will fail. And then what you will do is that you basically add network intent for the converge uh, uh, for the, for the converged in uh, setup. So you will you know use all the NICs for both VM traffic and both uh, storage traffic. So at least you have an idea how to do it. I will validate the status again against the cluster. So I'm not logging into the nodes. I'm doing everything against the cluster. And to be able to do this again, you have to steal PowerShell module because it's not present in Windows Server 2022. So I'm kind of stealing it to be able to have it on the my management machine. So if you can provide a feedback to product group, tell them that this is blocking from the scenario. That this is blocking you from the scenarios like having a management machine that is you know locked down and uh, you need to use this machine to configure your Azure Stack HCI clusters, right? Because now this is kind of not official way to do it. So don't tell anyone, right? Hopefully Dan is not watching me. <laughs> <coughs> Another um, question yeah. from the audience, uh, mm -hmm. Jaromir. In the cluster rolling upgrade script, I presume it's uh, it's about uh, uh, your your uh, cluster rolling upgrade scenario if yeah. we were to use this on a four node lab cluster with 50 running vms does the cluster where update give enough time for all storage jobs to be completed before moving yes. on to update next node this is completely production and should be and should be working well except it's not right <laughs> as you can see so um now it's it's, it's probably working it was just a uh, uh, cluster, uh, failover cluster manager being weird. Um, and yes, it should go and suspend the node. You will probably see in here that uh, every action is doing like uh, installing all the updates first, and then he will go uh, enable storage maintenance mode, probably uh, move all the VMs from the machine, update it, put it back, and validate if everything is right before going to another machine, right? The script itself, I think, is specifying max failed node zero, I think. Or is not. In Vox, cow scan and cow run. Not sure about the max failed, uh, max failed nodes. Maybe what this is something we should add. Uh, this is something that I copied from the official documentation, right? So you can test it. And if something goes wrong, you can then, you know, try it again and if it's still failing that probably wrong documentation because it may need to specify max failed node zero or something like that because you do if one uh, node will fail you don't want to continue right but this is how it works and you will be able to find the bugs for example there's a bug if you if it will not succeed you'll not be able to run it uh, again because one node is already on 21 h2 so that's a kind of bug. So what you can do is you can manually go and I didn't find a way to uh, run uh, a feature update remotely. So what you have to do is you have to interactively log on into the machine and invoke it or you can just go into the uh, sconfig and just put it uh, go there and from there you can update it. But this is more convenient, especially if you have a fleet of the clusters to update and it's much more informative than um, anything else. You have a lot of information here. You can, you know, at least watch and see what's the state. Okay, so for the network ATC, uh, the fail, uh, the lab will fail. I can show you that we will add some net intent, and it will take some time, and ultimately it will fail. But what we will do is we will try to validate the status, see what the status actually is. I mean, in this case, it's just you know waiting for. Uh, a network ATC to kind of finish the configuration. You can copy the script in case you have something going after. You can just copy the script uh, that is just doing something and waiting for uh, machines to finish, right? Um, then you validate everything. You validate if there's a VM switch, if there are VNICs, uh, if the VNICs are mapped to the physical NICs. So all of these things are configured with network ATC. But there are also things that are not right. So QoS policies, it's there. Uh, flow control setting is there, but there is not IP config. No, there are no cluster names. Live migration networks are not configured. Um, live migration option is not configured. So all of these things you have to know about. Um, you can practice and you can then explain to the customer, okay, we can do this and that and that with network ATC, but we cannot do this and that and that. 
and then I remove the intent and basically what I do, I, I show what should be configured, let's say manually, right? So instead of using a network ATC, I'm showing how you would do configure the same with the PowerShell. So you can directly copy the thing, these, these scripts and use it for any, any other deployment. And this will save you a lot of time. So let, let's take a look on the, th on the theme provisioning. Um, this will be probably short lap. So are there any other questions? Because we have. Yes, Jaromir, there's another Please one. Thank me. you, yes. Jaromir. Yeah, thank you, Jaromir. Your labs are awesome. I <laughs> think you, you <laughs> like to hear that, right? Yeah, are you yeah. still using the Xbox controller for deployment? Smile. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, it was really good. It was in your conference, right? So, <laughs> but I was uh, I wanted to show how easy it is to deploy just a KCI cluster. So I went with the Xbox controller and I basically hooked up the Xbox controller to my machine and used um, uh, joy to key software to be able to control. It's free software, I think. Uh, to be able to control a mouse and I basically was controlling the PowerPoint presentation and use Xbox controller as a mouse for uh, copying and pasting script. So it deployed uh, your Azure Stack HCI or uh, S3 cluster in your lab, right? So just I to demonstrate that. how easy it is, right? Because I think it's funny because I think this is the best way to, uh, to be honest, this is the best way you can deploy cluster, right? To do it with a script that is kind of consistent and it's self-documenting. So anyone after you will work for another company, he will come to the cluster and instead of, you know, reading through the documentation that looks like a comic book because of it's full of the screenshots, he will just go walk through the PowerShell script uh, and actually he will be able to see, okay, um, what he, the guy was doing, right? So in this case for the thing, thing provisioning, uh, I will create a volume but just by doing new volume, whatever, just a basic one. Um, see, oh, yeah, sorry, I copied the wrong text, whatever. Uh, this is cluster name. I'm, I created normal volume. Uh, then I will create, yeah, I'm now creating the normal volume. I will see how much um, uh, size I consumed with the normal volume. Then I will create thin provision volume by just adding one more parameter. Uh, see how much this consumed, right? And then what I will do is configure pool settings to uh, default to the thin provision volumes, right? So you can see that um, uh, create fixed volume, uh, it was one terabyte. Uh, I checked the pool, the size that was allocated increased, the volume itself, footprint on pool is uh, bigger. So, and then you can explore thin provision volume just by again, copying and pasting. You don't have to, you know, uh, reinvent the wheel. You can just reuse whatever was already created, modify it. You can change the cluster name variable with your cluster, uh, change your friendly name of the volume and change the size. And then you can recycle the scripts and you can always use it like this. As you can see, let's compare it footprint on pool with uh, uh, thin volume instead of you know, consuming three terabytes, we are now consuming 37 gigabytes, 37.5 gigabytes. So you can do some planning, then you can just configure what's default in the pool um, and do it with the script again. You will explore the pool itself. Um, um, you can see the default setting was fixed. We changed it to thin. And then if you create a volume without specifying, without specifying the, the, the type, uh, it will be thin. And yesterday, uh, I noticed there is one more setting that you can uh, configure per cluster. I forget the setting name. But now with the script, you can go and, and explore the pool itself uh, and see what, what's there, right? So you can just get uh, minus storage pool, uh, minus sim session, uh, cluster name, whatever. And this is your pool. You'll probably want to choose the friendly name uh, S2D something that's uh, always like this and maybe list all the features of oh, properties sorry and you will see okay okay what's here you know you'll be able to see what's the repair policy probably you should not <coughs> modify it you can see what the version it is it's Windows Server 2022 right on Azure Stack ACI cluster interesting and here are the supported provisioning times types so you can do thin and fixed provisioning yeah you can explore more and without having to buy expensive hardware from whatever vendor 
um, and yeah, you can even use any laptop right to do this because you can do two nodes cluster you can even do four node cluster you can uh, assign it to dynamic memory and it will be pretty pretty small and as you will see to set up this cluster i was not using much the prereqs for the thin provision cluster will be just you know install the cluster and enable cluster std that's it so it's pretty simple it will not consume any memory but you are able to play with thin provision volumes any other questions by the way Carsten. In the moment, there there are none. So I ask you a question. Awesome. Uh, what is your pre what is your preferred uh, uh, feature in uh, uh, in Azure Stack HCI twenty one H two? Okay, so I like then. So it would be definitely uh, network ATC because I I like the way that Dan is thinking. He's an XPFP and he's a really cool guy who knows his stuff, right? Uh, they came with this idea. I think this is the future for configuring your Azure Stack HCI cluster. That's why I was asking the question if they want to expand this, because my wet dream would be to have one configuration file that you will just apply against the cluster and the cluster will just happen, right? Um, unfortunately, it's not possible. As you can see, even with network ATC, you still have to configure some portions of the networking, I would say manually. Uh, you know, you should be doing a bit of script, but it's not nice. What I try to do is that I try to keep variables in here, but it's always different. For uh, now, I'm, for example, writing the deployment of the real machines, and the, you always have to adjust your script. So uh, you have to learn PowerShell. That there is no excuse for not running the PowerShell. There is no tool that will save you from not knowing the PowerShell. Because what you, what I'm, for example, doing here is and the net, 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 uh, best practices. I'm basically, you know, disabling unused disconnected adapters with just one command, right? Then I'm grabbing the fastest adapters available, and uh, I assume that the fastest link are the ones that you want to use for the converged networking. In this case, converged networking. But if you would like to do not converge networking, uh, separate NICs for the um, uh, uh, for separate NICs for the uh, storage traffic, you probably will do a different logic. So you will not probably grab fa fastest link link speed and then, then the fastest net adapters. You'll probably grab different logic. You'll probably go just with some uh, Cavium, some Melanox, or you know some driver, some some NICs that you will specify here. But you at least have some like um, I would say. Um, template that you can use and modify and you can practice. And this is the most important uh, piece. I already spent a lot of time doing all of this work for you. Uh, so you will be able just to copy it and adjust it. And by using this, you can learn. Uh, there is no other project I, I found that as assuming that you are running everything from the management machine to, you know, to comply with the best practices. And also, you know, trying to take uh, in, um, uh, I know, take in, uh, think about the things like, uh, you know, disable CSV balancer. You know, sometimes you may want to disable it, probably not. Uh, maybe meltdown spectrum mitigations. Do you want to enable it or not? Uh, should be everything in one script. I also add secure core, so you don't have to go to windows admin center to click it there you'll just you know run the script to, during the deployment and uh, you should be good to go right or you can just then write the validation script check the check the check the registry entry for example if it's still there uh, and reverse engineer what registry is being set by just reading the script that that's the whole idea and it's not like something i would like to show hey i'm the great yaromir oh, this is what i do no no no. this is what i like to share with the community because i hate when i see someone struggling with deploying s3 cluster because he tried to do everything with a gui with server manager because there was some guy like 100 years ago that was mentioning that you should create volumes with failover cluster manager because why not right because in the storage you can still go here and uh, you know create a virtual disk Okay, Jaromir, I have uh, um, one question for a quick answer from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a bit complaining about Arc, I assume. We cannot onboard Azure VM into Arc because they are already in Azure. Mm -hmm. How we can manage all workloads from one single pane of glass? And you have one minute for the answer because then uh, Helmut is up. 
And the answer is that uh, the no, Arc is just enabling uh, it as a resource in Azure. So if it's already as a resource in Azure, you don't need to enable it as an Arc, right? Because it's already a resource that's potentially with some agent. Uh, but this is more for uh, enabling uh, machines that are not in Azure and you want to project it to Azure to have a single pane of glass. So ultimately you have a single pane of glass. You have a list of the resources, some of are uh, Arc enabled and some of our native Azure. Okay, Jaromir, more Arc questions? I would say uh, we, we'll leave it to uh, Thomas, we, we do that in the Thomas session. Yes. Um, so we have just a minute to Helmut. I see Helmut on the camera. Thank you, Jaromir, for the session. I know this was not enough time to I know. Uh, deep, uh, even grasp the concept of MS Lab. We have done, I think, two or three sessions already together. You were speaker at uh, CDC. Yeah. Um, you will have this video, of course, for your website to link it. So go to the Git, uh, GitHub and uh, look into the scripts. Uh, it, you, you need a bit time to start with it, but then it's really uh, great what you are doing. So thanks so much. And now we switch over to Helmut. Hello. Hello, um, Helmut. I see you have our nice background there. Thank you. And the CDC speaker T-shirt. Helmut, I love you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Helmut, uh, you have yeah, the stage. Since, thank you. Since I was speaker on the CDC some time ago, and I hope I have the honor to speak again. Uh, I think in, when we will have one. In, in yeah, 2023. I so I think in 2023, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just okay. want to show my appreciation for what you're doing, Carsten. And yeah, and uh, I, I have to give back. You are doing great work with your other uh, community members in Austria. You do the Experts Live Austria, where we see the slides now, yeah. and also a great conference. And there is the next is next year again live, right? You had it two weeks or three weeks ago. Yeah, with we a small were. live audience. But I was so fortunate to be a presenter, and it was really great to be on a stage again and present and not doing this online, everything online, right? No, it was great to have an in-person event again. So we yeah. decided to do it in June, uh, to do it in September, just before school starts, before the numbers get too bad. And we will have uh, the next one uh, in June next year. Uh, we'll be at the end of my talk with the save the date. So <laughs> okay, cool. I, I, I will do some uh, yeah, marketing for our yeah. Experts Live Austria. And That's yeah, it, but, fine. it was great to see everybody. The only one I missed was DDA. Yes. Unfortunately, he wasn't allowed to travel. And it was interesting how guys doing uh, stage talks for years after two years of uh, vacation on stage uh, makes are not used to do it again. And it's thank you, all, thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was nervous in the beginning. Yeah, you're right. I'm mean, normally you, you I'm. Weren't, a, a, you weren't the only one. If you if you think about the keynote, it was the same thing. It yeah, was, exactly. It's normally I'm I'm so comfortable on a stage. I love it really. I want to speak, but starting after I, I did one year, I, I was once speaking in Switzerland at the Experts Live event. La only event last year where I was speaking and if you don't do that often you get a bit nervous but after two three minutes I had some problems with my pointer I had some problems with audio you remember right <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it okay was, it was fun yeah so, but now your session Helmut it's okay, not about yeah. us it's about your session go on please. yeah yeah my my session is about uh SMB to data center. So my idea is I want to switch gears against against when Jaromir did the technical deep dive. Uh, I'm more about a bit less technical this this time. I just want to speak from the field of what, what we encountered, what installations we have and what we, you can do with Azure Stack HCI in, in general. Uh, to, yeah, just it's a great product. It's uh, it's a tremendous product and I often think that not enough people know what they want to do and what what's going on there. So this, does everybody see my slides at the moment? 
Oh, is uh, I'm, I'm still on video. It would be great to see the slides, Manfred. Both Helmut, uh, you the slides are uh, in full size and a small video besides. Okay, great. It, it's enough if to see the slides though. So if you turn up the video, turn off the video, it's better because okay. some pictures on the slides are already diminished and then it gets really small. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my to my person, so the click is not working. No, my person, I'm Helmut Otto. I'm a managing director of SecureGuard, MVP for cloud and data center. Uh, my main profession is uh, at the moment, or my company's main profession are two things. We do, uh, we write software for uh, aircraft and commercial airplanes, build uh, some portable servers for them. And our other hobby is that we certify Azure Stack HCI, uh, hardware, especially for uh, German customers and uh, German resellers. And uh, in case of that, we see a whole lot of different configurations. And that's why I want to speak a bit about yeah, the emerging of that, what you can do it and what we see and configuration and customers and ideas, which customers have how to use Azure Stack HCI in different environments. Uh, just a short introduction, we go from leg legacy uh, infrastructure now to hyper-converged infrastructure that was the big step with uh, S2D and now the biggest step with Azure Stack HCI. We scale it from two nodes up to 60 nodes, even when Carsten and some others and like me don't want to see 60 node clusters in general. Uh, we start up with four disks and we can go to four petabyte of capacity. We can have scalability between uh, 10 to 400 gigabit Ethernet networking. So it's a real scalable, great product. And on including all that, you also have the possibility to run it in a hybrid environment so that you have a centralized management out of Azure that everything you get additional services out of, of Azure and can integrate it easily into a hybrid uh, infrastructure, which gives you a, a much better performance than if you have it on premise only. And it's scalable up to a whole number of use cases where we want to go through now. So we're based on Intel or AMD processors up to 2000. 48 logical processors from 32 gig to 48 terabyte of RAM, 400 terabyte per node, 4 petabyte per cluster of storage. As I said, 10 to 400 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, Windows Server 2019-2022 with S2D or Azure Stake HCI 2H2 and 21H2 are at the moment uh, the versions we are working with and we are certifying for. Uh, and then we come to the different use cases. But before I want to have some words about uh, certification and why it's so, so essential to only use uh, validated nodes or integrated solutions so that you use certified uh, environments like you've seen in the slide here, there's a whole scalability, but one of the essential things that your cluster is really, really running well and really running good is that somebody takes care that all of these camp components work together, not only work together, also were tested together and were certified together. So with all the sponsors here, like Dell and Lenovo, they really do a great job in certifying their uh, uh, apply uh, their hardware so that you as customer or at the customer has a good experience and all of the use cases we speak about are now uh, really possible from that. And it's not only uh, Dell and Lenovo, it's also a great number of other uh, suppliers, uh, especially also in German speaking Europe, where we have a whole lot of uh, smaller companies offering uh, validated nodes for Azure Stack HCI. Now from the use case perspective, the one use case or the use case which we see as uh, 
uh, which we see um, most in our environment at the moment for Azure Stake HCI is the two cluster, the two node cluster. So that the two node cluster is uh, especially interesting in rather small environments. So you have few VMs, few users, you are in a low budget and high availability is still required. Uh, from a hardware perspective, you can run such a two node uh, um, cluster on a normal desktop micro cluster like they are offered or on a really uh, small environment with only uh, four storage disks. And the, the different use cases we see here, are especially uh, branch offices, uh, of bigger environments. That's interesting because you have a centralized pane of glass for all of your branch offices. E each of your branch offices has a, the possibility uh, with uh, rolling updates, uh, with clusterware updates that you have no downtime in the branch offices. You have the same security and the same uh, availability in the branch office as you have it in the uh, in your main office or in your uh, in your center office or your data center. Uh, a special form of branch offices we see is retail store. And what we also see is an, uh, that uh, two node clusters are often used by ISVs as a rollout option for business software. So for uh, ERP software or for accounting software so often. The, the, the point it's at the moment with Azure Stack HCI is not often we, we see it, but it's not the, the main uh, environment where we see it. So at the moment, if we compare uh, HCI rollouts to um, normal Windows Server rollouts, I think we are in a sort of a three to one split or four to one split. So about between 20 percent to 25% of certified uh, hardware installations are really on Azure Stack S HCI. The rest is still on uh, Microsoft Server 2016 to 2019. And uh, um, the uh, use case here is you don't have too much VMs but you still want the high availability. The interesting thing is what we see in our own home market in Austria at the moment that we see more and more really small business uh, companies, uh, which are um, five to 20 user companies also using uh, Azure Stake HCI as their main installation point for their hardware, for the servers, and also for their uh, digital transformation to go to go more to Azure, bring services out to Azure in a hybrid environment. And when we look at, at this scenario, it's interesting in a way because it's uh, it really brings also uh, commercial advantages to the smaller ones. Since Azure's HCI in the meantime is based on, on a per core licensing, uh, the for the small company who doesn't need too much licenses, it's much cheaper than running a big single shot Windows Server with data center and things like that. So the, the smallest installations we have at, or we see at the moment are based on this micro cluster there. In that case, it's a, a Thomas Grand machine. It's already certified. Uh, it's based on a four core AMD Epic processor and the the two node installation including storage and everything is well below 10000 euros so which makes it uh, extremely affordable uh, uh, for everybody even in a in a smaller environment and the yeah say let's say the evolution of this whole thing is the next what we built, it was more or less built because it was, uh, yeah, I was forced to do it. It was a project over winter, 
from 2019 to 2020 uh, because one of the Microsoft guys, Cosmos Darwin, uh, on Ignite 2019 in autumn 2019 was always on stage uh, with uh, um, uh, half size one U server from another vendor telling uh, that's how small and how flexible uh, Azure Stack HCI and S2D can get. And when we met at the end of the show, I promised him when I will see you again, you will get a box which you can put on stage, take with you like a briefcase, and it won't be only something which you can show, it will be a full running cluster including everything and in infrastructure in a single box. And the uh, result of this whole thing was the cluster in a wooden box, which is a full flash dual node four core, uh, four core uh, H Azure Stack HCI certified uh, cluster, including a uh, uh, a 10 gigabit switch for the storage networking and a one gigabit switch with an access point uh, for consuming the VMs on there. And uh, that you that you can run it on, uh, on the stage. It has an integrated battery pack with uh, 200 watt hours of lithium ion batteries, which gives you around the runtime of two and a half hours uh, without any uh, additional uh, TC power supply. So at the end of the day, it's a USB uh, 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 backup uh, server, which can run in an edge scenario. And just to be total open, uh, we've built these servers already for an edge scenario. Uh, not in a wooden box then, but then in a uh, uh, in a metal case, uh, so that they uh, that they can run uh, on uh, cars or vehicles, and can gather data uh, on the outside uh, at uh, plants, buildings, uh, construction sites, and things there, and. Uh, the idea also is uh, the integrated uh, uninterruptible power supply, UPS, makes it also suitable for environments where the whole uh, the whole thing is a bit rougher. And yeah, and that's the that's the reason why it wasn't only a uh, let's say a hobby at the end, but it leads to a full qualified product. And also if somebody wants uh, uh, that uh, wants something like that, uh, just contact me. We can do it with every logo because the whole wood is uh, laser cut and we can change it. And it's, it's a nice little gimmick if you want to go to a customer displaying Azure Stake HCI. And uh, yeah, and it's based on certified hardware, as I said before. So it's says so the next use case we want to speak about, and what we see as the let's say um, most common, most often found installation at at our edge is uh, a four node cluster. So most of our customers at the moment deploy uh, Azure Stack HCI or S2D on four node cluster. Many of them since uh, 2016, uh, like Carsten already mentioned in a form that they stretch two nodes in two different fire zones. The interesting thing here is you get high performance and high bandwidth. Uh, and you should have, have low latency between the nodes, but it's normally in, if they are directly connected. And uh, in the enterprise, uh, we see this in uh, totally different use cases. Uh, one of the bigger customers we have uses it in uh, database and data mining. It's an interesting use case because uh, we have a whole lot of cores used by, by SQL Server and not too much VMs on these machines. Uh, um, but then the most common uh, installation we see there, and that's the most, uh, yeah, 
that's where the customers get most out of the advantages uh, of uh, Azure Stake HCI and the S2D environment uh, is uh, in a default company having a mixed environment with some Active Directory, for instance, still some exchange servers, some databases, uh, line of business applications, uh, things like that. Uh, a whole, not a whole lot of a big working set normally, because if you look at the databases or if you look at the exchange servers, what we encountered on customer sites when we do installation or when we support installation for our partners, uh, we see that the working sets are well below 10% of the whole storage there. Uh, in a normal environment, it's not only below 10%. We see the working sets of all the storage, which are really changed per day, is, is just around 2 to 3%. Uh, the application workload is uh, high in the beginning of the day when everybody logs on but it uh, doesn't show uh, some special forms. And what we see there in most of the uh, installation also is the possibility to use uh, tiered storage there. Uh, that means that you have uh, fast storage, NVMEs for cache, uh, SSDs for your working set and then uh, really HDDs down there for uh, cold data, which isn't that often used. So if you look into a typical exchange server, I think the hot data of an exchange server is well below normally 1% because you have uh, data mails from several years, but uh, you only get, you only work with the uh, mails or the data from the last two days. And then uh, tiered storage is the best possibility there that you really save and to get the best price performance uh, um, uh, out of your installation. Then uh, what we see also is what Carsten was thinking or was telling, that's the stretch caster environment with the redundancy between fire stretched between rooms, buildings. Uh, we have one customer which even stretches this cluster, his cluster between two, three tier data centers over around 100 kilometers with dark fiber between the data centers. Um, and in this environment, we also see uh, already then uh, um, not only the normal commercial free tier installations but what what we see here also is that uh, customers use um, <clears throat> uh, let's say some sort of uh, edge forms of installations so either things like uh, high storage capacity for backup solutions uh, we have one customer which is an in oh, we know a customer, we sub, it's not our customer, it's a customer of our customers. It's an insurance surveyor. Uh, he has the interesting use case that his guys, his agents are going out, taking pictures of insurance cases, filling up multiple sometimes SD cards, came back into the uh, office, load all of these SD cards up to the file server, and then from the uh, sometimes thousands of pictures, take two or three to make the reports. But all of the rest of the pictures are archived with the case. So in this case, in that uh, environment, we really have a corner case. It's one of the clusters we discussed before everything got live. It's a 12 node cluster, which uh, Carsten won't recommend. and for sure it's not really a, a total yeah, common scenario because still in a 12 node cluster you only have the possibility that new two nodes fails that third failure will at the end of the day in a way shut down the cluster if you don't go in special configurations uh, with your volumes and things like that but on the other side we there we have the the problem that we want to have uh, an extreme amount of storage with an extreme low working set 
because the working set of this installation, they have to keep the data for seven years. Uh, for some legal reasons, especially they're doing medical cases, and so they have to keep it on prem. Uh, so, and the working set is below 0.1% of the data. So, what we did here, we, we made a tiered storage, we built a tiered storage, and we pushed 36 HDDs with 12 terabytes into each of these 12 nodes for, for, for storage, and re really at the moment then begin scratching at the at the high level of uh, 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 yeah, 400 terabyte regions which we can address in on, in only one node and then also on the better byte ranges of the whole cluster but at the end of the day for this customer it's still the cheapest and best solution and thankful to a customer to one of our partners it was made available in that way um, yeah and then the total high end oh uh, sorry yeah total high end uh thing where we have data centers uh we have it Tier three data center where an MSP uses not Azure Stack HDI but S2D on Windows Server in that case to provide services to his customers. Uh, there, the maximum hardware configurations are things he's considering, like 2048 vCPUs for their RAMs, and at the moment uh, evaluating uh, 200 gigabit of networking, not 400, and uh, also having nodes where the maximum amount of v they are reaching the maximum amount of 2000 uh, vms in an environment uh i've, I've written or i've talked here about eight to 16 node clusters the, the idea is the biggest possible cluster is 16 node but in clusters which uh has really uh high load which are really highly redundant and which you want to work with, I think all of us, including Manfred and Carsten, we think that the highest number of nodes you should do if you're not in a special edge configuration is eight. Again, what I've discussed before, because you are in the case that you have fault domains and in your fault domain, only two nodes can fall down before the cluster falls. The metadata is only brought up on five nodes in general. So um, everything is fine there if you run it with eight nodes and you have additional possibilities like this customer is using where you do cluster sets so that you can easily migrate VMs between different clusters. You can go uh, between uh, different clusters with the normal tools and yeah it gives you more reliability more uh, availability of the whole thing if you run it with uh, lower nodes and if you want to stretch the clusters it's still a 4-4 configuration on two sides with stretch cluster and uh, uh, yeah it's always a, a also a commercial point the the more node uh you have in the cluster um the better the price performance ratio will be on on the other hand uh, on the other hand uh, the more nodes you have a cluster the more you suffer if you lose two nodes and the, the more likely it is that you lose two nodes because it's 50 percent uh, it's 100 percent more likely to lo lose two nodes in a 16 node cluster than it is in an eight node cluster yeah that was just the first part of my speech about uh, the different use cases and then I want to go over to the hybrid architecture in Azure Stack HCI so that one of the main features why customers think about these use cases why they go for Azure Stack HCI or for uh, uh, S2D and Windows services is the hybrid uh, um, idea Microsoft has, we can have an on-prem part included into a 
cloud part, we can easily migrate to the cloud part, but in, in between, I want to see if there are some questions. Castle, um, yes, they are. Yeah, okay. Um, just wait, I was just tweeting about, uh, <laughs> about your presentation. Uh, where's my Teams? Here it is. So we had some questions from the audience. Um, Here it is, the right one. Where? I go to the window. I have, I have multiple this team sessions. There yeah. it is. OK, thank you. Um, one is asking about uh, Azure Stack Edge. Uh, and, uh, they have a POC with uh, Microsoft hardware, you, the usual one you can only lease. But yeah. is there, are there also other options you maybe, uh, maybe um, refer to so if they want to do Azure Azure Stack Edge so the uh, I think the IoT deployment. Uh, the, I know the you really, do something there. We, we do something there. The real Azure Stack Edge is all for Microsoft only uh, but we also had project also or we have POCs including with, uh, with Microsoft since Azure Stack Edge is not available in all regions for instance also, uh, is that you can do uh, IoT on Azure Stack HCI. We have proof of concepts with Azure Stack IoT on HCI, especially when we look at the, at the small two node clusters or if this uh, at the idea like the, the cluster in a wooden box, in that case, the cluster in a metal case then, uh, where this, <laughs> this gives you the possibility to run your IoT edge part there you have the idea uh, you have the possibility to add uh, GPUs to these clusters or uh, do really good data mining because even if it's only a four core cluster with 10 gig networking uh, it can be full flash and it makes around 100,000 IOPS which is not bad for any hardware in the region of 5k for a cluster and uh, it is normally enough to uh, gather all the data on a construction site or somewhere somewhere there. So yeah, you have you have two possibilities there. You can make a small cluster uh, going full flash or going normally with a GPU card. Why it's an either or is that the small clusters are normally based on mini AT exports and you only have one PCIe slot. And you use either the PCIe slot for the NVMEs full flash or you use it for the GPU card. GPU card. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's another one. Um, uh, another question about interconnect setup. Are you interconnecting even more than two nodes so without using extra switches for storage replication traffic and are you choosing rocky or iwob which one you prefer i have also an opinion about that but uh, the audience asks you the the point is uh, i'm not uh, really a friend of direct connections so uh, even in, in my nodes. also not in two node uh, even in the glass in the wooden box, there is a 10 gig switch in there. There's a four board 10 gig switch in there for the storage network. It's a cheap one, to be honest. So the, it's around 100 euros. Uh, but it saves you a whole lot of problems when it comes down to uh, you're losing one cluster node. If you have a switch, the other cluster node knows that you loses the network connection to this node and knows that his own network interface is still fine. Mm -hmm. if, if you have it uh, on a crossover cable, one node thinks one of my network interfaces has a problem because it's going down. And you can more and more into problems where you, the cloud witness or a files, file share witness has to be used to get which one of the two, two nodes is really the healthy one. And we know some situations now at, at the meantime at our customers, especially with 2019, where both nodes think they lost their witness, they're down and they begin rebooting. So uh, I'm no friend of this uh, crossover installations. Uh, in some cases, it's fine because it's you have uh, environments where it has to be that way. 
you don't have the, the possibility for a switch or so, but if you can afford it, just put a switch in. It's not a high, or, high or end. Two. Or two. Or two. Yeah. yeah. Because the if end. the switch fails, you have the same problems, right? Yeah, if the switch fails, you have the same problems, but you're, then you're down anyway. <laughs> 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 so you're not down by accident and because of a, of a misleading witness uh, vote, but you're down anyway because one of your core component fails. But uh, switches are not that expensive, especially there. And uh, just to be honest, when it comes between iWarp and Rocky, I personally prefer Rocky. Uh, it's not hard to configure from my opinion. It's not everybody's opinion, but my opinion is it's not hard to configure. We started our biggest and, and high end as in installations where we had very two multiple million IOPS with Mellanox cards on Mellanox switches. And that's so not it's hard to configure with you. <laughs> so that's, that's per uh, a perfect setup. <laughs> yeah, uh, but on the other side, when we come down to this two node cluster and to this really small clusters and it, we come down to the uh, to the socks we have available at the moment. One of the really good socks we can use there is the Skylake DE uh, from Intel, which you have from two core up to 16 cores and it has an in integrated uh, X55 uh, 551 uh, card in there and this card does iWarp. And Helmut, your camera is uh, going up and up and uh, up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just saw only your, your glasses up, so uh, thank you. Sorry. So sorry. I have another great question, but I will ask it after this part of the presentation because uh, it's, it's a question we, I think there is more discussing ground for all of us around. So please continue your presentation and after that we have a question that can maybe take a while to answer. Okay, so I will speak for the rest or what? <laughs> if you need yeah. that, that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, uh, the second part will go with uh, Windows Admin Center UI and what uh, possibilities and services I have uh, in this environment uh, and to the hybrid architecture we have with Azure Stack HCI OS. We see we have validated par partner hardware on this. We have at least uh, the three main uh, services Azure Stack HCI OS as an infrastructure provider has, which means I have compute in Hyper-V, I have uh, storage spaces direct, which gives me storage like the name says, and I have uh, software defined networking for my network uh, for this. On that only, on that, I can, and on this on-premises Hyper-V, then I can run Windows Server. Oh, what a surprise. I can run Linux, which we see more and more often, and I have the possibility to run Kubernetes services on that, especially as Azure, Azure Kubernetes services. Then I go and administer the whole thing with Windows Admin Center, but like Manfred and you also said, not only normally you have also PowerShell and some line of uh, some uh, legacy tools to get all or out of the clusters, and then you connect to the Azure services. And I want to speak a bit about the different Azure services which are available and which we see on customer sites and which are really used by customers, or which are also used in proof of concepts or, or yeah tests at the moment. So the first Azure service you have to use with Azure Stack HCI is the Azure Stack HCI registration. As we know, licensing in the meantime is per core. Your cluster should at least uh, connect one month, one time a month to the uh, to uh, Azure to get a new license. Uh, not connecting to Azure won't shut down any virtual machines, but uh, will kill all your possibilities to administer virtual machines. So you won't see a breakdown in productivity and in what you're doing at the moment. But if you don't have a, a connectivity for more than 30 days, you won't be able uh, to reconfigure virtual machines, bring up new virtual machines, delete old ones and so on. So you're just running in the environment you have. Uh, to be honest, that's really working. So we disconnected a small do not cluster for 30 days from the internet and then we saw this behavior, it's implemented. So it's nothing which is just sad, it's in a way you get problems after 30 days with no connectivity to Azure. Uh, 
that and if you connect again, no problem, everything is working fine just on the minute. So the license is redone. Uh, then we have an the let's say optional Azure services you can use, especially uh, the site recovery, backup, update management, file sync, monitor, the security center, and all of that managed from one centralized management on your uh, on-prem installation from Windows Admin Center, which is in that case an edge local ad management. So you have it at your own. You have the whole set of applications then containers, cognitive services, Azure Kubernetes services, all, all on that, which is then their hybrid. And if you want to integrate all of your or your resources you have on Azure Stack HCI into the Azure portal and bring it as a resource to the Azure portal, you can use Azure Arc and integrate your VMs with Azure Arc, uh, something where we will hear more from in Thomas's talk, hopefully at the end. So how are these services uh, presented into uh, in Windows Admin Center. In Windows Admin Center, there is a whole section which says Azure Hybrid Center. In this Azure Hybrid Center, you have the access to all of these hybrid services. You can bring them up there. You can set it up there. You can integrate your cluster into this. Uh, it's not always the cluster. It's also the possibility that you integrate your single machine into it, so Azure Arc is normally only single machine integration. And uh, you see the same services again when you go to this uh, Windows Admin Center hybrid. You have the Azure Arc, that's a recommendation, it's free, so just do it. And then you have the, the different services uh, with backup, file sync. We will go through the services in detail. What is uh, Backup, Windows Azure Backup can be used in two forms, either directly, so you can backup Windows files and folders directly to Azure, restore them directly to Azure, use it native. The second form, which is available, you can go via third-party third backup, uh, like VM or so, or Commvault, Simbana, or available, uh, other third parties which then back it up in Azure in a blob and you restore it, can restore out of the blob. But uh, just to be honest uh, with uh, Carsten and uh, DDA there, so if you if somebody has uh, questions about VM and backing up, uh, there are specialists already in the speaking about it. Uh, yeah, uh, we have some vanguards in the speaker list also. The next thing is if you don't want to back up, so, but you want to have uh, only files synced, you can have a centralized retention of files on Azure. Then files are locally cached. And the interesting thing here is the, you have multi site access. So you can have multiple sites uh, attached to these uh, files and the changes made to one side will be synced over other sites in uh, all other offices. Uh, please be aware that's not real time. It's not a stretch cluster or something like that. So if you do changes on one side and you, if you do a whole lot of changes in multiple files on one side and somebody else is working on another side with the same set of files, you tend to get problems uh, how the whole thing can be synced again. Uh, so you will get multiple version of the same file and somebody has to do a, a decision how you uh, reintegrate the data, the different data to this file. Uh, if um, someone already worked with uh, shared OneNote, for instance, then for sure they will have this uh, feature set where you have multiple version outs from the same file where then where you then have to do uh, some conflict resolution to get to a correct version again. So it's a great possibility. It's a great possibility if uh, mainly 
if you have a whole lot of consumers and normally only one producer. So if you want to have it local on different sites, but it, the, the producing side is only one. And it's a great possibility, like we use it in some customers where their production sites are in countries where the, let's say, the data connectivity is normally not too good. So like one of our customers uh, has uh, servers in a uh, place called 103D, which is nothing else than an oil field in the middle of the Sahara uh, with a satellite link. And for them, that, that's a great possibility to get files there and work with the files and not run in blobs, uh, sync single files and get it as fast as a file is available there. Then we have uh, Azure Site Recovery. Azure Site Recovery uh, gives you the possibility to back up local VMs to Azure and fail start this F, uh, this uh, VMs in Azure and fail over to this whole thing. Please be aware, that's a great concept, but you will have some network problems because you fail over to a different network in Azure. So your server has to run with a different IP address. And also it gives, there's no possibility that you fail over your, for instance, your DHCP server. It, won't, it will be of no use if your DHCP server runs in Azure. It, you won't get DHCP addresses out of it because DHCP is a broadcast and it won't go over routed networks. So. Be aware that's a great possibility, but uh, sometimes you need to have some scripts if the failover uh, starts so that the whole uh, infrastructure and configuration is still is smoothly running. The, how to extend your on-premises network to uh, Azure then, it's the Azure Network Adapter. So if you want to start this uh, machine in Azure, you have to extend your network to, to Azure at the end of the day, and you need this Azure network adapter for uh, accessing then the resources in uh, there. One of the additional points is Azure update management. So you can update all of your machines, either in Azure or local, either if it's uh, Windows or Linux, or so it's yum apt or whatever you use there. Uh, the system is relatively simple. You have a, a run books. So you have a pre steps where you check if updates are necessary, if updates are can be applied, then the updates are run and then in a, in a, in the, the in the next step, reports are generated and you see how these updates were rolled out and if everybody's fine and how many of your servers accepted the updates and what what went wrong. Hopefully nothing went wrong and 100% of the servers have the update. But the bigger the installations are, the less likely you have no problems. So that's the whole thing and that all you see in a really simple uh, uh, dashboard that is, it gives you an overview of this whole thing. Coming soon, it's a bit of a preview. Or is it already released? Do you know, Carsten? I don't three know either. Ago, three weeks ago, it was know. coming soon, but it, uh, just I have to admit, I hadn't checked it in the last three weeks if it's already released. Uh, it's uh, the possibility to use the monitor security configuration and telemetry on premise. Uh, and uh, leverage Security Center and Azure Sentinel also for Azure Stack HCI and on-premise or all other clouds. But the, for us, it's really essential that we have the on-premise uh, whole Azure Stack family on-premise, which means hub and HCI, where we can report data to Azure Security Cent uh, Center and uh, at, to the same Azure Sentinel uh, to get uh, a, let's say single single look on my security environment and what's happening and use the same features which also think was one of the questions uh, how can we uh, prevent uh, ransomware attacks and things like that so like Dave said 
install security and when it's coming, please integrate the whole thing to the security center so that you have a single point where you can get uh, an idea about the health of your system and the especially the health of the security of your system. Same what's coming soon is the Azure Extended Network, which extends a local subnet to net, uh, Azure. So it means you don't have to change IP addresses any longer. You have 250 address, addresses on each side of the network. So uh, the idea then is you can start up uh, a machine in the same uh, IP address range on Azure as you have can on premise, which then gives a total new uh, use case for uh, site recovery because then you don't have to run any scripts for site recovery. You start the machine in Azure with the total same IP address range. It's just moving it to Azure. It's also a great feature when you uh, go, uh, go there and you want to migrate things to Azure and and also a great feature if you find out that your migration to Azure wasn't too successful, just bring it back and run it on-prem again. And then you have Azure monitoring and alerts. I think uh, uh, the Cosmos spoke about it. I'm sorry, I wasn't there at Cosmos talk. But uh, that's one of the big featured uh, features that uh, Azure monitor is now available for Azure Stack HCI. Then the idea when you have Azure registered Azure Stack HCI clusters, you get a, from the Azure portal, you get a lock, look on your on-premise clusters and also on the resources on your on-premise clusters, which gives you the possibility of monitoring, but also gives you multi-cluster monitoring and HCI insights there. And also, for instance, of all VMs, you see your VMs on your on-prem cluster in Microsoft Azure portal. I think was also one of the questions you you get an, uh, with Arc, then you get it as a resource into Azure and you get a, uh, a view in, in Azure on all your resources which you have on your own system. Same for sure with other resources, it's storage uh, and a bit less on SDN and networks at the moment, but that sure will come when then is ready with ATC and uh, HUD. I think that will be then the next so that you can do configuration changes and have a, pain, a, a look from Azure to the networking of your on-premise part. And yeah, you should be aware that there is a difference between Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server in the meantime. Uh, Azure Stack HCI is the infrastructure and virtualization part. Server is for traditional and server, and the future of virtualization will be on Azure Stack HCI. So my recommendation is for everybody who runs Windows Server on-prem in bare metal at the moment, be look at Azure Stack HCI and uh, think about uh, uh, migrating to it. That's thank you, and now my shameless uh, marketing. We have a conference on the 29th of June with a whole stack, a whole track about again, about hybrid environments. Hopefully some interesting speakers like Carsten and DDA again, which uh, takes place in Linz in Austria. And we will do something rather uncommon for the moment because we, we just want to run an not even a hybrid, it will be an in-person only conference on the 29th of June 2022. So Carsten, and now uh, do we have some, you said you have a question which will take more time to answer. So I run through the rust so that I have still some minutes left. Yeah, yeah I, I noticed it for an Austrian, you were very fast here. <laughs> Small yeah, joke. That, that, uh, <laughs> normally, we Austrians no, don't need to be fast because we just do solutions. We don't run around in regulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the question uh, uh, was, I have a question about pricing. How do you persu persuade customers to go into a subscription Azure Stack HCI plus buy lines, licenses, standard or data center? What are those features that, that you point out in favor of Azure Stack HCI instead of just data center plus S2D? 
Um, just to, we have two different use cases there. When we come to the small customers, they are in a low number of VMs. It's just uh, easy because it's cheaper. So my my really smallest customers where we have the last installations with 20, uh, 20 25 users, three VMs, uh, one of them Linux even, uh, four cores each, eight cores. So it's eighty dollars. It's eighty dollars, and they would need two data center licenses just to do the calculation. So that the break even point is uh, for for SMB is. Uh, is somewhere by with two eight core clusters or something like that where where it and it depends on the number of virtual machines then so that there's no persuasion and just I, I don't like the word uh, to persuade somebody uh, the <laughs> idea is the idea i don't want to persuade the customers if you look at the whole hybrid integration is the whole azure arc integration at the features you have only in hci which at the moment is mainly stretch cluster but we have a roadmap which is there's a whole lot of things uh, azure stack hci only uh, we even had one customer who then took uh, hardware from another sponsor here perhaps from a guy which spoke before me. Uh, uh, they they really were totally into Azure Stack HCI. They said that's what they think that is the future, so they don't need even to be persuaded. It was the customer's decision because mm -hmm. they want to go into this digital transformation, have the hybrid uh, idea and have the whole hybrid thing. But at the end of the day, it should be a win-win situation. So I don't want to persuade the customer. It's just present what you can do. What's the advantages on hybrid? Does the customer think he has a benefit out of it? Is it worth the money? He will do it. Uh, if not, uh, he won't do it and he will go with data center in 2019. Um, yeah, I have also I have also something that is better in Azure Stack HCI than in Storage Basis Direct. And that's the support. So Azure Stack HCI, you can get a really inexpensive, very good support uh, because it's ba it's it's part of Azure. You can get the support for your subscription, and that's let's face it, one hundred dollars a month for good support um, is a, a quite good offering. If you want the same amount of support with a storage basis direct cluster with Windows Server. You have to have uh, how it's called now a unity uh, contract for premium yeah. support and mm -hmm. that's that's maybe thirty thousand dollars plus a year so that's quite a difference one one thousand two hundred dollars uh, versus thirty thousand or even more so i think that's that's an advantage of uh, of azure stack hci if you ever need support of course then you have all the updates people are only comparing buying Let's say Windows Server 2019, but then you are stuck with Windows Server 2019. If you if you want the new features that are that that are there in 2022, there are some. There are not many, but there are some. You have to have a, sub, uh, a software subscription. Nobody counts the price of that into the picture, right? Uh, that that for sure. That's what I meant. You have to do the commercial calculation correct. So you yes. have to really do a good cost of ownership calculation, including the updates or including, OK, I want to buy new in five years and then uh, do the whole maths against something which is uh, pay as you go or pay by use. Uh, and and also um, just to be honest, some of the customers really like this pay by use system much more from a from a CFO side. <laughs> Because that's something they can scale up and scale down as the as the need. So that's why also the more and more uh, try to get hardware on the same form. So yeah. that the, but the, that's that's a bit more complicated on the hardware side. Software yeah. it's easier. But uh, I have another I have another idea, uh, Helmut. Uh, I was just discussing that with uh, Manfred. Uh, Manfred, you can show both of us maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there is these Azure, uh, how it's called, uh, Windows Server 2022 uh, data, data center, center Azure, Azure edition, 
We presume it's 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 not announced yet, but we think it's paid over the Azure subscription. So maybe you have your Azure Stack HCI and you also get your Windows Server VMs from Azure and you pay everything per use. So you yeah. don't have to add a data center or standard even to your Azure Stack HCI. Um, that, and if that, you want, that will be the logical next step at the yeah. end. So uh, pay everything, which also is premise on bear use. I've seen there's an additional question on the on the chat on the QA. Yeah. Have you heard about the certified solution? Have you heard about the certified solutions required by customers? Do you also have customers with an air gap scenario? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> just to be honest, we certify solutions. Yes, we. We heard, we on, we only have customers who require certified solutions. So, in, in detail, we run even if we do a, a PTO, a build to order, we run a, a private cloud simulator against. So we run it, do a certification run against every single machine which leaves our house. So let me say case. something. Let me say something. Helmut is the go-to guy if you want to uh, certify an Azure Stack HCI or storage basis direct environment. That's not the case anymore. So everything is Azure Stack HCI, but you did it for multiple vendors. So yeah. you are the guy and air gapped Azure Stack HCI. You can't air gap. At least you, you told that in that session and that's uh, yeah. known at least every 30 days. It has to connect to Azure storage basis direct completely other story, but we're talking about Azure Stack HCI. But, but, but we have, Helmut, uh, so, sorry, we have partly air gap solutions with these two node clusters with the, which run around in vehicles. They sometimes mm -hmm. uh, only get a connect connection every 20 days or so, especially yeah. the guys running in Libya. There's, it's yeah. a bit strange. So, yeah, but they have to ha connect to Azure uh, eventually at, every 30 days. Yeah, at Another least every 30 that days is, for reconfiguration. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that I will use to uh, switch over to our next session, an advantage with Azure Stack HCI is also the good integration with Azure Arc and even the cluster integration. And this this is a seamless uh, um, uh, side uh, way to Thomas. Thomas Maurer is now presenting about Azure Arc. Hi, Thomas. Can you hear us? Hi, Thomas. And thanks, Helmut, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I and I see, see Thomas uh, has the same face hair as I in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has a beard. He has father and has a beard now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, bye. Welcome, Thomas. No, we don't oh, hear you. Thomas, you are muted. Thomas, you are oh, muted. This is, yeah, I, as you know, I'm not so good with technology. So hi, Carson. <laughs> hi, uh, <laughs> as ex-MVP, you have to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, guys. I'm Manfred. Uh, and bye, bye, Helmut. Uh, it was great uh, seeing you and talking to uh, listen to your talk. So uh, ab absolutely awesome. I uh, hope to see you all in person soon as well. We hope that too. So we had already some questions at past sessions about Arc. So I we are re really looking forward to your presentation, and I think there will be some questions afterwards. So Thomas, please go on with your presentation and then we can tame, uh, take up the time until the full hour for questions. Perfect. I share my screen here and I hope, I guess, everyone yeah, we can see, see that. Perfect. Yes. So welcome everyone from also from my site. Uh, my name is Thomas Maurer. I work as a cloud advocate at Microsoft. Uh, and so basically before you think, okay, this is just going to be evangelism, marketing or sales all over. Um, I have to correct that a little bit. We are actually part of the Azure engineering team. So we are part of the engineering organization in cloud and AI. And um, what our job is, is basically two main things if you want to know uh, on a higher level. Uh, one of them is actually creating and delivering content. These can be presentations like this, uh, speaking with our customers, creating learn content, creating documentation, creating tools and scripts and so on to, to actually make customers more successful with our product. Um, and that is probably the stuff you see. The other interesting part we are doing, and that, that is very important for me to, to let you know that, is that we actually gathering feedback from our customers to find out 
what is working, what is not working, and how can we improve? So please, please, please reach out uh, to the cloud advocates, uh, especially also to me in this scenario. Uh, if you have anything you want to talk about, um, I'm always happy to learn. Also ask the questions obviously in the chat. Um, I try to answer them. I always learn a lot by answering questions. Um, so for that, um, I want to actually talk about the topic of Azure Hybrid and especially uh, focusing on Azure Arc uh, in this scenario. I, I want to really give you an overview about what Arc can do because Arc can do many, many things. As Karsten mentioned and you probably heard before, uh, it has a very tight integration with Azure Stack HCI, but there is also a lot of other things you actually can do. Um, Arc really is not just a single feature solution. Uh, to tackle one of the different problems, but it allows a couple of different scenarios. And I promise you, I have a ton of demos, so I will I will go through these uh, in just a bit. But before we get there, uh, you have to go through a couple of slides with me, so bear with me. Um, this is all about setting a little bit of a stage and the idea why we are actually doing this. And so the first thing I want to quickly talk about is why are we doing this and what is the reason um, we try to address this. Uh, what we see from customers, and, and I'm sure you're seeing that in your environment too, is that um, customer environments are basically involving or getting more and more complex as well, right? And we looked at this and said, well, what are the driving factors which adding challenges? Like why, why are getting these environments getting more and more complex? So we found out that a lot of our customers run hundreds, if not thousands of different applications. And some of them can be written in very modern languages, um, running on past services, running on co in containers or serverless. But then you also have all these traditional applications which run in VMs or even on physical servers, right? And they're not going away so quickly. So this is this is something where IT uh, developers, IT pros, operations people, they all need to come together to actually manage all these apps. And that's that's a big, big part of what, what we do. And then on the other side, we also see that a lot of customers are running in very diverse uh, settings and very with the very diverse infrastructure, right? A lot of customers have their own data centers. They use, for example, also service providers to like get some stuff out. They have edge locations, for example, like branch offices, retail stores, factories. I have some really cool cases with customers running factories all over the world, um, which uh, which especially can be addressed with all our hybrid solutions. But again, by having all these different infrastructure types, that also adds a, a ton of challenges and a ton of work you need to put into your environment. And then last but not least, um, we saw that like customers who drive in a multi-cloud environment, and sometimes it's really strategy, like that the customer says, well, I want to do multi-cloud because various reasons they do that. Um, uh, that's one thing, but then we also see customers, they started with one cloud provider and then they basically said, okay, well, Azure is now becoming our main cloud provider and which is by the way, a fantastic choice, of course. Um, but then you have to, have to actually manage multiple cloud providers and you, as you know, if you work with cloud providers before, one cloud provider is already a lot of complexity, right? Can add a lot of knowledge. You need to add a lot of knowledge to actually operate a cloud environment with one cloud provider, but adding multiples of those, you add obviously even more complexity to it. So how can we help our customers um, making these things easier? Now, and again, this is my, I think my only marketing slide I have in there, hopefully. Um, but I want to use that slide because it shows a very good overview and it shows a couple of things uh, I want to mention um, uh, in this presentation. So first of all, we don't just have a single product which is hybrid, right? It's not just about Azure Stack. Um, it's not just about Azure Arc. It's all of these together. We understand that customers um, actually have different scenarios, different needs. And so we try to address these by giving them the solutions um, and services they actually need, right? I think that is, that is a very important part um, uh, when you look at, at, at the Microsoft approach when it comes to hybrid and, and multi-cloud. The other thing is, and, and we really, as you can see from this slide, hybrid for us is not just something, well, we do on the side, right? We really believe, and Jason Sanders, the engineering lead of all of uh, um, Azure, 
he basically has all the engineering teams underneath him uh, and he's directly reporting to Scott Guthrie. Um, he basically said in his keynote back at Microsoft Ignite in 2019 um, that hybrid is going to be an end state for many of our customers and not just an in-between state until they have everything moved to the cloud, right? So we really, from engineering side, we really notice that like customers have different scenarios and different um, uh, different needs basically where they need to be in a hybrid environment. It, even it comes to data sovereignty, network challenges, and many, many other things. So again, we have a huge portfolio of hybrid services, uh, starting with Azure IoT, for example, like again, a whole new topic. If you um, think about IoT services, um, we have the tools to actually manage these, to actually deploy uh, these, uh, the applications to these services, gather data from these, and then actually do like some machine learning and other stuff with it. We also offer obviously our cloud inspired infrastructure with our Azure Stack HI portfolio or Azure Stack portfolio, I should say, with Azure Stack HCI, Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack Edge, um, which again, you heard a lot about already in the Azure Stack HCI days about. But then we also have other things like with Azure Arc, and this is now really the first thing where Azure Arc comes in. So we understand that our customers uh, have reasons why they, for example, cannot use our Azure services in an Azure region, right? So if they can't use the Azure services in an Azure region, let's make the Azure services go to them, so to their location, so they can actually build their hybrid application, their hybrid solutions uh, wherever they need them, right? So even if they want to run these services uh, outside of Azure, on-premises, at the edge, or uh, even at another cloud provider, they can do that. Let's think, for example, about something like Azure SQL, right? Our customers love that love Azure SQL, and some of them tell us, "Look, we would love to use it, but we are too far away from this Azure region, or we don't have an Azure region in our country. Um, so, and we have some data sovereignty challenges there. So, let's what can we do, right? And that is where Azure Arc comes in first, and we're going to have a look at this in just a bit. The other thing I want to talk about is the single control plane. Now you have all these different environments. Now you have Azure, you have other cloud providers, you have on-premises, um, you have edge locations where you probably don't even have a good VPN connectivity and stuff like that. Um, and then you probably have a ton of different management tools, some management tools for Azure, some of them for on-prem, some of them for other cloud providers. Um, but what you actually want is to have this single control plane to actually see everything, get the visibility, as well as obviously then doing the management. And that is where Azure Arc, again, in these two cases, extremely shines. So when we, when I need to like explain Azure Arc into, for you in one sentence, it's actually extending the Azure management and Azure services to anywhere. So Azure, Azure Arc really is the bridge between Azure and everything which is outside of Azure, right? So if you think about you run services on-prem or at other cloud provider, this is actually like Azure Arc helps to bring these into the Azure management experience and also helps to bring Azure services to these locations. So you can see that here, uh, one of the, the three big uh, tasks Azure Arc does here is really helping us when it comes to operations, getting visibility um, for security compliance, but also for management and operations. Uh, it helps us obviously to uh, bring these Azure services to anywhere, as I mentioned already a couple of times. And then also, um, it also provides us like with tooling. So for example, if you if you set this up for your environment, you can set it up that you can actually deploy these, um, these, the, these cloud native applications, like which you build maybe on Kubernetes or you build them on the Azure Pass services to basically set them up in any environment. And so this is what Azure R comes in. Now, let's if you look at the technical side, this is basically what I just like try to show you is with Azure, we actually provide that control plane and then we categorize this into uh, different separate uh, scenarios. One is the Azure Arc enabled infrastructure, which allows us to connect servers and Kubernetes clusters and, and much, much more to the Azure control plane. So you can connect your existing servers for the management part. And then we also have the other thing, which we call the Azure Arc enabled services, which again allows us to deploy Azure services outside of Azure. Now, instead of talking about this on the slides, let's just jump right in into a demo. And since 
I know a lot of you are familiar with Azure, um, but also a lot of that probably of you haven't really seen it before. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here first. So here I'm um, in the Azure portal and everything I'm showing you today is in the portal, but everything can also be used like if you do infrastructure as code, if you use the CLI or PowerShell, you can also do that. Um, but for now, for the presentation part, it's the easiest to get to get the visibility in here. So here I'm on the all resources page and you can see here everything in Azure is a resource. So everything is basically an object. Everything has a type from virtual machines to disks to IP addresses to databases. Even IP addresses are objects, right? And they're part of a resource group. And just let me do something here. Just want to make it a little bit easier for, for everyone to see. Um, so you can see here every part is part of a resource group. It's basically deployed or connected to a location and it's part of a description and then have things like tagging to actually organize these. Now, again, customers tell us this is actually great. This all comes with the Azure Resource Manager and this really helps us to organize and manage our resources in Azure. But they tell us, hey, um, we also have resources outside of Azure. How can we take advantage of this control plane with that? And that is where Azure Arc comes in. So let me show you something. If I want to have an overview about all my servers, doesn't matter what they're running, I can do that right now when I use Azure Arc. So basically what I have here is you can see here already connected a couple of servers with Azure Arc. So I want to show all these Arc enabled servers. These are all the servers which are running outside of Azure. And then I want to see all my virtual machines which are running inside of Azure. So if I apply this filter, it's now just my servers. So it's all my servers in my complete environment. I can see them in one single location. You can see here the blue ones, my Azure virtual machines side by side with my Arc enabled servers, which are running in my local data center, basically underneath my desk here. But again, um, these are all like now in one place and I get that overview. I can see they're also part of a resource group. They're part of a description and I can even use tagging. So if I want to see, for example, what I do usually is I do cost center tagging. And so I can see, let's say if I want to see all my servers, which are just part of these three cost centers, I can apply that filter and now I get that view, right? So I can easily organize my servers here and group them basically using like tags and stuff like that or resource groups to do that. Now you would probably say Thomas, well this is this is great, but uh, <laughs> then there needs to be more. So there is more. So what I also can do here is I, I told you this is not just in the portal. I can also use things like for example the Azure resource graph um, to get go through this. So what I have here it's it allows me to basically do queries using the keyword query language. So for example, if I want to do get the same list, I can do a query here and you can see here where I different resources, some of them with Microsoft.compute slash virtual machines. And then at the end we have Microsoft uh, as well, Microsoft.hybrid uh, compute slash machines, which are basically the Arc enabled servers. And if I run that query, I can basically get this list of servers here. So you can see all of these resources listed here. Now I can also go further and like let's say group. So if I want to if I have a manager which probably responds better to charts than to lists, I can also make this a little bit more graphical. So if I run this and I go to charts, I can also say OK, I want to see how many servers do I have in Azure and how many servers do I have outside of Azure. So because I like donuts, let's do a donut chart here. Um, so you can see here in total, I have 32 different servers running in my environment. Um, I have 65% uh, running um, as Azure machines, but then I also have 34 here running as Arc machines as well. So pretty cool stuff I can do. Again, this is this is not like just a feature to show you, right? What I want to tell you here is by adding these servers using Azure Arc, and I'm going to show you how you can do that in just a bit. It's very simple. It's just done by an agent. Um, it actually becomes a native Azure resource, right? So it's really in the Azure resource manager and not just something we just pull up the name into the portal and that's it. We really make it an Azure resource so you can actually manage it like an Azure resource. Now, so you get all that visibility, but what if I want to do some more? And this is especially interesting if you deal with compliance 
Um, and, and we have some cool stuff there uh, coming out as well. I will tell you some new stuff. So if you're not, <laughs> um, if you have worked with this before, there is more stuff coming. So when it comes to compliance and settings, we have something called Azure policy. And for those who don't really know what Azure policy is, it basically allows us to configure the Azure environment. So I can go out and basically say, hey, um, I want to basically only al allow people to deploy to specific Azure regions. I only want to let them use certain sizes of Azure virtual machines so they can, for example, not everyone can go out and deploy our large MB2 series virtual machines with hundreds of cores, terabytes of memory and draining credit cards in seconds. Um, you can actually go out and limit that depending on on, on on what you want to do. Now, what a lot of people don't know is a feature called Azure Policy Guest Configuration, and that feature allows us to basically audit the operating system and settings of uh, Azure virtual machines and with Azure Arc also for servers running outside of Azure. So think about this like what this can become is like um, uh, group policies on steroids, right? So I'm going to show you an example here. I'm going to do an assignment here. Um, so I'm going to assign an initiative, which is basically just a group of policies. Um, I select the scope. In my case, I just do this on the subscription level. And then if I go to the initiative where I can actually select it, I have a couple of the, uh, possibilities here. So first of all, I can choose between a ton of built in definitions, um, which we offer you, which I will show you in a bit. But obviously, I can also create my own. And we even have a tool to convert group policies to Azure policies. So check that out if you're interested in that. Now, again, this is, by the way, more on the server side of things. But again, I, I'm going to select now the, the built in one. And you can see here some of them are very technical. For example, let's say it should enable Azure Monitor for virtual machine scale sets, enable the Azure Monitor agent um, for VMs and stuff like that. But if I scroll down here, you can also see I have some industry specific ones. Um, so for example, this helps me if, you, if, you, if your company is dealing with, for example, ISO, uh, I can apply this policy to my environment and this will see if I'm actually compliant with, I, with ISO certifications um, uh, for my Azure environment, but also inside how I did configure my uh, virtual machines, for example. And again, with Arc, also servers which are running outside of Azure. Now, in my case, I want to just check something very simple. I want to make sure that all my machines have secure password settings. So we can actually go out and audit machines for insecure password settings to find out uh, what's going on there. So I select this one, uh, and then obviously I would give that assignment a better name, a description, and then on the next page, this, this wizard will just go guide me through it. But here, I can actually now set up a new um, setting and say, hey, I don't just want to do this for Azure Virtual Machines. I also want to do that for Azure Arc enabled servers. And I'm going to set this to true, and then it will basically uh, assign this policy um, to all of my servers living in that subscription in this case. Now this will then go out and audit my servers and um, will send the data back, but that will take a while, right? So um, instead of now waiting for this, like in a good cooking show, I already prepared uh, something here. So if I go to compliance, you can see a couple of things. You can first of all, you can see here that when I when I'm, when, when it comes to compliance, I'm doing a horrible job. Uh, there's a lot of potential here for me to, to do better. But the other thing you can see here is this policy. Now, this is the one I just showed you, right, which goes out and audits my, my insecure password settings. If you scroll down, you can also see here um, what these policies are. So, for example, like minimum password age uh, and so on. Um, and you can see here, like then at the end, how many resources are uh, compliant or not compliant with these different settings. But more importantly, if I'm responsible for compliance or if I want to know how my environment is doing, I can now go to non-compliant resources. And what I can see here is I can now see my Azure VMs and my servers running outside of Azure side by side, and I can figure out, okay, these are not servers which are not configured the right way. So this is pretty cool tool. Again, you can customize this. You cannot just do this for insecure password settings. There's a ton of other you, things you can use. For example, also like check for certificates which should not be on the machines or certificates which are missing. 
uh, and much, much more. Now, before I'm going to show you how to onboard um, now service to Azure Arc and a little bit of like more of what you can do, uh, I want to quickly go jump back to the slides. So what I just showed you basically is if if this is a high level architecture of Azure, and I want to show you how how I actually do this now. So we as Azure customers on the left side, we usually use tools and experiences, as we call it at Microsoft, to interact with Azure, right? So we use the portal, PowerShell, CLIs, APIs, the SDKs, and so on. And what we're doing is we are actively interacting with Azure Resource Manager. Now this allows us basically to do role-based access controls, description management, tagging, indexing, search, policies, all that good stuff, and much, much more, which I just showed you uh, to do that. So this is actually the magic, how we manage Azure resources. And it's actually super interesting. If you ever have the chance to go into a deep dive talk about Azure Resource Manager, I highly recommend you do that. Um, but then we also offer a couple of management services. Um, for monitoring, update management, backup, security, and so on. Um, and in the past, basically before Azure Arc, this was this was completely designed to manage Azure resources, right? So everything which was in Azure, you could basically go out and, and, and manage using these tools. But as you can see on the bottom, our customers, we understand our customers do also have on-premises environments and they have multi like environments and other cloud providers. And until Azure Arc it was announced, they basically just used their local, like their existing local management tools to manage these. Now, what Azure Arc does, it basically bridges these resources also in the Azure Resource Manager. So you can start taking advantage of these management technologies. Now, very important, this doesn't mean you cannot use the existing tool you're using. We don't want to create a dependency. So you can still use absolutely your local management tools. So if you have System Center, if you have Windows Admin Center, um, you have like your Kubernetes tools, uh, your Data Studio, you can still keep using these as well, right? We don't want to have like, okay, this is this is now just Arc. Um, Arc just adds additional management capabilities if you need to, um, or for those who haven't used existing tools, um, they now get these management tools. So what can Azure Arc do? Azure Arc can, can actually, like when we when you look at the um, Azure Arc enabled infrastructure, we can actually bring these on-premises and multi-cloud infrastructure services into it. So we can enable Azure Arc servers or servers. Um, again, these can be Linux and Windows machines, virtual machines and physical machines, um, basically everything which is outside of Azure. And we, we support a couple of different operating systems. Uh, we can also bring in SQL servers for better uh, um, recommendations there when it comes to security. Uh, these again, these are your existing C and Microsoft SQL service you install in your environment or already have installed. And then we can also connect Kubernetes clusters. And again, this doesn't need to be, for example, a Microsoft flavor like AKS on Azure Stack HCI. It can be, but it can also be like OpenShift or Ranger or other, other basically uh, uh, Kubernetes distributions as well, uh, which you can then connect. Now, let me show you how that actually works. So if I'm in the Azure portal and I go to Azure Arc, this is our basically Azure Arc center. This is where you go if you did want to deal with anything Azure Arc related in the portal. Uh, you have the getting started guide and so on. And if we zoom in here on the left side, you can see here a couple of things. You can get an overview and we will talk about custom locations and data controller and so on in just a bit. You can also see here the infrastructure management. So under infrastructure management here, you can see I can manage servers, Kubernetes clusters, SQL servers, and obviously also Azure Stack HCI. With Azure Stack HCI has Azure Arc built in. So as soon as you register your Azure Stack HCI, it will show up here in the Azure portal as well. And you can then get benefits like monitoring and other stuff as well. On the bottom, we can see, and I will talk about that a little bit later, the Azure Arc enabled services. Now let's have a look at uh, servers here. If I click on servers, you can see here, these are all the servers I already have connected. Uh, you saw them before in the old resources list. Uh, if you want to connect the server, very simple. We help you uh, by creating a script for you, uh, but you can also just get that from the documentation page. It's actually pretty simple. It's downloading an agent. It's actually then installing that agent and then run a command to register that server with your Azure environment. Now we offer here a couple of scripts. Um, if you have just a single server you want to be onboarding, uh, the easiest way is just to basically create a script with a, uh, which gives you an interactive 
login experience, but that's obviously not very handy if you want to automate that process and onboard multiple servers. So for that, you couldn't just use a service principle, uh, which basically allows you to just onboard a ton of different machines with that account, and it only has rights to onboard machines. Now, let me quickly go through that wizard here with you, because here we can also see what are the prerequisites to install that and use Azure Arc with Arc enabled servers. Now, first of all, um, the Arc enabled service needs outbound connectivity from your network. Now, this can be on this is, this is on port 443 to specific Azure endpoints, and you can find the URLs here in the documentation. Um, I, that said, you can also use now a private link setup. So in this case, if you have a VPN to add to your Azure network, or if you have Express Route in place, uh, you can also go through that. So you don't have, if, if you go in the case of Express Route, this means you don't go through the public internet. Even though you go through the public internet, by the way, it's still obviously encrypted, um, so no one can actually see that. But if you want to really be like, okay, I want to use my Express Route for this, I can do that as well using the Azure Arc private link scope uh, here. Uh, and then obviously I need to have local administrative rights um, to install that agent one time. Uh, so that is basically what I need um, for that server. And then I also need a resource group, obviously, uh, to onboard these servers. And next you can see I need to select the subscription. I need to select a resource group to join that server. I need to basically select the Azure region. In my case, I'm selecting Western Europe. And then I choose the operating system of that server because that is then helps me generate the script if it's a PowerShell or a shell script for Linux. Uh, and then here you can see the connectivity mode. So I really want to highlight this because it's pretty new. So if you have played around with Azure Arc um, a year ago, uh, we have a couple of new options again with the private endpoints I just mentioned. You can also be behind a proxy. Um, so if you're behind that, that's also fine. Uh, and we help you set this up. We also give you some recommendations when it comes to tagging, but you can also use your custom tags and you can always change these later on. So at the end, you just basically get your script, which again downloads the agent, installs the agent, uh, and then basically runs a command to register it. And then let's have a look on a machine here. Um, just a second, oops. I'll go to that machine. So here I have an Azure Arc enabled server. Uh, I already run that script on this machine, so it's already joined, so we don't need to do all the login stuff and so on. So here is the name of that server, it's app01. Um, if I now go in, into this, I get a new process running. So I have this process now, and this is also, the, by the way, the one you can find on Azure Stack HCI, uh, where it's already built in, but this one here is just a regular Windows server. By installing the Arc agent, you get that process. And then you get the Azure Connected Machine Agent, uh, as we call it. Um, it also gets this little CLI here, uh, which helps you actually do the connect, do the disconnect, right, uh, and get some additional information. Now, if I show you some additional information, I can run the show command. And this now is very handy if you want to know, okay, to which um, Azure resource group or subscription is the server now connected to. You can also see the Azure resource name. You can also say, okay, this is connected to that specific Azure location. Um, again, um, this is an additional like information here as well. Now, also very important, I want to highlight this as well. Uh, this also gets a ID. Like, so this server now, um, by installing the Azure Arc enabled server, gets a managed identity. Now, if you're familiar with that, this is an object in Azure Active Directory, which you could use, like could, could use before, for example, for uh, servers running in Azure, for doing like logging or authenticating against Azure Active Directory, right? And you could just use the machine object instead of having some passwords laying around or something to authenticate. So with that, you, if you build applications, if you build some certain tooling, um, you can now use that um, managed identity. So that is pretty cool. Um, and, and we use that also in a lot of different scenarios here as well, which I'm going to show you in just a bit. So if I go back to the portal, after installing that agent, it will take a couple of seconds, I think, uh, to like show that server. And if I go down, I will use this server here now because here I enabled all the different features. If I click on this server now, you can see here, it looks like an Azure resource. It looks like this server is running in Azure. However, um, 
again, it's part of a resource group, it's part of a subscription, but you can also get some additional information here. So in this case, I'm having a Windows Server 2019 server, uh, and you can see here it's part of a local uh, Active Directory domain. It doesn't need to be domain joint, so if you don't have a domain, that's absolutely fine. And then you can see here, I can use a couple of tags here um, as well. Now, what I get here as well is now um, role-based access control. So I can now use Azure um, Active Directory to provide access to, this, to the people who actually need access to that server. So if this server is managed, for example, let's say by the SharePoint administrators, I can enable the group of SharePoint administrators to see that object in the Azure portal or in the CLI uh, as well. Now, we have customers now, they take away basically all the local administrative rights of most of their administrators, and it just provide them with rights using the Azure portal. Now, the advantage here now is very easy. Like, very quickly, you get the single control plane, you get an activity log, so you can see who did actually do the change to this server and so on. Now let's speak a little bit about tooling. So what you can do is you can enable security center. So you can automatically get um, recommendations for that server from Azure Security Center. So it will tell you what you actually should do. And it also gives you different um, priorities on what you should focus on. You can also then use extensions. So if you're familiar with Azure VMs, uh, we have this concept of extensions, which allow you to run different stuff uh, on the agent. And so there's one, for example, the custom script extension, which I could now go and I could just deploy a script or run a script against that specific server directly from, from the Azure portal. And if I go back, I get a ton of other, a lot of other administrative stuff. I get, for example, the log analytics configuration. Now you will probably say, Thomas, well, we had log analytics before. Uh, true, but there it was very limited. Um, like to how you could use role-based access control. You basically need to give every admin who needs to access to the log, um, access to the log analytics workspace. And that meant basically you could see logs of everything which is going in there. Now in this case, you can see here, the scope is just limited to that specific server. So I, I can only see the logs from that specific server in this case. And so I could do a query and get, for example, all the security events from that server and again I can add the event logs or sys logs and so on and get all the logs I want to up there if I need to right I can configure that what I want to be uploaded I can also start using monitoring this is super interesting so if you're familiar with Azure monitor this is probably nothing new but again this is a server running outside of Azure and so you get all these benefits from Azure monitor you can monitor the disk space CPU utilization memory utilization um, disk performance uh, metrics, um, as well as like uh, networks throughput and so on, and you get all that data in here uh, as well. You can then also set up alerts uh, for that, so you can basically get alerted um, as you would do for Azure machines as well. And then what I think is pretty cool is the dependency um, part, so you can actually see what clients are connecting to that specific server. So if I open this up, you can see here I have like different clients connecting to that server, to that server. And then I can also see where this server is actually connecting to, on which ports um, the server is connecting to different servers, or what I would say endpoints is probably a better name for that. So if I look at, for example, port 443, you can see here connects to a couple of public IP addresses and endpoints here. And the last one here in the list, is for example also the one of the ARC endpoints. So you can see here that this server, that this is obviously the ARC agent running on the machine connecting to that endpoint. Uh, so that is pretty cool stuff. You also get, um, I'm gonna quickly go through this change tracking uh, to see that you get inventory. So you can basically go and see what software is installed on that machine. You can see here a couple of updates. You can also do update management now. So if you wanna do install updates on these machines and centralize and manage them from Azure, can do that as well. So you can see here, these are the missing updates on that machine. So I just highly, like, urgently patch these machines. So I can just schedule a new update deployment, give that a name. And I detected that this is a Windows machine. So I can then say reboot if required, define the maintenance window, and then say update now, which would mean like in five to 10 minutes. Or I could schedule this because I'm doing a presentation and you probably don't want to do an update during business hours. Uh, I can actually schedule it for later. I can even make it a recurring um, task. So I can say every Tuesday night, 
I want to patch that server. Um, I can then select what updates and what update classifications I want to install. I can run a pre and a post script, and then I get a summary and, and basically said, OK, create that update deployment job. Now you say, OK, Thomas, I have hundreds of servers. This is a little bit silly. I don't want to do that hundreds of times. Yes, so we got you covered. Um, if you go here to manage multiple machines, you will just get it to the Azure Automation account because it uses the update management solution in Azure Automation, where you can now see here all my servers which are joined to that, which are enabled. These are um, Azure servers as well as non-Azure servers using Azure Arc, for example. And I can then also do an update uh, deployment here. In this case, the difference is just instead of having a single VM to get updated, I can select a group of servers um, to get updated and then basically have the updates installed. The same, by the way, for inventory and change tracking as well. So that is what I can do. Uh, what, and, and obviously there's more features what I can do with Azure Arc enabled servers. The other thing I want to show you here is the same thing for Kubernetes clusters. So if you manage Kubernetes clusters such as AKS on Azure Stack HCI, they will show up in the Azure portal and they look like similar as an AKS cluster would look like. So if I click one of these, you can also see here again, looks like an Azure resource. I can see which version is installed and so on. I can then also get log analytics, monitoring uh, for that Kubernetes cluster. So you can see here um, what's going on. So the node CPU utilization, I can also go in uh, and monitor the different containers running on that um, Kubernetes cluster. And then I can use uh, security center extensions as I showed you before, policies. But then I want to show you something called GitOps. So GitOps really allows us to basically configure that server. And what we do is we store the configuration of this, the Kubernetes cluster um, or uh, your, your applications in a Git repository, right? We store the application there, we store the configuration of it there. And then what we do with Azure Arc, we tell them, hey, in that Git repository down here, for example, um, there is a application configuration you should get and pull down. In this case, we do that every three seconds, which is like a little bit extreme. Um, you will not do that in production, but you will thank me that I do this for the demo and we don't wait like 30 minutes for it to happen. Um, so I configured that already. So now let's have a look at the application here. So here is the application. If I do a refresh, it basically says, Hello Azure, right? So this is the application and I, you can see here, I took all my web design skills uh, to create that application. Now let's do a couple of changes. So what we can do here is we can go to that Git repo I just showed you. And this is basically the application configuration here. So I have a Helm chart uh, here, um, basically tell me, okay, this is the container you're gonna use. This is gonna be the application you're gonna use. And then I can set up the replication count of how many containers I wanna run and then I configured my application that I can simply change the message here. So don't do this at home. I'm going to do now a commit directly to the main or master branch to say hello Azure Stack. Oops, Azure Stack HCI days. Um, since I'm still a good admin, at least a little bit, I'm going to do here a commit message, and then you can see I do that directly to the master or main branch. Again, you would obviously not do that. You can use multiple branches and then use approval steps and so on uh, to do that. But again, uh, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to do it that way. Now you can also check in, the, like write the code using Visual Studio Code and so on as well. Uh, so if I go back um, to the portal, obviously you can still again have a look at the configuration I, I did here. So I said, okay, this is the Git repo I just showed you, but there is the application stored uh, and the path and all that. So what I can now do if I go back to the application and then hit refresh, you can now say, see here, it changed the application to hello Azure Stack HCI. Now again, this is, you might think, okay, well, for one application on one Kubernetes cluster, well, it's still a good thing to do because you get all the benefits of the Git deployment. You have different versioning, you have everything in place. You can actually see, you can buy, um, build approval steps and so on. But the power really comes if you manage, for example, now multiple Kubernetes cluster running that application. Uh, for me, there's no big difference if I do this application deployed at once or if I do it a thousand times, uh, it will work in the same fashion as well. So that is GitOps. And so it's pretty cool uh, feature here as well. Um, so what we can do here, I'm gonna quickly go through that. Um, 
Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes, as I showed you, similar features with govern and security features, policies, security center, role-based access control, and all that. But then also, obviously, the uh, GitOps configuration. Um, so to actually configure the application part or also the, the state of the um, uh, of the Kubernetes cluster. Again, this works with different Kubernetes clusters uh, as well. And then I can also, for example, use a connect tool to actually connect to that Kubernetes cluster using the agent. So instead of like having a VPN connection uh, wherever that Kubernetes cluster is placed, for example, I can just go over the Azure CLI basically and use a command called uh, kubeconnect uh, to actually connect to that Kubernetes cluster and run uh, kubectl uh, commands there. So now I spoke a lot about the um, Azure Arc enabled infrastructure because I think that is what people most are interested about at, in, in this scenario. But then there's also the Azure Arc enabled services. And what they do is, as I mentioned, they allow you to run Azure services outside of Azure. And what we enabled, uh, what we have right now is the Azure application services. So this allows you to deploy app service such as web apps, uh, functions, logic apps, APIs, event grid, and so on outside of Azure, right? So think about if you build an application with using web apps or functions or logic apps, you can also do that now and deploy that even on premises or at other cloud providers, which is pretty cool. Um, this then uh, is obviously not the only thing you want to do. Uh, a lot of applications also need databases. And again, customers tell us they love Azure SQL. And we allow you with Azure Arc enabled data services to run Azure SQL managed instances outside of Azure. So you could actually run this now. You could set up Azure Stack HCI and then on top run AKS on Azure Stack HCI. And on top of that, you can then run Azure SQL managed instances or web apps and so on. And I will show you in a quick graphic how that looks like. But before we jump in into that, let me quickly show you the demo how that now what I just told you. So you can see here my Kubernetes clusters which I just showed you, which I manage. So I tried, I connected two of these clusters as or registered them as custom locations. So you can see here, I called one of the custom locations, I called other cloud provider 01. So you can guess that this cloud, this cluster is running, this is actually a Kubernetes cluster running another cloud provider. And then I have one Kubernetes cluster um, running in my own data center. So what I can do is I can now go and deploy a new web app uh, directly here. So let's do a new app service deployment. And again, this is exactly the same wizard as you would do in Azure uh, one. So the only thing I need to select here is uh, the resource group, and then I could give this a name. Look. Ace. I hope that doesn't exist yet. And then again, could select the runtime stack and so on and, and what I'm running, but the most interesting part is now here where I select the Azure region. So you have obviously all the Azure region where you can deploy to, but on top you get now the custom locations. So you, there's just two um, Azure Arc uh, enabled Kubernetes cluster show up here as other cloud provider 01 and Thomas data center 01. So I can now select, okay, let's deploy this web app, for example, to Tom's Thomas data center, which is obviously not an Azure region, <laughs> not for now. Um, but then just deploy that web app here. I could go through that and create that. Again, very simple. I can also do that using ARM templates, BICEP. Um, I, if I use tooling in Visual Studio Code, I can also do that. So it's not just about the portal, but you get the idea of how it works best in the portal. So now this enables you and like your developers, your architects, your IT administrators, to deploy these applications using your existing tooling um, outside of Azure. So you can use that on Azure Arc enabled infrastructure. You can deploy that to Azure Arc enabled data services, which includes Azure SQL, Postgres, or even Azure like Azure machine learning. And then you also have Azure Arc enabled application services like web apps and so on. Now, as I just mentioned, you can run them in your own data center. Again, the only thing you need do need is a Kubernetes cluster. Now, if you don't have the expertise and you don't want to actually have just like a Kubernetes cluster on, uh, like setting up everything by yourself and so on, you can take advantage of AKS, our Azure Kubernetes service on Azure Stack HCI, which we also I saw in the agenda. We have a couple of awesome sessions um, for this as well. 
This allows you to actually basically set up Azure Stack HCI, and then that allows you to run Windows and Linux VMs, running different types of applications. But it also allows you to run a Kubernetes cluster based on AKS and Azure Stack HCI. That allows you then to run containers or Azure Arc enabled services, such as data services or web apps or logic apps and so on. Um, and then you can basically deploy your cloud native applications on top of that. And all of that is managed using Azure Arc. So that is this, the integration we have here. And you can again can see how Azure Arc really can integrate all of the stuff outside of Azure into Azure to make your life easier. Now, if you want to know more about this, I have a couple of resources laid out here, uh, which are very important um, uh, to go through. We have a couple of awesome things. The thing I really want to highlight is the cloud adoption framework, and I even quickly want to show that because now we have a scenario for hybrid and multi-cloud environments. So if I go here, I already opened up the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework. This is basically um, proven guidance we created with partners, um, with our customers, with the product groups, engineering and field teams. And it goes about technology stuff to set up how to a migration, how do I set up landing zones, but also about strategy and how you set up your organization, right? That you're successful with your cloud deployment. Now, many of you are hopefully familiar with this, but what I want to show you, which is new, uh, is actually the different adoption scenarios. Now we have one for hybrid and multi-cloud uh, scenarios. And in this one, we really go through like all the stuff or, or even more than the stuff I just talked about, right? It goes through, okay, why would you do hybrid and multi-cloud? Um, an introduction of the unified operations that like the thing like I showed you with the control plane, it explains the idea of the control plane. And then obviously it does a link here to the different Azure uh, services and how you would use them. And there's much, much more, as you can see here on the left, also our hybrid cloud architectures in the architecture center and much, much more uh, you can relate to. And then obviously we have a ton of cool stuff on Microsoft Learn um, for you, where you can go through and learn more about Azure Arc. And with that, um, I want to say thank you. And um, I hope we have a couple of questions in the chat. Hi, Thomas. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, I really liked it. Great slides and great demos. We have some questions lined up. I have three so far, and if there are more, we have still 10, 10 minutes to go. So I will read the first one. If an on-prem server has the Azure Arc agent installed, does it mean it can also leverage Azure conditional access and MFA to enable admins to manage it? So and you can read this. You can read them too if you don't understand me there in the Q&A part. No, no, I, I think I understood you pretty well. And I, I think the question is a, is a very good one. So the way it currently works, the login, obviously we don't take away your log by default. We don't take away your logins to that server, right? So if you set up your local administrators, you use Active Directory administrators, you still be able to log in and do all of that stuff. But obviously we have customers who say, well, now I, I just want to use the management tools or provide my admins with the management tools we have in Azure. So they don't need to log in directly to that machine anymore. We probably still have breaking glass accounts and stuff like that. But um, in general, they, they just need to go and deploy scripts and we can actually do that over Azure or they need to like basically look at the monitoring or uh, the event log or whatever. And so as soon as you switch over to, um, to that model, you obviously can then use MFA with your Azure Active Directory accounts when you log into the Azure portal or the Azure CLI or where, however you're going to manage it. Um, the, the question is like, if you want to then use MFA and stuff like that to locally log into your Windows server, is a very interesting one. Um, so I will definitely keep that keep that in mind. Okay, so not yet, but maybe in the future. Okay, so what additional costs do I have when I enable Arc for on-prem servers or Azure Stack HCI? Well, the cost is, of course, important. Great services need some money. You need some money for that, right? I absolutely waited for that question. This question always <laughs> comes up, and, and it, it's great. I, that's why I actually go quickly to the portal here. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm still sharing. Yes, uh, I will. Yeah, you are. Perfect. 
If I do, uh, I quickly, you can always find this information on the on the pricing page of Azure, but if you're in the portal here if in the Azure Arc Center, you also have a pricing button. And now the cool thing comes. So if I look at servers here, which was the question, joining a server by default and making it look up in, in, in Azure and using tags and the resource graph, using extensions like the script extension and so on, that is free. So there's no additional cost to do that. As soon as you then start using other Azure services like Azure Defender, Azure Monitor, uh, Log Analytics, Security Center, and all of that, there's obviously, like for Azure servers, additional costs involved, and you can find like what these costs are. But they're not different in this case from, from Azure servers. The only thing which is different is the policy part. So Azure policy um, is free for Azure uh, servers. But for Azure Arc enabled servers, we gave you some extra costs for that. So if you want to try it out today and you don't use any of these additional services, uh, you can actually uh, start using it and testing it, just the role based access control, the visibility, and so on. Uh, and then as soon as you enable these services on the machine, you will actually get built for that. So to clarify, same, okay, sorry. Uh, Thomas, for the policies for Azure Stack HCI nodes, is it included or also an additional cost? Do you know that? I don't know if there is any difference currently in terms of Azure Stack HCI nodes. Um, I guess, um, and this is just a guess, don't quote me on that. I need to double check on this. Um, I guess for that is also a charge in place if you want to do it for the Azure Stack HCI nodes. However, I, I need to double check on, on okay. this if there's any difference. But you wanted to talk about Kubernetes and the other stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. I was, I was Just interrupting you. No worries. So that's why you're here. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, of course, there is also like for the Kubernetes part, similar thing. If you just connect up your Kubernetes cluster as well, this can be again AKS on Azure Stack HCI. I uh, connect that up. Uh, basically, the connection is free. But then if you start using additional stuff like the configuration part, using GitOps and so on, um, uh, you will uh, have different costs involved. There's also some regards to like on Azure Stack HCI, which probably has uh, no charge for the for these kind of certain things, right? So if you, for example, have if you connect an OpenShift cluster, which is nothing to do with that, then there are some charges. If you run, for example, AKS um, on Azure Stack HCI and so on, um, you have different different things you pay for um, in this case uh, for the configuration part, right? So that is pretty awesome. And then for the data services part. Uh, we, since these services are in preview, which is actually not 100% true, I need to investigate on this one. Um, th th they're basically no cost because they're in preview, but actually we already launched a couple of the data services part. Could be that I'm in the preview portal where not everything has changed yet, but uh, um, yeah, there's obviously some costs if you deploy these services. Okay, I have another question for you. Uh, given that Arc can bring Azure management and operation benefits to any infrastructure, what are the benefits of using it with Azure Stack HCI versus other on-premises infrastructures? So for servers to manage, like for, for general servers, um, I would say there isn't really a, a benefit like just for Azure Arc management purposes when it comes to just the, the guest VMs on top of it, right, at the moment. Um, However, obviously Azure Stack HCI, like if you look at the nodes monitoring, if you look at this, like this stuff, uh, which uh, which is Azure Stack HCI related, which is also Azure Arc, there you obviously get the benefit to also have that right into um, uh, the portal. And I think Cosmos talked about this or will talk about it in the roadmap. There is a couple of awesome things coming there with the Azure Arc uh, connections of Azure Stack HCI. Um, but again, it, this is designed like in general, if you just install the agent in the guest VMs, um, it doesn't really think about what is what is it running on, right? It doesn't care so much about this. It cares about the operating system where it's in. Um, and so we also have that available for other, other uh, service running, even on physical nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have three minutes left. I think I think I have two more questions. Is it possible to use Azure Bastion services for Azure Arc managed on premises server? <laughs> I I love this question. Next to the pricing question, this is the other question always coming up. Uh, okay. Uh, um, 
let's put it that way. Nothing to share. And I have it two times, point. actually. I have it two times. <laughs> that are the two questions. <laughs> um, currently, I, we get we heard that feedback a lot. Let's put it that way. Um, we don't have anything uh, public announced yet, um, but it's a, it's definitely an interesting scenario. Okay, you you don't have to announce anything in the moment, but there is coming something maybe in the future. Okay. <laughs> We, we definitely heard the feedback. I can say that. Yeah, uh, you had the feedback. OK, I, I was just uh, uh, dreaming about something. OK, um, so we have still two minutes to go. Final questions. Otherwise, great job, Thomas. Um, I have uh, Kat Katerina Fernandez is asking if uh, the presentation and the recording uh, will be shared. I answered already the recording will be shared publicly. The presentations, uh, unfortunately not. That's not because of the speakers. I have no place for them to share them. So uh, good, good um, yeah, suggestion for the next Azure Stack HCI days to also share the presentations for from the speakers. So Thomas, I would say thank you. Um, Great having you. Uh, I hope we can speak on stage. You you were this week on a conference where you were on stage, right? Yes. Wasn't it that was, a great feeling? It was very special uh, because I haven't done that now, and I'm sure you the same for you for a long, long time. Um, so I was really happy to 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 see some faces again in the audience directly and not just on yeah. screen. Um, yeah. So that was awesome, definitely. Uh, also, by the way, for people who want to access my presentation, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter or on my blog. Um, I will. I'm happy to send the presentation to you, uh, but you need to reach out to me, and I will. I will send it. Yeah, you will find Thomas Maurer. I will share. Uh, yeah, you will find him on Twitter even or in, uh, on LinkedIn and reach out. Okay, so thank you. It's uh, one minute to the next presentation. Thank you, Thomas, and we switch over to. My friend Udo. Hello, Udo. Hello, guys. Yeah, we can hear you. Everything Hello. fine. So I try to. Hi, Manfred. Hi, Thomas. And congratulations to the extension of your team back home. <laughs> this is an insight. <laughs> 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 yeah, we had not uh, spoken in person the last <laughs> whatever two years. So, um, yeah, hello guys. So great session. I also learned a lot the last days. I would say, but uh, I hope so, Udo. I hope so. Uh, yeah. So, so we see your screen. We see you. You you are ready to go if you want to. I can fire on. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, Thanks for having me. And yeah, I try to uh, give you an overview about the Lenovo offering for Azure Stack HCI solutions and how you can use it in a simple and easy way. So I try to be quite technical. Uh, uh, if that's okay for everybody, and uh, and uh, let's have a look what I have for you. So first, quick intro from my side, and uh, then uh, we have a quick look on the Microsoft ecosystem. You have seen it quite often, and how does it map to the Lenovo solutions, and uh, more details on our offering for the Azure Stack HCI. And uh, we'll finish up with some management, of course, how to use Windows Admin Center for managing the whole stack. And first, uh, some words to me. So here you see a picture from last week. So uh, we really had a in-person event in Austria. So when you're below 100 or so, you can have a, a in-person event in, uh, and everybody has uh, is okay with Corona terms, then you can have an in-person event on stage. So it was quite uh, interesting after when we, when we had the last session, Carsten, uh, was March 2000 in the office from Munich, from Microsoft. So True. it was a long time uh, having no direct uh, contact to customers and partners. And as you see, so you need to have quite a lot of room for uh, 100 people. And yeah, that's also part of my job. So I'm doing the Microsoft nerd role here in uh, Lenovo for the DACH region, so Austria, Switzerland and Germany, doing pre-sales support, uh, as you know from the vendors, so helping customers and partners. And together with uh, one of the MVPs, you, 
you now see in the second picture. So Carsten, uh, as I call him, my friend and MVP, my personal MVP, of course. So and um, we do trainings together for our partners. So if you're a partner and you're interested in learning all the stuff you, you saw the last days, um, we also are able to train you in three days if you can handle that. Uh, pressure and uh, yeah having fun on events means okay we uh, normally we go to events and show our solutions and of course we try to have also some fun there and together with Carsten we founded the Hyper-V community in Germany 2011 so it's almost 10 years now and uh, it was a little bit quiet Carsten so we should have some sessions the next uh, Months totally so. agree, and it's it's already <laughs> ten years. It's 2021, even in the in the third quarter. So it's ten years ago, Udo. I, I forgot <laughs> when it was when we started it. I guess it was April or May or so. But yeah, it's ten years now. So we should have a party on that ten years. So that's my job here at Lenovo. So I'm doing that now the last three years uh, almost. And uh, if you need some support on that, uh, just let me know. So our demo systems are uh, based a all, and I, I have also my own demo system in Stuttgart, but it's an EMEA uh, uh, briefing center. So everybody from all countries around in that region can have a visit there, of course, when it's uh, available again. So now we do most of the things uh, virtual. So we do briefings and webcasts and POCs. So customers and partners can um, also uh, log in remotely and do their own test so and we do it together whatever what you want to see and we use that for our trainings also uh, uh, for the demos for the customers and the partners so so all stuff available uh, let's say remotely and uh, if it's possible to have some meetings uh, there then we will have some meetings there again so first a quick look you have it seen already uh, quite often i guess just to set the basics where we are talking about so as you have seen from uh, thomas the azure stack arc is the important beast for the next years uh, to talk to infrastructure which is somewhere in Azure and uh, somewhere around. So in uh, all data centers of the world, your local stuff. And of course, today we talk about the Azure Stack family and just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So we are talking about the beast in the middle, Azure Stack HCI. So we also have an offering for the Azure Stack Hub. So Cosmos talked a little bit or some questions have been in the yesterday on that. The Hub is uh, still there, so uh, it's not going away, but it's like a niche play for some special use cases. So you need to have a use case for the Hub. And uh, it was, uh, the wording was Azure Stack 2017. So Carsten has also had also one and uh, we converted that a little bit to the Azure Stack HCI because that's a new beast uh, which is more important now and uh, it's the kind of same the hardware stack but today we talk about the Azure Stack HCI offering from our side and yeah as everybody knows sometimes it's uh, lost maybe in the in all the sessions so we are talking about the Azure Stack HCI which is yeah going from converged or what I call Lego on the light on the left side, going to uh, talk about the HCI layer. So standard servers with uh, some fast networks, as you have seen also in the session from, from Helmut a bit. And uh, if, if you have not seen it, so where you find all this uh, fancy stuff. So Microsoft has done this Azure Stack HCI catalog already in since 2019 so when windows server 2019 based systems have been called azure stack hci so it was not just for you but for all of us a little bit confusing in the early days when the new operating system hit the market and uh, so in the azure stack hci catalog you find all the solutions so the integrated systems how microsoft called the the uh, new versions let's say and the validated node uh, what we call sometimes certified nodes that's what I want to show you the next uh, minutes. So first, let's start a little bit with how does our offering look like? Because the Microsoft stuff you have seen quite deep the last uh, sessions. So here is our view on, on the solutions we have. So the Think HR platform is uh, like in the middle and on the right. So everybody hopefully knows that Lenovo 
not only has laptops and tablets and uh, also owns uh, Motorola, so you, we also have the mobile phone uh, area, but we also have uh, since 2015, IBM sold their server business to Lenovo, uh, which have been done by with the PC stuff 2004 or so, if I'm correct. I was not there at this time. And uh, but the, the regular servers are called sync system. So you can have servers networking as you heard yesterday is gone. Um, so our leaders decided that network stuff is better. We, we work together with the leaders there, like with Mellanox, uh, we have heard already uh, during the days uh, or NVIDIA networking, you call it now, and storage. So we have offerings there for servers and storage and uh, together with some certifications, you get to the point that it's a Think Agile uh, solution. And Think Agile always means that you have software and hardware kind of together in a, a certified node or in an appliance. So we have said two names like certified nodes or single nodes, and the appliance is when something is added so we only we, we not only have the microsoft certifications of course we also have something for you if you uh, want to use different solutions from other vendors and uh, today we have a look on the azure stack hci solutions and uh, with what I start normally when I talk with partners and also with customers is a little bit uh, have a few back in the days when we started with now we should call it again storage spaces direct kind of and that's how I use it so when I talk about storage spaces direct of course that is a storage layer <coughs> excuse me in uh, both situations or in both solutions but uh, we now call the S2D again what is Windows Server based so that is what you buy normally you buy a validated node from lenovo and then you add the windows server data center license and the windows server data center license has these features you need for the storage spaces direct so you of course you have hyper-v sometimes you get the funny question if why microsoft doesn't support other hypervisors but yeah if you have your own hypervisor why should you storage spaces direct is more the the, the beast in the middle so software defined storage what you have normally and the software defined networking which is sometimes used uh, to separate the workloads um, but you still and that's why i have it green so with windows server 2022 you still have the same functionality so it's not it was not going away with azure stack hci operating system so you still have it and from my point of view it's still the yeah, most done installation in the field as of today so because azure stack hci is quite new let's say and uh, all the management tools also thomas showed you are still coming let's say and uh, when everything is uh, is in place with the next release end of this year and with all the management capabilities uh, from Azure portal, I guess that the game will change also a little bit. But as of today, I would say 90% something are still having Windows Server based uh, HCI solutions from Microsoft. Of course, you know you, you use the admin center for uh, managing that uh, beast and uh, you connect to Azure for hybrid services, but there's no need for having a connection, which changes in the in the next picture. So that is the, the view we normally start with, with partners and customers when they have some ideas what they want to uh, have in their data centers. So that's the two choices you have. So you still have the Windows Server based HCI solutions. And I guess also Carsten is doing a uh, high percentage still on the Windows Server based solution as we do some of them together. And the new view is this almost the same. You use the same validated nodes. Uh, you use uh, Azure Stack HCI operating system, which has the same features in the uh, in the operating system, like virtualization, storage spaces direct for the storage layer, and storage storage spaces, uh, and software defined networking, of course, for the separation. And as you heard the last days, uh, uh, last sessions already, a lot of features are only coming to this Azure Stack HCI beast. So uh, you don't get it on the Windows Server if not everybody was in all sessions yesterday. So there will be over time, there will be a, a differentiator on features uh, between the solutions. Of course, both have the storage layer in, uh, in, the, in, in the operating system, but like stretch cluster you have seen from the Carson sessions and from our friends from Fujitsu. So uh, there are 
features which are only coming into the Azure Stack HCI operating system or also the GPU session yesterday night was really interesting what's coming. And all these new features are just coming in the, in the Azure Stack HCI operating systems. That's why we are doing also these sessions these two days. And of course, you can use Admin Center. You can do everything on PowerShell first, as that was called when I was a Microsoft employee 2012. So everything can be done through PowerShell. And the, the basic features you also can do now with Admin Center, of course. Some features are, or some settings are only available on PowerShell, but most of the things like installation, you can install the Azure Stack HCI, as you have seen from Manfred, uh, all through the Admin Center GUI. And here you have to connect the Azure Stack HCI to the Azure for billing, of course. Uh, Microsoft wants to get your nine euros per core per month, and the function only starts if you have registered it. Uh, otherwise, uh, you cannot install, as uh, Helmut also uh, mentioned in his session, you cannot uh, use it for virtualization. So that is the, the new change that you have to have connection to the Azure, uh, and uh, then you use Azure Hybrid Services as, as Thomas has have shown us, and Azure Arc will be what we will play around the next couple of uh, weeks and months. So what we have seen in the Azure Stack uh, HCI catalog are these two areas. So you have this validated nodes, <coughs> what we call the last year's certified nodes to confuse the Russians, I said always when I was younger, and uh, the integrated systems are called appliances because we have set branding for, for other uh, solutions also, but on the end, it's the same certified hardware. And uh, if nobody has mentioned it before, maybe good to know that there is only an Azure Stack HCI certification run, so there is no Windows Server uh, certification anymore, so it's just Azure Stack HCI, and uh, the new version of the certification tests for 21H2. So for the new version, uh, Cosmos showed us a little bit um, uh, also on the roadmap slides, which coming the next two months or so was uh, was the wording, I guess, or, below, or in that two months. Uh, this certification also brings the certification with 20, so Windows Server 2022. So uh, once the certification for the Azure Stack HCI 21H2 is done. All systems are also certified for the new Windows Server. So uh, it's already GA since 1st of September, if I'm correct. Um, uh, but the solutions like uh, uh, Storage Basis Direct, so Windows Server based systems with, uh, uh, with our certified nodes or integrated systems um, are coming uh, or gets listed on our pages for Server 2022 end of this calendar year because the certifications are uh, have a combination, so you only do the Azure Stack HCI certification, and with the newest version, you get also the certification for for the Windows Server for the newest one, and that's why uh, no one installs now a Windows Server-based system already with uh, Server 2022. Uh, the tip here would be, uh, if you buy a system for for a Windows Server-based HCI. You can already, or you should already, buy the uh, uh, the OM or ROC license for Windows Server 2022. So you already have the newest versions. You are uh, already allowed to install virtual machines with this uh, version. And once uh, the certification for the platform is done, you could upgrade your uh, servers from 2019 to 2022. But uh, funny, sometimes uh, the shipment of that servers because of the situation in the industry could also take two, three months. So maybe if you order it today, you and you get it end of the year, so you already can install the Windows Server based HCI solution. So for me, uh, as a technical guy, this uh, validated uh, slash integrated system is more like uh, the PowerPoint or marketing trick uh, because the hardware, at least on our side, is uh, still the same. So we do the same certification. Uh, it's just one certification run you do. And if you use it, send for Windows Server based or for Azure Stack HCI based, um, uh, that's your decision, kind of. So, and if you have already bought certified nodes the last year, uh, you are fully uh, supported if you upgrade that uh, or you change the operating system to Azure Stack HCI operating system. So, from a support point of view, uh, if you uh, bought, of course, the 
think HL advantage support recalls that normally it's kind of mandatory also for Windows Server based systems. Uh, so everybody or every partner which gets trained through our cycles are uh, buying systems with the Think HL support and you can uh, keep the Think HL support in mind like, like the solution support. So if you just buy hardware, of course, as before and you say, OK, I'm not interested in any support, uh, not on the solution side, not on the operating or whatever side, then you are down to hardware only. So you get the new power supply or a new disk if it's broken, but nobody helps you uh, uh, in the solution area. I'm guessing that no one is uh, doing that uh, uh, just for, for labs maybe or for demo systems, but for production systems, everybody I guess is uh, is on the side having support for the solution. So you can have this HCI support or the solution support for both sides for the validated nodes or for the integrated system systems. Um, the only thing is if you are listed on the Azure Stack HCI catalog, uh, when you check the integrated system, so there are just three vendors, if I'm correct, uh, this morning. They agreed with Microsoft on a contract that there are more agreements. So especially this joint support agreement. So you have like the red phone to talk to each other. So uh, Microsoft can talk to Lenovo support and vice versa. That's more the agreement on the support. And you have said Windows Admin Center integration where you uh, uh, get guided through the first installation. So you already hit the buttons and then uh, the server needs some updates before or during the first installation. So that this is a deployment phase and uh, also you have support uh, in the cycle of updates. So if you do the upgrades, what I show later, then you also need to provide more support. So if you are listed if your vendor is listed uh, on the checkbox integrated system means he agrees with more contracts with Microsoft and he also needs to establish processes on the support so uh, each other can talk to each other and they get more training and things like that but from the hardware point of view that what I tried to tell you the both systems are good to run um, both Windows and uh, Azure Stack HCI operating system for the solution and if you have that uh, think HL support. You are good to go for both uh, areas, and of course, we you can if you are a customer or a partner, you can uh, select that you want to have the deployment services with it. Normally, so as we train the partners, they are doing the installation with you. Uh, if there is no skills available, you also can book as a customer the deployment from Lenovo. Of course, then that uh, Lenovo expert comes. Uh, into your building and do the deployment. You can buy it as a, as a fully managed service. So you just pay something per, per month, uh, including hardware support, everything. You can integrate also in that um, solution the Azure Stack HCI payment. So it really depends. But the message here well, from, from the technical side is the solutions or the hardware stacks are 100% the same. They are the same network cards left, left and right. They are the same storage devices. So um, that's why it's more up to you how, what you uh, uh, what you configure or what you buy. If you start from scratch and you want to have Azure Stack HCI, of course, the integrated system uh, is what you normally select because the HCI operating system is already installed on the box but you also can check it on our configurator that you uh, get a certified node because you maybe have already a three node cluster, then you buy a fourth node uh, to extend it and on that uh, journey, you maybe uh, decide you want to uh, go to Azure Stack HCI because of all the new features. So it doesn't really matter for me uh, and there's no real differentiator just more on the support side, but if you start, as I said, with the certified node, you also can um, add or you add it to the Think HL support. So it's it's same good support for if you change the operating system during your project. So, and uh, some guys already mentioned it, that, okay, the certification has already an outcome and that is the important thing as uh, you saw yesterday already, that is what we call this best recipes. It's basically um, a listing where all the versions of firmware and drivers have a, a, have a 
you get a package with uh, the listed drivers and firmware which went through that certifications. So we don't do that every day, but when we do that, you get like the best recipe. You also get it like a PDF and you also can download it manually and because it depends really on the customer or size of the customer, some enterprise customers will have their own a software to deploy firmware and drivers. So you can download this package and can you use your tool of choice to um, install the versions uh, to your stack. We will later see how, how you can do it through Windows Admin Center, but if you don't have that in place or you have different uh, uh, tool sets for bigger customers, so you also can, we also have a customer who, who is deploying firmware and drivers with System Center Configuration Manager on a few hundred nodes. So it really depends. And the best recipes like here is from the, the, the screenshot, the last one from July 2021. So you get for that kind of uh, certified nodes, you get the package which comes from the certification runs. So it's not done every week, but uh, once a month or once a quarter, you get the new package uh, where you can be sure that SIDS firmware and driver package is certified especially for Azure Stack HCI and for the Windows Server-based solutions. So there are two, maybe some, some different versions sometimes, but normally it's the same because the uh, driver testing and the certification, as you, as I said, is the same testing. And so that's what uh, we normally prove. And you, so you don't need to go to, uh, to our support pages and, and select uh, single versions of drivers for firmware and for network cards or so, and then find out if it's working. So that is uh, for me the best thing since Azure Stack HCI catalog was kind of uh, created from Microsoft 2019, um, that you have these bundles and also every vendor kind of has this, we call it best recipe. So you have this package, what you get uh, for updating and installing your solutions. And a quick look on which configurations uh, uh, you can uh, do also on the Lenovo. Of course, we have that hybrid storage solution, what Microsoft calls the configurations with uh, HDDs. So we or I personally normally stay away from that HDD configurations, just if you use it for, maybe you have heard yesterday the, the uh, white paper Carsten and DD did for the backup. So we used for the backup target here a maximum configuration with HDDs to have really a big, I forgot the, the terabytes, a few hundred terabytes for backup. So you can fill up this uh, uh, old style configurations with the maximum HDD capacity you can uh, uh, bring into the system. So it's still the, the 3.5 inch uh, HDDs. So for productive virtualization solutions, I normally try to stay away because the uh, repair time of an HDD is really not good. And as you also should know now, uh, every HDD configuration, and that's the starting configurations you see here, every HDD configuration needs to have a cache in front. So that's the easiest or the smallest bundle you can start. Uh, two cache drivers uh, are minimum and four capacity drivers is minimum. And uh, normally if we go once forward, the flash storage configuration allows you to not use an, an, an cache if you don't need. So uh, what I forgot to tell you on the other side uh, is on the other page. So uh, uh, the HDDs have cache for read and write in front. When it comes to flash storage, you only have the write going to the NVMe if you take the configuration in the middle. And that's why uh, what I call always my Udo configuration, uh, partners and uh, customers normally end up with this SSD only. I, I call that the right side. So you only have SSDs for capacity. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> As you also have the choice of different uh, SSD uh, drives, so you also can start with, you know, uh, yeah, how you call it easy or uh, uh, small configurations with small performance. Uh, I try to find the right word and also like mid-range SSDs and they also are like from Samsung. They produce really fast uh, 12 gigabit uh, SAS SSDs. So you also have the choice on the SSD side from different uh, speeds and also of course from different price points. And that's why we normally have most of the configurations I do are SSD based on the right side 
or NVMe based if the customer needs really more speed, then we uh, try to avoid this a cache to capacity ratio and also the calculations and the numbers because you, uh, if you have heard it, maybe also so you need, you should have a optimum configuration. So like uh, the ratio is not just the percentage of the how much cash you need for the capacity, also the number of drives. So you should have like here in the picture two to four or two to six, two to eight to be optimal. Or when you need three uh, cash devices, you should go for uh, like three to six or three to nine. Everything else also works because the Windows Server is uh, doesn't take it to, uh, with a lot of uh, error messages. So he also will accept if you have two to seven, uh, but uh, you should not do it if you want to have an optimal running system. So just to uh, complete the picture, if you need a little bit more speed, uh, you also could uh, go for the storage class memory as Microsoft calls the persistent memory modules, just uh, to be complete here. We have sold so far not too much of that because there's really a niche place for that configuration and also the capacity of this storage class memory modules uh, are not you know, so high, so the biggest one I guess we have now is 512, so what Intel should use. Um, so we had some questions on that, but uh, I have not seen one in production. Uh, and you also lose some uh, slots for your uh, RAM, so because that's the same slot you use, but it's the shortest way, I would keep it in, uh, in, in mind. Uh, it's the shortest way to the CPU, so if you need to have really fast storage, that could be an option. With the new Intel platform, it's getting a little bit better, but you still have to use uh, slots for your memory. So as Helmut also talked with Carsten about this networking, I just uh, put it in so you have it in the reference in the recording and also in the, in the slides if you get it. Uh, what we normally do in the configuration, so that's a design I have learned in the production that we all uh, often do. So we, we have like six ports normally, if it's uh, switchless, what I show uh, next slide, uh, or uh, you, you talk to switches, so it doesn't matter for me. So normally if you go to uh, come to me, so we, we end up with a configuration, it's looking like this. So you have like two dedicated storage ports, like in the back uh, in the old days, you would have like fiber channel or iSCSI also dedicated. So you have dedicated storage ports uh, for the uh, east-west traffic, as we call that in the solution. So cluster interconnect uh, for storage traffic, and then you separate if you, if you can do the management of the host. <coughs> on the left side and you uh, do two separate NICs or more. That's just a minimum. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and you use two ports for the virtual machines. So that's what we normally do or uh, what we present. And if the customer is okay with that, then normally the partner decides that and knows how, how the a network configuration at the customers is. We, we start with six, six ports. And of course you can do it converged as uh, you do it with these two ports and in all configurations and all deployment guides you also find on our pages. It always starts with these two ports. Uh, because of an easy reason, all the certifications uh, for Azure Stack HCI catalog are always done with two ports, so 210 or 225 gig ports uh, in a converged uh, configuration. That's why you have it in all papers and on Microsoft pages, because the certification is always done with two ports only. Uh, but uh, I hope Carsten agrees that we <laughs> we normally do the separation of the storage traffic and to the virtual machines and, and so on. So that is uh, quite often the discussion point in the configuration. And the second one is, okay, if you start small, I heard Helmut more likes uh, the uh, switchless design also as a two node design also with switches, of course, if it's possible. So we would normally start here also with SSD. So I'm always pushing that they use also 25 gig pipes in the back and not every small customer of course want to buy 25 gig switches and that's why the uh, switchless design with two nodes and direct connected cables. So I have heard through the, through the sessions the last days that some guys have problems with that. So I have not heard from any problem of my from my partners or customers that there are problems since uh, one or two months with uh, with the witness but of course if you have switches so the game uh, goes uh, until three 
Microsoft tests it until five. I personally, when it's more than three nodes, I always would go, especially on four or more, with switches because you have more control about your network. But for me, it makes sense to end with three nodes with switchless because then the cabling is also quite complex and all the IP range uh, it addresses you need to configure it, but it would work, but we would normally uh, stop on three nodes with switchless. So my personal Udo advice, but if you have switches, of course, it's always better to have switches. I would also recommend that because you have more control about your traffic and you have more settings on the switches and uh, the monitoring is better and so on. But uh, these two configurations are quite often happening, especially when it comes to Windows Server based. So when it's not stretched, uh, one rack, one room. Uh, on the left side, we had this discussion with Carsten already. So two nodes, uh, we quite often have a longer cable than five meters because the configuration or the, the functional uh, things are not changing when you have a 10 meter or a 25 meter cable between it, but that's what's what's normal. So on a two node, uh, it's still not stretched, but maybe it's, uh, let's say two racks in a room and um, two rooms are uh, just next to each other and you have a longer cable. So from the solution point of view for Windows server based solutions, so S2D, that's possible. Uh, if Microsoft would find out that it's a stretched cluster, uh, the comment normally is that the support call ends once they know that the stretch cluster, but you have heard that. So coming to the technical details quickly, no surprise. So every vendor use uh, the basic 2U server. So that's our, if you know it from the server branding. So our sync system, SR650 is a 2U machine and the 630 is a 1U. So with uh, the new branded, uh, in, with the new versions of Intel platforms, so the Ice Lake platform, which uh, was showing up this year, you also get the 1U um, if you need it. So I have not needed it the last years, but there are some customer cases where you pay the rec space may be on your provider per unit, per rec unit, then uh, you could save money per month if you just need a, a small two, three node machine with two, three, uh, with, with four or six uh, drives per node, then you can use, of course, the, the one U server. It's basically the same server, just in a different chassis. So we call that SR st standard rack server 630 and 650. They are different numbers, so not so important. We call, you know, flash and, and hybrid. So we have the H and the F and so on. And you have the new platform and the old platform. Uh, I guess no, no rocket science here. So you have a standard server, standard industry server. What's maybe different here is we have this small fancy server. So we have seen it maybe on some videos when <clears throat> Cosmos had it on stage because he likes that small box. What I try to show you a little bit more in details. It's our uh, edge server and we also have certified this small edge server with uh, with the uh, Azure Stack HCI. So you see it in a second. First, if before I get the questions on the chat, uh, we're also working on certifications on AMD based machines. So the, the platforms already, so that's our REC, uh, standard REC server names or model names uh, uh, we have for, for AMD. They are already listed in the Azure Stack HCI catalog since almost a half year, I would say. But um, we have not turned that into a, a certified solution in terms of the, the hardware is certified, but you, it's not like an MX version. So it, you don't get it as a sync HLMX if you want. So we also have customers and uh, I call that uh, on the top always Lego. So you have a list of certified components and you can build well, before Microsoft called it like do it yourself, but with certified components. So you don't go out and just find out if it's working. We have tested it. Uh, you get the list, but you don't get this best recipe, if you remember. So you don't get this driver firmware packages and you don't have the HCI solution support. So I would call it it's on the way. So we have already certified it. If a customer wants to have it and is okay with that uh, non HCI solution support, then uh, 
it's good to go. We have some in the field. So especially when it comes to service provider type of customer, where they have like maybe a different coverage on Microsoft support and on Lenovo support, then it's maybe a good idea. Otherwise, for a regular customer, I would uh, stay with the Intel based uh, Think HLMX. But as you see, so you have it in the catalog. We are working on it. It's coming. And let's highlight a little bit the SE three six uh, SE three hundred and fifty. So our edge server, whatever you call it, small box. Uh, what makes it special? So it's uh, made for environments where you maybe have don't have a data center. So you have some edge designs like. Uh, in the wind turbine or something like that, or in production area. Um, and uh, it can handle a little bit more uh, heat. So up to their model up to 55 degrees Celsius, and you can uh, shake it a little bit, what I say normally as a joke, because it has uh, only flash systems in it. And also the chassis is, is a little bit more for vibrations and shock, especially what you have in production areas. And that brings it first time when I saw it, uh, to be honest, I said, okay, what do you want to do with this small box? But from the use case, uh, what you need for edge, uh, systems it really makes sense and you see also the wi-fi antennas here and uh, the 5g antennas so 5g would be for for a remote management if you really have it off-site somewhere you know like in in robo sites so you could have the the, the management through 5g um, and uh, you also can use it for so wi-fi so let's have a quicker a detailed look on the network so these two small boxes are really good for for a two node system so you have it somewhere in the in the robo or, or branch office uh, where you have no no real it stuff and uh, maybe also not a rack um, so you can use it and so we have uh, the versions there are different versions of that model so you also can use it as a standalone system of course for production areas or for azure stack uh, for iot edge uh, uh, systems and uh, so standard Windows Server or whatever you want to run on it. There are a lot of systems uh, certified, but for especially Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server based, so you can run it with these two nodes. So we also have done some German speaking videos with Manfred. So if you have uh, uh, want to have a look, so it was last year, I guess, or maybe it was this year, really forgot it. Uh, maybe Manfred knows when we did the video series for that uh, small box. So you can plug it with, uh, with direct cables for storage and you have uh, one gig uplinks and uh, the fancy thing is you also can use it for Wi-Fi. So maybe it's the first and only certified system where you really can use Wi-Fi. So if you have some stores or other use cases where your workstations or your uh, point of sales units are only having Wi-Fi, then you also can use this connection to the uh, other systems and for the storage as you see in the middle you have this two pipes for 10 gigs so it's uh, it's limited for 10 gigs because of the box is quite small but you can put in uh, up to eight nvmes per box so you get some terabyte of storage also in and you can shake it a little bit and here just to summarize it where you can put it of course you uh, you also can wall mount it there are different there are tons of options how you can uh, uh, mount it you also can have it in a rack so you can have two in one u so uh, next to each other with the power supply is external that's why the box also gets a little bit smaller and as you see here you could also do like a small tower so you can glue it together and have it in a funny uh, configuration. So all the, the systems I showed you on the configuration gets um, often updated and where you find all the stuff for the data center stuff uh, and we call it now infrastructure solution group. So the group I work was called data center uh, group the the last weeks and years and we changed that uh, in a, in a rebranding with the rest of the Lenovo groups, we are now the infrastructure solution group. So don't be scared if you have see a different wording, but it's still the same. So the data center stuff from Lenovo, all kinds of details you find in our Lenovo press. So everything I showed you or uh, what, what's coming next, you will find in details there. Also the deployment guides, uh, guides I, I talked about, the best recipes, you find on our support pages and you have for both versions, let's say the REC server version and the, the smaller SE350 Edge server, you have a very detailed uh, deployment guide. So uh, if you 
have any idea how Windows works and uh, what's PowerShell, so you will get a guide how to really deploy it with or without Admin Center. So it's quite easy if uh, if you follow the guide. So it also has some details in it, especially for the network configuration, how you want to use it. So to end now with the solution management, so we have seen already a few management solutions uh, during the week from other vendors. So of course, every normal server vendor has its own infrastructure management. So we, we call that X-Clarity. So everything which has to do with X, with management, with systems management is has some X-Clarity in the word, in the wording, in the naming, and the Xclarity administrator, which is the beast who uh, controls all the infrastructure, so storage and servers and switches, if you still have it, as you have heard, it's the switches are certified also for Azure Stack HCI. The next versions, you need to have a specialized uh, certification for the switches. You can handle with that uh, administrator and like the baseboard in, in the server, inside the server are called Xclarity controller, just that you have heard it once. So there's always a free version, which are good for the regular uh, management. And there are a few features where you need the Xclarity Pro version. And that, that's just a few uh, euros per server when you buy it. And you also get uh, the possibility to open a support ticket. So it, I would uh, define it like, okay, if you want to open a support ticket for that software, then you need to have the pro version so and, and pay a, a few euros per server when you buy it. Uh, but the, the functionality is, um, is there to uh, monitor and operate the server, so the basics, and uh, it's a free of charge. So basically you download a, a virtual machine just to show it. Also this software is uh, uh, made for automation. So we have PowerShell commandlets for the administrator. So that's a good thing for our Microsoft stuff. So you also can use automation, which uh, fires PowerShell to that administrator. And just a quick uh, a screenshot from my lab. So I have seven server in my lab now. You see two or more have warnings because uh, you need to show also warnings. So it's a network cable which is not connected and that's a basic management. So you can have alerting if a disk is down and so on. And you also can automatically open a ticket in the support if something is going wrong and you get maybe tomorrow a new uh, SSD and you didn't know that something happened. But we want to see how it's integrated in the Windows Admin Center shortly. So of course, uh, the extension model from Microsoft allows us to a hook up into the admin center and here just a quick view how it works. Normally the the extensions from the admin center always talk to the uh, to the uh, management system from the vendor. So in our case, the Xclarity administrator. And but as it's especially for two node systems, you would not always have somebody who is uh, uh, working on that administrator. So there's a new the red error here should show you what I show you also in the second uh, uh, gives you additional possibility that the extension talks through PowerShell with the server. And as you maybe know, each server normally has this LAN over USB or whatever is support called. So you see a, a connection from the Windows operating system to the baseboard management controller, you would call it in generic, so to our uh, Xclarity controller. And you also can get all the information uh, especially when it comes to which version of uh, firmware is on the uh, uh, network cards or on the servers. Uh, you get that also through the PowerShell way. Uh, so that's quite new since uh, a couple of versions that you can have uh, a second way, especially for small customers. You don't need to have this Xclarity administrator running in the virtual machine. So the key features I just uh, go quickly through. So we will see it a little bit in the demo. Of course, you see the cluster. If it's a cluster, so it's not just made for a cluster or for HCI, you also can use it for if you still have bare metal Windows Server, um, uh, the integration. So you have the inventory and the alerts, so you get a uh, uh, notice uh, that something is wrong. It's not a monitoring, of course. So the monitoring is done in the Xclarity administrator for the hardware. And also Microsoft normally tries to tell you that the admin center is no monitoring. So it's a management tool. So admin center does not uh, alert you when something is wrong. It shows you the problems, 
but of course in the back when you run it with the Xclarity tools, you also will get the errors if uh, if, uh, if uh, a disk is broken or a power supply. But more interesting in that certification run is that system updates. So uh, you have it for, I show it in the last demo, in the last video quickly, you have it for the installation process and for the deployment and you have it during the life cycle, of course. So you can combine the drivers, firmware and the Microsoft updates. So the life cycle and that makes these uh, certified nodes different from the Microsoft point of view to the, uh, what they call it? So we call it an appliance and they call it integrated system, sorry. And of course you also can see the disks in the server, especially for the HCI solution. Sometimes it's helpful when a disk is like broken, you can start the workflow to um, uh, get rid of an old disk. So it also tells the storage pools that you retire a disk. No, it, it, uh, sometimes you have remote uh, locations, of course. You want to have uh, the, the light on for a SSD or for HDD. Uh, and so the technician doesn't uh, destroy something else. So he really uh, pulls out the, the wrong uh, not the wrong disk, uh, so you can uh, turn on the lights and so on. And there's also a workflow to remove it. So quick, just as you have seen it. So when you install the extensions, it always extends uh, the the view. So you have now this Xclarity integrator. If you use it together with the administrator, you would see in the admin center all your hardware servers. Of course, we normally don't have so much errors, but to show you that it's working, we normally in the lab, especially we have some servers with problems and um, uh, something prepared for you. So you would see the server and if you click on the server, you also can go deeper. You can log on to the remote console of the server and going into the configurations in the, in the BIOS and so on. So you will see some inventory, of course, uh, but I want to show you the, the last video quickly and have some room for questions. So you will see the inventory, as I said, what all you expect without leaving the administrator, uh, the performance and the, the uh, temperatures and so on. And But the important thing is uh, when you have a cluster like an HCI uh, or a storage basis direct cluster, the important thing here is that you see the cluster has a problem or not from also the combination of hardware alerts or situations and the software, and especially what's important for HCI clusters uh, on Microsoft side is that you have the same firmware level, right? So, and here you come back to this best recipe. I hope you see it a little bit in the middle. So if you update a cluster during the, the three, four or five years you run it, uh, you have the possibility here to really have the view on the uh, best recipe. So if it's compliant or not, you will see it in a second in the video. And here is a quick picture on the disk manager. So you can uh, really have a workflow. Just you can replace it or you just put the lights on. You put the lights on on a server that somebody is doing a recabling remotely. So he is not doing the wrong thing on the uh, on another server. And there's really a workflow if you would see it that you want to continue. It will first be retired in the Windows server and then it will be uh, replaced uh, physically. Uh, so that's like a, a small workflow, but we will see it in a video uh, and the end of my presentation. So I just talk you through and of course you have seen Windows Admin Center quite often. So I skip a little bit. So the guy and all these videos you find on YouTube, so our service guys also are doing uh, like short uh, videos how you can configure it. The guy here just adds a cluster to the Windows Admin Center. So normally would install it with Windows Admin Center when it's an HCI. Then you have the dashboard and when you click on this integrator, you here have these two uh, options. <laughs> Carsten tries to say something to me. Udo, we have some questions for you. So maybe you left some room for 45 yeah, questions. I'm done in a minute and then we can okay. go to the questions. So here you have these two options I tried to uh, tell you. So this native OS management. So without having this management tools in place, you can talk to the Windows server or to the HCI operating system uh, uh, without using the Xclarity administrator and so get you get the same functionality. Uh, you get the inventory as you see here in the dashboard and uh, we jump quickly to the um, update process with the best recipes. And of course you see the best recipe is uh, 
in place and it has some uh, new version so it, you're not compliant and you'll see all the details of the best recipe and just quickly jump to the last process so when you fire it you can have it running now or run it later and you have a nice uh, that's what's what I want to show you as last you have a nice um, uh, view how what is done already and what what is done as the next so it will uh, copy the, the files to the servers and instead of uh, using that administrator uh, it's uh, uh, done from the windows server or from the hci operating system you do the upgrade of course first the server will be put in maintenance mode and the virtual machines get uh, uh, migrated to the other nodes and all the stuff you uh, you expect so that's the end and uh, we can have some questions now. That's great, but now my questions are gone in the live event Q&A. <laughs> Can you open them? Oh, there, yes. there they are. There they are. OK, I have them. Um, so starting. Yeah, from Lenovo perspective in switchless topology, can I upgrade from two nodes clusters to three node clusters or do I need to rebuild the cluster? I heard these questions, I think, three times already, but yeah, uh, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, it's always the same. So it's uh, from two node direct cabling, it's always more work and more planning uh, to upgrade to the three node because you would to need to add more devices. It means more network cards, more network cables. So you can do it quite kind of online, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, you, know? you normally would shut it down and then add more network cards for switchless for three nodes or going to switches. So everything can be done online kind of if you really plan it correctly, but if you really want to do it or not depends always on, on the skills of the people. And normally a two node is for like robo sites or so you would get the maintenance window easily and then do the, the trick in a, in a downtime, but you don't need to rebuild the cluster, but there's more work to do. You agree? Yeah. Yes, I do. And uh, just uh, think of the additional subnets you need. You need a subnet for every cable, right? So next question, can I do a four node switchless configuration supported by Lenovo? Uh, so we would support it because Microsoft supports it up to five, but uh, uh, we would not recommend it. Yeah, so. OK, but you would what get the, the support. Yeah. Yeah, what is the maximum cable length Lenovo is supporting between two nodes using the switchless option? Is single mode supported? I think I know where this <laughs> question is leading, right, Udo? It's a little bit <laughs> we stretched, know it, right? And, uh, it's quite easy. So uh, single mode means stretched and stretched is officially not supported. End of story. That's the hard answer, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> all, all, all between what, what partners and customers are doing, uh, yeah, it's up to them, you know. Yeah, but, but the don't physics are rely on Microsoft support if you stretch the storage basis direct you know, cluster. If if you want yeah. to have full support and on uh, especially this, you know, we don't offer single mode for that stretched uh, scenario. Yeah. If you buy it somewhere and use it, that's your deal. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, to translate Udo's genau, it's German for exactly. So uh, <laughs> in Leno in Lenovo. Is Lenovo also able to configure number of used CPU cores as presented yesterday by Dell via BMC? Uh, not right now. So uh, you would need to do it not through the Windows Admin Center. So you can do it, of course, in the servers, but not in the graphical version. Yeah. Yeah. So there, yeah. Are, uh, there are PowerShell commands to, uh, where you can do it, but not uh, if you want so sexy as you have seen it yesterday. It's in the pipeline for the admin center uh, plugin or extension, but not today. Yeah. OK, the next one, um, I don't know if if you remember where you talked about it, but what is the ratio cache capa ca capa cache capacity? Yeah. capacity? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no problem. Maybe yeah. it was about, uh, about the backup target, uh, but usually we would say at least 10% caching devices, more is better. 
correct, uh, 10 or more. So it's always a question if you know the environment from the customer uh, he has already in place uh, good enough or not, or you have data you can rely on. But uh, if you know nothing, then the Microsoft uh, so has nothing to do with Lenovo. So the Microsoft um, uh, number is 10% or more. So normally if you have a cache system and you, if you have uh, uh, seen all the details what I showed, I would always try to stay away from the cache systems because then the extension or expansion is super easy. You just plug in an SSD on each server and done. And uh, but if you have to have cache or you didn't listen before, uh, let's say then uh, you put in more cache because if you want to extend the capacity, you are good to go maybe, or you also need to add uh, cache devices. That's why I try to avoid set configurations. Yeah, there is much more about cache devices. We have to have a ratio. So ratio of numbers and, and, uh, and percentage. even multiplier. Uh, if you have three caching devices, six, nine, 12 capacity devices and so on. So much more there, and there was a session from Cosmos at the uh, CDC Germany 2018 where he was talking about cash, and it's available still online to watch if someone wants to do that. Next question, do you do you Rocky supported in switchless topology? So does Lenovo support Rocky and switchless topologies? Correct, yeah, thanks. So you you have both options, so you can do iWarp or Rocky. So uh, normally all the guys in our community are doing Rocky because they know how to configure it, right? And uh, we trust on, and that's most of the time, Mellanox network cards and switches because we trust on that vendor the last years. And we as Lenovo also use that vendor for our high performance computing stuff with InfiniBand. So this vendor knows how to do Rocky, but on the end you have the choice. So I have customers who are using iWOP and, uh, 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 or Rocky. So you can do both, yeah. So you have yeah, both choices. The, yeah, and an addition from my side, because I see this off not done, you have still to configure DCB on the hosts. So uh, configuring your prior, prior PC, PC, how it's called, PFC priority and uh, configuring which, which is lossless because otherwise you don't get the pause of frames if the, the network is full, and that's very important. Otherwise, your cards drops. Correct. Drop we, 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 uh, I call that always in short, like configure the host the same way if you have switch or switchless, then you yeah. are easy to go and you don't forget it if you add it then later on on the switches. So, yeah, but we have set discussions, Carsten and me, especially with uh, Mellanox or our Microsoft guys, and we all know this uh, Microsoft. Uh, recommended page uh, uh, that uh, use iWOP to get less support calls, but on the end, the guy who, who deploys it has to have some knowledge. End of story. Yeah, exactly. So well, Lenovo, uh, Lenovo Udo or Udo <laughs> from Lenovo, um, your session is up. It was an interesting one. I heard some of it before. I even recognized some slides from our training. Correct. <laughs> well done. Um, so thank you, Udo, and thanks Lenovo for the support of uh, the Azure Star uh, Azure Stack HCI days. Uh, I really appreciate it. And you know, without you guys, a free a free uh, online conference wouldn't be possible. So now we are one minute away uh, from our uh, Azure Stack HCI roundtable. Uh, we have some very interesting guests. So Manfred and I, we are on the show, but we are a little bit more moderating the stuff. Maybe we have also some questions, uh, Manfred. Yeah. Um, then we have Dave Kahula. He was yesterday uh, in the show presenting about uh, security. So if you have security related uh, questions, I think that's uh, that would be uh, he would be the right one. We have Jaromir uh, Kasper. He was presenting this morning about uh, MS Lab, uh, the, the script environment where you can do all your demos and test all the scenarios. But I know Jaromir is also very knowledgeable about, about storage bases direct and Azure Stack HCI. We have uh, we have Dave, I have already Helmut Otto. Helmut is from Austria. He had a presentation today about um, 
small to large uh, Azure Stack HCI deployments and also integrating the Azure services. Uh, Helmut uh, does also the certifications of the nodes, so he's very deep into Azure Stack HCI and Storage Spaces Direct. Uh, I think uh, many questions can be asked here. Um, and then we have two guys from Microsoft. I'm very proud of that. Um, uh, Jeff Woolsey is here. Jeff will have a uh, presentation after the roundtable about what's new in Windows Server 22. Um, looking forward to that, but Jeff also knows a lot of stuff around all the topics we can discuss. Hi, uh, hi Dave. And we have Matt McSpirit. I hope Matt is fit. He just flew in from the US to the UK this morning, but he said uh, he has a session after Jeff, so I hope I hope you are still uh, up to it and not too tired. Uh, um, Matt is uh, in the moment doing AKS, so Azure Kubernetes service, and I'm very interested in the two sessions after Jeff where we have um, an overview of Azure Kubernetes services on premises from Matt, and then a colleague of him, Mike, will, uh, uh, will show us a little bit deeper how the architecture is. So if you have any questions about Kubernetes, but um, uh, Matt was also doing the Azure Stack Hub uh, deployment and he's also in the Azure Stack Azure Stack HCI team, so um, a lot of knowledge there. And unfortunately, with Teams, we can't do a, a picture of all of you, so we have to switch to the picture when you speak. So um, now we will see if we have questions already for the audience. If you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A part. We, we noticed some question, questions from yesterday, and we have some new questions, but if you have more questions, please ask them. So I will just start or first. Uh, yeah, first I will start uh, with a question. What is the enhancement on Windows Server 2022 HCI? So I think the question is about storage spaces direct in uh, Windows Server 2022. And there is a bit. I don't know, Jeff, if you will talk about that too in your session so we can postpone it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm I am definitely covering um I mean I, I don't I this has been Azure Stack HCI. By the way, greetings everyone. Uh thank you so much for 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 the invite, Carson. Uh I know this has been Azure Stack HCI day, so I I I'm not sure how much or how little 2022 has been discussed yet. Uh I definitely plan on going deep into 2022 um and talking about what's new here. Uh keep in mind that Azure Stack HCI is going to get the the pointiest and all of the uh, all uh, you know the, the the focus of the HCI capabilities as they're coming from Azure, and we're moving at a faster pace there. Um, but there are some things that have that have come into 2022, and I'm looking forward to talking about those in my session right after this. So I don't want I don't want to spoil what I'm what I'm covering. Okay, so uh, thanks, Jeff. We have already this uh, question, and there are a lot of questions around. Uh, Azure Stack HCI versus Storage Spaces Direct. So I think we will come up with some more here in the roundtable because our audience is very interested about the difference and also why to use, uh, why to choose Azure Stack HCI over Storage Spaces Direct. But we come to that later. Another question is, can I do cluster rolling upgrades uh, uh, to upgrade a Windows Server 2016 storage spaces direct cluster to Windows uh, Server 2022 storage spaces direct cluster. Who wants to take this question, guys? Show your hand if you want to, to, to do it, and uh, I, we will switch our picture to you. <laughs> No, no. Uh, so you, I, uh, you know, that's an I will take question. It, and I, yeah, go ahead, go for it. I, I will take it. So uh, a rolling cluster update you can only do from one operating system to the next one. So you would have to upgrade to 2019 storage spaces direct Windows Server 2019. And then you, you could, I haven't done it. I know Didier has done it and Didier is missing here, I think. Yes, I, uh, maybe, I can I correct you, you can, I think, right? You can do replace operating system on one node and join it back to the cluster, but not with cluster updating, right? So what you can do with Windows Server 2009, no. You cannot do any Windows Server, you can do just Azure Stack HCI as a feature update to, to uh, take it into the newest uh, Azure Stack HCI. 
the thing you would have to do is probably go one node by node and replace operating system, reconfigure it, and uh, and give it back, right? So you can do, uh, I think, 2016 to 2020, 22 should be possible. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure because you can mix clusters. But there's a, I will try to find it on the docs, right? There, there, there's a way that you can do upgrade from two, but I'm not 100% sure if you can mix it. I think. Probably not, you are not probably able to mix it, but what you could do is to make entire cluster offline. I can love it, right, for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jaromir, Jaromir, now you are talking uh, no, no. your head away. I don't know the exact English word. Um, the question was rolling cluster update. Of course, there are other possibilities to get from Windows 20, uh, Windows 2016 to 2022 with offline, but I think the question was more about a rolling cluster update while your workload is still running. And as far as I know, but we have Rob later in the session. Uh, he has the last session today. He would be the right guy for that, but he's talking about uh, kernel uh, soft, soft reboot. reboot. Yeah. Um, mm. um, as far as I know, or Dave is showing his hand. He wants to say something. So Dave, we get you here. Yeah, thanks, Carson. Thanks everyone for having me again today. Um, so I, I think one of the things to look at with a double OS skip like that on your upgrades is the life cycle of your hardware that you're having inside of your organization. The reality is, is that most organizations roll with a, you know, a four to five year hardware life cycle. Um, so by the end of, you know, your 2016 cluster, is that really a good target for 2022? Possibly not. You might want to actually be looking at a new CapEx, picking up a new cluster and just going side by side for the migration. Then you can turn the old 2016 cluster, flatten it like Yarmir was saying, and then you can have that for like a DR cluster or something like that. That's typically what I see happening from the field on a double OS skip right now. It's just the hardware, the, the plans for most organizations are four to five years, so. Okay, thanks so far. Let's go to the next session. I was a bit distracted because my my friend Didier can't get into the session, but I I will send him a link a link uh, soon. So the next question um, uh, would be, where can I find a cost comparison between a solution with Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server 2019 for SMB? Uh, it could be helpful to. to to determine the break even size between the two scenarios. I I think we are talking about uh, HCI, so doing Windows Server 2019 uh, storage basis direct versus uh, Azure Stack HCI. Uh, and the cost is for many people. This is not only the uh, this is not the only question we had around this this topic uh, is uh, very important. Be uh, we we had of course a, a fantastic very cheap uh, solution for HCI, uh, Windows Server, with the data center license. You had you had nearly uh, uh, the free uh, HCI stack uh, included in data center if you have VMs. And now with Azure Stack HCI, we have additional costs and uh, we got the question a lot. So is someone there who wants to cover that? I know cost is always something uh, we don't like to talk about. We, we like to talk about features. I don't think I don't know that I don't know that I've seen a, a cost breakdown and that would be something I would I would uh, push to my my uh, colleagues over in the marketing side. But I would also point out that these are these are two different things now. Um, keep in mind that Azure Stack HCI has, you know, built in stretch clustering. It's going to include more capabilities. It's going to include additional features that Windows Server will not. Um, I mean, it, it's you know, I, I get that the difference between Azure Stack HCI as it as it shipped in 2019 were relatively were relatively there wasn't a huge amount of differentiation. You're going to see more of that going forward, um, and as as we deliver. So I, I understand the cost aspect, but I would also point out that there's you know there's other aspects to Azure Stack HCI, such as the native built-in Azure integration, more features coming to Azure Stack HCI. Um, so it's it's part of the equation certainly. But as for this specific question, I don't have it. I mean, you could pretty easily do it yourself. It's ten dollars per core um, with Azure Stack HCI, and you know we wanted to be consistent um, from a licensing standpoint. 
Yeah. Um, to add to that, we heard in Helmut session that uh, sometimes Azure Stack HCI is even cheaper than storage spaces direct on the same hardware. El uh, um, Helmut, do you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, it depends on the size of the solution. What we learned is especially for SM, for really small solutions, it's Azure Stack HCI is cheaper and it's going to a no brainer. So when we also come down to, to edge solutions and things like that, and like I said in my call in a second thing also, and like uh, Jeff said, it depends on what's the features that the customer wants. So it's it's not really a, a good idea to just uh, put it side by side and say, okay, that's the one price and that's the other price because you have two different feature sets, two different integration sets for this whole thing. And uh, at the end of the day, um, not comparing the, the the same things anymore and when it goes on uh, HCI will get more and more features and yeah but one, one thing to uh, add there as well sorry sorry carry on and and for sure when it comes down to let's say uh, 20 25 user companies we have a whole lot of them in the meantime and yeah they are happy because they get a real high-end high available solution for a nice price True. Yeah. Matt uh, wanted to add something, if I heard correctly. Yeah, and, and one thing to add that, that is often perhaps not, not first uh, appreciated as much is the cadence at which uh, the rate of new capabilities comes to Azure Stack HCI versus the traditional Windows Server path. You know, all of our focus at the infrastructure level or the vast majority is focused on bringing that innovation in HCI at a cadence that's much quicker than it has been historically. So we've already had Azure Stack 20H2, 21H2 is very close and you know that sets the precedent for future new capabilities coming in the OS itself, but also the surrounding technologies. Arc, for example, is, is, a, is a perfect uh, way. You know, the, the things we're doing and that you found out about in this, uh, in this conference around self-service, around enhancements to monitoring and, and so on and so forth. A lot of those are very going to be exclusive to HCI. So the cadence and the kind of updates that are coming really can enable even the smallest organizations to have big benefits in simplicity of management, new capabilities, efficiencies, storage efficiencies and more. And can, can we take a moment to talk about cadence? Because I think, Matt, you, you bring up a really excellent point here. Um, cadence is something that we are 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 have watched very closely. I've been I've been in I've been at Microsoft now for over 18 years and I can't tell you how many times we used to talk about cadence like all the time and the reason why to be super clear was customers. OK, when I first joined Microsoft way, way back in the, the 2003 era, um, customers were screaming going, you're too slow. You're too slow. Everything is taking too long. These Linux guys can shoot out, you know, new kernels, you know, every few weeks and everything's fantastic. Well, it really wasn't. But the point was Microsoft, you're slow. And we were releasing, you know, every two to three years like clockwork. And so 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, every two to three years. So finally, we got to 2012 R2 and we said, fine, we're going to do exactly what you asked for. And we released a new version. 2012 R2 came out 11 months later. And I remember sitting in my office and I like pulled out, you know, a huge drink and I was like, folks, we've done it. We finally nailed what customers are asking for. They've been begging and pleading for this. And I cannot tell you the whiplash we got from that. 2012 R2 was released 11 months and we had no end of escalations at people screaming at us going, I just deployed SQL Server. I just deployed Exchange. I just rolled out a whole set of new applications and you just did this. What are you doing, Microsoft? This is way too fast. But what it taught us was something very, very important, which is now you're seeing come to fruition with Azure Stack HCI Windows Server, which is at the application layer, people want slow and steady. We've learned every two to three years. So I'm about to break and break some brand new news, everybody. The next release of Windows Server will be in two to three years. OK, you heard it here first. I'm giving you an exclusive, Karsten. You just heard it here. The next re -release, Thank you. release of Windows Server will be in two to three years. Karsten, I'm giving that directly to you, my friend. You are the very first We need first this person. kind of content. Uh, you new can post it on Twitter. Oh my god, Jeff from Microsoft just announced the next release of Windows Server after 2022. It's in two to three years. 
Okay? <laughs> Spoiler alert. Okay? And by the way, the one after that will be in two to three years. Okay? Okay. If we go, to, if we go faster than that, everybody goes screams. If we go slower than that, then guess what? Th then, then, it, then, then we run into other issues. So we realize that. Now, at the infrastructure layer, the Azure Stack HCI layer, at the storage layer, at the hypervisor layer, things, that's where people want the innovation fast. That's where people are saying, hey, guess what? Uh, we do want these new features. These new processors just came out and we need to, we need to be able to deal with the fact that, you know, our, our, our hardware partners are changing things and our schedules don't align, okay? We, 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 you know, we try to coordinate with the industry, but honestly, things just happen. And so you'll very often see, you know, a processor release that is not in sync with us or some new network technology, a new storage technology that's not in sync with us. And so we can't, you know, two to three years on that part is difficult. So with Azure Stack HCI being an annual cadence, like Matt just said, we 21H2 is right around the corner here. Guess what? This is going to allow us to innovate faster. So the app layer, we're, we're you know, that, that consistent train to keep your stuff uh, on two to three years continues, but the infrastructure layer allows us to go faster and allows us to take the cues from Azure. And we are taking a lot of cues from Azure. Um, in fact, that's part of part of a couple of things I'm going to point out today in my 2022 conversation is there are some things that are, are in 2022 that I don't think people realize have come from Azure as well. Um, and so um, this allows us to really make sure that we're lining up products and 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 hitting the right solutions on the right guidance at the right time. As as a can I jump in there, Jeff? Uh, as of a as course. A hello, as a, hello. You finally made it. Yes, as a remark to that, Jeff. I mean, what 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 we also see is how slow sometimes people are to upgrade their existing servers to the latest oh, of the greatest. Absolutely. So that means you're also going to have to make it a lot more, let's say, easy for them to upgrade. You you'll have to have the trust that they want to upgrade, because in in the field you have these two types of personalities almost. You've got people that are always looking for, uh, let's say to improve things, to get the latest of the greatest, to indeed make use of that new hardware. But then there is, in my humble opinion, uh, a part of the market that's a bit too big, too large <laughs> for my liking, that stays behind way too long. And yeah. I was wondering, is, is that something that you will be able to address with Azure Stack HCI? Uh, what's the incentive there? Can you can you dive in there? What 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 will what will Azure Stack HCI do for the people that today now, let's say, are at least one uh, operating system or probably even more behind? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question, and I'm going to point at the two layers again. So at the Windows Server layer, at the app layer, we've actually done a bunch of work starting in 2016, 2019. Yeah, I see, or four behind Dave. We'll get to that in a second. 2016, 2019, or 2022. Every release, and I'm going to give huge props to my to my colleague Rob. We have been working on the update functionality of Windows Server um, to make it as easy as possible for people that want to do in-place upgrades. And you know, are still, you know, you know, a lot of cases, you know, if you, you know, it's for a lot of customers, they just want it as the last resort. It's because they installed this application on an OS 15 years ago. They don't have the install media. They don't have the source code. Whatever reason, all they have is an OS running the app, and it's running in a VM. And so, yep, we hear you. And so we've done a lot of work to do that, and we're going to continue to do that. And 2022 has done even more work just around fixing and upgrades and all of that. So uh, we're finding about 90% success rate on our upgrades. Thanks, Dave. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so that's definitely that's definitely. Um, um, you know, in line with what we're seeing. And that's that's definitely a, a big improvement from where we were to say 2012 R2 and 2016 back way back in then. And then at the Azure Stack HCI, you know, a big part of it is just making sure that the upgrades are just, look, these are just feature upgrades. You know, Windows Client has been doing this for a while now. You've been getting feature upgrades. Uh, Windows 10 has had many, many feature upgrades. We're getting ready to go to Windows 11. And, you know, part of it is making sure that upgrade process is as easy as possible. And we plan on doing that very much with Azure Stack HCI as well at the infrastructure layer. So, yes, we are tackling both of those and we are working to make both of those as easy as possible. Yeah. So let, let me add something and then we have to change the topic. 
because um, I, I, I'm now getting, getting a lot of in the Q&A and it's, it's even too much to read it all. Uh, but there are some suggestions uh, if uh, a, if there could be an inclusion of data center in the Azure Stack HCI pricing, I assume even for a higher price. Other things I heard is, for example, in Azure you have these uh, used in, used instances, or if you reserved are instances. reserved instances. So if you say I want I want this VM for three years because I'm relying on it, you get a better price. With Azure Stack HCI, not many people build up a cluster for a month and then uh, uh, shut it down and throw the hardware away. So usually it's a long a long term commitment to Azure Stack HCI. Let's say five years. So I heard from many customers it would be great if also these re reserved instances would be available on premises for Azure Stack HCI that would make it much easier. Let's say if we have a reduced price 50% or whatever for a five or three year commitment, it, it would lower the costs and Microsoft has a benefit. They know this this is coming yeah, and uh, it will help a lot of people to move to Azure Stack HCI to lower the pain a bit. What, what would you say? Helmut uh, has the first. Uh, Helmut is first. I just want to add to that that it's also for a lot of customers, especially with big IDs, a sort of a psychological uh, element. So they want to fix the price for the next five years because that's what they are used to and they have to run with their budget. And we have a, a whole lot of questions for sort of reserved instances for Azure Stack HCI because they have a five year budget now that they, like Dave said, they plan their hardware for five years and they know that everything will be new after five years and they just want the security. OK, it's running for five years. We, we do it up front. We finance it, however, do it leasing or whatever. And then uh, uh, after four years, we start planning our next cycle. And that was really, really, we, we see it a, a lot also with our partners like Thomas Grenner so that their customers ask for that. Yeah, and we had several questions uh, that were in this uh, direction. Uh, why do we have in uh, most of the scenarios to do both license Azure Stack HCI and buy Windows Server data center license usually, maybe sometimes standard for our virtual workload. So several questions were also in this direction. How can we um, have also our VM workload consumed or is it possible to have the VM workload consumed uh, on a pay per use or prepaid uh, basis via Azure? Yeah, so let's, uh, there's another question that's, uh, that's also interesting and we had a bit of that yesterday. Um, so with Windows 11, we heard that it requires on hardware TPM support. Um, and we are, we are not quite sure about that. We had some discussion, is that required or not? Yesterday we learned that in Azure Stack HCI, we have no support in the moment for the vTPM. So you can't have a virtual machine with a, with a virtual uh, TPM. And uh, that would mean if Windows 11 requires TPM, we really have a problem. We know, uh, Jaromir, in the moment it's possible with the pre preview build, but we are not sure, is it a hard requirement for 11, uh, for Windows 11 to have TPM support or not? And if it is, how, uh, how would we do that in Azure Stack HCI? Anyone to, uh, am I right with Windows 11? So, so, so there, have been, there have been a bunch of questions that have just flown by and I'm taking a couple notes because I we, we didn't, we kind of went from one topic to the next. So yeah. on, on the data center with Azure Stack HCI, um, I'm not, on, again, I'm not on the marketing side. I'm not in the business side. I don't have anything to do with licensing, but I will tell you this. Um, I know that um, there are some customers that are used to buying their data center licenses. That's the way they do it. That's the way we're doing it forever. And so they're comfortable with it. I also know that there are customers now that we're moving to cloud, you know, subscription model that are actually asking for this. So I can tell you that the, the folks that are, that are, that do make these decisions are aware of people wanting to, to be able to license a data center in a subscription way, just like the underlying license. I have nothing to announce. I have nothing to say other than those people are aware about it. They know it, they, they know about it and they're looking at it. So it's definitely a customer request. The one of the other top customer requests I would tell you is what we just got into, which is 
you know, Windows client on Azure Stack HCI. But the bigger question, the bigger request, and this has been like a, a, a huge, you know, dam breaking is everybody wants AVD. That's what everybody really wants. Yes. Yeah, and everybody I've seen, I'm seeing head shaking. That's that's yes. what everybody at the end of the day wants. Everybody wants AVD. Forget about this whole Windows 11 TPM stuff. They just give me AVD on Azure Stack HCI. I got nothing to announce today, but yeah, we hear you. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I think I think to I think to add to that to, to add to that as well, um, Jeff. I think on the on the AVD side, uh, the investments that the Azure team are making in bringing new and exciting options for people to run, for example, Windows 11 in in Azure is absolutely happening. Those teams are working on that, so you can bet your bottom dollar that. The investments they're making to enable Windows 11 in the right way to run on Azure, we can learn a lot from from the HCI space. And again, no announcements or anything, but we've we've heard the feedback, and we want to make sure that we're not reinventing things. We want to use what the uh, what's being pioneered in Azure as much as we possibly can, and bring it down where appropriate. And uh, just to one final point on the the licensing side, I know I know we're getting dragged down a little bit, but it's important that, as Jeff said, to separate what technically is is achievable and what business uh, is is achievable and the technology to enable a subscription based windows server to run on hci is probably a lot simpler than than, than what we need to work through from, from the business side so uh, i think there's definitely work to do the feedback keep it coming it's great and we love hearing your scenarios as to why you think one is more important than the other and vice versa because that really does help influence the directions that we can adapt uh, and we can adapt more quickly because of this subscription model that we have in place with HCI. Okay, uh, so um, nice to hear some not announcements, but at least some. I didn't announce anything. Some, yeah, I said nice to hear some not announcements, but uh, we get the, a little bit of a feeling. Yeah, um, feeling. If all feeling, I said yeah. was, all I said was, I hear that you guys really, 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 really want Azure Virtual <laughs> Desktop. Like, like Jeff, for Christmas, that's what I want. I don't want anything exactly. else. Just give me exactly. AVD on Azure Stack HCI. That would be the best Christmas present ever. That's all I'm saying. That's what I've heard, but I've got yeah, nothing for, to know. Yeah, Jeff, and for all who don't know the acronym AVD, it's uh, Azure, Azure Win Virtual Desktops. Virtual Desktops. Yes. yes. Okay. So another question I, I heard, um, there is a bit uncertainty around. What are your plans regarding uh, Windows Server, uh, where you want to see it? Because uh, we heard, we hear Hyper-V uh, virtualization storage, that is Azure Stack HCI. And uh, former it was all, uh, it was Windows Server. Uh, so where is Windows Server heading? Uh, can we answer that here or will you uh, come to in your session about so, uh, that? Absolutely, I'm going to cover this in my session, but let's be super clear here because I keep hearing these rumblings and I want, I'm just, let's cut this right to, right to the chase. If it's in Windows Server right now, it's not going anywhere. I heard someone, I heard some vicious rumor that, oh, we're going to take Hyper-V out of Windows Server. That's not happening, okay? Windows Server is in Hyper-V, period, end of story. Storage space is direct. It's in Windows Server. It's not going anywhere. SDN is there. But the new stuff going forward, because it's coming from Azure, it's coming at a much rapid pace. It's going to change very quickly so we can enable new Azure scenarios and new capabilities. Hey, Jeff, I really would like AVD for Christmas on Azure Stack HCI. Those things will go on Azure Stack HCI. Windows Server, yeah, it's got Hyper-V, it's got a storage spaces direct, it's still a fantastic file server, it's still your domain controller, it's still your print server, it's all of those things. Oh, and by the way, it's an application container, it's an application runtime, it's a container runtime, it's for apps. It's always been for apps. What's the number one reason why people deployed servers? Well, it was to run your file server, it was to run domain controllers, it's to run print servers, it's to run SQL, it's to run SharePoint, it's to run Exchange. By the way, yeah, we're seeing a ton of people moving Exchange to the cloud. SQL is exploding everywhere. We are seeing SQL massive adoption on-prem as well as in the cloud. 
SQL is continuing to expand at a, at a crazy rate in both places. And so we're going to absolutely make sure that Windows Server is a fantastic um, application runtime for all of those things. That doesn't change. That's where it has been for since since its first inception, long before there was anything called, you know, Hyper-V or Storage Spaces Direct or SDN. So I hope that helps. But if it's in Windows Server, we're not taking it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. We we had another question. Um, I'm just looking for it. So um, it's it basically as what it was uh, when you have uh, virtualization on Windows Server, let's say uh, Windows Server 2019, and you want to move to Azure Stack HCI. We have in the moment uh, kind of a blocker. You can't do that. So customers are ask why is that? Why can't you move? Uh, from Hyper-V 2019 to Azure Stack HCI uh, 20 H2 Live Migrate or even replicate your VM, it's 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 blocking some or it makes it, let it put it that way, it makes it much harder to move your workload to the new world, yeah, the new, new stuff. If you have 100 or even 50 or 500 VMs at customers, it takes a long time because it's an offline process. Yeah. Yes, un unfortunately, um, the migration process, there's there's some additional friction that technically, you know, doesn't have to be there, but unfortunately we have to deal with uh, more than than technically. It's you know what it's 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 business business requirements as well. And from a business requirement standpoint, we cannot live migrate between the two products. It's basically crossing the streams and I'm not going to get into specifically legal reasons, but basically live migration between Windows Server and Azure Stack HCI. There's a reason that's in there and it's basically it's a business reason. We are working very hard to make sure that we can make that migration process as easy as possible to minimize downtime, but unfortunately there are some constraints that we have to live with. So hopefully it's a it's a one time process. You get them over there and then you're in the new world and everything is fantastic, but I understand that there's friction. Very sorry about that, um, but it's Honestly, this is an area where kind of our hands are chied from an engineering standpoint and we have to follow business rules. So that's kind of where yeah. we're at. We're at. And, and yeah, to add and, a, oh, go on, go on, Carsten, sorry. No, 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 go on. I, I, I was at another question. Go on, uh, Matt. It was just to add a little bit of extra context of, um, of what we've seen, and it is an unfortunate circumstance, but what we've seen uh, many customers have success with is in, in some cases using their backup technologies that they're very familiar with, you know, a backup from uh, 2019 Hyper-V, a restoration onto uh, Azure Stack HCI. It doesn't negate the in-place changes that you may need to make to roll out HCI onto potentially the same hardware. So there's extra considerations there. But if you were doing a from A to B and both were stood up at the same time, a backup and restoration from from one platform to the other is is feasible and in many cases quicker than some of the alternatives out there. We do provide some scripted guidance as well in our docs to move from Hyper-V to Azure Stack HCI, but it does involve an element of downtime. Long term, it wouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that Azure Migrate being our company's focus as, from a migration perspective at both VM and app layers, database and more, is where we're investing our energies to make as rich and as seamless and as automatable and as scalable solution to shift from both alternative hypervisor platforms and legacy hypervisor platforms to Azure Stack HCI. So that's where our focus is uh, is going forward. And I would like to add to this, uh, what I'm planning to do is, uh, as I finished all of these scenarios I was presenting today, the next scenario I would like to focus at is uh, how to migrate from Windows Server to Azure Stack HCI. So I have two options or maybe three options that I would like to try with MS Labs. So basically one option will be that you will replace operating system. So basically shut down the host, replace operating system, turn on the host, um, and then import the metadata from the disk. So it will see all the virtual disk. You will just run a script, rename it to correct names and import all the VMs. So this would be one approach and then other approach, uh, either copy item uh, from one cluster to another cluster and then importing it one by one, one machine by one machine. Uh, and then another, maybe I'll try some quick migration or something like that if, if it will work, right? Or maybe I'll just explore it as what kind of uh, issues you will see if we'll just try it. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, we had several sim uh, similar questions from the audience regarding SCVMM, so System Center Virtual Machine Manager and Windows Admin Center. And the, the, the question was always, what's the future of both products? Because it seems System Center Virtual Machine Manager is there, but it's not really uh, evolving. We don't have so much new features. Um, and Windows Admin Center is the tool, but in Windows Admin Center, on the other hand, there are some features missing that are in the System Center Virtual Machine Manager. And we got this uh, question in, um, in, this, in this scenario several times. Can anybody say something about this? What's the roadmap? I think mainly of System Center Virtual Machine Manager and the comparison to Windows Admin Center. I can so, discuss that a bit, if, unless Jeff, unless you want to take some. Matt, you go right ahead. Can you hear me? I'm yes. Myself yes. Back. Sorry. Um, uh, so one way to think about VMM, absolutely, it's it's still there and, and it's been recently updated to support Azure Stack and HCI and, and that will, I think that evolution of supporting newer builds and operating systems will, will continue. Um, that said, you also identified that some of the new, it's not getting many new capabilities and new features. And I think that's a reflection of where customers are looking to change the management approach for managing a modern hybrid infrastructure like Azure Stack HCI. And you'll see a lot of our investments from a management perspective in HCI. Absolutely for local management, Windows Admin Center is getting more and more capabilities, more and more rich extensions. We've recently enhanced more capabilities around SDN. There's obviously been hybrid pieces uh, built in and weaved in, in in terms of onboarding HCI into other Azure services. But where a lot of the focus is going is gelling that with Azure Arc, such that uh, deploying new workloads from Arc becomes streamlined and easy, monitoring those clusters, applying updates, uh, policies, all of those things uh, are very much Arc focused. And that's not to say that VMN disappears, but far from it. Again, no announcements or anything, but more specifically, that's where the focus, I think, of leveling the control plane up into the cloud but still bringing Windows Admin Center enhancements in for, for organizations who, who want to have that local like management experience as well. And Jeff, if you've got anything to add there. Yeah, you, you know, and I, I think you nailed it pretty well there, Matt. I think the thing I would add to that is, again, if I go back to what we're hearing from customers right now is people love the fact that they register their Azure Stack HCI and boom, it's there in Azure. And it's like, wow, I didn't need to like <clears throat> do any sort of special magic or any PowerShell scripts. It's just I click the register button and it's there. And once you start, once you've spoken with a customer who even has a few sites, I mean, it can be as little as, look, I got four sites around the city, but all of a sudden now I'm at home doing remote work and I can actually see all of those different without actually having to drive to any one of those to actually do the legwork to do this remotely. Boy, I would love to be able to do even more from Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, I'm going to apply policy. I'm going to do setup updates. I'm going to set up monitoring. But boy, you know, I'd like to be able to also, you know, do VM management. I'd be like to be able to create VMs and stuff like that. And so, you know, we are seeing as more and more people get used to con the control plane there, we're starting to see now a, a whole, you know, swath of feature requests for things that we do from the Azure portal. So we're starting to do that. We've also continued our WAC integration, and I have to say it's been awesome. You know, I logged into, I logged into um, the Azure Stack HCI days, and one of the first comments I heard from one of the presenters was, I think it was the, L the Lenovo gentleman was saying, "Look, I know you've seen WAC and you're sick and tired of it." I'm like, "Yes." That is music to my ears. Uh, you know that that that's been the plan is to make Windows Admin Center ubiquitous, and it's just uh, it's it is it is a it is a standard part of everybody's arsenal. And now it's in the Azure portal, and we're doing we've been integrated in even further, and we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming on with WAC very very soon. You're going to see, um, but it's also to make management easier so that you can better manage your Azure Stack HCI's or your Windows servers from anywhere. And so, you know, we look at this as having a rich set of tools for you guys to all use so you can be successful managing, especially since remote work is is that much more important these days. So. Can I also well, comment on this a little bit? Um, so uh, I always see all of these three products, right? And you have a Windows Admin Center, you have Virtual Machine Manager, and now you have Arc. So Virtual Machine Manager is especially focused on uh, having multiple clusters 
running solely VMs, right? Nothing else because you need to provision VMs. You need to uh, control what VLANs each VM will connect to, what are the subnets, where you have different data centers. So for this, the virtual machine manager is awesome. It's really fast. You can have 1000 VMs in one VU, but it's only about VMs. While the Windows Admin Center is more or less about one cluster. If you if you ask more customer that has two node cluster or you know two two node cluster, that the Windows Admin Center is is perfect. And then Azure Arc is somehow mixed between these two. It will enable you to consume new Azure services, and also hopefully in the future you will be able to manage at scale, right? With less details focused on a VM. So Virtual Machine Manager will be be still there for managing the VM's workload, traditional data center. I would say and and the other thing I would add is is and Windows Admin Center <clears throat> is about helping you what's running inside the guest as well. And so you know VMM is managing your VMs, but if I need to get inside there, like I need to configure my file server, you know, things like that, whether it's in Azure IaaS or whether it's on my Azure Stack HCI or wherever Windows Admin Center is, wherever your Windows server is, Admin Center can help you manage within the guest as well, too. So there's that as well. Yep, and there's still PowerShell, right? So we can do all of this. And absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so good for I, exploring features and then everything else you can do with the PowerShell scale and that's the 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 tool to for everyone uh, for every IT admin that wants to manage things at scale. What what so, I would add um, to that? Sorry, sorry, Carsten, just to quickly. No, go on, go on, Matt. Jump, I, I was. Uh, what I would add to that is if you are using VMM, if you enjoy using VMM, and there's a feature that you cannot let go if there's something you have to have before you potentially transition to admin center or arc or both let us know you know because if there's something that you want it's probably something that others want as well so we would love to hear from you and 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 start the ball rolling and potentially bringing that to market in one of the two appropriate solutions as we go forward we can sync matt i think we can sync together with artem on all of these guys uh yeah definitely there are many so things one, that one of emm is great for Sorry, guys, one, one of the biggest asks that I see coming from customers that's kind of sorely missing is that role based access control access to the VMs and driving that down and you know just in time VM access is great, but having the ability to have it like that same seamless experience that you have with VMM. That's huge for organizations to be able to drill down and say, OK, this department gets access to these VMs. This department gets access to these VMs. You can start stop, but you can't you can't you know whatever. And those those are that's such a huge request. Every customer I come to has that. And so I think as you look at Azure Arc extensions into Azure Stack HCI, other platforms cross cloud and having the ability to control that management plane, that's going to be huge. And when that comes, then I think you're going to see a bigger separation between VMM and uh, and the, the other tools that are available. But that's kind of where customers are stuck with VMM right now. S self service is a critical feature. Yeah. Good to hear. Yes. Absolutely. Hey, hey, Karsten. Karsten, I don't mean to hijack this. I know I know where it's 840. Uh, what I, I'm, I'm going to be starting soon, but there's one topic I wanted to bring up real quickly, if I, I could. Do, um, do. And, and this is about saving money. So uh, we were talking about licensing earlier, and I took a note, and I forgot oh, Jeff, to mention wait, this. Wait, 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 Jeff, 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 yes. wait. Uh, let me ask my question, but I, I think it's, it's a comp perfect answer for that. OK. So my question would be, why should a customer go to Azure Stack HCI? What is, in your opinion, and maybe multiple of you guys can answer, uh, but Jeff first, what is, in your opinion, uh, the advantage over server uh, storage base, uh, storage bases direct in Windows Server 2019? There, there are advantages, and I think uh, your, your example where you are going to is examples, right? There are a lot of reasons, but I'm going to give you one that everybody is missing. <clears throat> and, and I bring this up because Dave actually made a comment about this, how, how, how everyone is you know, a few versions behind, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four versions behind Windows Server. OK, super important point, ESUs. I cannot stress this enough. I've been tweeting about this uh, last few weeks. I have run into multiple customers. I'm not killing, kidding here. They're spending upwards of millions of dollars on ESUs. I want you I want I'm, think about that for just a second. Explain ESU. Paying. ESUs are extended security updates and that's for Windows Server 2008, that's for Windows Server 2008 or 2. And we also announced that when 2012 and 22 are, are, are 2, we are going to make ESUs available as well. If you're running in Azure, Azure property, 
you get ESUs for 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2 for free. It's all included. If you're running on premises, which a lot of these folks are saying, no, it's really, really old. It's still running on 08, 08 R2, and we're, you know, it's gateway and firewalled and VPN, and it's way behind many, many layers of network defense. So we're going to keep running on our premises because we just haven't gotten around to upgrading yet, but we need support. We need security updates. So they're paying crazy sums of money for this. Here's the thing. Azure Stack HCI includes those ESUs for free. So if your customer is paying, forget millions of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars are ESUs, there's a very simple question you can ask them. Would you A, like to write a very big check to get ESUs? Or B, would you like to call up your partners over at Lenovo or Data On or HPE or Dell or Fujitsu, buy a brand new Azure Stack HCI solution with that same spend, get brand new hardware, and get all the ESUs included for free? Okay, this is like an intelligence test. Okay, you can get free hardware, or you can run the same stuff on your existing really old stuff uh, and pay for those ESUs. So I cannot stress this enough because I have had so many conversations where the where literally the virtual the conference just stopped and a director of IT you could see like almost went shades of white because he realized he could have bought like a rack or two of new hardware. And in one case, I ran into a customer that I could have purchased, and I actually spec'd it out for them, four four-node Azure Stack HCI clusters, all flash. And they could have retired a whole bunch of ancient hardware. So to me, that is the sleeper feature that nobody is getting. And it's really important. So I just wanted to mail that. Everybody on the call, make sure you understand that. When a customer says, if you if you see 2008 and 2008 R2 and 2012 in their infrastructure, stop them and say, are you paying for ESUs? Let's get you some free hardware. Because it can really be a huge benefit. Okay, I'm done. I'm off my soapbox I, now. I got one more <laughs> more question, actually, if, if we have time. One of the discussions we have is like, like I love S2D. I love Azure Stack HCI. I'm really convinced that it's a great solution. But uh, unfortunately, not everybody in the world agrees with me. And some people have other storage needs and they feel a bit left behind. So they're like, either we make that jump and go for that one storage solutions to rule them all, or we are we are getting left behind. So they're struggling a bit with that aspect of the story. Can you can you address this a little bit? So I'm I'm assuming by storage you mean traditional SAN. Or yeah, I, I scuzzy, whatever, 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 whatever. Let's 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 call it everything that is not Azure Stack HEI, right? Let's be sure. let's be very clear. It's it it can be it can be convert storage or hybrid convert storage, but it's not Azure Stack HCI. So I I, w I will tell you, and I I'm, I'd love to hear from you guys about this as well. I, I'm I'm genuinely curious about this. But the conversations I've had with most customers over the last couple of years has been about retiring those sands. Um, a lot of people are on old fiber channel sands or heaven forbid old iSCSI stuff, and they kind of look at it as that's that thing that those storage guys run that's really, really expensive, that uses their own set of processes, uses their own set of tools, and it's really, really difficult and painful and super expensive. And so we don't want to do that anymore. And so that's predominantly what I hear. Every so often, though, I will run into a very, and it's usually a really large corporation or like a government that will say, look, we've been doing SANS for 20 years and we're just comfortable with it. Okay. Okay, well, if you want to do your SANS, okay, then yeah, guess what? Not much has really changed there. I mean, we can still take advantage of Fiber Channel. We can still take advantage of iSCSI. And if you want to hook that up to, you know, you know, your servers, you can go right ahead and party on. But at the moment, that's not where our customers are leading us right now. So yes, it's there. The documentation exists. We haven't done anything to deprecate it or remove it or, or change it. But at the same time, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of innovation. I mean, we got NICs now, you know, RDMA NICs that are 100, 200, 400, and we're working on terabit Ethernet. And, you know, Fiber Channel still talking around 1632 and, you know, 64 gigabit and whee, it's super crazy expensive. So, you know, and and I guess the other the other last thing I would point out is when it comes to storage, you know, the beauty of flash storage and NVMe and Optane and all of these ridiculous things we've been doing with flash storage has been the goal is to move the storage as close as possible to the CPU. And the moment, you know, you start 
pushing it out, you know, over a fabric or stuff like that, you've kind of shot the performance benefits because now you're limited by the speed of that fabric, where in many cases it can be sitting right next to the processor in the chassis. And so that's one of the really nice things about hyperconverged is the performance, the performance, you know, it, it's it, it's crazy the types of performance you've seen. But again, I'd be curious to know from you guys, are you guys seeing similar um, discussions about, you know, people, you know, kind of retiring the old sands and, and that type of thing? And if not, you know, how would you characterize those customers that are still using these large storage uh, devices? I can I can I can give you some input because I'm working also with with large enterprises and these guys love their SAN systems. Everything that is not a SAN is not storage. It's uh, it's something to play with, but not for production. So there are there's not in in this type of enterprises the storage guys don't involve a lot. They love fiber channels, they love SAN, and they want to retire with it even if they are only 40 yet. So uh, not not much innovation there. Yeah, the, the, other, the other thing I see is that, I mean, it's not just about the sands and the ice cubes. There are other, other storage options out there, and some people have heavily invested in that and have moved to that. So they modernized, but to a different platform, let's put it that way. And now they have this thing like, yeah, where are we in this? Uh, that's another that's another discussion. So I wouldn't I wouldn't only point to let's say the people that are like I want to. You'll get my sand when you buy it for my cold dead hands. You know, there's there's <laughs> yes. a there's a yeah. different uh, public that has some challenges or explanations to do to their management as to look we we just made this very nice move to very modern hyperconverged storage, but now we'd like to move to to Azure Stack HCI. Okay. So, it's not it's not just the laggers let's let's put it that way i can i can add to that because for for many guys it's scary the hyperconverged infrastructure is all in one so you have the same servers for storage for virtualization you have some demand in network maybe rdma so that's really scary for a lot of people before that they have they had their clear part so they were doing either virtualization or storage and you have your network guys. But nowadays, I often see in companies, in bigger ones, if it's not ZAN, they say, oh, it's uh, it's Windows Server. Uh, it, this is now not, not a ZAN, that's not our part. Virtualization guys do this networking. We, we also uh, often have a lot of trouble. So the virtualization guys, the Windows guys, they have to do storage as well. And they they are not comfortable with that. So that's that's uh, that's something that is, holding back, in my opinion, uh, HCI, and it's not only uh, Microsoft HCI, it's HCI everywhere, because wow. you have your clear uh, silos, or you had your clear silos, and now everything is meshed together. And I'll, I'll, I'll be very clear about that, Carson. Silos are a choice. Even, no matter what technology you use, silos are a choice, and you have to pay the price for your choices. And of either course. You, you get with the program, or you don't, and if you don't want to get with the program, you you could silo up your Azure Stack HCI deployment, right? If you want, if you really want to, you can do that. If that's so if I that's want... your major concern, I'm I'm like, you know what? Throw away some of the benefits and go full silo on this thing. You can so, if you want to. I, I wouldn't recommend so, it. Uh, but I want but. to come back to to my initial question before we uh, drifted to this one. Uh, one feature from all of you. Um, why to choose Azure Stack HCI? What is your preferred feature? I heard it from Jeff already. It's the extended use rights. So maybe uh, every other one of you has maybe something to add. Why is Azure Stack HCI a good choice over storage basis direct? I, have I know my thing, pick, right? but first you. Can I? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so my favorite one is that you have integrated system. It means that you have support from Microsoft. And it will just, you know, we will call it uh, B. <laughs> Microsoft will, sorry, still used to call me, we, Microsoft. Sorry, not yet, not anymore. Uh, so you have one point of contact. That's that's the thing. I remember times when um, it was like, no, 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 it's not our fault. It's uh, OEM manufacturer fault. No, 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 OEM told us, no, no, it's a Hyper-V fault. And it was like a ping pong, right? Then I remember issues with the drivers, like com various combination with the sand. So you had a sand, it was more or less unique in the world because you have you had some kind of, uh, you know, 
blades chassis with the blade server with this and this nick and with this and that switch and you had this and that fiber channel card with this and that sun and it was so many combinations so you most likely hit some crazy issue with latencies and it was go uh, you know it was ghost and and mm -hmm. you were not able to troubleshoot it correctly and customers were completely completely lost so your, so your now, pick is easy easy of choice the easy of the support so easy of the support one, one contact. drivers one yeah. pack for the drivers and you, okay. know, you can forget i would add to that so it, because it's it's fitting here i would add to that the cost of support to to get an uh, supported support in an azure stack hci solution it's the azure support and there are fixed prices for that so for 100 dollar per month you get your azure subscription supported and it doesn't matter if there is one uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster in there or five or even more, you get the support for all of them for $100. And if you compare that to the same level support from Microsoft, if you have Windows Server, um, you have to have a support contract uh, because the 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 call the the incident based support will not help you in, in that depth than uh, than the uh, Azure support. So you have to have a support contract, and that is multiple ten thousands of dollars per year. So that that's my favorite. But other guys, please. So maybe Dave. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Karsten. So I would say that my favorite is the direction that we're heading towards the self-service management, the just-in-time VM access, and uh, also the, the security integrations through Azure Arc and Azure Defender. Those are so huge for organizations today because we always talk about standing up the fresh infrastructure and what everything looks like in a sunny day. Nobody ever wants to you know, dive down the rabbit hole of when a threat actor gets into your infrastructure. And so being able to protect that and being proactive on that is absolutely huge. And so having that almost immediately integratable, it's, that's, that's, those are big ones for me. Okay, so we have three minutes left. Helmut, Manfred, you will, you will be last. <laughs> Helmut. <laughs> I would be, I, I'm totally with Dave, but uh, on a more general purpose. So the, the whole hybrid story behind it is, is the main point. So it's it's a whole story about how can I go hybrid, uh, keep parts on premise and go to the cloud and uh, everything is is like it's it's in one architecture. And OK, yeah. so thanks so much. So we go to Didier, then to Matt and uh, then uh, Helmut will finish, and then uh, I think Jeff will start his session. Well, I'm I'm very much on board with all the the innovations they're doing to improve on the existing capabilities of S2D. So that's where I want to be. I, I want I want to move ahead. So for me, that's that's one of the major reasons to do what uh, to do Azure Stack HCI. Okay, thanks, Didier. Matt, I, I I think I know what what your favorite is. Well, you might be surprised. I'm, I'm going to be greedy and choose two, actually, because I love GPUs. And I think the work we're doing with GPU uh, in the 21H2, so that's currently well, in preview, well. <laughs> um, that I think is incredibly innovative and opens up new scenarios for organizations at the edge and the data center and so on. So cluster GPUs, moving workloads more flexibly and, and taking advantage of that. The other one, which I think is cool, What's the hardest thing that people struggle with setting up uh, infrastructure in the data center? It's networking. So the network ATC stuff that's coming in around really using a more declarative approach to defining the network uh, is, I think, a, a game changer is overused, but I think it's it's incredibly uh, important. So I was betting, and Manfred, I think, the, was doing the same. We uh, we are betting on AKS on Azure <laughs> HCI, but well, yeah, that's also. Awesome I love well. your other answer. Answer. So Manfred, yeah. <laughs> so you, you have still your favorite. It will be the last one, yes, but yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to steal your one. No, no, I have. So, I say I have said my ah, support okay. because I support lost my bet about you because I would have said your favorite is stretch clustering. Because it's also a great oh, there is something like that. But my <laughs> one is uh, my one is the as a service concept. So for me, I think it's really great to have Azure Stack HCI um, as an as a service concept. So we have the pay per use model, and we receive the new version, so we can ensure that the customer 
is always enabled to use the latest technology. So this is my favorite. And I have to add a stretch cluster, of course. Yeah. It's all I'm doing with yeah. Azure Stack HD, you know, I know. OK, thanks, guys, so much. And uh, excuse to the audience, I couldn't keep up with the questions. And I was seeing that some questions were asked, uh, answered in the chat by the speakers. So thanks so much for doing this, guys. It was. Uh, it, it was great having so much opinions and so much knowledge here. And now we go over to to Jeff's. Uh, what's new in Windows Server 2022? I'm, and I'm looking forward to that. Jeff, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Let me share a screen here. And just to uh, actually preserve a little bandwidth here because I have kids and school and my wife's a professor and will be teaching. I'm going to turn off my live video just to uh, so okay, I will uh, turn your slides to full screen as soon as they are available. There they are. All right. Can you so see Jeff, them? I heard in the US, uh, internet is always great. Isn't that true? Internet sorry, is sorry. Uh, <laughs> go on. Uh, it, it, you know, so we have we have limits on upload and I have kids doing school and they have to have their cameras on for school and my wife's a professor. So there's a lot of upload and I just I, I figured you guys are going to be focused on slides anyway. So thank you everyone. I just I just want to give a huge shout out to Karsten and Manfred and the entire team. Um, this whole Azure Stack HCI days is, is just really brilliant. It really is fantastic. It's wonderful to get the community together. It's great to hear from everybody. And I was kind of watching some of the comments going through in the chat window and they were coming through fast and furious and we were you know, trying to keep up as fast as we can. Um, I know this is Azure Stack HCI days. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about Server 2022. And look, I, I get that you know there are a lot of questions about, hey, you know what? Things are changing here and help me understand what's changing and we'll get through this change together and it'll all be good. Um, but I, I'm very excited quite honestly about what's new in Windows Server 2022 because we have been so focused on a bazillion things. We've all been very heads down working through the pandemic. We've all been working remotely. I know it's been a challenge to everybody and there are different companies and different organizations in different places in, in terms of, you know, you know, their their abilities from an organizational standpoint. Um, as Dave and a few others mentioned, you know, not everybody's on the latest version of Windows Server. Um, I've run into way too many people that are just getting to 2016 or just getting their first 2019s deployed. And it's just like, yeah, and what's the majority? Well, the majority of our stuff is still on 2012 R2. And so, you know, there there is a lot of innovation that's waiting to be, you know, just consumed in those those newer versions, but there's still a lot that we're doing in Windows Server 2022. And 2022 is, you know, let's let's be very clear here. You know, there's a lot of things that we are focused on, but these really are driven by your requirements. So, you know, Windows Server 2022, it's about running your business critical workloads and it's about running everywhere. It's about running in Azure, on premises, on premises, on premises, and I'm just seeing it a few times, and at the edge. Because everybody seems to be, you know, un under the under the under the guise that, you know, we say hybrid, which means for some reason that we're ignoring on premises, and that's not the case. Um, our goal is to create the best of both worlds. We know that folks are moving stuff to Azure, and we know that a bunch of things are staying on premises. And that's great. That's fine. That's absolutely part of our strategy and has been since day one. Um, but it also means that on premises, we've got to, you know, make sure that we're doing the things that are, you know, that are important to you. Things like advanced multi-layer security, where we want to elevate the security posture of your environments on premise or, or wherever it's reside and doing that with the OS. Um, it's also with hybrid capabilities. We want to make sure that we can extend to the cloud for greater IT efficiency. We also want to make sure that you're getting the best of both worlds. If you have an on-premises file server, and, and there's probably a good reason you have it there. Maybe it's data sovereignty, maybe it's performance, maybe it's latency, but it also means we can make it better. We can give you bottomless storage. We can give you hot tiering. We can give you all sorts of capabilities that make that file server better because it's connected to Azure. Um, it's a flexible application platform. You know, Windows Server is used by millions of organizations and hundreds of millions of deployments of Windows Server out there to run apps. And yes, it's SQL, it's SharePoint, it's Exchange, but it's all the apps that our customers have written over the last couple of decades, and they love that flexible application platform, and they also expect it to modernize for new applications. 
container based applications, cloud based applications. And so there's, you know, having a flexible application platform is, is 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 a key critical scenario of windows server and then finally of course we want to help you evolve your organization with new uh, azure innovation for windows server so let's we're going to cover each one of these let's get started with multi-layer security so we've been hearing from customers all around the world you know ransomware keeps us up nights we don't want to be next we understand that concern a recent IDC survey finds that more than one third of organizations worldwide have experienced a ransomware attack or breach. And it, it's more than that. Here's another recent article where dozens of hospitals and clinics are canceling surgeries and diverting ambulances because ransomware attacks have knocked out access to virtually all their operations. This kind of stuff honestly makes me sick. I mean, I can't believe that, you know, when hospitals can't service patients because literally, they're, they're held hostage by bad actors around the world. These security threats, they are constant, they are costly. Here's a couple of other examples from just a few months in 2020. In February 2020, over 142 million personal records from guests at a resort hotel were found on the dark web. In April 2020, 112,000 employees and patients from a medical uh, a hospital were compromised. In July of 2020, 450,000 residents of Polk County had their driver's license and social security numbers exposed in an attack. To put this in perspective, the average cost of a data breach is about $3.62 million, and we know that's just only rising, and it's really just scratching the service. At Microsoft, we have a strategy. It's to protect, it's to defend, and it's to prevent. Protect with hardware root of trust, defend against firmware level attacks, and prevent access to unverified code. So let's start with firmware protection. 83% of all businesses have experienced a firmware attack in the past two years. And the goal of firmware attacks is really simple. Let's get in, let's attack the system before the OS is even started and implant malware. So let's take a look at one of these attacks and actually what it looks like in detail. So here's an anatomy of the Robinhood ransomware. Robinhood ransomware is distributed as a packaged executable that contains multiple binaries. One of these files is a gigabyte driver. It's gdrv.sys. This driver has a vulnerability that can allow elevation of privilege and this enables the bad guys to gain kernel privileges and then disable kernel mode signing to facilitate the loading of an unsigned driver. The unsigned malicious driver is then used to disable security products from the kernel. The Robinhood ransomware then goes on to encrypt files and demand ransom from the victims. Now, Robinhood is not an isolated threat leveraging a vulnerable driver to achieve this elevation of privilege. In fact, the last two years, the Defender ATP research team has seen a rise in the use of vulnerable drivers by adversaries, ranging from commodity malware to nation state level attacks. Now, this may sound pretty awful, but the good news is we have a solution and we actually have proof of its effectiveness already. And that's with Secured Core PC, which we've been shipping now for some time. Secured Core PCs provide more than twice the protection against infection. That's why we're introducing Secured Core Server with Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server 2022. A Secured Core Server is a modern device that comes with the highest level of hardware, software, and identity protection ready right out of the box. So with Secured Core Server, it means it protects boot up with hardware root of trust. Secured Core Servers use industry standard hardware root of trust coupled with security capabilities built in today's modern CPUs. With Secured Core Server, it defends against firmware level attack. Secured Core Servers use hardware rooted security in the modern CPU to launch the system into a trusted state, preventing advanced malware from tampering with the system and attacking it at the firmware level. With Secured Core System, it also prevents access to unverified code. So once the CPU is brought up safely, the OS takes control. Hypervisor enforced code integrity ensures that all code in the OS kernel is trustworthy. And to help raise awareness, we're making Secure Core security obvious and visible with Windows Admin Center. And I'm so glad to hear that folks are using it. It's become a regular tool in your toolbox. And we're going to highlight these new security features and work together to make these Secure Core safeguards the new normal for servers. 
So we've talked about firmware, we've talked about compute and memory. Those are just a few aspects of security. Now let's switch gears and discuss network protection, starting with transport layer security or TLS. Now TLS is a widely adopted security protocol. You're all using it designed to enable privacy and data security for communications over the internet. It's truly, it's, it's literally a fundamental building block of networking security. TLS is used to encrypt communication between web apps and servers like browsers loading a website, and it's also used to encrypt things like email, messaging, and VoIP. Windows Server 20 2022 uses the latest version TLS 1.3. Now TLS 1.3 has two big benefits. First, security. Many of the major vulnerabilities in TLS 1.2 had to do with older cryptographic algorithms that were still supported. TLS 1.3 drops support for these well-known and vulnerable algorithms, such as RSA key transport, which doesn't provide forward secrecy, CBC mode ciphers, which are vulnerable to Beast and Lucky 13 attacks, RC4 stream cipher, which is not secure for use in HTTPS, arbitrary Diffie-Hellman groups, CVE 2016, as well as export ciphers that are vulnerable to freak and logjam attacks. So TLS 1.3 says, nope, sorry, we're not gonna allow these. Next, TLS 1.3 is faster. The number of handshakes has been cut in half. And in cases where the client has connected to a website before, the handshake has zero round trips. This makes HTTPS faster and improves the overall user experience. So while we're covering network security, let's cover SMB encryption for your file shares. As I'm sure most everyone here knows, SMB or server message block protocol, it's a network file sharing protocol that allows applications to read and write to files and to request services from server programs over the network. SMB encryption protects against man in the middle attacks. With Windows Server 2022, we've made SMB encryption more secure. 2022 introduces new AES-256 cryptographic suites and will automatically negotiate the more advanced cipher method. With Windows Server 2022, we've made SMB encryption flexible and easy to use. It can be configured per share or for the entire file server. And finally, SMB encryption can be enabled via group policy, PowerShell, or with one click in Windows Admin Center. Next, SMB encryption and SMB Direct. So SMB encryption now supports SMB Direct. So previously enabling encryption disabled direct data placement, and this had a huge performance impact. Well, now <clears throat> data is encrypted before the placement, resulting in security and a massive performance boost. In addition to that performance boost, we also added AES-128 and 256 to raise the security bar as well, which also takes me to our next sweet new SMB feature, SMB compression. I love this feature. Big shout out to the file server team. So SMB compression allows an administrator, user or application to request compression of files as they transfer over the network. Compressed files consume less network bandwidth and take less time to transfer at the cost of slightly increased CPU usage during transfers. You probably won't even notice it. A common scenario we're tacking, tackling is copying virtual machines. These files are pretty usually large and compressible. Let's show you a test we ran. So in this test, we copied a 20 gigabyte virtual hard disk from a Windows 11 client to a Windows Server 2022 file server. Without SMB compression, this took 2 minutes and 43 seconds or 163 seconds. With SMB compression, it took 28 seconds or almost six times faster and consumed significantly less network bandwidth. So your network folks will be pretty happy with that. And of course, it, to enable SMB compression, you can use group policy, PowerShell, or enable it with one checkbox in Windows Admin Center. SMB compression requires Windows 11 clients and Windows Server 2022 file servers. And by the way, of course, if you're one of those folks still on a really old fire server, 2003 era even, 
or anything you know after that, 2003 R2, 2008, 2008 R2, et cetera, and you need help migrating to Windows, your, your file server to 2022, let me tell you about the new storage migration service in 2022. So the storage migration service can help you modernize your file servers to Windows Server 2022 or migrate to Azure. If you need to keep your file servers on premises, rock on. Use Azure File Sync to centralize your organization's file shares in Azure files while keeping the flexibility, performance, and compatibility of an on-premises file server. So with Azure File Sync, this transforms your Windows file server into a hot cache of your Azure file share. This means the hot data your organization using is locally available. It's right there on the network. You're not going up to the cloud. It's super, super fast. While the cold data is transparently tiered to the cloud. This means your on-prem file server is virtually bottomless. Well, with Windows Server 2022, the storage migration service can now migrate from NatApp FAS systems to Windows servers or Windows server clusters in the cloud or on-premises as well. So, <clears throat> I, I heard S2D mentioned many times, people talking about you know, how they love S2D and how they love the innovation there. And in fact, you know, honestly, I've heard feedback like that a lot. In fact, one of the things we've heard is this, S2D rocks, the performance caching and tiering are awesome, but you know, it would be great if you could use this in a single node environment for test dev. You know what? You're right. Boom, baby. That's why we're introducing Windows Server 2022 single node caching and tiering. What we're doing is bringing the storage bus layer technology that we've had from S2D to a single node. So with Windows Server 2022 single node caching and tiering, there are some huge benefits. Number one, it's great for your random IO workloads. And so the scenarios, SQL development, container development, or even a file server synced with Azure File Sync. So what we're doing here is we're taking the, the, the many benefits we learn from S2D in a clustered environment, and we're bringing these to a single node. For example, again, random IO workloads, because it's using SSDs for intelligent caching, it's great for SQL, for container, or even a file server if you're using Azure File Sync for a backup, um, as a backup uh, DR. Now, it is very important to understand this is a single node. This is one server. This is not a high availability solution. Let me repeat, this is a single node. This is not a high availability solution. In fact, I'd recommend a battery backup as well. If you need HA, use S2D and a failover cluster. However, for dev, for home labs, or uses with proper backups and DR, this can be an awesome solution. This requires Windows Server standard or data center and two drive types, like an SSD and a traditional hard drive or an NVMe and a traditional hard drive. So let's kind of explain this a little bit further. So this solution is a mix of both tiers and caching. The combination of tiering and caching improves random read performance as data is read from the parity tier and cached on the faster mirror tier. We recommend using a portion of the SSD as a mirror tier in a mirror accelerated parity configuration. This is for fast writes to the SSD. The other portion of the SSD is used as a read cache using our storage bus layer SBL technology. Now by default, 15% of the SSD is used for the cache. This way, both read and writes are hitting the SSDs. So let's talk about each one of these. We've got writes and reads and reads here. Let's talk about this, you know, this description a little bit more. Let's start with writes. When a write operation occurs, it lands on the mirror tier. Once the mirror tier fills up to 80%, we start rotating down to parity. That's why you see there's a little clock here. It's because we have to calculate the parity as we rotate and we destage to the parity, the hard disk tier. Now, there are two really huge benefits here. Number one, the write is occurring to SSD, and so it's really, really fast. Number two, when the data is destaged to the parity tier, it's done sequentially, which is optimal for hard drives. So two really huge benefits. Next, we have reads. With read operations, the read is cached from the parity tier. So while the first read comes from the hard disk, subsequent reads are cached from the mirror tier, and again, 
much, much faster and not hitting the spinning disk. Now, you may be wondering, hmm, is there anything new here in 2022? Can't I do this in 2019? Yeah, absolutely, you cannot do this with 2019. There is a whole bunch of new things that are here architecturally and new logic that's in here that's specifically for 2022. What's key to this new scenario is that we've adopted critical portions of S2D to work in a standalone server, like the storage bus layer, SBL, and some others. Here's the another big difference. If you use standalone mirror accelerated parity without the SBL cache, for example, we don't rotate data from the parity tier back into the faster mirror tier. And without this, performance would be, let me describe it as especially painful on random read performance, i.e. it would tank. And so a major reason, and, and, and this is a major reason why it required a whole bunch of new innovation, development, and new features that are delivered in 2022. Once the data is rotated out of mirror to parity, it stays there. And now with the SBL cache, we can cache data from the parity tier for faster, i.e. ridiculous read performance. Finally, one other thing, you may be wondering how many SSDs are required there in the mirror tier? So technically you could get by with one, but you don't get any resiliency with that. So we do not recommend that. Um, two SSDs are recommended at a minimum so you get resiliency at the mirror tier. So um, one last note about single node caching and tiering. And this, I wanna make sure I cover this because it, it, it may look a little odd as you're reading the documentation. Um, the server must have the failover cluster feature enabled. However, the server cannot be a member of a failover cluster. Now this may sound odd, but remember how I told you that we've adapted parts of storage spaces direct specifically for this scenario. Well, those components are part of the failover cluster feature. That's why it must be enabled. However, it cannot be part of a failover cluster. If you're looking for a tutorial, we have a complete PowerShell tutorial at docs.microsoft.com. Um, I'll drop a link um, in, the, in the chat window shortly. Uh, this is all delivered via PowerShell. Um, yes, we are looking into figuring and considering what an admin center uh, experience would be, but this is all delivered via PowerShell. Next, um, you know, we've been talking about TLS, I've been talking about SMP encryption, I've been talking about compression, I've been talking about security. I also want to point out that Windows Server 2022 takes full advantage of the latest CPU advancements. So with 2022, it takes advantage of the latest third generation AMD Epic processors, third generation Intel, Intel Xeon scalable processors. You get higher workload performance designed for flexibility at scale, new cryptographic acceleration, as well as advanced security capabilities. I also know that there are many diehard folks that are still running SQL Server on bare metal. I always run into them and hey, I get it. You, you guys are pushing the limits of compute and memory and just wanna let you know, for, folks, we have raised the bar again. Windows Server 2022 supports up to 48 terabytes of RAM, of memory, and up to 2,048 logical processors per physical host. That is not a typo. Uh, it's 48 terabytes of RAM and up to 2048 logical processors. This all came because Azure needed all of these things. And so guess what? We just made sure that we dropped this into Windows Server as well. Um, so we got you covered that. And while we're talking about CPUs, I also want to highlight the fact that Windows Server 2022 Hyper-V also adds nested Hyper-V virtualization support for AMD Epic and Ryzen processors. So if you want nested support with AMD Epic and Ryzen, the host must be Windows Server 2022 or Windows 11. The guest can be any supported guest. It doesn't matter what the guest is, uh, but the host has to be 2022 or Windows 11. And with nested Hyper-V, that means you can run Hyper-V and Hyper-V. This is great for test dev and labs. It also means, you know, nested Hyper-V not only means VMs, but if you want to run containers with Hyper-V isolation, we got you covered there as well. I also want to point out there's, you know, nested nested virtualization is definitely one of those interesting things. And I the probably the, the use case I've seen the most over the years has been for test dev and labs. I also want to remind people that when you do nesting, there are a couple of considerations. First, when Hyper-V is running inside of a virtual machine, just a reminder, 
hot add memory and dynamic memory do not work. You need to shut down the nested VM to change its memory size. This is by design. That's how it works. Um, we're not doing multiple levels of paging. That's that's that would no, we're not doing that. Um, next, in order for network packets to be routed through two virtual switches, MAC address spoofing must be enabled on the first level of the virtual switch. So this is completed with the following PowerShell command, or of course you can just check the checkbox in Windows Admin Center to enable MAC address spoofing. We've got you covered. And of course, if you want to enable nested virtualization on your brand new AMD Epic or Ryzen, there is the checkbox right there in Windows Admin Center. Awesome. All right, so let's get to some cool new things in Windows Server 2022 networking. So 2022 includes some really nice networking performance improvements under the hood. And really a lot of this is brought over from Azure and a lot of this is starting, well, some of this is starting with UDP. So UDP is becoming a very popular protocol carrying more network traffic. Uh, UDP is being used for streaming, gaming protocols. Now there's the new quick protocol built on top of UDP. And this brings performance of UDP to a level on par with TCP which is kind of what's kind of hindered its adoption for a while. Well, with the rise of UDP, we realized it was important that we added UDP segmentation offload, USO, to Windows Server 2022. USO moves most of the work required to send UDP packets from the CPU to the network adapters hardware. And complementing this is UDP receive side coalescing, or UDP RSC, which coalesces packets and reduces CPU usage for UDP processing. Uh, in addition, and I, I literally don't have the laundry list, um, but we've also made hundreds of improvements and optimizations to the UDP, UDP data bath for both transmit and receive. And like I said, I don't have a laundry list, but it's as we've been spending a ton of time looking at this code path, we've been tuning, we've been tweaking, we've been optimizing, and it's just a massive benefit you're gonna get with both Windows Server 2022 and Windows 11. Now, that's UDP. On the TCP side, we've also been collaborating in the industry to optimize performance for high-speed networks. Specifically, Windows Server 2022 uses TCP high start to reduce packet loss during connection startup, especially in the high-speed networks, and RAC TLP or recent, recent acknowledgement tail loss probe to reduce recent retransmit timeouts. And these features are enabled in the transport stack by default they provide a smoother network data flow with better performance at high speed. And this is really important as you start to get to 10 gig, 25, 40, 50, um, where you know, retransmits can be expensive. We wanna go as fast as possible. Well, these new optimizations will actually smooth deliver better performance, better throughput at high speeds. And again, this is simply built into Windows Server 2022 and Windows 11. If you wanna know more, because quite honestly, each one of these has a, some beautiful papers uh, written on them, do a search for TCP High Start Plus Plus and Rack TLP. There's some fantastic documentation written by the standards bodies that explain these in full detail. Finally, um, on the Hyper-V side of the house for networking is the virtual switch. So virtual switches have been enhanced with updated receive segment coalescing RSC. And this allows the hypervisor to network to coalesce packets and processes as a larger segment. CPU cycles are reduced and segments will remain coalesced across the entire data path until processed by the ultimate application. Um, this, this improves, this change improves performance in both network traffic from an external host received by a virtual NIC, as well as from a virtual NIC to another virtual NIC on the same host. So in terms of performance across the board, I wish I could give you hey, here's a percentage advantage, but a lot of this is quite honestly, your mileage will, will, will vary. Um, what's the speed of the network you're on? What type of traffic are you using? Are you using UDP? Are you using TCP, et cetera? The important thing to understand is we've taken a lot of optimizations that we have learned and tuned and tweaked in Azure and in the cloud. We have delivered these in Windows Server 2022, and these help both on the host side as well as in the guest side. 
I also want to point out it's not a huge thing and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it other than to say yes, Windows Server 2022 does include the Edge browser in here. Um, I will tell you I would much prefer you to not use this or to ever even see a UI. I would much pr prefer you use Server Core and manage your servers remotely, but we do know that in some cases where someone has literally a single server, um, they need to have a local um, uh, browser experience and we want to make sure that we provide a secure one. So Windows Server 2022 does include the Edge browser. Um, also, it's a small thing, but I'm quite honestly pleasantly surprised by the number of people who have noticed that sconfig has been rewritten in PowerShell and a number of items that have been subtly updated um, within sconfig. And the goal of sconfig has always been clear. The goal here is to quickly enable a server to get on the network where it could be managed remotely with PowerShell, Admin Center, or whatever your management tool of choice is. So another, another enhancements there. So let's switch gears and start talking about application innovation. So as I mentioned earlier, Windows Server has been there since day one to run your apps, whether you've written your own applications, whether you're using Exchange, SQL, SharePoint, other third-party applications, COTS apps, whatever. We also know that the world is moving to different types of packaging and deployment of applications. We launched containers for Windows and Windows Server 2016. And since then, we have come a long way. Um, you know, as we were developing it, customers said, look, we need we need innovation quickly. These containers are changing. You know, we've got Kubernetes, we've got Docker, we've got all of these different things out there. There's a lot of innovation going on around networking, around storage, and we need Windows Server to keep up with that. So we delivered a rapid set of container releases with 18 months of support. And this innovation occurred in the OS, we partnered with open source projects like Docker, Calico, Flannel, Kubernetes, and the result is quite honestly, we're in a very different place now. And now your feedback has changed. It's changed from, hey, we need a bunch of features to this. Hey, Microsoft, the container features and open source integration is great, but our org has what we need to run containers. Like our apps are deployed, they're running great. The problem is we don't want an 18 month support life cycle. We want this to be a longer lines of you know, LTSC. We want a, a, a longer, longer support life cycle. Well, done. That's why we're introducing five years of container support with Windows Server 2022. And I cannot tell you how many high fives and thank yous we have received already just for this alone. So in addition to that, with Windows Server 2022, we've added a whole bunch of new features like using group managed service accounts without domain joined hosts, run globally scale applications with virtualized time zones, align with, with the industry standard container D, bringing the latest and greatest to Windows containers, enabling consistent network policy implementation across hybrid Kubernetes clusters, IPv6 support for Windows containers, multi subnet support for Kubernetes worker nodes. I mean, we, it's not like we we said, hey, we're going to give you five years of support and nothing else. No, no, we, we've still had our foot down on the gas pedal delivering a ton of container innovation. And of course, one of the biggest things that everyone's always looking at is the container image optimization. Windows Server Core, the 2022 container size has been reduced by another gigabyte. And it still gives you all the compatibility you need, which is what our customers are looking for as they're modernizing their old applications, you know, their .NET, their Java, some of that stuff, and they're and they're bringing it on over to server core. Guess what? We've we've kept all the compatibility, but we've improved performance. We've improved compatibility. We've improved uh, uh, integration with uh, open source container innovation, and we continue to do more there. Then. We also have Windows Server 2022 Nano Server, which, you know, Nano Server is quietly just awesome. So, just as a reminder, Nano Server is a 64 bit only runtime. This was designed for containers, it's less than 100 megabytes. It's optimized and it's hardened for building new cloud apps. And it is quietly very popular. This screenshot came right off Docker Hub. If you look below the Windows logo, you may see there's over 100 million downloads of Nano Server. So Nano Server is this ultra light modern Windows offering for new app development. 
Then we have server core, which is best for your lift and shift Windows Server apps. And we've heard, unfortunately, we still have a gap. And this is something we kind of talked about a little bit in the roundtable, which is GPUs. GPUs are getting a lot more interesting. There's a lot more things that are going on with GPUs uh, around machine learning and AI. And many of you want to build apps that use GPUs for machine learning. Done. That's why we're introducing the Windows Server base image. So this image has nearly the full Windows API support, and it's built from Windows Server, not Windows Client. So we in the past had a Windows Client based image, but customers said, no, 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 we need server because we need things that only the server composition has, like support for greater than 10 IIS connections. And by doing so, what we are introducing is support for ML and GPU dependent applications via DirectX for Windows containers. So by enabling GPU acceleration for DirectX, we've also enabled GPU acceleration for the frameworks built on top of DirectX. One such framework is Windows ML. So Windows machine learning is a set of APIs providing fast and efficient AI inferencing capabilities. With GPU acceleration in Windows containers, developers now have access to a first class inferencing runtime that can be accelerated across a broad set of capable GPU acceleration hardware. So lots of really cool innovation here. And to make it easier for people to do lift and shift, we've also got some great stuff going on with tooling for lift and shift. So many organizations have developers building containers for new apps. And you know what? You've told us that you want help modernizing your existing stuff. So Windows Admin Center has the container tool with an easy to use and friendly UI, and it just keeps getting better. In fact, the latest version will create Docker files for you. Admin Center supports um, containerizing ASP.NET and web deploy, and lets you easily deploy containerized applications to AKS on AKS HCI directly. Um, however, we wanna do more. We also know that in addition to Windows Admin Center, we tend to see that larger organizations are using the Azure migration tools and they have, they have focused it, they're investing time and resources, and they're really comfortable with the Azure migration tools. So we've added the new Azure Migrate containerization app to containerize existing Windows Server apps as part of Azure Migrate. So we've got both flows. For the folks that are kind of more used to, you know, on-premises, Windows Admin Center, and smaller environments, we've got that. For those folks that are saying, no, no, we're in a large organization, we're in a large environment, we have our IT invested in the Azure Migrate tool set, great, we've got you covered both ways. So with the Containerize app, it targets the running server, it extracts the content to be containerized, it uses the Azure Container Registry, and creates a new container to deploy on AKS. The Containerize app supports ASP.NET IIS, and neither of these tools, neither of them requires any code changes. All right, time to get to Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition. So it's time to discuss cloud innovation with Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition. So first of all, you may be looking at that name thinking, boy, that's a mouthful, Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition. Well, the reason why it's named that is because A, it includes all of the Data Center Edition features, all of them, and it ad adds additional Azure and Windows Server innovation, latest hybrid and compute features. This runs on Azure Cloud as well as Azure Stack HCI. Let me say this again, this runs on Azure Cloud and Azure Stack HCI. And it's the best Windows Server VM with Auto Manage. So, what does Windows Server Data Center Azure Edition bring? Well, it starts with hot patching. Hot patching updates in memory code of running processes. No process restart or reboot is required. And I want to point out that today, as of right now, this currently requires server core. I'm just saying today, that's all I'm saying. Next, we have SMB over quick. So SMB over quick introduces an alternative to the TCP network transport. It provides secure, reliable connectivity to edge file servers over untrusted networks like the internet. 
What's great about this is SMB over Quick offers an SMP VPN for telecommuters, mobile device users, and high security organizations. Now, the server certificate creates a TLS 1.3 encrypted tunnel over UDP port 443 instead of TCP port 445. Now, SMB behaves normally within the Quick tunnel, meaning from the user standpoint, this is completely transparent and the experience doesn't change. So if you're used to SMB features like multi-channel, signing, compression, continuous availability, directory leasing, yada, yada, they all just work as normal. SMB over Quick is great for edge devices so they can safely access a file server. It's also great for telecommuters, mobile and hybrid workers with Windows 11. Finally, we also have Azure Extended Networking, which is designed to solve the challenge of moving apps to the cloud that need to maintain the same IP addresses. And this is really a challenge. So we've been spending a lot of time working to enable this scenario. Azure Extended Network enables you to stretch an on-premises subnet into Azure to let on-premises VMs keep their original on-premises private IP addresses when you're migrating to Azure. That's right, let me say that one more time. Azure Extended Network enables you to stretch an on-premises subnet into Azure to let your on-premises VMs keep their original on-premises private IP addresses when migrating to Azure. The, network's, the network is extended using a bi-directional VXLAN tunnel between two Windows Server 2022 VMs acting as virtual appliances. One is running on-premises, and the other running Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition in Azure, with each also connected to the subnet that needs to be extended. Each subnet that you're gonna extend requires a pair of appliances, and you can do multiple subnets can be extended using multiple pairs. So Azure Extended Networking provides a path to IP independence, and this is a really big deal. So, Let's go and do a quick demo. Uh, everybody loves hot patch. Nobody can get enough of hot patch. So let's do a quick demo of uh, hot patch with uh, Windows Server 22 Azure Auto Edition, uh, Azure Edition. Hot patching, so this is a new way to install updates. Doesn't require root loop. It doesn't interrupt your workloads that are running on your servers. So let me kind of describe the demo environment. On the right, I have a new Windows Server 2022 Core VM created with Auto Manage, where I'm going to manually install hot patch updates. On the left hand side, for comparison, I have Windows Server 2022 Core VM, and I will install a comparable latest cumulative update or LCU. And this is a traditional update. Um, you can see I've got a top, uh, I've queued up massive file copies here as sample workloads. And on top here, there's a timer so we can track the status of the patching installation. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start off the patch installation on each VM. First, I'm gonna start the, I'm gonna give a little head start, the traditional LCU on the left-hand side, the latest cumulative update. Uh, next, the hot patch on the right, oh, it's already done. Hope you didn't blink, hope you didn't miss that. Uh, the hot patch is done, and by the way, you can see that the file copy continued at the bottom completely uninterrupted. Now on the left-hand side, you can see the traditional LCU is still going. It's about 11.5%. Uh, in case you missed the first hot patch, let's run a second hot patch. And we're installing the second one that's gonna again happen on the right-hand side. And you can see that, yep. And just like that, we've just installed a second hot patch with zero impact to the running workload. Now, one of the great advantages of hot patches is these are made in memory. So this means that even running processes pick up the new updates immediately and without interruption. Next, we install these updates manually for these demos so you can see just how impactful this technology is. In reality, I would use update orchestration. I'd be using auto manage to do all of this hot patching for you. So this is still going. So uh, I'm gonna speed up the video here so we can get to the completion of this traditional update. And you can see on the left-hand side that it's now done, but it requires a reboot to complete the update process. So if I reboot now, it's going to interrupt the workload, namely this file copy, and I'm gonna have to wait for the file copy to complete. So let's speed ahead to the end. 
so we can perform the reboot. And again, we did two hot patches on the right hand side in, I don't know, less than 20 seconds. And uh, this left one is just about done. Now we got to perform the reboot and there we go. So that was a quick demo of hot patching with Windows Server 22 Azure Edition um, with Azure Auto Manage. And you can see just, you know, delivering this awesome innovation, this Azure innovation to Windows Server. So told you I had a lot of content. Um, again, the focus here is your requirements. Advanced layer, multi-layer security. We're elevating the security posture of the OS and protecting against the latest malware and ransomware. With hybrid capabilities, we're going to extend your data center for greater IT efficiency. For the application platform, we're doing so much with regards to AKS, AKS on HCI, containers, open source integration, and more. And we're empowering both developers and IT pros to deploy modern apps and modernize existing apps faster than ever. And finally, we're again enabling unique Azure innovation for Windows Server. But, and, and again, when I say Azure innovation, I want to point out that that includes Azure Stack HCI. So when you look at things and go, huh, you know, that Windows Server Data Center Azure Edition looks really cool. Well, keep in mind that runs on Azure Stack HCI as well. And that's another benefit of Azure Stack HCI is that we're able to deliver Azure innovation on premises. So with that, Again, I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Karsten and everyone here at the Azure Stack HCI days. This is really awesome. It's really a pleasure to do that. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Karsten. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. This was really great. I I, I thought I, kn I knew a lot about Windows Server 22, but you had some impressive things there. I didn't know about the storage spaces things, and we have some questions about that. And uh, to be honest, a lot of questions in the Q&A. Many of them. So I, if I don't get them all, it would be nice if you can go to the questions afterward and answer them, uh, some of them yourself. Uh, but let's uh, let's start with some. Maybe let's start with one that matches this topic, uh, the Azure edition we had at the end, because yeah, there's yeah. one in the chat directly um, with a question, will Windows Server 2022 uh, data center Azure edition have the same LTSC lifecycle Windows Server has, or will there be a new feature showing up earlier than it will show up in Windows Server? So it's regarding the lifecycle of this Azure edition. Ah, Azure. So Azure Edition, our goal is to be able to deliver this on a faster cadence because we're delivering things in the cloud. So if you desire the traditional LTSC, we've got traditional LTSC because everyone gets upset when we change things that we've been doing for the last 20 years. So we have traditional LTSC, but with Azure Edition, no, we, we want to also be able to deliver things on a faster cadence. Um, and again, because it's an because it's Azure Edition, think of it as part of the Azure service, we want to deliver it on an Azure cadence. So you can expect it, you'll see it on more of a yearly type cadence um, uh, with Azure Edition. Okay, great. Let's see, uh, are there any plans to use TPM2 on clients to identify and secure access to company servers like SMB3 over Quick? I don't know if you can answer that. It's very specific. That is a very specific question, and I don't want to give the wrong answer, so I'm going to pass on that one. Sorry. OK, um, I wouldn't know either. Uh, uh, as flagged in Windows Server 2022 Insider, uh, why PowerShell 5.1.NET 4.X and S channel does not use TSL 1.2 as a minimum? S channel has similar configs as uh, 2019. Well, also very specific, I would say. Very specific. Yes. So there are there. Uh, you know, I, I I couldn't tell you why specifically that 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 is why it is in S channel. Um, uh, that. I would again. I would need to. I would need to chat with one of my colleagues to to get the answer on that. I don't want to yeah. give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, the nested high, uh, virtualization. How does mm -hmm. VBS and Secure Works in a VM? Is nested Hyper-V needed? Um, 
So VBS and nested Hyper-V, because it's all on the hyper all on Hyper-V, we actually know exactly how to do all of that security work, and we know how to plumb it as efficiently as possible between the two layers. That's one of the benefits you have of using Hyper-V on top of Hyper-V, is this all just works, and it works extremely fast. Works extremely okay. efficiently. Cool. Then, uh, Jeff, having the document comparing the version as you shared for 2019 renewed with 2022 would be awesome. It's super helpful to help deciders and IT to see why it's not a good thing to start with 2016 or 2019 now. So yes. the, the, they ask fair, for fair. the documents if they are updated. Uh, no, it's very. I'm. I'm actually reviewing. Where it's in. It's in late drafts. Almost. I think we're almost in release candidate stage internally. We have just been working on a bajillion different things, but it is. It, it is well underway, and it's. It's in the final stages. And if you follow me on Twitter at WSV Guy, I promise you, as soon as the new version is posted, I will let everybody know. But yes, it is absolutely in process. Yeah. Then a question about the hard, the network improvement you, you talked about. Do these UDP offloads need special hardware or just recent 2022 drivers? Well, no, the, the, the NIC has to have the UDP offload support in the NIC. So we are, we are basically querying the NIC. Does it have this offload support? If support, great, then we will push it down into the NIC to do the processing and, and hand, handle that off from the CPU. If it doesn't, then we, of course, handle it in the CPU like we always do. Yeah. Then I was very impressed about the single node caching. So here's a question about that. Does, does single node caching use storage spaces as base? What file system preferred, NTFS or latest ReFS? Uh, definitely latest ReFS. Um, you'll find, a, in fact, I, I should post a link in the doc. I'll do that in the chat window. I'll do that in just a second. REFS is definitely recommended because you want all the latest benefits of REFS. Um, um, in terms of, like I said earlier, um, so you know this this whole single node caching tiering that we're delivering in 2022, um, it is it is leveraging work that we have done in S2D. Um, again, this is innovation we've been doing in storage spaces direct for many years, but it is adopting it for the single node because there are there are very there's a different there's a different logic that applies, and it, we also require that our broad you know portions of the SPL cache on over so we can provide you know high speed cache dating from 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 um, from the parity tier. Uh, for faster read performance, things that you you know normally wouldn't have, and if you tried to do this on 2019, like I said, a not work, does not support, will fail, and performance will be terrible, um, is because we had to really adopt and create, you know, and make this scenario work end to end. But REFS is definitely, definitely the recommended file system. I'm looking for the link right now to put in the chat window for the documentation here. Yeah, and you mentioned in the presentation uh, for the. Uh, storage spaces with caching. I, I I don't know the right word uh, out of my head. There is no VAC, so uh, so Windows Admin Center integration so far, but we uh, but the audience is hoping that something is coming, right? Y yes. So uh, you know it's funny that people mention that. So uh, yeah. Yes, so we are absolutely um, we lit, we lit up PowerShell, and PowerShell is you know how we light things up, and then WAC generally uh, will take advantage of the PowerShell because as everybody knows, Admin Center uses PowerShell uh, under the covers. Um, but right now, this is all done uh, via 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 PowerShell. Yeah. So another question: We heard that Windows Server 2022 Essential Edition do not be root for the domain anymore. Is that true? Can we use Essential Edition as a RDS host or RDS license licensed server? You can absolutely use Essentials as an RDS host. I believe it supports 25. I don't remember exactly the exact number. I think it's 25 users. Yes. Uh, Manfred can elaborate on that. He's good in licensing. <laughs> yeah, yeah to, to add this, the new thing about Windows Server 2022 Essentials is that it's an OEM only product. So you will always buy it together with the hardware. And uh, we have the limitation Jeff mentioned, 25 users and uh, 50 devices. 
based on the licensing from the technical perspective, we have all the features in there we have in standard, but the limitation one CPU socket, maximum 10 cores, maximum 25 users, maximum 50 devices. Um, we don't have any longer this uh, limitation that it has to be a root of the domain or um, has to keep the, the FSMO roles. Yes. Yeah. So I have another one and I'm curious about that too. I have my opinion, but I want to ha hear it from you. If you have Azure Stack HCI and thus licensing data center with, S with SR, does it qualify to install data center Azure edition or do customers need additional licensing for this running on the Azure Stack HCI? Manfred is doing this. No, uh, I'm, I'm uh, you want that this question because we had this several times. So yes. It's good that it showed up again. Sorry, so, say that. Give me the question one more time. So I think the question is basically if you have Azure Stack HCI and additionally data center for all the CPUs and maybe also uh, software assurance, can you then uh, take data data uh, data center Azure edition? So uh, Windows Server 2022 data center Azure Azure edition, put the VM on the Azure Stack HCI and it's licensed or do, do you have to additionally license it through Azure? Do you get the question? Or, or in other words, if I want to run Windows Server 2022 um, data center Azure edition yes. on my Azure Stack HCI host, do I yes. still need Windows Server data center for the host, not the Azure edition, but the data center edition to license my virtual machines? Or so can I have this Azure edition pays, paid by Azure, Azure consumption? So to be so to, to run Windows Server Data Center Azure Edition, you have to be running Azure Stack HCI in the host and you have yes. to, Windows Server has to be properly licensed for that server. If those two things are met, you should be covered. And so you think it's included in the data, Windows Data Center 2022 edition? If your host is Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, of course. So if, if I, your host if is I Azure Stack a, HCI. Yeah, I, I'm, on I'm, Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, let's do this. Let me let me double and triple check this with the licensing guys and, and I will come back with an answer to you for that. Yeah, that would uh, be great because there's a lot of questions around this. Uh, if you have to license uh, uh, Windows Server 22 data center edition, uh, data center Azure edition only through Azure or is it if it's included in the data Windows Server 2022 data center edition that you attach to the node? Yeah, or both. Yeah, yeah that uh, people are very interested uh, about the Azure edition yes, when, on Azure Stack HCI. Intended functionality. I yeah. think it's especially the kernel software reboot. And we had several of these questions in the direction of what do I need uh, except Azure Stack HCI to be prepared for this uh, Azure uh, edition of Windows Server 2022 data center regarding the licensing perspective? Yeah, got it. There's an Another one that's interesting. So, Jeff, I hope you can uh, can give us maybe feedback uh, in the next six hours or, or five hours, so we can publish it here. Otherwise, we have to get it to the attendees. Yes. Some, so, some so Carson, hours. here's what I'm going to do because I'm about to run out of time myself, and I've got a meeting with with my boss in three minutes. So, number yeah. one, I put link to the storage spaces, uh, single node bus caching in, in the chat window. So everybody can get to that and take a look at that to better understand the requirements, the prerequisites and how it works. And it goes into even more detail with all of the PowerShell commands to enable it. And I would recommend Great. everybody sticks with the defaults. But one of the beautiful things about it is literally it's a standalone server that with two, I mean, literally you could put in two SSDs, two spinning disks, on a home lab and all of a sudden you've got a pretty rocking system at home to do some pretty awesome lab test dev environment. So that's something I would definitely take a look at. With regards to the licensing, I know exactly who to ask and I will go double check with this and then I will respond back to you uh, via the chat um, so that you have an answer because I want to make sure everybody's clear on the licensing of Windows Server uh, 2022 Data Center Azure Edition and apologies for any confusion about that up front and I will get you an answer and respond to that shortly. That's great. Jeff, great. do you still have a, a, a minute for one, just one quick answer or do you have go to for run it. now? I have, I have one minute, go. Yeah. Uh, um, Azure Stack HCI version 21H2. This is also 2022, right? So 
is it also or will allow for a single server solution? So people assume this or this uh, this is it is assumed that Azure Stack HDI 21 H2 is Windows Server 22. I think that's not not the case. No, no. So will there no. be a single Azure Stack HCI 20 2021 H2 21 H2? Uh, can you can you do something with that? No, I, I don't think so, right? It's always a clustered solution so far. Right. What what we are doing is we are we will definitely listen to. I'd like to better understand that feedback and what people are looking for in a single server solution. Um, but nothing nothing to announce today. Okay. okay. So thanks, Jeff, a lot for the last two hours. You were uh, it was a great session and you were very helpful in the roundtable. So uh, I say goodbye to you and maybe we see each other at the next Azure Stack HCI days in Absolutely. 2022. Again, a huge thank you to everybody. Uh, really appreciate everything you're doing here, Carson. This is an awesome event and uh, really appreciate all of all of the customers and partners involved. Thank you very much. And now we go directly uh, to the next speaker because it's the hour is up again. Uh, we have Matt McSpirit now, and I, I always love his name, Matt McSpirit. Uh, there is some speed in it, right? So we are looking for a fast session. No, I know you are very tired, <laughs> maybe jet lag. <laughs> you just flew in uh, <laughs> this morning, right, from uh, from from Redmond or from Seattle to to the UK. So yeah. Jeff, you are talking about. Uh, Azure Kubernetes service, something I'm very interested in, and uh, the stage is yours. And to add, after you, there is Mike. He goes more deeply into um, to the AKS. Uh, so uh, we have now two hours of, of hopefully great AKS content. Yeah, excellent. Can you hear me clearly enough? We can hear you. Perfect. Excellent, Perfect. excellent. I will share my screen and I'll probably drop off video so I don't consume my entire parents' house bandwidth uh, where, where I'm based currently. Uh, I let me know if the, the slides in the through. UK is also great. <laughs> not at this house. Uh, no, it's not too bad, actually. Can you see that OK? Has it come through? Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, Excellent. Off you go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yeah, as, as Carson said, I'm uh, the warm up act for Mike, who's going to take you deeper into this thing we've built called Azure Kubernetes Service on Azure Stack HCI. And, and personally, I'm really proud of how far it's come in, in such an incredibly short space of time, but I, I've been working on it. Um, and I know some of the folks like Mike have been working on it for, for even longer, but it feels like we've brought something to market that's incredibly compelling and it's just, it's just exploding in popularity and it's come so quickly. So in this session, I'm going to take you through everything you need to know just to get started, understanding what it is, what it isn't, where some of the integration points with Azure, it's a common theme that you've heard throughout the, the, the day and a half so far of the session, of the sessions, there's a lot of integration touch points with Azure in various different ways. And AKS on Azure Stack HCI is definitely no different. So let me kick off by setting some context as to where we started. And many of you may be familiar with, and some of you may have actually already started using Kubernetes at scale in Azure. Now we provide in Azure a managed Kubernetes solution called AKS and that service, all of the behind the scenes plumbing, the, the complexity of running and building Kubernetes infrastructure, we take care of that for you in Azure. So you as um, an IT operator, an, an, an application developer, an application owner can focus on what's important to you, which in this case is the applications. And as a result of running this service in Azure at hyperscale for many years now, we've learned a lot. And those learnings, not only technically, but how to operate, how to support, how to secure, all of those and more, we can amalgamate and bring as much as is relevant down to run on premises in your environments in the form of AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So we take all of that knowledge we've learned about running different customers' environments at scale in the form of best practices that we make available to customers so they can learn and, and deploy in an optimal way for meeting the needs of their applications. We lock things up from the bottom to the top, from the physical data center security to the isolation of the physical infrastructure in Azure, through the software layers, through the Kubernetes layers, through the image hardening, through the additional tools that we give you to put in place additional security controls like Azure policy and more 
Azure Defender is another good example we'll touch on later. We enable you to be secure by default and really drive very enhanced security for your applications in the context of Kubernetes. And something that was touched on in the uh, roundtable earlier on, and something that, that I know Carson's very passionate about, is, is support. The support in the context then was around Azure Stack HCI, but we take all of those learnings we've made through supporting this service at scale in Azure, all of those learnings through our CSS engineers, engaging with customers, learning about their environments, troubleshooting, their expertise is incredible, and they bring that now across to AKS HCI. And perhaps, I don't want to say the most important because security is top of mind for everybody, but unification of management as we embrace hybrid is important to the point where if I'm giving you two different environments to manage two different Kubernetes solutions, that's not efficient. It's not the best use of your time. It doesn't enable you for success. So we want to unify management of Kubernetes infrastructures, not just in Azure and on Microsoft properties like AKS HCI, but also across other clouds that you may have invested in or may choose to invest in in the future where you may run Kubernetes uh, applications and workloads. We want to help you control, manage and, and deliver the best experience for Kubernetes, no matter the platform. So that's a bit of background. But what are we doing? Uh, great animation. Um, uh, what are we doing to bring some of those capabilities, some of those learnings to you? to run in your environment. And that's where AKS on Azure Stack HCI is, is essentially born. It brings that familiarity from a Kubernetes perspective, in particular for those developers, those uh, application owners who are looking at containerizing workloads. Kubernetes is the de facto, de facto standard now within the enterprise and, and beyond. So we're bringing all of that, but we're hybridizing it. Uh, that may be a made up word, so I apologize. We are making it hybrid integrated by design, meaning from deployment time, it's integrated with Azure. So there is a connectivity requirement, but beyond that, we're packaging AKS HCI in a way that is easy to deploy. You'll actually see this in a few minutes, easy to manage. It provides a great platform for running, not just what you would assume in quotes would be Microsoft apps. So yes, it's great for .NET, whether you want to run those on Windows or Linux, but it's a great solution for other workloads that may run on Windows and Linux uh, platforms that you want to containerize. But it is, from a Windows perspective, the first class uh, Kubernetes solution for running Windows containerized workloads at scale. You can manage it through Windows Admin Center, or I know many of you will love PowerShell, so you can manage it through PowerShell as well. And increasingly, as we saw earlier when we were discussing uh, Azure Stack HCI, more and more functionality is being built into the Arc layer to enable you to manage from the cloud and benefit from all of the goodness that the cloud enables, such as uh, the ARM APIs, the integration with other Azure services that we'll look at shortly as well. And I touched on security earlier on. One of the, what I feel is one of the key advantages of, of AKS HCI compared to alternative offerings out there is that it integrates with what many enterprises are embracing within their infrastructure today, Active Directory. Azure Active Directory in many ways through the ARC integration. It brings a, a level of management and control that Microsoft provides to make it easy for you to run and secure, both secured by default and, as I mentioned before, the additional tools that you can place on top like Defender, Azure Policy, all contribute to enhancing the level of security uh, within the solution. So you've really got a secure by default, but you can even go even further uh, to, to ramp up that security to meet your needs. And because it's a service, it's evergreen. It's always up to date. Yes, we, Microsoft, provide you those updated images, those updated, those updates. You choose when you want to apply them, of which you could automate that very easily. So there is an element of control that you need to apply there. But fundamentally, you never have to worry about do I move from the 2016 version of AKS on HCI to the 2019 or the 2022? It's just AKS on Azure Stack HCI. And we generally release a new build more or less every month. Sometimes it may be slightly longer uh, in between builds, but just recently that's been the typical cadence. And the upgrade procedures and processes are very, very straightforward and easy to enable you to upgrade your Kubernetes clusters that are running your apps, but also the AKS infrastructure that's that's managing and powering the overall solutions. 
we drill into what our, what our class actually is a more of a architecture slide than a true architecture slide. Um, I've got one uh, a better architecture view in a minute, but I, I'll not go too deep on that because I'd love Mike to go deeper in his session on those. But at the base, what do we need to run this this Kubernetes solution? Well, we need a Hyper-V virtualization platform at a high level in the form of either Azure Stack HCI 20H2 today or Windows Server 2019 with Hyper-V today. So those are your two solutions for running AKS on top of. Now with Azure Stack HCI, as we know, it's hyper-converged. With a Windows Server-based Hyper-V cluster, you've got a little bit more flexibility. You can go down an S2D HCI configuration, or you can use uh, remote storage like, uh, like SAM, whatever your preference. We support both from an AKS HCI perspective. As long as it prevent, presents a cluster shared volume, you're good to go. And then the value that AKS brings specifically are the three middle layers, predominantly the, the two that Microsoft are, are delivering more heavily and then integrating with the rest of the goodness that the, the Kubernetes solution and the community are contributing to. So those bottom two layers there, we, Microsoft, provide the virtual machine images, container hosts if you prefer, for running the Kubernetes infrastructure. Now we provide the Linux based solution in the form of our Mariner uh, Linux OS. So we provide that image, that VHDX. You don't have to create it yourself. You don't have to change it or optimize it. It's, it's configured for you by default. We also provide the Windows equivalent and the Windows equivalent will enable you to deploy containers on either server core or nano server if you if you have a preference there. With the container host images, as we said, uh, we Microsoft uh, ensure that those are updated. You choose when to apply them, but we uh, provide those for you. And then we needed to make sure that this Kubernetes solution could work effectively with the underlying infrastructure, Azure Stack HCI, Windows Server, etc. So for that, that's where our big contributions really start in the form of our storage integration, our network integration, and our cluster integration. Because when Kubernetes says, I need to deploy a new worker node, it needs to be able to talk to Hyper-V to spin up the VM. It needs to be able to configure the virtual networks. It needs to lay that images or those images down in some form of storage. And it needs to make those workloads, those workers highly available. All of those are just a, a sprinkling of some of the ways that we have touch points into Kubernetes there. And then we obviously integrate and provide a Kubernetes compliance solution, which is AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So all of the things that your development teams, your um, uh, customers that you may be working with or yourselves, all of the things that you may have experienced today with Kubernetes, whether it's around monitoring, whether it's around integration with certain backup tools, or this is at the end of the day, AKS HCI is delivering a compliant Kubernetes solution. So your investments in tooling and expertise and uh, the ecosystem work should work just as well with AKS HCI as it would on any other Kubernetes solution that might be out there. And then once you've got that Kubernetes layer deployed and you're ready to deploy your workloads, you have a little bit of a choice to make as to how you want to manage it. As I mentioned, if you've got existing investments in certain Kubernetes type tooling, you could go ahead and use that, no problem. However, Microsoft wants to make Arc the best place to manage Kubernetes clusters no matter where they are whether they're running AKS on Azure Stack HCI, whether they're running OpenShift, Tanzu in another public cloud, you name it, we want to manage that Kubernetes cluster because we feel we can do a brilliant job of doing that. So optionally, you can choose to integrate your Kubernetes clusters in AKS HCI with Azure Arc. And we'll actually see a bit more of what that looks like a bit later on. But that opens the door to efficient management, uh, application of policies to enable you to achieve governance and standardization, the ability to deploy applications easily and efficiently through GitOps, which may be a new term uh, to some of you. You may have heard of DevOps. This is slightly different, but using Git as a source of truth uh, for your applications where your developers are building apps, pushing their code into a Git repository of some sort, it doesn't have to be GitHub, uh, and from there, the engines within Azure Arc take that checked in code and orchestrate the deployment of applications down to um, to your AKS HCI based clusters. So it's incredibly powerful, really easy to get going with. So it does open the door to 
uh, as an organization embracing Kubernetes in an efficient way without needing a PhD in Kubernetes. Is, and that's from my perspective is, is incredibly important because it lowers the bar of entry. So I'm not going to touch on this in too much depth because I think Mike will go through this in more depth later on. But what fundamentally gets deployed when you run an installation of, of AKSHI? Well, on the left, we've got this management cluster. I personally refer to this as the, the brains of the operation. It's the first thing that gets deployed. It's a single VM. And from there, once that is deployed, you use that management cluster to orchestrate deployment of subsequent pieces of the infrastructure, such as the target clusters or workload clusters, as it's called on the slide. And they are essentially where your apps will run. And you'll see lots of Linux little penguins there. The vast majority of AKSHI runs our Mariner OS. Uh, so all of the load balancer, the control planes, the, uh, the, the management pieces run Linux. And then when it comes to the workers, you work in nodes where your um, your apps will ultimately run. That's where you have a choice of do you deploy a Windows based uh, solution or a Linux based solution. So that's a bit about the architecture. And, and as I said, it can run on either Azure Stack HCI 20H2 or Windows Server 2019 uh, today. We are obviously in the works to validate later releases of each of those platforms because customers are, are asking us to do that and, and they want to embrace those more modern platforms. Um, and 21H2 and Windows Server 2022 are, are those platforms. So stay tuned for news on that in the future. But, um, but today, right now, it's Azure Stack HCI 20H2 or Windows Server 2019 as, as your uh, Hyper-V layer, if you will. But what are your options for kicking the tires with this versus production. Well, if you wanted to go full steam into production and start containerizing your applications on AKS HCI, the production deployment scenario would be to run this on either an Azure Stack HCI 20H2 multi-node cluster. Obviously, Azure Stack HCI is a minimum of two nodes, so it's always going to be multi-node uh, on validated physical hardware from the catalog. And that is our primary subscription based solution, if you will, Azure Stack HCI and the core based subscription, AKS HCI with its subscription model. However, if you've got an investment or a preference for Windows Server Hyper-V based clusters, as long as it's a cluster, you'd be supported in production in the same way there. When it comes to evaluation, you've got a couple of options. If you've got a spare piece of physical hardware, because don't we all, uh, even if it's just a single node running Windows Server 2019 with Hyper-V, you can install AKS HCI on there and, and kick the tires and test all of the different pieces, the installation, the target clusters, the integration with Arc and, and more. If you have no hardware, you want to test it inside an Azure VM, we've got some useful automation guidance in our um, evaluation guides, which you can use. And I know Jeremy has got a, um, a scenario in, w, in MS Lab as well that you could also choose to deploy. So lots of different ways. Uh, we just love you to experience it and see how easy it is to get going with something that is actually quite scary under the covers, which is it's Kubernetes. It's complex, it's hard. We make it easy. So I want to prove it to you how easy it is. Uh, and with the first demo, I'm going to I'm going to walk you through uh, deploying the uh, the management cluster. So at this stage, I've got a vanilla environment. I've not deployed any Kubernetes pieces yet, and I'm going to deploy the the initial infrastructure before I then go on and deploy uh, some of the um, target clusters to run our workloads. So in this case, familiar screen, Windows Admin Center. Many of you will have uh, will have seen it before. Usual kind of prereqs. Check you've got a system that's got CSVs and this amount of space and memory and so on. Once you've done that, provide some creds that you can connect to the environment. In my case, I'm running this on a single uh, Windows Server 2019 machine. So this is a single host evaluation, but the process is identical for the most part when you're running with um, uh, an Azure Stack HCI cluster. Some of these values on the screen may look slightly different in terms of larger memory more likely. Um, it would uh, separate out the different um, uh, nodes within your cluster. The key thing it's looking for here is that all of the necessary pieces, roles, features are in place. And if they are not in place, AKS HCI can turn those on, apply those, and whatever they may be. So in this case, it's firewall rules and a few other bits. Cred SSP, everyone loves Cred SSP. We've got to enable that. And now we're just specifying where are we going to store stuff? How are we going to connect stuff from a networking perspective? 
oops, you'll see we support um, DHCP and static IP addressing and integration with VLANs and you choose your virtual switch. Very straightforward stuff for, for any experienced uh, Windows Server slash Hyper-V uh, admin. We're defining some network settings here, what we call the load balance, balancer settings. And these are essentially an IP range that AKS HCI will manage for you and, and allocate to the different services that are, are going to be running in the environment. My advice, where we've seen a number of customers come unstuck here is they've set these ranges without perhaps doing a full validation of if workloads are already using some of these IPs in advance. So definitely, Matt's tip of the day, check that your ranges aren't being used by other things, check that you're not setting this one here and also setting it as a DHCP range elsewhere, you're going to get into, into some deployment failures potentially where IPs are already used and, and you've got duplicate IPs in the environment. So um, we're working on understanding how we can help with validating some of those scenarios. But right now, my advice is definitely make sure you're, you're checking all of the different things you're providing. DNS is another that catches people out. So make sure the DNS resolution is, is properly operating in your environment. The next step in the wizard is to integrate with Azure. Now, it's as simple as providing some creds, choosing a subscription that you've got permissions to, providing a resource group, new or existing in a particular region. And once you've selected all those pieces, that's essentially it. From there, it'll go through the review, it'll integrate and capture all of those um, uh, registration, uh, integration pieces and necessary information. And from there, it will lock that set all of those settings you've made will be locked into a, a configuration that when you click deploy new cluster it deploys that it's almost like a building a template of what you want to deploy 12 minutes in my environment not too shabby at all pretty quick and we then have our aks hci management infrastructure deployed so at this stage no workloads i can't just go and start deploying apps to this cluster it's literally just the AKS management pieces deployed. And then from there, obviously those of you who are more, uh, have a preference for PowerShell, okay, WAC looked easy, but how easy is in PowerShell? Well, let's count here. So one, two, three, if it's a long, it'd be a long line, but I'm still counting it as one line. One, two, three. The VNet is optional here in terms of whether you use DHCP or static. So I'm still counting that as just three lines four for the config, five for the registration, six lines. Six lines of PowerShell to do what I just did in the WAC uh, UI. The end result is the same. You can see how with DHCP, it's asking for just a few settings relating to the, um, the IP range that's going to be allocated by AKS HCI for services running in Kubernetes. The initialize is that same as that step where it's checking the nodes to, for roles, features, WinRM, the usual stuff you'd expect. The config is where we lock in all of the, select, the selections we've made, including where we're going to store stuff, where we're going to place VMs, a cluster IP address that's going to get created as part of deployment, and then the registration. Um, okay, there might be a couple more lines if you're locking in some of these variables, but you know, six to eight lines, I think you get away with. And then you run the installation. And that, from a PowerShell perspective, is easy, it's automatable, it's consistent and it can be easily standardized. Uh, so you've definitely got a solution there where if you're looking at uh, streamlining how you roll this out to new locations, edge locations, repeated deployments, PowerShell is your friend there for sure. So going back to the architecture, we've done the bit on the left here, we've deployed the management cluster. Next, we're gonna deploy a workload cluster. So we're just gonna do one for the purpose of this uh, demonstration. So what does that look like in Windows Admin Center? And then I'll, I'll give you the PowerShell equivalent. I'll give you a hint right now. It's less than six lines. But anyway, here's the, the Admin Center version. And admittedly, when you run this, this um, if you test this, you play with this, uh, this uh, extension yourselves, you might find that some of the screens have slightly different details. You know, we, as I said, we release builds nearly every month. So there are always subtle changes happening that can make things easier and, and more efficient. So same kind of thing as we saw before, some prereqs, what do we need for space-wise to deploy this particular Kubernetes workload cluster. In this case, we'll provide some basic information 
And this is where I was referring to that optional step of do I want to integrate this target cluster where my workloads will run with Azure Arc? I don't have to. It's included within the license fee or the subscription fee of running AKS HCI. So whether you choose to enable it or not, you, you can. You, you can. Uh, all I need to provide again is the appropriate subscription credentials, resource group, region, etc. So nothing, nothing too crazy here. So I'm going to choose uh, a particular resource group that's pre-created. It's already detected a number of these um, settings here. Which Kubernetes cluster am I going to deploy to? Oh, sorry, which uh, uh, HCI cluster running AKS HCI? Give it a name. Choose a version if, for this target cluster if I have a preference. And then I can define some sizes for my different um, components. And then we have some steps to create what essentially are groups of worker nodes that are related by operating system. So for instance, if I would like to create a pool of Linux worker nodes, I'd follow these steps here, choose my size. And more recently, we've updated the node pool functionality to give you more granularity around different sizes and of virtual machines within the different node pools. I'm going to, in this case, create a node pool for both Linux and Windows. And you might think, oh, well, why is that significant? Why? What, what is, what's the big deal about putting a Linux and a Windows pool in the same cluster here? Well, actually, from a manageability perspective, that's actually a good thing because I can manage that cluster containing the two node pools as a single object. From a policy perspective, it gives me some extra granularity. It's uh, it's a useful, but not compulsory. You could obviously have a separate cluster for Linux and Windows pools if you prefer, but you don't have to. So next, I mentioned earlier around security. One of the things that uniquely differentiates AKS HCI is that depth integration with what enterprises are running today. And that in many cases is Active Directory from an authentication perspective. So the ability to integrate AD with your AKS HCI environment is an important ask, uh, important ask that we've addressed uh, within uh, AKS HCI from customers. So we're proud of the work we've done in this space. I'm not going to use it for the purpose of this demo. I'm just going to go on and choose my particular virtual network and my type of network configuration that I want. In my case, Calico, which is now the default and review and then click create. And now I'm going off to deploy my target cluster that will ultimately run my workloads. And that one took 22 minutes. OK, well, that, why is that? Why was that longer than the, the management infrastructure? Well, this time around, it has to download a slightly bigger Windows container image. It doesn't download that initially when you install AKS HCI, because at that stage, it doesn't know whether you're going to run Windows worker nodes. Now that you've established a node pool, it downloads that image at this time, and that takes a few minutes to download, extract, and then create those create those virtual machines from that image. Hence, why the time is a little bit longer. And so, 22 minutes for that cluster, all done, and now we have our Kubernetes target cluster linked to Azure. So I click on the link there; it takes me to the Azure portal, and I see my Kubernetes cluster that's running on premises integrated into Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes. And from there, I can go on and integrate with additional Azure services, both Kubernetes related like GitOps and policy, but also monitoring uh, and more. And I'll touch on some more of those a bit later on. But you saw how easy it was to onboard there. So when we think about in PowerShell, I've actually missed one line off here, so I apologize, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll explain which one I've missed. Uh, some of you eagle eyed folks may, may know which one. Firstly, to create the cluster, I use this top line. New AKS HCI cluster, you have to create one with at least a Linux node pool. I don't have to create a Windows node pool if I don't need one, but I at least need to create a Linux node pool. And if I miss that out, it's going to create one anyway. So you can actually, I think, get away with just doing new AKS HCI cluster name and it will just create one. Um, but I'm providing a few more um, uh, parameters here. There's additional parameters you can also provide around VM size, um, and, and additional um, uh, parameters that can shape your deployment to your needs. I can then add a node pool for Windows, in this case referencing the same cluster, this time providing a Windows node pool name, one worker node of OS type Windows. And then from there, if I need to scale up my workers in either one of the node pools, I just pass the node, uh, the actual cluster name, the name of the node pool, and the number of um, 
workers that I want to scale to. In this case, the Linux node pool for two nodes, please. And then if I want to scale the control planes, which a control plane is deployed by default, at least one is deployed. You'll see it says control plane node count one at the top here. When you deploy a new target cluster, we'll deploy at least one control plane node and a load balancer node, uh, as well as your worker nodes. So this is this command here is just an instance of me scaling that out. So technically, if I just wanted to deploy a cluster and not scale it with Windows and Linux, it's only two lines. The one line I've missed off this slide is the Azure Arc integration. And that's a simple enable dash Azure Arc integration, I think off the top of my head for the cluster name, and it will go ahead and, and integrate that with Azure Arc. So either way, two or three lines automated, and you've got a new Kubernetes cluster that's integrated with Azure Arc. So really easy stuff. So hopefully that's not scared anybody off uh, and you realizing, oh, well, actually I don't need a, a PhD or to be a doctor of Kubernetes to, to, to really use this valuably within my environment. But when would you use it? When are the best times to think, well, actually Kubernetes could be a great solution for this and AKS on HCI in particular. Well, if you have investments already in AKS today, we're speaking with customers very regularly around, I've deployed this in AKS in Azure. I want to bring it down and run it at the edge, run it in my data center for compliance, for data gravity, for data sovereignty, whatever it may be. I want to run that same application or an instance of on-premises in my data center. And by bringing AKS HCI on top of Azure Stack HCI, it enables them a very streamlined on-ramp to be able to do that. That's not to guarantee that every app you could just literally copy and paste without modification. There may be instances where apps in Azure are utilizing features in AKS that don't exist yet in AKS HCI. But for the most part, our goal is to deliver an, an AKS consistent solution on premises that does enable you to do that in the future. I've talked about the platform supporting both Windows and Linux applications. We're actually working on tooling separate to AKS HCI, more so for Azure at this point, that can help you take applications running in VMs or on physical servers through Azure Migrate and containerize them to run on AKS in Azure. So with an extra hop and taking those files uh, and binaries and, and code, you could technically then move them down to AKS uh, running on HCI. But either way, how you modernize is up to you, how you modernize these applications but modernizing them onto a Kubernetes platform running on HCI is, is a powerful and flexible way to do that. And because it's a subscription-based solution, you pay for what you use. So you start small and you, you grow to your needs as and when the business demands. But my favorite thing that AKS on Azure Stack HCI is enabling is an on-ramp to consuming some of these additional Azure services that running these on-premises for reasons of network latency, data sovereignty, data gravity, uh, compliance. I think it's an incredible way to consume PaaS services like SQL Managed Instance or Arc Enabled Data Services specifically, the Azure App Service. These are services that historically have only ever lived in Azure. They've only been available in Microsoft data centers. Now, through the power of Kubernetes, we're able to decouple those services from running exclusively in Azure and enable you to run them on Kubernetes in your own environment. So once you've got the AKS HCI platform deployed, as we saw in the previous two demos, you've then got a platform to bring AKS apps down. You've got a platform to modernize existing applications from monolithic VM environments. And you've also got the opportunity to easily bring Azure services down, PaaS services to run on premises in the form of data services, app services, machine learning, and more. And that's attractive because it's a hell of a lot easier than building those kind of services yourself. And they're all subscription based, so you pay for what you use. So I wanted to visualize how what, what some of the elements I've just described and dive into some of the areas where the Azure management, the Arc integration really shines. So Imagine you've got a, an infrastructure, you've got this validated hardware from great partners uh, like Lenovo, who we've had on the, on the call. You've deployed your Azure Stack HCI infrastructure, uh, or alternatively, uh, Windows Server 2019 Hyper-V with a cluster. 
and you're running happily virtual machines, traditional VMs running your applications, but you want to go down that modernizing path. And as soon as you introduce AKS HCI, not only do you open the door to modernizing your uh, applications into containers, but through integration with Azure Arc, you open the door to a method of applying standardization and governance through Azure policy, but also a new way to deploy applications in a centralized, streamlined way through GitOps. And I've actually got a demo of that to show you to help illustrate A, how easy it is, and B, what the impact of that is. So let me go over to this uh, Arc enable Kubernetes demo. And what you should see is where we pretty much left off before, uh, albeit we were in the um, the Azure environment uh, when we left the demo, but I can quickly revisit that. So what I've got here is that AKS HCI cluster that I deployed, and I'm going to go up to Azure and check out that uh, instance. As we recall, it was Arc registered automatically through deployment with Windows Admin Center, so nothing else I, I need to do specifically. Back into Azure, I've got this GitOps integration tile, I've got policy, I've got integration with monitoring, automation, all of these things get lit up now that my cluster is Arc enabled. But fundamentally, what I want to show in this demo is how I can start to deploy applications and workloads. And to do that, I'm not going to use policy, that's for compliance and governance. I'm going to use the GitOps tooling, which is a powerful way of automating deployments from that central Git repository. GitHub is a great example, but it could be an alternative enterprise on-prem Git. It could be an alternative public Git repo, whatever it may be. Now, in order to do that, I've got to add what we call a configuration. Now, I have none so far, uh, and so nothing is happening. It, the uh, Arc enable Kubernetes is not changing my cluster in any way. It's not deploying any apps to my Kubernetes cluster. It's not doing anything at this point. So I need to define this configuration. Now, I can do it programmatically through something like Azure CLI, or if I prefer, I can do it graphically. And if you want to do it graphically, all I do is click Add Configuration. I provide some basic parameters, name, uh, instance name, whether I want to, uh, what my operator type is, which is Flux today, but we're working on uh, alternatives and updates to that. You'll see I provide a repository URL as well, which is me basically saying point to this repo, in which case could be GitHub, and pull the code from there. And so in this case, I've got a cluster config here that I've, uh, here's one I created earlier, cooking show style. And if I uh, bring that one up and show you some of the settings I chose. What you'll see is all of those parameters have been defined, names, etc. It's going to check GitHub every three seconds, which is mildly aggressive. But you know our developers are very proactive; they're very busy, so they're always checking in code. Uh, so it's going to check that Git repository, and this one in particular is my personal GitHub with a Hello Arc application uh, that's that's housed in that GitHub location or re repositories more specifically. So what happens now is every couple of seconds, it's going to pull that GitHub, and if it detects a change, or for the first time, it identifies that application, it's going to go ahead and use the Flux operator and the uh, GitOps capabilities to grab that code, grab all of the necessary pieces, and deploy that application down to my, um, my Kubernetes cluster that this configuration is attached to. So if I bring up my Kubernetes uh, cluster, and, and in fact, I'll look at the application first. So I'll go to the IP address of this highly sophisticated enterprise application that I've modernized on premises. It's a web app with a, uh, a banner that says this is Azure Arc GitOps demo, but it's cycling through the pods, the pods that are essentially running this application, of which there are uh, three, I think, in this case. And I've set a special extension in Edge that's going to refresh the page every two seconds so we can see the changes more quickly. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to open my uh, direct link into my Git repo, as all, of the, as all developers should do. We should be checking code right into the main branch, obviously not, uh, but I'm going to do that. Uh, and there's the value that matches what's on the right hand side of the screen uh, in the main web app here. So that's that's the kind of key feature, if you will, that I'm going to change. Um, for those of you who want to see what's going on under the covers, I'm going to bring up this little PowerShell window here as well. And that's going to essentially allow me when I run this watcher command to just see what's happening with the Hello Arc 
um, pods that are running the application that's shown on the right hand side. You can see the little uh, letters that make up this application are matching those on the pod on the right hand side. So let's make an important enterprise change. Uh, so we'll check in. This is an awesome uh, Azure Arc GitOps demo. We'll commit this straight to the main branch. And from there, just watch the PowerShell window. Stuff's happening. Yeah, things are being created, things are being destroyed, things are being created, pending, new things are coming online, things are happening in real time. I've, I've not sped this up, this is just how it's happening. And from there, we've now got our application on the right hand side that, blink and you miss it, is now running the awesome Azure Arc demo. All the three pods that are making up this application are now running the updated version. So that was how I checked in code into a central Git repository and GitOps just took it and deployed it to the cluster that had the configuration applied to it. The more clusters that have the configuration applied, the more broad reach that, up, that upgrade would have. So it's great that we can deploy, it's easy. It's great that we can automate app deployments, that's easy as well, but we've got to get visibility into what's happening. And that's where integration with Azure Monitor, uh, specifically monitoring the Kubernetes layer, provides a lot of value as well. And you'll see I've got I've gathered a few screens here that illustrate some of the different views in respect of containers. So you'll see in this case, we're looking at all of our monitored clusters that have been uh, added in to our, our views here, our Azure Monitor for containers. You see a big list of our clusters. It's got AKS, it could be AKS HCI, OpenShift and more. We get version information, number of nodes, their status, the pods, very useful information for monitoring Kubernetes. When we dig a bit deeper, everyone loves nice graphs. These are a little bit flat, but you know that's fine. We're doing well on utilization, low at least. Uh, and the number of node counts is fluctuating here and there, but we're getting visibility through rich and customizable graphs to understand what's happening in our environment. And as a result, we can also alert on some of these insights as well. When we drill into, in this case, the nodes that make up our Kubernetes clusters, we can see information about what's running on the particular nodes in terms of agents, pods, and so on. Drilling a little bit further into specific controllers uh, that have been deployed as part of applications, you'll see a proxy uh, controller there. There's an OMS related monitoring agent there. We're getting information into what those are like in terms of their use, usage, utilization. And then the containers themselves that ultimately are running the application. So we've got a Azure voting app front end, the back end, the OMS agents. So some of the agents that we deploy down onto the Kubernetes clusters are themselves containerized. So hence why you're seeing them in this view and the different pods and nodes that those are running on. So you knew that if you were having a problem with an app, you could quickly correlate it to a particular pod or a particular node within that cluster and understand if it's encountering issues, the usage, the capacity, thresholds, etc. And then when it comes to protection, I mentioned before that we do a lot of the hard work under the covers to make sure that Kubernetes with AKS HCI is, is secure by default. But there are certain things that we allow you to add on top to enable you to enhance to a level of security that you may require specifically in your environment. So in this case, we're looking at uh, what's the value out of, of things like Azure Defender for Kubernetes, which allows me to centrally manage all of my Kubernetes resources in the context of applying security and detecting compliance against certain um, security settings that we may wish to apply. So we can see alerts by severity, we can see information about what's been detected there and the impact. Uh, so all of these are very useful insights from a security perspective uh, within uh, and applied to not just AKS HCI, but any Kubernetes cluster that is uh, integrated with the solution. So we looked at Kubernetes there, we looked at briefly Arc enabled Kubernetes and how we can use that to deploy apps with GitOps. We touched on Monitor and Defender. Azure Policy, as I said earlier, is a way to apply standardization and governance against, in this case, Kubernetes clusters. And a lot of um, Kubernetes related policies are there by default, and you can obviously define your own as well. But then as we go forward, as I mentioned before, we, Microsoft, are decoupling more and more Azure services from running exclusively in Microsoft data centers to be able to run on Kubernetes outside of Microsoft data centers, but managed through Arc. 
And that's where Arc enabled machine learning with integration to Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, the Azure ML tools that uh, anyone who's played with Azure ML will be familiar with. The Arc enabled data services, so Postgres Hyperscale, SQL Managed Instance, integration with Azure Data Studio, and again, Azure Monitor. Those are now, instead of being exclusive PaaS services that only live in Azure, now they can run on Kubernetes on-prem. And then finally, very popular in Azure, the application services, web apps, logic apps, functions, to name a few. Those are all key parts of the Azure app service. And that too, currently in preview, is decoupling from Azure to enable you to run on-premises uh, on Kubernetes, in this case on Azure Stack HCI. Again, all managed through Arc. So that is a whistle-stop tour of, of kind of getting to know AKS HCI. If, if you only take one thing away, just know that it's easy to deploy and get going. You really can get going with this in a very short space of time and start to learn about Kubernetes and how it operates and how it's different from VMs in a very short space of time, whether it's on existing hardware, whether it's in an Azure VM, uh, you've got options there to, to, to download that. And you can just download straight from the PowerShell gallery or through uh, Windows Admin Center, uh, the extensions built into the later versions of Windows Admin Center. And we've got loads of good documentation to help you on your learning journey. Loads of resources, you'll have the slides, I'll make them available to the team so they can share them. Uh, this is a really good one, actually, the Azure Arc Jumpstart. I'm sure it's probably been talked about on the session uh, or sessions previously. But if you're looking for sandboxes and scenarios to test in a similar way to what MS Lab provides for uh, some of the infrastructure components, the Jumpstart is, is a very powerful way to start to learn some of these Arc components across different areas of uh, not just Kubernetes. And that is me. So I will hand back to the team and check in if there are any questions. Yeah. Um... Matt, that, that was a very interesting presentation. So I think we learned a lot about the basics of um, Azure Kubernetes services. So I have some questions here. Um, okay. Let me see there. Um, can we deploy AKS on Windows Server HCI clusters? And I mean, I think it's uh, Windows Servers mean storage spaces, direct HCI clusters. Yes, you can. Yes. So we fully support uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI 20H2 or Windows Server 2019 uh, and Hyper-V based clusters. Now those clusters can be either using the 2019 HCI S2D or they can be using uh, a remote storage solution that presents a CSV. So if it's a SAN fiber channel iSCSI, that's fine. Um, but yeah, obviously we'd love for it to be HCI, but if that's not the case, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the difference between AKS on Azure Stack HCI and Kubernetes services on Windows Server? Just the name, just the name. When you see the deployment and the eagle eyed among you may have noticed in WAC, it displays as um, the uh, Azure Kubernetes, either Azure Kubernetes service runtime or Azure Kubernetes runtime on Windows Server. It's purely a naming element today. Functionally wise, there wouldn't be a difference that you would you would uh, notice from an AKS HCI perspective. That's not to say there wouldn't be in the future. Uh, as we go forward with AKS HCI on Azure Stack HCI in particular, we've talked about some of the innovation that's going in exclusive to HCI, stretch cluster, uh, GPU support. Some of those things will take uh, AKS, uh, sorry, Azure Stack HCI down a direction that separates from Windows Server. So. In the future, you may find that AKS HCI could hypothetically take advantage of some of those features on one platform that don't exist on the other. Yes, um, because I wanted to, to ask a personal question um, because, because today, as I understand, there's no difference uh, of uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI and AKS on Storage Spaces Direct and AKS on a general Hyper-V cluster. So why choose AKS uh, on Azure Stack HCI? But you, you kind of answered this question already because um, Azure Stack HCI has feature coming, for example, GPU support, and I think some containers could leverage uh, yep. GPU. Uh, so this would only uh, run maybe on Azure Stack HCI and not on, uh, on Storage Spaces Direct or so. 
Correct, yeah, GPU is a good example. Stretch clustering is another. Um, you know, we are working on validating and, and, and scenarios where stretch clustering and AKS HCI uh, will work in harmony. That's something that we, we definitely want to achieve. Um, but I think in addition, you've got to think also about the the choices you're making when you deploy a subscription based Kubernetes service like AKS HCI, it's, it's a subscription. So there's many organizations out there who are looking to match that subscription approach on the, the hypervisor layer as well. So Azure Stack HCI plus AKS and roll all of those up to an Azure subscription. It does bring us back obviously to the Windows Server data center piece that we discussed in the round table earlier around licensing those guests. But from a container perspective um, and from an AKS perspective, it's, it does line up nicely with that, that subscription model of Azure Stack HGI. Mm. So I have a special question because, you know, I'm very interested in containers. I'm an, I'm an old virtual machine guy. <laughs> it was part of my life for the, the last 15, 16 years. And I, I, my Twitter handle is Hyper-V Server. <laughs> you may know that. But I'm, I'm very interested in containers. So we heard, for example, from Ben Armstrong two, 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 two years ago, there's a huge move from Windows workloads into Windows containers. Um, my problem actually is to find uh, useful examples for applications in Windows containers. So most of the Windows applications are uh, have a GUI. And as far as I know, uh, you don't have a GUI with a container. You sometimes have something like an, an VNC uh, client running and you, then you use something else. But uh, GUI and container is not is not quite uh, on, on the same level. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, and it, we it, heard also but, but just and we heard also from uh, from Jeff, there are some really interesting improvements in container in Windows Server 2022. Uh, so uh, something there you can help me with or even the audience because most of the guys here are Windows administrators, not Linux um, uh, Linux guys. And if they want to go to containers, of course, it's Windows and not usually not uh, always Linux, right? Yeah, uh, and you're right on, on the, the application. I think what we've seen most commonly with refat or bringing with legacy Windows applications over is their legacy .NET applications that, that don't necessarily have that local clicking U UI, but more of a web-based experience potentially where you know, you're accessing, it wouldn't be any different accessing through the IP connecting to a container than it would be to a monolithic VM. So I think those would be considerations, but it also introduces the need of some organizations to refactor apps to take advantage, not necessarily just of containerizing on our platform, but containerizing on any platform. If they wanted to modernize that app onto the Azure App Service, they're going to hit the same challenge as they would putting it in a container in terms of how you move away from that, perhaps that local heavy GUI that, that represents that application. So I think the tooling we've provided, we, we provide some with as admin center, we're working on more in, in Atom Migrate, will help organizations modernize uh, as many apps as we can, but there's going to be scenarios where the app needs to be refactored in an experience way that that does require more work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Windows Server 2022 will solve that necessarily, but we from the AKS HCI side are looking to support that uh, in the not too distant future, the, the Windows Server 2022 piece of the infrastructure. So is it fair that there will be all, uh, as long as we have Windows applications that can't be containerized because we don't have the developers anymore, the company who have, who have designed them are not available anymore, um, we need virtual machines uh, still around and there is not a move all in in containers. So we will have a world where we still have a lot of VMs because to be frank, there's old applications running where nobody that are still needed, but nobody can, is there to update them to a to a modernized app that that leverages uh, HTML and so on. Yeah, and, and but you've raised indirectly there. You've raised one of the key value points of the Microsoft solution, because the Microsoft solution is not telling you you can only do VMs or you can only do containers. It's saying Azure Stack HCI plus AKS HCI is a VM and Kubernetes and container solution. So if you do have legacy apps that run 
God forbid, a, a really old version of Windows and you can't get off it and the development team have gone away somewhere and there's just no way, leave it in a VM and protect it with your backup tools and monitor it with your monitoring tools and so on. Because you can do that on HCI and you can do it really well. And you can get great performance out of it because HCI will deliver that on modern hardware. But then for those that can, side by side on the same infrastructure, you've got your containerized platform that can modernize perhaps a different set of applications. But you end up with Azure potentially being a unification of management, of monitoring, of control of those different pieces at the infrastructure, at the app level and more. Uh, and it's a single platform without forcing you down one or the other, which there are vendors out there that, that can only deliver one on one platform. So it's uh, I think that is completely fair. And Microsoft's goal is to not rip VMs from your cold dead hands. It's definitely a, a best of both worlds where it's appropriate. Yeah, OK. Manfred, any questions from an old uh, VM guy also? We have two in the <laughs> chat. We have okay. two more in the chat. Oh, Maybe I didn't see should... that. Uh, we have one uh, about uh, can Windows Admin Center in gateway mode run in a container is here in the chat. It would be a great application. It's ATM, uh, HTML5 based, right? Yes. Would be a great example for something in a container. Yeah, let me Good know idea. how you get on. Let me know how you get on with trying that. Uh, it's, a I service. Don't it's a Windows know. service. It, it, you're right. It, potentially, it would be a great know, example, by the way. I don't know if it's been tested or supported, but you're right. It's the kind of application, stateless in the, in that sense. It's a, it's a good exactly. candidate. Yeah, it could be. Good idea, Manfred. Yeah, good idea. Hang on, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna write that down and steal that idea. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it because we don't we need something for the Windows guys where they can see Windows applications in containers. Because yeah. my problem is, you know, I'm I'm when I started as a Unix developer, so so a Unix guy and Unix developer, I have attachments to Linux and so on. But uh, now starting with container or Kubernetes, it's a whole new world. All the Linux distributions, whatever, um, the the commands that are not the same on every different thing. So you start fresh, and that's yeah. scary for someone who who has done Windows for for ages, right? Yeah, and. So we need something to 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 show it's also possible with Windows. But uh, before it takes me away, because this is re really something <laughs> I'm looking for. No, we could yeah, the we other, could get together and try question. it for sure. We could certainly yeah, try the, it. The, the, the other question is a little bit longer, and I think we have the answer already. I'm I'm double checking it. Um, so in a so in a short, you mean that how how to convert existing Windows VMs and apps running there to convert and get it running. To uh, so it's the question about converting to the it's in the new track, Carson. I think it's related to the containers. How can we convert existing VMs to containerized applications? It's similar to what right. we discussed with the Windows Admin Center. Yeah, I don't have. No, it. I would yeah, I, I would answer it. I would answer it in the same same essentially in the same way. We well, we actually have what I'll say is two approaches. There's the Windows Admin Center approach, which I, I believe it's a, an extension, a container extension that can help you. And don't forget, you're not converting the VM. You're capturing the app from the VM and you know taking off what it needs and, and putting it in a container. In addition to that, the Azure migrate functionality, which um, yesterday it does migrate to AKS, but as I said in the session, that doesn't limit it to living in AKS forever. Uh, therefore, today you could go via AKS to AKS HCI if you wanted to use the Azure migrate functionality instead. Um, so that's what I would say is the two options. There's probably more, mo most likely from third parties and, and the, the community as well. But from a Microsoft standpoint, especially on the Windows side, that's where um, the team have been investing um, uh, on, on helping you migrate those containers. So I, I have one addition to make, and you know that, Matt, of course, and you mentioned it, we need uh, AK, AKS support for stretched uh, stretched uh, Azure Stack HCI clusters because this is a scenario many people waited for for stretched clusters and they want that for Kubernetes clusters as well. So yep. if you put data services on top, um, I think that's a huge demand for that and it's quite, I would say, needed. Where I'm yep. in contact with people who want to do uh, containers and AKS on top of Azure Stack HCI, they're, they're all, always talking about stretch clusters. 
Yep, and it's it's definitely a goal. You know, we are uh, it's, we are validating. We're working with uh, customers as it stands to work through those requirements and what changes might need to be made and enhancements to AKS HCI in order to support the because there's a number of different scenarios as you know with stretch. There's active passive, there's active active, there's synchronous asynchronous, different network configurations. So it's not a trivial amount of work to do the validation, but it's definitely we know that yep. that flagship feature for HCI is important. And so we want to make sure that we take advantage of it as well, because it gives us a layer of redundancy and resiliency that without it is difficult to achieve. So or would you or would you say I should push Mike for that? Because yeah, Mike is up 100%. next. Mike is up next. Mike. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, nice having you on the call. And Matt, uh, thanks so much first for the roundtable. Oh, I know you. you are you are tired, I think, for the round Both table the and, and for the AKS <laughs> session. So next up is is uh, Mike, and Mike will pre get get a little bit deeper, I hope, into Azure Stack, uh, not Azure Stack, sorry, AKS. <laughs> um, uh, Matt di did the groundwork and introdu introduced us to the stuff and uh, why do that and uh, the stuff. But now, Mike, I hope you do. Uh, you said it in your in your announcement. It is um, let me see actual deep dive, a, a architectural deep dive Azure Kubernetes service on HCI. So, Mike, the stage is yours. We see you. Uh, can you say something? I think we hear you. Thanks, well. Thanks Kurt. Yeah, we Thanks we hear you quite well. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me all. We can hear you well. If you share your screen, you can just start because it's eight a eight p.m. in the evening. We are going now. I think. Seven hours already? Yes, uh, <laughs> nearly eight hours. Oh, nearly eight hours. Cool. So if you want, you can start. All right. So while I'm trying to figure out, here is the whiteboard. So because it's an architectural deep dive, let me introduce myself really quick. My name is Mike. Um, I'm a PM lead on the AKS HCI team. And um, my, uh, my team owns the deployment, um, it owns the um, the general, the, all the base components of Kubernetes, and as well as all the first-party interactions with our first-party teams um, in in Microsoft who use Kubernetes at the edge. So, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a quick um, or a, a quite extensive walk down uh, what all the pieces are that Matt just talked about briefly. We're going to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, and let me see if that works. Um, if my pen works, then I could actually draw. OK. So when we start out, as Matt said, we'll have a either an AKS HCI, an Azure Stack HCI cluster or a Windows Server based cluster. And let me make that a little smaller. And we got so I'm going to start out with four nodes. I'll call them very simple node one, two, three, four. You'll have some sort of storage underneath and, and I'm not going to dive into what that's going to be, but that's going to offer things like CSV based storage uh, or, and also a place where we can store all our VHDXs and all the other things that um, that, that, that AKS on HCI uses. And I'm not going to dive into all that basic stuff, but um, on top of that, there's also failover clustering. So we're going to take that. And so those are the basic components that AKS on HCI um, gets built on. So when we go through the first step of deploying the management cluster, a few things happen. Uh, first, what we're going to deploy here is a component called, and I'm going to zoom in so I can write better. That's going to be something like called a node agent, and that goes on each of the physical nodes. That's a component that um, comes as part of AKS HCI as part of the management components. And those node agents, they do things like configure networking, they um, they configure uh, storage for, for the VMs. They instantiate virtual machines and things like that. So how do they get to that stuff? Because when you're deployed, there's nothing there. So we do have the, the big, the great big internet here. 
and there's a piece out there that's called Secure File Service, SFS. And that's where, where we store all our VHD images, where we store our um, mock components, and, and we kind of come to mock and, and all these other bits and pieces, the binaries that make up AKS HCI, they're all stored out there um, on that. And there's uh, the PowerShell gallery is out there which contains all the PowerShell modules that, that both WAC and also our PowerShell deployment um, actually use. So when we do a set AKS HCI config and then call in and then do an install AKS HCI, what happens is we'll, we'll initialize failover clustering and we'll deploy a clustered service. Uh, let me take that out here really quick and make that a little bigger. We'll deploy a clustered service that's called Cloud Agent. And the cloud agent gets an IP address um, out of the VIP pool, and we'll talk about VIP pool a little bit more later. Um, and then that cloud agent actually is our interface um, that that our management cluster talks to to deploy itself and then other components inside AKS HCI. So when when that happens, once the cloud agent service is up, you'll find it also in 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 the cluster manager. It's something like it, it's called CA dash and then has some random numbers and letters after it. Uh, so that kind of identifies that piece. Never delete it because if you delete it, your cluster is done and you'll have to go and, and redeploy. So what happens after this, uh, we'll download the VHD image for the management cluster and that is um, the um, our, our KVA or Kubernetes virtual appliance. And that thing gets run in a Mariner VM, which is Mariner Linux. And it's basically a single node Kubernetes cluster. And that brings in some K8s and a lot of pods, in, including the Arc agent that makes the connection to Azure. And things like that. So once that's deployed, um, we have all bits and pieces in place, uh, and that's our Kubernetes virtual appliance. Kubernetes virtual appliance. And so once we have that, we can actually go and deploy um, a target cluster. This is what Matt showed in the second demo, is where our Windows um, worker nodes come down and then the worker node images get instantiated, the node pools get instantiated. But the first thing that gets pulled up when there is a, a, a target cluster that gets deployed is a Kubernetes control plane. And that's pretty opaque to the customer. And writing on a laptop screen is really difficult because it always flexes. So that's a Kubernetes control plane for our, for our target cluster. Once that's deployed, it gets our connected to the, um, it connects to Azure and then the Kubernetes clusters are connected. It enables the AD connection. All those things get enabled and turn on. And once that's in place, we'll spin up the node pool. And as Matt said, there is a couple of different node pools that we can deploy. So there is Linux node pools, they consist of one, two, N Linux machines. And then there is Windows node pools. Um, they consist of one or more Windows machines. So this is a node pool. And this is a node pool. So now we got all node pools deployed, but one thing is missing. So how do we how do, how do we access applications that run on those node pools in pods on those node pools? And for that, Kubernetes uses a, a concept called services, and those services are hosted. Uh, they, those services get ass assigned a virtual IP address. Uh, and for that, we have a load balancer that currently is HA proxy. And that get also, gets also deployed as part of the control plane deployment. And we'll reassign the complete VIP pool that's specified as part of the um, new AKS HCI cluster network command. That VIP pool is assigned here. And whenever you deploy a Kubernetes service to one of those, those nodes here, so that's a service here, 
then it gets one IP address out of that VIP pool. And then customers can use that, that extra, that's usually an external IP address that's also fronted by say an F5 or a big IP or some other external uh, that basically publishes that IP address to the internet. And then we got the internet here and we got our client out here that accesses the service. And that will go here and goes through the VIP pool through the load balancer and gets redirected to the service. And that that service can consist out of multiple applications that run on uh, multiple nodes for high availability and it's all a single IP that gets published. So this is kind of the, 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 the rough or the high level structure how how these things come together in, in, in AKS HCI. Um, so well, now I want to dig into uh, some of those some of those basic components. So let's swipe up here. So I said we have a component called the node agent. And the node agent knows how to talk to storage. So for example, it enables the CSVs for all the for all the VHDs that run on there for for all the VMs up there to actually uh, expose um, at uh, CD storage for Kubernetes to expose storage for the Arc agent and, and other things as well as uh, provide shared storage for the application that runs in the Kubernetes cluster. It also knows about the physical network. And that's kind of an interesting thing where we integrate with the with the network on on the HCI cluster in a very high level fashion right now. As 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 Matt said, we're using Calico as the default CNI, which is an overlay network uh, in Kubernetes. But in the future, the node agent will also integrate the Calico network or the Kubernetes network with SDN on on HCI, and that is something that we are um, actively actively developing right now, and um, is going to be act is actively in development. And then the last thing that this actually talks to is the failover clustering or the VM subsystem, the, the virtual machine subsystem on HCI uh, to create the VMs, associate a network adapter with it, assign an IP, and there's another set of IP addresses which you specify by the uh, when you create the cluster network, that's the node IPs and the node IP pool is is the one that gets associated with each of those uh, um, uh, virtual machines that that are the container nodes, the container host nodes. So the node agent deals with that. The cloud agent on the fail of a clustering is an interface for the for the management cluster and that cloud agent also gets an IP address out of set AKS HCI config. So here, we have all those configuration parameters that make deploying AKS HCI really simple and, 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 and really a breeze to do like Matt showed in his demo. So that's all I have in terms of the graphics and I'm going to switch back to the presentation here and, and hope we'll have a good discussion on some of the, um, on some of the uh, topics that I just raised. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, Mike, do Mike, you have do more have content, more content or, or should we discuss this uh, now? No, let's get let's go into discussion. I wanted to leave a lot of time to to, to answer specific questions. Yes. So because otherwise I lose myself in discussing things for three hours and we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, we can discuss up to the uh, hour because then the the next guys are um, available. So. Um, if other other have questions, feel free. But I'm interested in the load bands balancer. Um, mm -hmm. Is it one virtual machine, or uh, can you have multiple virtual machines? And how then would they take the traffic from the outside world? Okay, so this is a really great question. This is a really great question, Carsten. Uh, so it's one virtual machine right now that runs HA proxy. Uh, we do allow you in the in an upcoming version will allow you to deploy this highly available. So right now it uses failover clustering. So if that one 
load balancer dies, it gets thrown over to it, or when the node dies where it runs on, it gets moved to another node and it comes back up and, and the load balancer continues to work. But in the future, we'll also allow highly available deployments for multiple. But also what we're doing right now is building uh, the, a way to, so you can bring your own load balancer. You don't have to rely on a VM-based one uh, that's HA proxy. You can bring things like Metal LB, for example, uh, that's a Kubernetes-based load balancer that runs in multiple pods distributed across the entire AKS HCI cluster. Mm -hmm. So um, then I got the impression the the KVA. This is uh, this is the first uh, the first step of the of the deployment, right? So this is, is a, let's say master Kubernetes cluster. It's a management cluster. Yes. Yeah. So it's it. it Actually, now it's it's also in one virtual machine, right? The default deployment is one virtual machine, but you can deploy as many as you want. You just specify that as part of the uh, set AKS HCI config. Okay, but I think it's it can't be done in the GUI. It has to be done with uh, with uh, PowerShell. PowerShell then. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Windows Admin Center doesn't allow you to change that right now. Uh, something we're working on though. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so as far as I understand, um, I, I talked with a guy. There is a day zero experience that, that is now in uh, in Windows Admin Center. That's a deployment of all the stuff, right? But uh, if you have to handle it uh, afterwards, if you want to deploy more pods, more VMs for, for the nodes or so on, that's it's all only possible with PowerShell, but you are working, I think, on in Windows Admin Center to also uh, offer this capabilities because the Windows guys, you know, usually love mouses and uh, mm -hmm. and pens and uh, are not usually the command led guys. I know Jaromir would say learn PowerShell and get over it, but still uh, there is some hesitation about only doing <laughs> uh, using uh, PowerShell or uh, something else. Right. So yes, Windows Admin Center is actually gaining day two operations, what we call them. Um, yeah. uh, basically with every monthly release. So you now can scale a cluster. Uh, you can create additional load pools. You can scale node pools up and down. Those things are already in the latest Windows Admin Center release. And as we move move to the next release, there's going to be even more day two operations showing up. OK, and uh, you use the cluster. Uh, do you do you use um, the cluster the, the, um, to put the worker nodes or the the pod nodes on different uh, different uh, hardware servers. So uh, do you use an anti affinity rules uh, for that? Uh, otherwise, I could imagine uh, that that all the Linux uh, VMs are work are running on the same cluster node and this node has a problem and dies. So the, everything is coming up, of course, but you have some problems. So yeah. do you leverage so that? We are definitely using the failover clustering mechanism to distribute the, the load. Uh, evenly across all the physical servers. That was an issue with the GA release uh, that got fixed. Um, I think in the July, I think a July drop actually fixed that. So we're mm -hmm. now distributing the node pools um, physically across all the physical nodes. Okay. Um, what I'm interested in, I will, I will look to the if there are any questions about this so far because I think. Most of the guys uh, didn't expect the whiteboard session. I was also surprised, but I love them. Uh, um, <laughs> no, there's not much here. Um, can you maybe elaborate about the update process? Because uh, you update the Mariner Linux and the components, right. or you 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 offer new versions, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is updated through Windows Update, I assume. Or how is the process there, and okay. how does it work? OK, that, that's an excellent question. Let me jump back to the whiteboard for that uh, because yeah. I think it's easier to draw that uh, to draw that out. So let me scroll up here. So let's assume we have a management cluster. So I'll just draw one square here or one, one rectangle here for the management cluster. Uh, so that's our KVA. And let's assume this runs Kubernetes version 122. And then we'll have a, I'll just say target cluster. And that's on 119.11. Those are the Kubernetes versions, by the way. So when we publish a new version, uh, we'll, 
uh, we'll have SFS here. And we'll publish a new version and that version will be. Kubernetes contains Kubernetes 121 one and 120 whatever five, right? So the first thing that happens when I call the, the update. AKS HCI commandlet. What will happen is it will go and grab the latest version and then update the, the KVA. So that's going to be 121.1. So first thing is all the VMs that run KVA, worst case it's one, so you'll have some downtime for day zero and day two operations. But so first this will be updated. It'll spin up a new VM. It'll spin up a new KVA in parallel before the first. So this one's still up, but it's read only at this point. And that's going to be 121. One. And once that's up and running, we'll migrate all the data over. And once the data's migrated over, this one gets deleted. And so now we are running on KVA 121.1. Once that's done, um, the customer can now go and call update AKS HCI cluster and provide the name, whatever, my cluster, right? And this is my cluster here. Yeah. This is one with the control plane you, you specified, right, right? Exactly. So this one runs a control plane, has a bunch of worker nodes. So let's say it has two Windows worker nodes and it has two Linux worker nodes. And the control plane and maybe the uh, the, the the proxy. And this is our control plane and yeah. and it also has our HA proxy, right? Which is here. So what's going to happen first is and when I do the update AKS HCI cluster again, if I don't specify anything and 119.11 is still supported, then we will just update the operating system, but the Kubernetes version stays the same. Same for HA prox. If there's a newer version, we'll just do the same same rolling update. So we'll bring in a new target cluster with new OS. And that's like OS version one, and this is OS version two for simplicity. So now we have 119.11, but we have version two as the OS. HA proxy was the same version, so it, it stayed untouched. Oops. Uh, there we go. So HA proxy stays the same. It's untouched. All my applications are still running, right? At mm -hmm. that point. And then it's going to go and update all the worker nodes. So it's going to go for the Windows worker nodes. It spins up a new one. When the update's done, it deletes this one and then basically drains this one. Uh, it drains one node, then it basically uh, blocks it from. Um, getting new scheduled uh, workloads and then the new node comes up, all the workloads get scheduled and it goes through and does each node one after the other. And then once that's done, all the old nodes get destroyed and all the new nodes run and the cluster is now in the newest version of the operating system, but um, with the same Kubernetes version. So the yeah. other thing that you can do, of, of course, is I can I can also add another pro, uh, parameter here and say Kubernetes version and specify one. What did we say? One twenty one one, one twenty one one. Then the same flow will happen, but in, besides also doing the OS upgrade, we're also going to swap the the Kubernetes version and update that at the same time. At, at the same in the same step, right? In the same step, okay. yes. So uh, as you may know, Windows administrators have a kind of fear about updates. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no Windows, uh, uh, just a theory, there's no Windows up, uh, admin there that has never had a problem with a Windows update. So uh, if this is all fully automated, so if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. what can we do? Or is there a, a 
the, the, um, the, the not the fear, but is there the chance that you uh, end up with a cluster that is not working? How do you prevent that? Because it's just one command and your whole cluster components will uh, will be updated. Yeah. So, so the way the way you prevent that is very much the same as you do it on on a virtual machine based uh, system where your application runs on a VM. You're not blindly auto updating everything, right? As a customer, the customer yeah. runs a test pass, so you'll have a staging cluster or a test node pool that you update first, where your application runs in a test environment, and you'll make sure your app keeps running on the new version before okay. you trigger. The production cluster update, right? It's like Matt checking uh, checking in code into main directly. That's not a good yeah. thing. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the customers we talk to, they all have some processes in place to actually validate before they update production, and that's okay. the important piece here. So you'll basically go, you'll run the update through on your staging servers, you're tested, you're validated, if it works, you go and pr put it in production. And over time, the customer is going to get confidence that, oh no, this one didn't break the last 19 times. So maybe with 20, we can actually go directly and and, and trust Microsoft to do the right thing. So from a, if you're, if the, that the container is still the same, right? So your container image will still be the same, it's, at least on Linux. You don't have to rebuild your container image. If you switch Windows main server, uh, Windows main builds, then will become, you'll have to redo your container image before you do the update. Yeah, and, and your you application care, might not launch. Yeah. And you take care that uh, the Azure Stack HCI versions and mm -hmm. storage bases direct 2019. Yeah. Uh, it's tested on that uh, on that uh, environment. Correct. Correct. Yes. I, so we have uh, we have test passes. We have sample applications that some of our um, EAP customers, our, our early adopter program customers, have shared with us, uh, where we are or some processes and flows that they have, microservices they have, and and we're basically in, in, include those in our pipeline test passes. Okay. So in the uh, I had a question here that was wasn't answered in the in the last session that Matt did, but I think it's uh, also uh, valid uh, to ask it you. Some uh, some uh, attendee asks uh, if we have now DDA support, so for GPUs uh, mm -hmm. in Azure Stack HCI 21 H2, um, could could it be used potentially in a container or will it break the uh, isolation of a container? Depends. I think it depends. He, so the, the classical Microsoft answer, it depends. Of course. You are principal <laughs> so program it, it, it manager. Depends so on, it depends on your GPU. Um, it yeah. depends on, on what the card is that you use. So T4s are the most uh most common ones we see right now. Those are the ones we we are working on supporting. And with DDA, no, it's not going to break the isolation of the container, but there is some considerations to take into account. I would not deploy those in a hostile multi-tenant environment, for example. Yeah. yeah right? So for, for an internal application that runs some GPU-based workload that has no chance of some outsider to come in and, and do something weird with the GPU, I'm fine. Um, the A100s or the A70s, the A40s, those are much um, are much more advanced cards that allow things like GPU slicing and 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 sharing a GPU across multiple VMs, for example. And so those will be once we support those on on um, HCI, uh, things will become uh, much more much more high fidelity than it is with the T4s right now. Yeah. Then I have another question because AKS uh, uh, um, is not free on Azure Stack HCI or on Storage Basis Direct. You have to pay for the worker nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so we have to have connection to Azure somehow because I think they are they are built through Azure. Is it done by the uh, by the Azure Stack HCI cluster or is it done by the KVA? Or something how because when I think of storage bases direct, <clears throat> there is no not the requirement for an Azure connection mm -hmm. per se. So it can't be a component in the Windows server, it must be something in the container. And some oh, of right. the IP addresses have, have to communicate with, mm -hmm. with Azure, right? Yes, absolutely. So KVA 
through the ARC connection of the KVA, uh, ah. we transmit the billing data. There's a pod, there's a set of pods running in the KVA that do the inventory, uh, that check how much, uh, that basically concatenate how much uh, vCPU is used for worker nodes. And then it reports that uh, at a regular interval. And so like with, with HCI, you'll have to connect to Azure at least once every 30 days. Mm -hmm. So once you run out of 30 days, once you run out, sorry, yeah. once you run out of those 30 days, um, you won't be able to do any day two operations anymore. Okay. So in, in Windows Admin Center, there's a question if you want to uh, in, uh, in, include your uh, AKS, um, AKS cluster into ARC, mm -hmm. but then I, I assume the KVA is automatically included in Correct. ARC, otherwise you can't yes. do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's only for target clusters you can choose to project them into Azure. The KVA is always connected. Okay. So I'm quite satisfied with, with what I hear um, or, or heard. So other topics you may want to touch on because we have still half an hour to the next sure. session. Uh, sure. And I think I think there's there's a couple of things that are that are really of interest for this for 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 the attendees here. Uh, and then one is uh, what we're working on for uh, the rest of the calendar year, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have our public roadmap. Matt had it also on his resource slide what, where, where the roadmap is to be found. But GPU support is one, as I mentioned. So that is currently in private preview with a set of with multiple customers. Um, we're working on a, a deployment guide for the retail industry, for example. That is something we've been asked for by a lot of customers. And so if there is interest from uh, this group or customers you know, then then that would be definitely of interest to to include those into the discussions we're having right now. Because there's some certain there's some specific challenges with deploying into uh, a lot of different branch office environments. And so learning about those environments, what they look like, what the requirements of those customers are, uh, is definitely something we want to we want to dive into a lot more. Um, another thing we're working on right now is integration of service mesh. I'm not sure how how from your point of view, how far that that is, how how, how value, valuable that's going to be. But we have a lot of US customers asking for service mesh right now. Yeah, I, I must confess, I, I don't really know what service mesh is. I think I heard it, but I have no clue what it really is. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. What sure, is sir. it? And I have then another question for you, but uh, first first okay. service mesh, what is it? Sure. So service mesh allows you to, to connect interconnect multiple or lots of Kubernetes clusters or containerized services. Okay. So and it allows you to manage those in a in a coherent fashion across multiple clusters. So if you have say you have a branch office network, you are uh, Walmart and you have thousands of stores and each store runs a Kubernetes cluster all with the same application. You want to apply policies across all those applications. Yeah. You'll use service mesh to do that and expose that application. So that's kind of where service mesh comes into play and it helps okay. with managing those large networks. Yeah, I may be interested in that because I'm I'm in the moment in a POC with a customer who has some branches and uh, there's also my next question. I see um, a lot of interest or more interest in the data services on mm -hmm. Kubernetes that are available in Azure. So as far as I as as far as I understand, it's SQL, for example, in a container, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, Arc managed or so, and we heard about that, and then you get it on AKS on premises. So mm -hmm. the, the first question would be, um, if a customer needs some kind of high availability for their SQL, they have high available SQL databases now, and they want to to go to the data services. Is there a possibility to to do high uh, high availability there? I don't know if that's, that's your your topic of expertise, but uh, it's not rather... it's not it's not totally my topic of expertise. But from a from an infrastructure point of view, it is supported. Um, it's slightly different from what you would do in Azure because we don't support regions right now, so you can't have uh, multiple failover regions and things like that. So. Those things will are coming, but you can deploy high available SQL data, ARC enabled data services on AKS HCI today. And that will somehow uh, keep them apart or so, so not. Yes. 
Okay. Okay. And then what you're not getting because you're not supporting stretch cluster yet. So once we support stretch cluster, you get different physical locations. You get all those additional things, but right now it's all assumed in a well connected single location. Yeah. I do have two yep. customers that deploy stretch clusters today with AKS HCI very successfully, but they have very high uh, bandwidth, low latency connections between those locations. Yeah, so um, I do. Stretch cluster doesn't really know that they're to, they're like 20 kilometers apart. Yeah, that uh, in in Germany it's 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 a country of stretching everything. I got the impression. So <laughs> we have a lot of stretch cluster even in the mid area of customers. So not only the the larger ones do that. So even uh, 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 Mittelstand customers is the German word. So mid sized customers and. Um, all the um, all the Azure Stack HCI deployments I basically do are stretch cluster deployments. So, uh, uh, but most of the time they are on one campus. So you have maybe some hundred meters or some hundred feet okay. with, between the the sites. So it's not really five kilometers, ten, okay. fifty, m multiple hundred kilometers. It's really on site. So the latency is not not uh, not uh, high there, mm -hmm. and they. Uh, they always ask uh, when when we talk about data services, they always ask about stretch cluster. So um, we know that it's not coming or it's not planned this year, but mm -hmm. maybe you can uh, can give us um, an impression. Uh, how high is it on your list? Uh, do you hear the question for stretch cluster often with AKS? Yes. Or is it is it more I'm asking and to other customers? No, it's <laughs> actually it's actually a fairly uh, it's a fairly common question. Um, yeah. And it has come up frequently, and it's pretty high up on our list of things that we want to tackle in the next semester. Yeah. Okay. It would so, be help. Yeah. It would be helpful for you if the same IP addresses are on both sides uh, and so on, something like that. Um, yeah, that helps. Um, it also because we'll have to change our network configuration quite drastically to make it work uh, yeah. with different IP spaces in the in the different locations, but. Uh, this is something we're looking at. So if you have a set of requirements from different uh, deployments that you're looking at, uh, definitely interested in hearing about those. Yeah, Mike, uh, I'm I'm also on the AAP, A, EAP program for Kubernetes. Uh, IAKS would be cool. Uh, I have one special customer, or maybe the uh, maybe two, to be mm -hmm. honest, that are very interested in data services on uh, stretched uh, stretched uh, Azure Stack HCI and with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, get in touch. Topics. Let's get in touch next week when I'm when I'm back from vacation and and yeah. let's uh, talk about that uh, next week then. No, of course it it, it doesn't. It, it's not so important that we have to discuss it uh, even next week. So other topics uh, we want to touch because we have still some time. Otherwise, yeah, we have two questions. Um, so there were a couple of questions. I see a bunch of questions that have popped up uh, in in the Teams chat in the QA. Yeah. So where are they? You go a little bit here. They started. Ah, OK. When will we see the corresponding Windows admin center support? <laughs> for, <laughs> yeah, that's not for you, I think, for uh, uh, Azure Stack HCI 21H2 GPU support for KA. As pods, okay, it's it's yes, it's it sort is of for, you. for me, but it's it's also a and 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 HCI question, but it's it's a mix. But yeah, so HCI, I've I've heard, I've heard the next Windows Admin Center update should have it. Yeah, uh, I think for we saw it. VMs for VMs on on HCI twenty one H two, and then for K eights, we are for AKS on HCI. We are looking um, either very late this year, but most likely early next year. And you so mean uh, you mean not fiscal year? You mean you mean you mean the fiscal year, calendar. not the Microsoft year. Calendar. Yeah. The calendar year. Okay. Yes. So what else do we have? Oops. No, I. So I first have to read them. <laughs> so there's a question of how much free space on CSV should we maintain for the K8's upgrade progress as a percentage? So you should at least have. Um, from the largest VM size you chose and your largest VM disk you have deployed, you should have at least twice that. So say you're running, uh, your worker nodes run 32 gigs, 16 vCPUs, and you're using um, 
128 gig storage disk, then you should have at least 256 gigs there uh, for the upgrade process. Mm. Okay. It will upgrade one cluster after the other, so it is it is definitely uh, there's no simultaneity there. So if you have 10 clusters, you upgrade. You try to start it for all 10. We'll upgrade one after the other. It's not um, parallelized right now. Yeah, you said 10. I, I thought there was actually a limitation of four clusters in, in a deployment. Is that not uh, there anymore? Or, no, or there's, no I... hard, there's no hard limit. So um, we are the, the things we see mostly are two to five clusters. Yeah. Uh, with the average be, being three right now, but um, we are we are testing for way above that. And same with the four node limit, right? We save it's four nodes. That's recommended, and that's what we're seeing mostly. But we're also seeing uh, an influx of six node clusters right now, and mm -hmm. whatever HCI can scale to, you can scale to. It all depends okay. on what um what's the mem what's the hardware limitations you have. It's not like Azure where you have unlimited resources or almost unlimited resources to grow. So you'll have to be careful when you when you define uh, how much you want to put onto the physical hardware. Yeah, there are some commands about the networking stuff. Some said, and I, I'm not sure uh, what that means. You can use Lisp today to do GRE, no GRE uh, overlay or VXLAN overlays to cover the networking issue, and it natively works in NCP, whatever NCP is VMware, I guess. Yeah. So it's not it's not in it's not in uh, Windows uh, or in Azure Stack HCI. Uh, another one is maybe you could stretch the layer two networking with Azure extended networking between two sites for AKS on stretch cluster. But yeah, there's, how, there's how definitely those you? are all options. Those are all options, and yeah. and we are definitely looking at uh, what HCI is doing in that space, and then we're we're layering on top of that. But keep okay. in mind that Kubernetes always has an overlay in, in our current deployment. AKS another has overlay. An overlay network that completely ignores the underlying network. So. Or, or mostly ignores the underlying network. So, so if you now if you now integrate in SDN, the next session is about SDN. Uh, you have still another overlay network in Kubernetes, right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. A much so a lot of overlay. SDN and then SDN is opaque to Kubernetes as the way it's deployed right now. Uh, then it basically sits the 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 VXLAN overlay network sits on top of that. Okay. Cool. Network policy controller. Ah, network policy controller. That's something uh, Windows has. OK, thank you for clarification. So it was not about VMware. Uh, it was NCP was a network policy uh, controller. It would be NPC. And, some, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you can use Lisp uh, guy. <laughs> Does know uh, K8S, uh, I think, uh, a lot. So much more than I do. Other topics we can uh, we can touch because we are out of questions. OK. Um, so because you spoke about SDN, so there's a there's also an effort going on and David Schott's going to talk about that, I believe, in the next session uh, to integrate actually directly with SDN to go away from the overlay network in to allow you to go away from the overlay network in Kubernetes to actually attach directly to SDN your pods. OK, and so that, that's going to be an interesting thing too for customers because it removes a complete layer of networking and makes things much easier. OK, cool. So um, as far as I understand, we have a uh, Kubernetes is the, the developing fast and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not easy to keep up. Uh, I was surprised. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Kubernetes rookie, would, I would say. Uh, I, I can barely use a uh, cube cuttle or how it's called. Even there is confusion about the name. Um, but I learned, for example, that Docker doesn't use or Docker is not any more anymore used in Kubernetes. So I, there's something about container D. Uh, so I imagine it's hard for you guys to keep up with all the changes or. Um, it depends what the way you look at. If you look at it, Kubernetes has switched from a six time release, six releases a year to three releases per year now. Oh, that's so they, easy then. They have matured much. They have also matured. 
there is definitely monthly patch releases for CVEs and other hot fixes. Um, the one, the one thing for the last, the last minor release came out, and that removed Docker shim support. Yes, so we're now basically Docker also runs Container D under the covers, but there is a shim on top of it, and that support got got removed from um, uh, from Kubernetes. So we're switching to native Container D now, or we have switched yeah. to native Container D. Yeah. Yeah. For the customer, there's no difference. The containers keep running. It's really the container runtime that now is pure container D and does not talk through that adapter interface that Docker yeah. had before. So I, I I heard something, but I'm not uh, quite sure if it's true. Um, you you skipped the storage part, and that maybe that's not uh, the, your expertise. But there is, I think, in Kubernetes is NFS supported? Is there also SMB supported because it's a Windows thing? Uh, I think in AKS and in, in, in Azure it's supported, or? Yes. It, um, all, but SMB all, is, is barely used in AKS in the cloud, um, but it's used heavily, obviously, in, in, in AKS on HCI because that's the predominant storage interface we have. But we also yeah. support um, other storage interfaces like Azure Blob Storage or something like that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would I would say um, if we don't have any more questions. Um, well, Not for the container part, I think so. We finished all the questions in the in the Q and A. I think so. Hopefully, we didn't miss anyone. Yeah. So maybe you can look through the Q and A again, Mike, later and answer some questions. And I would oh, say thank you. Yeah, or do you There's want one to question that just came in? Um, is KVA a management node and Kubernetes control plane is the master node? Then how to make the control plane HA? So KVA is an is an appliance, it's a single node Kubernetes cluster. So it runs a Kubernetes cluster, control, Kubernetes control plane inside that VM. And you can make that HA by just specifying you want to run three instances of it. Uh, in set AKS HCI config. You cannot do that in Windows Admin Center, only works in PowerShell, but then it will deploy three uh, of three VMs, for example, or you can deploy five, whatever you, you desire. And keep in mind though that the more you deploy, the more resources you take away from your HCI cluster, obviously. Um, and running KVA as HA uh, has, also, has also certain downside if you go beyond three nodes uh, with etcd reliability. Uh, and that's something we're working on for uh, future release next next calendar year to actually improve on that. Okay, so it it is possible, and as far as I know, you don't pay for the management uh, VMs Correct. like the KVA yes. and the control plane and so on. It's only the worker nodes. The that Linux, is correct. Uh, yes, only the, the only the V cores of the worker nodes are are built. Yeah, yes. and and the real cores, not the um, hyperthreaded. I learned if if that's correct. That is correct. Yes. <laughs> okay, so if there are more questions, please type them in the Q and A. And otherwise, Mike is done with his session. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, sorry for uh, taking the session and asking my questions because I'm very curious about. Uh, the AK, AKS stuff and how it's done, and I learned I learned more, and I have to look at the PowerShell deployment I learned, not at the Windows Admin Center. It's so convenient if you click around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but one more question: If you yes. have a production production uh, container cluster, uh, the IP addresses you provide, how how large should you, should they be? So a CNET or so. So it, it depends. It all depends on how 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 many worker nodes you want to deploy. So we recommend that uh, on, in the documentation we have kind of like a formula, quote unquote, how to come up with the right set of IP addresses. But uh, you specify you need a you need an IP address for each worker node in the in a node pool uh, or in a target cluster, and you need an IP address for each service that you plan to run in that cluster. So. And then you need an additional two or three for updating. Right? For updating. So, and also take into account control plane. So if you're running your control plane HA, you need additional IP addresses for that. So it, say you want to run 15 worker nodes and three control plane nodes, that's 18 nodes. You need 18 IPs plus two for updating. And you need at least a VIP pool of three addresses for the API server. You need one, one IP address. You need a second IP address for 
an update when when the H on the H in the HA proxy gets updated, and then the third one would be available for your application service. So, but you're saying you're saying you want around hundreds of service, hundred services, then you need a hundred and three, right? So yeah, okay. So okay. So keep that in mind when you define it, because right now we do not allow you to change it once it's deployed. And you so, you uh, you uh, prefer. Uh, static IP addresses and not DHCP uh, uh, as far as I understand. Oh? That is correct. So DHCP is not recommended for production deployments for the simple reason that it's very easy to mix up DHCP scopes across different deployments and, and you can you end up other pieces in the, in the infrastructure using up IP addresses you don't want to have used up. Uh, okay, okay. There's another uh, question from Anonymous. That's always great. Uh, is KVA a um, is KVA a management node and K A K eight Kates K A S K K eight S <laughs> control plane is the master node? Then how to make the control plane HA? I so understand same question, thing when you. for a target cluster to make the control plane HA, you specify the control plane VM count, uh, and that is. Uh, a parameter on new AKS HCI cluster, and you just say three, and then it'll deploy three of them. So all in PowerShell, not in WAC, all in but PowerShell. maybe we get we get it some sometime in WAC because WAC it, also it will show up in Windows Admin Center eventually. Right now, it's just in PowerShell. Okay. Yeah, Mike, I, I think uh, I we, we asked all the questions. You could answer everything I wanted to know and also the audience. So thank you so much for jumping in for, for Ben. I, I understand you are in, at holiday as Ben, but you you unfortunately for yourself has internet has internet connection, right? Correct. I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually near Vienna in Austria, so I'm in the same time zone as you are. <laughs> oh, that, that's good to know. So uh, uh, your last name sounds a bit like uh, like European with a Z in it, so that's yeah. Austrian. It's Austrian, it's actually. Yeah, I'm Helmut. I'm, Helmut, Helmut comes up. <laughs> <laughs> Another Austrian. <laughs> so you speak yeah. Austrian? Do you yeah, speak? I'm actually uh, born and grown up in Vienna. Okay, then you. Then this is a uh, yeah, great, great to have having you here. <laughs> so thanks, Mike. And uh, uh, Helmut, do you have a question for your fellow Austri Austrian uh, countryman? Uh, not really, because when he started uh, holidays, he was uh, in, on a coffee break in Linz. Ah, oh, <laughs> so you know the guy. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> we, we, we already discussed <laughs> some of the questions. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you discussed I, them. I answered not, all not... those questions over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for asking question, I missed the lunch. <laughs> okay, so thanks, thanks so much. I see the uh, SDN guys showing up, but we have still ten minutes to. Yeah. The... I I think it's a good if we are if we, we, decide we to finish this session. I yeah. think we are done. You can, uh, Mike, you can go back to your holiday or sleep or whatever. Sounds good. Thanks so much for being Thank here. You. And, and if there's anything that to... comes up afterwards, just shoot me an email. I'll respond next week. Yeah, and I will contact you about the customers. Uh, um, uh, uh, where where we want to do Azure um, AKS with uh, data services. So thanks. So good, Manfred, yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Manfred has yeah. an idea Bye. now. Yeah, we, we, we have a question and I think we had several questions yesterday and today where maybe there are some misunderstandings about the basics. So actually we have the question, does HCI use storage spaces direct question mark? I believe it does. So maybe let's uh, clarify. Are you are sure it does? Yeah, th th this is the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely sure. Because <laughs> I believe it sure. does. <laughs> no, this was part of the question. I Do another that. voice if you ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, to, to, to clarify that for everybody, it's clear what we are talking about. The technology is always storage spaces direct. Right. So the technology was introduced in Windows Server 2016 data center. It was storage spaces direct. In Windows Server 2019, it was and is storage spaces direct. In Windows Server 2022, it is storage spaces direct. In Azure Stack HCI, it's storage spaces direct. But See, the, the confusion about Azure Stack HCI is there because um, in the area of Windows Server 2019, Microsoft started 
to talk about Azure Stack HCI already, but there was no OS Azure Stack HCI operating system. Azure Stack HCI in those days was the name or the, 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 the naming of the certified hardware. And the hardware vendors started to use Azure Stack HCI as a synonym for storage spaces. Direct 2019. Yeah, 2019. And I've heard this so often. It's not correct what I'm saying now, but I have very often heard um, sentences like this. Oh, Microsoft started with Storage Spaces Direct. Then they moved to Azure Stack HCI and now they are back with Storage Spaces Direct in Windows Server 2022. This is not correct. It was always Storage Spaces Direct. The technology is Storage Spaces Direct. What changed is the meaning of Azure Stack HCI. In Windows Server 2019 area, uh, so till mid of tw uh, calendar year 2020, it was the name for the certification program of the hardware. And starting in December 2020, when Microsoft launched this new Azure Stack HCI operating system, since this launch date, it's only used for the Azure Stack HCI mm -hmm. operating system. But the official naming is not Azure Stack HCI OS. It's only Azure Stack HCI and it's uh, with an addition of the version 20 H2, 21 yes, H2. Absolutely. Yeah. The actual version is 20 H2. And the next version, we have seen a lot of features of this next version yesterday and today, is 21 H2. Exactly. So this is the release cycle. What I mentioned in this roundtable, what's my preferred thing that we have an as a service concept, so new features on a regular basis. Yeah, but let me add to yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, so far it is true, but now we have different features in storage yeah. spaces direct in Windows Server 22. Yeah. And uh, Azure Stack HCI 21 H2. So there are some features not available in Windows Server 2022. And as far as I think, Microsoft will only bring new features if it's possible, because there is still a shared code base. So if it's possible, only in uh, Azure Stack uh, Azure Stack HCI and not in Windows Server. So the next Windows Server we heard of Jeff, he was announcing it as it was a first, that the next Windows Server will be in um, in two to three years. Yeah. And my opinion, but this is my personal opinion, we will maybe not see any advantages in store in the storage basis direct layer in 20, let's call it Windows Server 2025. Yeah, it will be the, the storage layer we have in 2022. Storage bases will still be there in the next server if we get a next server, and I, I think we will. Uh, it will, will be there. Announced it. Uh, yeah. Jeff said uh, it will be yeah. not removed. Hyper V will not remove from Windows Server. It will be there, but there will be no new uh, features. New features are Azure Stack HCI. I think there will be new features, but what's important, we have these two, these two, um, yeah, systems: Azure Stack HCI OS and Windows Server. And the development goes in two different directions. So it's not the situation that every two to three years uh, the features of Azure Stack HCI come to the Windows Server. No, it's an individual development path. And the situation is that I think that the, 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 the basic features will also be in the Windows Server operating system. So for example, we have this uh, adjustable storage repair speed. It's a new feature in Azure Stack HCI, but it will always also be available in Storage Spaces Direct in Windows Server 2022. But it, it all, is already. It's all, it's, sorry, it's already. But there. what's not available is it's, the uh, thin provisioning, thin provisioning yeah. and the GPU support and so on. So this is the important thing. You you have to look at these two things independently and never think, oh, the feature was in the two-year-old version of Azure Stack HCI when you are in the future. Maybe now it must also be in the Windows Server. No, this is not the situation, but the technology storage space is direct. It's in both uh, stacks and also the hypervisor. We didn't discuss this in the two days, but the only hypervisor we can use with storage space is direct and we can use in Azure Stack HCI is Hyper-V from Microsoft and Hyper-V is also in both uh, yeah, scenarios. It's in Azure Stack HCI and it's in Windows Server 
2022, 2019, 2016. Um, the big difference is in Azure Stack HCI, we have this Azure connectivity, we have the pay per use, we have no virtual usage rights included. If you use Windows Server, for example, 2022 data center, um, license your hosts accordingly, you have unlimited virtual usage rights on this hypervisor. And this is the situation why we discussed this in the, I think it was in the round table, that in many scenarios, we need Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server 2022 data center on top to be correctly licensed for the virtual usage rights. Um, and many customer asked, why should I do this? And the answer is easy. We discussed this exclusive features in Azure Stack HCI and you have to check this. And when you need one of these features, you have to go to the path of Azure Stack HCI. If you don't need any of the Azure Stack HCI exclusive features, you don't need any of these features. And if you look at the roadmap and you say, I will not need of any of the features that Microsoft announced, then it's more effective for you to go with storage spaces direct in Windows Server. But as soon as you need one of these exclusive features in Azure Stack HCI, this is the reason why you will decide for Azure Stack HCI, because for example, stretch clustering, extended security updates, um, then uh, uh, GPU support, thin provisioning for volumes and so on. Cheap it's support. On Cheap support. Cheap support. Uh, Cheap the support. extended use rights for old extended operating system, yeah. uh, systems. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I want to clarify something more. Um, we heard a lot, uh, stretch cluster is a big thing and in, in at least in Germany and also in Austria and in Switzerland, I presume. Uh, stretch cluster with storage basis direct is not supported by Microsoft. You can misuse the, uh, the um, a storage basis direct in a four node and in a two node cluster to build a stretch cluster. It technically it works, but we have also some um, requirements in network that has to have to be met and also requirements for the witness. So it's not easy. Don't e and don't only set up a stretch cluster and hope it works. You have to have a lot of knowledge there. A stretch cluster in Azure Stack HCI is not only supported, it's a complete different technology with a uh, storage replication. So you have more data resiliency and uh, you can't do a six node stretch cluster with storage basis direct. If one side fails, three nodes, all your data is gone and you have to rely on a backup and restore them. This is important to me to, to clarify. I have built with my company around 100 stretch clusters with storage basis direct. Every customer knows it's not supported by Microsoft, uh, but they, they still want it. But you have really to have the knowledge how to do it. It's not easy. I have done webinars about it. You can watch it up. Uh, I talk in my trainings about it, but now we have a supported solution, Azure Stack HCI, and I, I would strongly advise, uh, advise if you want to stretch cluster, do uh, do it with Azure Stack HCI, even if it costs uh, more money. Yeah? But now um, we are already one minute in the next session. Sorry, guys, I saw you lining up already. So I, I, ha I have two to four speakers now. Um, one of you who wants to start, maybe unmute your microphone and show your face if it's possible. And then you can start with your session, please. Awesome. Um, I'll start by sharing. Remember, the session is recorded. It will be available afterwards because we have a lot of people dropping out because it's late in Europe already. So don't uh, don't look at the numbers of the live attendees. Uh, we will be the recording will be available very soon uh, next week. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. All right. Um, hello, uh, I'm George Gerges, a PM on the networking team. I, along with David, who's also a PM on the networking team, uh, we'll talk to you today about SDN in Azure Stack HCI. So today I'll give uh, sort of a short intro about SDN in HCI. Uh, David will introduce the SDN integration with Azure Kubernetes Service on HCI. Uh, then I'll introduce a new SDN deployment wizard in WAC um, and the new SDN diagnostics script. All right. With that, by the way, I never checked that. You can see my screen just fine and hear me just fine, right? Yes. Yes. 
Oh, yeah. okay. Perfect. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Go on, please. Awesome. All right. With that, let me go through a quick overview of SDN and Azure Stack HCI. So I'll start first by uh, talking about the HCI structure and, and how SDN fits in it. So the structure starts here at the bottom uh, with a validated hardware from our partners. This will be in a form of servers that you can get from OEMs like Dell, Lenovo, HP, etc. Um, on that hardware, you would install the HCI operating system, and that will include all the platform features that you need for HCI, uh, whether it's Hyper-V, Storage Space Direct, and software-defined networking or SDN. Um, HCI and its features are best managed through Windows Admin Center, but you also can use PowerShell or System Center if you want. And finally, you can connect to Azure Arc and other Azure hybrid services here. As you can see here, SDN and its features are available with the default Azure Stack HCI operating system. You don't need any additional licenses or anything extra to, to deploy SDN. Now, uh, I'll give a short uh, overview of the key capabilities that we support with SDN in Azure Stack HCI. People that are familiar with our SDN solution uh, probably already know that SDN provides customers the ability to bring their own overlay virtual networks for their workloads, which of course sits on top of the underlying physical network. What you might not be aware of is that many of these network policies can also be applied to workloads attached to traditional VLAN networks as well. You can apply micro-segmentation policies to protect from internal and external attacks. You can apply quality of service policies to prevent individual workloads from hogging all the bandwidths on host machines. And you can configure load balancing policies to dispute application traffic to multiple backend servers. All of these servers, uh, all of these services, I'm sorry, are applicable to traditional VLAN physical networks. And for users who want to bring their own virtual networks and subnets and attach workloads to them, SDN will provide isolation on multi-tenancy with other customers' networks. And you can also take advantage of the same services that I mentioned for traditional VLAN networks, like micro-segmentation again and quality of service policies. If you want to bring your own appliances, uh, something like a, um, an advanced firewall, for example, SDN supports user-defined routing to ensure that traffic to the virtual network is routed through these appliances. And as mentioned before, whether on traditional or virtual networks, you can expose your applications to the internet and configure load balancing for high availability and scale. You can also leverage NAT or network address translation so you can provide outbound or inbound internet access to your applications hosted on your networks. The last capability here that I'll mention is the backing connectivity through gateways. This is usually needed when you want to connect your virtual networks to external networks. These external networks uh, could be your on-prem data centers located across the internet, it could also be a public cloud like AWS or Azure or any other remote location. We've got a couple of options here. First, if you're connecting to a remote location over the internet, we support encrypt encrypted IPsec connectivity between your virtual network and your remote networks. If you already have a high speed network, um, a private connection between your different locations, uh, then you don't really need, I guess, the, the encrypted connection. And in that scenario, we support GRE tunnels, which is very similar to IPsec, but without the encryption for connecting of these high-speed networks. And finally, if you have workloads in your data center that can um, that cannot be virtualized, some legacy application, for example, but you still want to enable communication between them and your apps hosted on virtual networks, we support L3 Gateway to support that scenario. And that's pretty much, in a nutshell, the, the SDN capabilities in HCI on a high level. Now I'll talk a little bit on the infrastructure of SDN itself and how you enable some of these scenarios. 
So at the very top here, you have the management plane where you define policy of your network. There's a standard REST interface and there's also PowerShell commandlets on top of that. If you prefer a GUI or a graphical user interface based tool for simplicity, you can use Windows Admin Center or System Center Virtual Machine Manager for configuration and management as well. From the management plane, policy is pushed to a centralized control plane, which is network controller. In the case uh, of our SDN solution, uh, that's the component used here for the management plane, the network controller. Um, and the network controller ships as a server role in Azure Stack on the operating system. It receives the policy from management plane and configures the data plane with this policy. Part of the job of network controller as well is to maintain a goal state and remediate configuration drift whenever it happens. And finally, on the data plane side, we have a couple of elements here. Uh, of course, there's Hyper-V host, which gets all the switching and routing policies for virtual networks. All the other network service policies like quality of service and micro segmentation policies, etc. Um, and then all the traffic on prem networks uh, goes through a component called the uh, SDN gateways. This also ships as a server role in Azure Stack HCI operating system. And then finally, we have the software load balancer component, which also ships as a server role in HCI operating system. Uh, through the software load balancer, all the inbound and outbound internet traffic will go through. So I talked a bit about the SDN capabilities. I talked about the SDN infrastructure required. I'll talk a little bit about how some of these capabilities map to the infrastructure components and what type of deployments do you need to light up uh, specific scenarios. So first of all, network services on traditional networks. We mentioned micro segmentation, quality of service. If customers want to deploy these services on traditional networks, then you only need to deploy the network controller. If you want load balancing on top of that uh, or network uh, address translation capabilities on your traditional networks, then you'll need to deploy the software load balancer or SLD component as well. In the same way, if you're deploying virtual networks or services on SDN virtual networks like micro segmentation, quality of service, uh, service chaining, peering between your networks, then you only need the network controller component. And then also, if you want load balancing for your workloads on virtual networks, then again, you will need the software load balancer component. And then finally here, if you want to provide external connectivity from your virtual networks, which could be a remote network or physical workloads in your local data center, then you'll need to add the gateway component. All of, all of these components, all three components, are deployed in VMs. Uh, for network controllers, we recommend having three VMs for high availability. For SLB, we recommend two VMs uh, and two as well for gateways. And uh, just for your reference, this table and guide is also available on the Plan SDM page on our Microsoft Docs if you want to refer to this later. So uh, this is pretty much a high level, uh, a summary of what the key SDN scenarios and what the infrastructure requirements for some of these scenarios. And with that, I'll hand it over to David, uh, who will talk to us about uh, Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes Service and the Azure Stack HCI. Awesome. Let, Thank you, George. Uh, let me uh, give you access here. Uh, hmm. Can you request access? Uh, yeah, I have requested access. Or can I actually share? I'll just share on my. Yeah, OK. That's. Uh, that's perfect. Lightning event will continue in a moment. Yeah, if nobody shares the screen, this is shown. The event will continue in a moment. So I will switch on our video till we have a new screen. And there yeah. it is. <laughs> All yeah. There it is, but it's not in presenter mode actually. David, can I already share it? 
want seconds. David, we don't hear you. No, now the screen is gone. David, we see you, but uh, we don't see your screen. Uh, let's see. Do you see the screen now? Now no, we, we have a screen, it. yes. Okay, excellent. Sure, I have the audio enabled. Now the screen. We see your screen. You can go on. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, all right, so let's get started on this. Uh, what is Azure Kubernetes service on Azure Stack HCI? So uh, I think you've just seen a presentation on this, but basically AKS HCI is a managed Kubernetes platform available in Azure Stack HCI and on the server. Uh, its goal is to enable users to manage the lifecycle of Kubernetes clusters uh, through an experience that is simple and secure by default, but also consistent with AKS on Azure. Essentially, it provides a solution that is easy to deploy and manage for any customers with an existing investment in Windows Server or Azure Stack HCI. Uh, we don't have uh, enough time to give a more in-depth overview, um, but as you've just seen, there's more sessions about this to familiarize yourself with AKS on Azure Stack HCI, as well as documentation. And going forward, we will assume some basic familiarity with uh, SDN support brings many exciting features that will improve application portability between AKS and AKS on HCI and deliver a consistent experience. So the first bullet point that you see here is that SDN brings true virtual networking support. So without SDN, AKS HCI VMs today attach directly to your physical network, which means scaling out will also have an impact on your physical network. With SDN, you can create overlay networks that use the XLAN encapsulation and are essentially equivalent to the Azure VNet that you're used to in the Azure public cloud. So using SDN means you'll not be bottlenecked on having to do changes to your physical network, like carving out new VLANs for new clusters uh, or similar things uh, when trying to scale out and add new uh, Kubernetes clusters. Um, as a consequence of that, uh, SDN will also introduce Azure CNI support into AKS HCI, which is, um, you may, might have heard of it, is the networking solution for pods already used uh, by AKS today. And what that means is essentially any networking enhancements or any fixes that go into Azure CNI for AKS will also light up in AKS on HCI. So that is a big consistency improvement over the current experience with uh, flannel or calico as the choices for CNI. Um, finally, there are also many more, you know, Azure networking concepts that translate directly into SDN that you see on the screen, like software load balancers equivalent to Azure load balancer, user-defined routes or UDRs and ACLs. So SDN provides many similar concepts that people are used to in the Azure public cloud as well. Uh, the second uh, pillar, so to speak, of AKS on HCI is hybrid by design AKS in your data center. So SDN support in AKS HCI will also improve the experience on that front by uh, you know, essentially enabling connectivity from pods that might be running on-premise, you know, on AKS on HCI into actual uh, remote Azure VNets, uh, for example, through the SDN virtual gateway that George has mentioned earlier. Uh, so this powerful feature enables um, you know, some many exciting scenarios such as uh, scaling out into Azure with direct connecti connectivity into these services that would otherwise only be available in that remote Azure VNet. Uh, the third promise of AKS on HCI is built-in security and default security. Uh, so again, SDN is a unified solution that's maintained by Microsoft. There's no dependency on third parties. Um, it's a robust and mature networking stack that's uh, already, uh, you know, it has been around for a while, so it's it's been tested and battle hardened. 
And it also, of course, provides many uh, features such as uh, network isolation uh, between virtual networks, a distributed firewall that allows you to define access control lists to manage network traffic or uh, even you know, control traffic flow through user defined routes. So we believe enabling SDN and AKS HCI improves security and reduces attack vectors from a security standpoint. Uh, the fourth pillar is building a modern platform for .NET applications and containers. So again, SDN minimizes operational complexity. It offers, offers um, you know, this converged network infrastructure that manages all network devices and appliances in the data center, you know, whether that's VMs or containers running in, in Kubernetes, all of that can be managed kind of under this single pane of glass. And through that, SDN offers, you know, basically a simplified support matrix. Um, in most cases, there should not be a need to stitch together various other solutions that need to be configured to interoperate with each other, like custom F5 load balancers or other load balancer solutions, et cetera, because STM provides many of those capabilities already. And finally, there's many advanced features that George uh, covered earlier um, needed to operate applications in a modern data center, you know, from cost policies, virtual network peering, NIC teaming, and more. So let's take a look at the architecture as well of AKS HCI, both without SDN and with SDN. So what you see on the screen right now is a very simplified diagram of AKS HCI. Uh, it can be essentially broken down into two major parts. Uh, the first on the left here in that gray dotted box that you see is to deploy the uh, platform services also known as the management cluster. Uh, what this management cluster does is essentially uh, it creates a VMs that would control the deployment and management of additional clusters, the workload clusters or target clusters as they're known, which is the dotted box on the right that you see here. So essentially what I'm saying is we create one Kubernetes cluster that will drive the creation and management of other Kubernetes clusters and additional clusters. And the workload cluster is the actual one um, where you run your applications and workloads, as you see in this uh, dotted orange box right here. And uh, when you ask AKS HCI to provision a cluster, one thing or one commonality that you might notice is that it will automatically deploy VMs that act as the control plane for that cluster, including at least one VM that contains the API server of the Kubernetes cluster and the VM which serves as the load balancer so, uh, you know, for better availability, that's needed because the API server is the entry point for all resource operations. Uh, the load balancer solution used today in uh, AKS HCI without SDN is HA proxy of Keep Alive D. Uh, so, yeah, that's an overview of AKS HCI without SDN. So, what does this picture look like with SDN? Uh, so, with SDN, we have uh, SDN infrastructure that gets created. Uh, beforehand and it's created once and it can be leveraged by all additional clusters that are created afterwards for all their networking needs. With SDN there's uh, less overhead for each cluster because uh, again there's no need to provision these uh, separate HA proxy load balancer VMs since uh, you know we can reuse the SDN software load balancer already for you know load balancing purposes. Um, also all the VMs in a, a particular cluster, uh, cluster can be attached to a SDN virtual network with isolation optionally configured between clusters, and they're uh, you know able to use all the feature sets uh, of SDN that would otherwise not be available in AKS HCI. Um, so the second big enhancement that you might notice in the uh, orange dotted box uh, and for the worker nodes right here is that. Uh, we can introduce Azure CNI networking support, which essentially allows the pods or containers to attach to the SDN virtual network as well. And so in that case, uh, you can use the SDN features not only for the VMs in your data center and your Kubernetes VMs, but you can use it all the way through to the application containers inside those Kubernetes clusters as well. And so finally, the last point uh, is that all the SDN infrastructure components can also be replicated for high availability and reliability as well. Uh, so 
Without further ado, let's jump into the demo to showcase the creation of AKS HCI on an SDN environment. Uh, so I do have audio here. Uh, let me know if you can hear it or not. Are you able to hear that? No, unfortunately not. Okay. Well, can you speak over the video? <laughs> Us. It's <laughs> that will be a bit tricky. All right, one second. It will take one minute. I'm sorry about this. Not a problem. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, in the moment, yes. Uh, I hope. Uh, can the audience? HCI cluster. So let's take a look at the uh, environment we will use to demo AKSH. Can you hear that? I can hear it, but I'm not sure. Same. I don't see your screen. Uh, do the other, uh, can someone uh, uh, give us an, a feedback in the Q&A um, if they see and hear, uh, David? I see and hear the demo. Okay, that's great. So then go on, please, David. Okay, apologies for the logistics. So let's take a look at the uh, environment we will use to demo AKS HCI with SDN. What you see here is a typical four node HCI cluster with a few virtual machines deployed. Uh, so uh, we can view them in Hyper-V Manager as well. You can see network controller here, MUX and gateway VMs. So that is the SDN infrastructure that we provisioned already. Uh, so this environment is, uh, meets all the requirements for HCI and SDN, so it's ready for deployment. The first step to deploy HCI is to define the network settings used by SDN. So we've expanded this uh, commandlet that's already available in HCI with SDN support, and essentially you pass in the SDN virtual network in the node IP pool parameter, and you also pass in the logical network used uh, as the VIP pool by the load balancer. But enough uh, PowerPoint, let's actually put this into practice. Uh, so what you see here is a PowerShell window uh, with this new AKS HCI network settings uh, commandlet. Uh, we, in our case, we have uh, actually already pre-created a virtual network previously that we want to use with AKS HCI, but ultimately the experience we're targeting will also create one for you if you are not passing one that's already pre-created. Uh, so yeah, let's run that. And that's all there is really to the first step. So the next step consists of defining the AKS HCI configuration that will be used. Again, there is a PowerShell function that does that, which we've extended with SDN support. We pass in our previously created VNet object, and we also uh, enable network controller as well as pass in the uh, the references to the virtual network and the logical network that we're using, as well as the network controller, uh, REST endpoint and certificate name. So let's actually put this to practice. Uh, we have the same commandlet here right now on the screen. So what this will do is basically um, set up the configuration for the various AKS HCI subsystems uh, like Cloud Agent, Mock and KVA and it will get us ready for installation. So the next final step before we can actually install is to register our resource group with uh, Azure using Arc. So this means that our Kubernetes cluster, which we will ultimately create, will show up in the Azure portal and we can use, uh, use that to basically deploy uh, resources to the cluster. And yeah, now that we've uh, configured everything, we're ready to actually deploy AKS HCI and create the management cluster that will be used to create the target clusters. So now that the AKS HCI installation has completed, we can see that there was a management cluster here consisting of a single VM, which hosts our control plane. And um, yeah, we can also take a sneak peek inside it, view what are the pods that are running there, make sure everything is running and healthy. Uh, so let's print those. 
Uh, there's quite a lot of them because again, uh, this is the management cluster control plane. So it contains all the custom resource definitions for cluster API and all the controllers that are used to create uh, workload clusters or target clusters. Uh, we can also see that uh, there was a load balancer created. So again, this is the API server entry point. It should be highly available. And uh, hence we have a SDN load balancer policy that was configured. You can see the corresponding resource here. Also note that's using the uh, IP address range that we previously specified in the VIP pool in the first step. Um, and yeah, we also have a, of course, the VM is attached to a virtual network, so we can see the corresponding network interface resource has been created here as well. And the IP address should also show up in Hyper-V Manager. So next, now that we've uh, looked at our management cluster, we'll look at creating the actual workload cluster where our applications will run. We'll be creating a workload cluster with one Windows node and one Linux node. Now that the uh, workload cluster is completed, we have uh, node pools for Linux and Windows, uh, each with you know just one node, one Windows node, one Linux node, and one control plane for the workload cluster as well. Uh, we should see three new VMs that were created. You can see those here uh, spread across our nodes and our HCI machines. Uh, so yeah, that's the control plane, which is here. Um, let's take a look. We can view what are all the pods that are running as well. You can see these running here. Note that we do have Calico for pod networking set up here, uh, but we are aiming to light up Azure CNI for SDN uh, capable clusters. You can also view the nodes here. Those are all ready as well. Uh, however, what was also done was, um, you know, same as with the management cluster, we have a load balancer resource created for the API server on the workload cluster control plane. And uh, we also have network interfaces that were created for each of the VMs and attached to the SDN virtual network. Let's just highlight those. Uh, here's a Linux network interface attached to the virtual network and uh, here is also a Windows network interface. So yeah, that concludes the section on workload cluster creation and next up is actual deployment. So the very first application we will showcase is Nginx on Linux uh, with five replicas and we'll also be creating a load balancer resource. So we'll showcase the SDN integration uh, with SLB uh, as well here. So let's actually deploy this now. We see there was a deployment and the service resource submitted to Kubernetes. You can view uh, what the state is of that. Service is pending an external IP. It takes a few seconds. And uh, here we can see the SLB provisioned external IP. And uh, going into SDN Explorer, we can also see this here. Uh, there is a load balancer resource created here for the Linux web server. Now uh, let's actually try to fetch that IP address and uh, punch it into the trustworthy Internet Explorer. Uh, we'll see that the application is up and running. And so what this shows is even though the pods themselves are not attached to an SDN virtual network, uh, the nodes are, and as we've just shown earlier. And so what that means is essentially there's uh, two layers of load balancing at play. One is the external load balancer, which is uh, the basically the SDN load balancer is uh, redirecting the traffic to the nodes, at which point the internal load balancing uh, of Kubernetes uh, provided by kubeproxy kicks in and uh, redirects the traffic to the uh, backend destination pods. And so that allows you to view the page that as we've just shown. 
Now this demo wouldn't be complete if we just showed Linux, so let's show an IIS web server uh, on Windows as well. And so let's deploy that. It's very similar to what we've just shown. You can wait for that external IP to pop up. All right, we see we got 109. Just to show that in SDN Explorer as well, you can see that highlighted here. Uh, we can also see, you know, taking a closer look, we can see the front end port is port 80 and back end port is set to the node port actually that we see in Kubernetes. Uh, now let's punch that into Internet Explorer as well. Uh, 109, let's wait for it to load and here we can see the IIS page. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the demo of AKS HCI on SDN. So let's take a look. That was the end of that. <laughs> uh, all right, so last but not least, uh, we I wanted to share the roadmap as well. Uh, so we have a private preview of essentially the feature we've just demoed and shown uh, coming soon this year. Uh, we have a sign up as well that you can see, uh, aka.ms slash SDN dash sign up that you can sign up for if you're interested in registering with the private preview. Um, just asking some very basic questions, just your name and email and optionally some inf more information on what features you're interested in using. Uh, we also have some design optimizations coming. Uh, so for example, um, if you saw in the demo, we had a virtual network that was pre-created. Uh, we're trying to remove that requirement so that AKS HCI will provision one on your behalf. Uh, finally, uh, in the demo, what you've seen was uh, actually not using Azure CNI and the uh, pods were not attached to the SDN virtual network. So that is a feature that uh, we're working on and actually already at the testing stage already that looks promising as well. However, it does require an Azure Stack HCI 21H2 host for this feature to work. And uh, last but not least, the demo showed a lot of PowerShell and commandlets, uh, I know about that. Uh, we're trying to light up this experience through a GUI as well in Windows Admin Center as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's that. Without further ado, I'll give control back to George. Uh, and yeah, he'll talk about diagnostic improvements. All right. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, a new SDN deployment um, wizard here and uh, also a new SDN script. First, let me start with uh, SDN deployment. So earlier this year, the HCI cluster deployment wizard was released. Uh, it looked something like this. Uh, you could go and add um, your cluster. I'm sorry, I think it's shifted one more slide. Would you like me to go back for you or? Um, I uh, give me a second. I'm not sure here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm trying to go back. Uh, there's a lot of lag I see here. All right, let's try this again. All right, so as I was saying, there was the HCI deployment wizard, um, and it looked something like this. You could go, um, click add here and create a new cluster. And through this wizard, you're able to deploy your cluster, hyper-converse storage, and for the last step, you could control, S uh, you could uh, deploy SDN, I'm sorry. Um, but there's one main limitation here in this wizard. 
or that experience uh, is that what do I do if I already have a cluster and I just want to deploy SDN on its own? The way to do that was still through the SDN script or through SCVMM. Uh, but today here we are. Uh, today here I'm uh, introducing a new simple experience through WAC that will enable you to deploy SDN on its own after adding your cluster. Uh, and through this demo, we'll get to take a look at it in action. Uh, David, I, I think I'll present uh, from here and see if, if that works better for me. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yes, we do. Yes. Uh, now it's gone. We had your. We had your screen. You, you see it now. Now it's there. Yes. Can we already share it? Yeah. Okay. As a, okay. Perfect. All right. Uh, so let's take a look at the demo. Hello. In this demo, we will showcase the new network controller deployment. wizard. First, I'll add my cluster that doesn't have SDN deployed on it yet. Here in the list of extensions, you'll see that since I don't have SDN deployed, I will not find any of the SDN extensions yet, except for the SDN infrastructure extension. If I go to it, I can hit get started here and start the network controller deployment. The network controller service gets deployed on a cluster of virtual machines. On this page, you'll need to specify some settings for this cluster. Here, you can change the default name of your network controller cluster, and then add the path for the VHDX that will be used to deploy the NCVMs. This should be the same build that is deployed on your nodes. It's then gone. you can choose the switch. You'll need to use an external Hyper-V virtual switch with at least one physical adapter connected to the management logical network. The default here is to deploy at least three NCVMs, so they're highly available. And here you can specify the VLAN ID of the VMs. Your NCVMs should have the same VLAN ID as your management network adapters, so that's what we'll add here. You can also change the default parameters for the VM's info. And of course, you'll add here your credentials. And finally, these advanced options, VM location, Mac pool, will also be populated for you, but you can, of course, change them. Then the next step is deployment. I'll let this run here for about 20 minutes. And of course, I'll fast forward for the sake of the demo. If for any reason the deployment failed at any stage, just go to your nodes and delete the VMs with their VHDXs and go through the wizard again. But here I'll hit finish. And that's pretty much it. The page will refresh and you'll be able to see the rest of the SDN extensions and the health of the SDN infrastructure and the infrastructure extension. With the network controller deployed, you can now create virtual networks and leverage user-defined networking with your virtual networks. You can also take advantage of micro-segmentation and quality of service policies with your virtual network as well as your traditional VLAN networks. That concludes our demo. Thanks for watching. All right. Um, so that was pretty much the wizard. As you can see, it's a, it's a very simple wizard um, that you can go through. And uh, again, it solves the issues that 
if you have already an HCI cluster, you don't need to deploy it. You just need to deploy SDN. You can just go to the extension after the fact and deploy SDN. Hello. As for future plans here, uh, you'll notice that currently there's no way to deploy SLB or gateways through WAC, neither from the HCI cluster creation wizard nor from the wizard and SDN infrastructure extension. But we are planning to add these wizards to deploy both components in the SDN infrastructure extension um, in, the, in, the tabs, in the tabs for SLB and gateways respectively, I guess. Um, SLB here, as we mentioned before, will allow you to configure load balancing and NAT rules, and the gateway component, of course, will allow you to create the GRE, IPsec, and L3 gateway connections. Um, until we add these wizards, you can still deploy the components after deploying NC uh, through the SDN Express script. The script, of course, is available on GitHub, as a lot of you know, and uh, it has a lot of sample configuration files for the different types of deployments that you may want to have. As far as this wizard goes, we will have uh, private builds available by next week, and we're hoping to uh, have this wizard publicly available within two weeks. And I'll, I'll definitely publish a blog about it, a blog post about it, so um, people are aware that it's now available. Next, let's talk a little about uh, diagnostics. So because of SDN's complexity here, um, it could really get hard to diagnose, and that's why we're releasing the SDN diagnostic script. This is pretty much an open source script available on GitHub and PowerShell Gallery that will allow you to first validate your SDN infrastructure, identify known issues, and finally collect diagnostic logs for analysis. Before we see the script uh, in, in a demo, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the structure of the script, uh, then we'll get to see it in action. So first of all, uh, the script is very lightweight. All it needs for input uh, is the NCVM name and then figures out pretty much everything else for you in the background by running uh, queries in the background. Uh, so yeah, most commands take only the NCVM name as an input or NCORI. And uh, as for the structure of the script, uh, you can say that it can be broken down into three main sub modules. First, the health module. Um, and through the health module, you'll be able to run health tests that will validate the states of the S different SDN components and services. This will return the status, of course, of the validation, whether it's success or failure. And if it's a failure, it returns parameters relevant to the failed uh, component or service. The next module here is the known issues. It's very similar to the health module. Um, but instead of just generic SDN health uh, validations, it has very specific tests for specific issues that we have seen before. For example, um, it makes sure that you don't have more than one network adapter in the NC network with the same MAC address. Or for example, that the partition size of each service is within the right limits. And finally, here is the log collection piece. Uh, this module here, this last piece, will allow you to collect all the diagnostics data that you could imagine for SDN. Uh, this data, of course, can be analyzed to resolve SDN issues. And without further ado, let's take a look at the demo. Hello. In this demo, we will install and run basic commands from the SDN diagnostics script. The script is available on GitHub and PowerShell Gallery, and instructions to install and run it are on the GitHub Wiki. Now, let's get started. To install the module, I'll run the install module command here, and then import it. With these last two commands, the module will copy and install itself to every SDN machine on your SDN environment. And now we're ready to use it. The first command that I'll use here will run the SDN health validations, and it only takes the name of any NCVM as an input. If you want to focus on a single component, just add the parameter role, and then you can choose whichever component you want to diagnose. But I will validate everything here. 
you will see here that the module will start validating the configuration and provisioning state of the gateways, SLB muxes and network controller, as well as the services and configurations on the host. And you will notice here that we actually have two failures. The parameters are pointing us directly to the failed services or states, and there are more details in yellow up in the output. If you want even more details, everything that the module runs is stored with the results in a log in this path. You'll see here the same failure pointed out. And the log also points you to a cache here where the result is stored as an object and can be retrieved without rerunning the validations. And it can also be used in this way to get the same details about the result. Now that we see here that the failure is for sure that the SLB host agent service is not running, let's go ahead and start it. And if we run the same validation command here, we will see that everything goes through this time. Next, we're going to see how to identify known issues. In the same way, this module tests for known issues and it also takes the name of any NCVM as an input. And the same parameters apply if you want to check the known issues for a single component or even if you want to run a single test. And we'll see here that we don't have any of the known issues. Here, you can also use the get command to enumerate all the commands in the module. Then you can take a look at all the available tests. You can also see the get commands that collect SDN data by running queries in the background. Soon, there will be an overarching data collection command that will allow you to collect the data from all these get commands, get all the relevant ETW events, network traces and logs, as well as the validations results, and organize all these logs in a folder. Until then, you can take advantage of these commands individually. The value added here is that, first of all, the commands are a lot simpler than the original queries. The module only gets the NC name or URI as an input and figures out the rest of the parameters. Secondly, the module parses the output and displays it in a more user-friendly way. For example, this is how you get the health information for the service fabric cluster from network controller. Finally, the module also stores this output in a PowerShell object, so you can use this output in however way you want if you're running a more advanced diagnostic script. In this demo, we covered some basic functionality of the script, but there's a lot more left. And the script will continue to improve and evolve as we and the community contribute to it. Take the time to explore the module and make sure you're running the latest version. Thank you for listening. All right, and that was pretty much uh, uh, the demo about the script. Uh, and like mentioned in the script, it's it's only a portion of what the script can do and the capabilities. Uh, you can use the get command here to um, enumerate all the commands that, uh, that are available in that module. And the script will always be work in progress, right? We you will know, we'll always continue to contribute to it, and uh, hopefully the community also will continue to contribute to it. And as new issues come up, there will uh, there will need to be new tests in the script pretty much for them. Um, but as much as, as far as like the bigger plans here that we're having, as mentioned in the demo, we're planning to have a more comprehensive data collection command. Uh, this command again will pretty much be the one command you can go to and uh, it will call all the get commands, all the validations, and uh, just organize all the app in a folder for you. And uh, Second of all here, we have, uh, we're have we planning to integrate the script with Windows Admin Center for a simpler experience and uh, for a more user-friendly output. And finally here, we're adding, we're, we're planning to add a little bit of insights or pointers to documentation that will help you resolve your issues based on the output from that you get from that tool. So you run the tool now and you see that, oh, um, my environment is busted exactly in this spot. Um, next, we're planning to add specific documentation that will tell you, you see this, you see X, you do Y, and then you'll be good. I really encourage whoever can to contribute to the script. Uh, the script, as I mentioned, is open source in GitHub. 
um, it's very modular and granular. Uh, you don't need to understand every bit of the script to contribute to it. Uh, it's just, I guess, the, the main structure of it. And there's a very good documentation on how to contribute to it uh, with the specific commands on how to create new functions and specify the function parameters that will create a new file for you and uh, with the right template and, and add the references for your function wherever needed. Here, uh, these are just uh, some of the links where you can find the script uh, whether in, uh, or references to it in, uh, in GitHub, uh, where you'll find the script and the wiki that has a documentation about it, and uh, in PowerShell Gallery and on NuGet. The script was actually released publicly yesterday, so you can go and play around with it today if you want. Um, and yeah, I would definitely appreciate feedback or even uh, raise bugs through the GitHub issues. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Yeah, thanks guys. This was really a great session. I, I, I really love what I've seen, especially um, the uh, wizard that you after the fact can add SDN to uh, to an Azure Stack HCI cluster because this was something I I really wanted because um, if you want this stuff later, great. Um, I have a question for you. So I saw you you answered uh, the questions already in the Q and A. So my question is. Um, Azure Stack HCI for me is a lot of time stretch cluster and uh, so far uh, SDN is not supported in stretched cluster. I understand it's maybe very complex, but have you plans to uh, to uh, plans to to add that to the roadmap and uh, give us some insight when uh, if you do that and maybe when? Yeah, uh, I can take that Karsten. This is Anirban. Yeah, so, hi Anirban. Great question. Hi, great question. And if if you ask me, that's probably the biggest request from our HCI customers today. And um, we are getting requests from multiple fronts, especially for customers who have clusters across multiple locations and then customers who are having stretched clusters today. We are working on this. I cannot. Yeah, uh, I cannot give a timeline yet, but we are definitely working on this. Hopefully we should be able to announce something soon. But uh, yeah. but yes, this is definitely on top of our mind. Yeah, uh, I ask this because most of the Azure Stack uh, HCI implementations I do today in, in Germany, we are big at stretch clusters. I, I don't know why, but uh, they are the, the the main driver in Germany for, for Azure Stack HCI is stretch cluster scenarios. And uh, it would be great if we uh, have SDN here because the SDN, the number of SDN deployments or even questions about it, they are very low and I think it helps a lot if you integrate it in uh, in an admin center and you are going uh, that I see. So that's very important so that's that it is easy to deploy and also to manage. Uh, Manfred would agree, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so you are doing great work here and uh, I, I, I really I liked what I see because I'm a little bit tired already. It's 10 a 10 a.m. in Germany, 10 p.m. in Germany and we had a long day. We are nine hours uh, in the show now. No, 10, 10 actually. Yeah, 10 hours, yes. Wow, and we have that, still two to long. go. So um, great stuff. Uh, what was the question you had most in the Q&A? Because you answered them and uh, we didn't see them. So. Uh, can you elaborate on that? We have still four minutes uh, yeah. uh, until the next session. Uh, sure. Um, the last one at least was related to Windows updates, uh, and there was a good question as to how do we update SDN uh, infrastructure, right? So uh, today this is, uh, if you if you remember that all the SDN infrastructure is on Azure Stack HCI operating system, so uh, you don't need a separate license. And to update the SDN infrastructure, you simply use standard Windows update tools. This could be PowerShell, or if you are using the sconfig UI, you can use that, or you can use Windows Admin Center to, you know, uh, log on to that machine and update it as well. Mm -hmm. There will be a follow-up question, if not vocally, but in your mind, that how about integration with, you know, cluster-aware update? Yeah. Today, cluster-aware updating only updates the hosts, and they are planning to include support for VMs soon. And we are very tightly talking with them, and this this integration with SDN VMs is also 
plan. So hopefully sometime in the very near future. Yeah, cool. I, I have another question. Uh, you know, so you deploy, uh, for example, three network controllers. Um, yes. And uh, I think you need them for the, for the functionality of the SDN network or uh, um, so do you spread them over different nodes and uh, make sure they are not landing on the same node? Do you do you do that or or does it work without yes. a network controller? Right, so so network controller uses a very standard technology underneath for hosting called service fabric and this is a very uh, common Azure technology. So the way service fabric works is that it creates multiple replicas. So you have multiple microservices in network controller. Like one microservice will take care of your software load balancing. Another microservice will take care of your routing and switching policies and so on. So service fabric um, distributes the microservices across the multiple nodes. And when a particular node goes down, it shifts the microservices to a different node. Each microservices has a one primary replica and two secondary replicas so that even when a primary goes down, it automatically comes up on the next node and you do not see any kind of disruption or data loss. Very, so, very uh, cool. So, yeah, yeah, that's how it does that today. Yeah, and I, I liked a lot the Kubernetes integration of SDN. And as far as I learned, uh, we can use the load balancer from SDN. Uh, it's an option. So uh, what I what I've seen, I'm very excited, and I'm I I will I will uh, I will try to get into the private pu uh, preview program if I have time. So very very curious about this stuff. OK, we have one minute to the next session. I would say thank you guys for presenting. Um, you will you get you will get the video as soon as I have it, because in the moment we have not too much uh, viewers anymore because of the late time in Europe. Most of the guys are watching from Europe, but great session and you will have the recording and I, I try to share it early next week or even earlier. We will see. So thanks so much. And now we go to our next speaker, and I hope it's here already because I don't see him. Do you see him? Yeah, yeah Jason is there. Yeah. Jason, uh, maybe you can share your camera and your screen. Hi, thanks, Carson. Um, can you confirm you can hear me? We can yes. hear you uh, loud and clear. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, let me go ahead and share my slides and see if you can see them. Yeah. Can you confirm once more that you can see the slides? Yes, there are they. Can you take them? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I heard some other noise here. This yeah, we can noise. we can yeah, see them. Fine, and, yeah. yeah, and we are sharing them. So if you want, you can start. Or do you want to have a small conversation about VM fleet first? Um, because yeah. I don't know how long your session is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll begin with the intro. Um, and if I understood correctly, I think everything's coming through voice and the screen. Um, yeah, yes. So great, awesome. So hi everyone. Go and uh, start, good. please. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, hello everyone. So good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your location. Um, and so first, I just want to begin by saying I'm really excited to be here, um, and I want to take a moment to thank all the organizers um, for making this possible. So thank you. And if you attended the Azure Stack HCI day last year, uh, many of you might remember me from a Dispeed session. Um, but if not, um, I'm back again to talk to you a bit more about performance tools and can't believe it's already been one year already. Um, but if anyone hasn't met me, uh, my name is Jason. I'm a program manager on the Edge and Platform team, and I work on performance and partially on sizing scenarios as well. So today, um, I know some of you really care about performance, and so what I'd like to do for today's session is introduce a pretty big update. Uh, more specifically, excited to announce uh, VM Fleet 2.0, which involves uh, the new changes to both disk speed and VM Fleet. So let's dive into it. So before getting any deeper, I want to quickly highlight a few of the topics for today. First, we'll be discussing the most important thing: um, what are the new changes in VM Fleet? And then we'll go over some quick examples as well. And then second, we'll also discuss a new test mechanism in the form of a commandlet with the goal to provide more guidance. And then we'll go over a quick demo and proceed to discuss what's next on the future roadmap. So many performance tools often reach the end of their lifespan, 
Fortunately, Microsoft still loves Azure Stack ATI performance, which is why Disk Speed and VM Fleet is here to stay. And for those of you who might not be familiar with VM Fleet, it was originally a collection of scripts that helped deploy virtual machines and use Disk Speed to perform IO to stress the storage system and often used as a performance benchmarking test. So what does VM Fleet 2.0 bring? Well, first, it's the biggest VM Fleet update in over three years, um, has been quite a while. And second, previously there was admittedly a bit of a learning curve. So if you are a first time user or if you even take a break from using the tool, it's pretty easy to forget how to deploy, utilize and measure results using VM Fleet. Not to mention it's always been a bit tedious to deploy the tool in the first place. A lot of manually moving files around and even after deploying, there's a bunch of scripts. Um, which one do you run first? All of these questions. Therefore, we decided to make this process a bit more easier and intuitive for all users. And the third thing is that VM Fleet 2.0 introduces more powerful ways to simulate workloads. And this includes um, new disk speed flags and parameters as well. So the first thing, given that this is the biggest update in three years, you might be wondering how different is it from VM Fleet 1.0? Is it a complete revamp? Well, luckily it's still your familiar and reliable VM Fleet tool. Um, and most of the original functionalities are still there, meaning that you can run a VM fleet test with disk speed commands, open up watch cluster to see the IOPS, graph polynomial fits if needed, and your familiar folder structure is there as well. And all of this is still fully open source on GitHub. So the VM fleet 1.0 scripts and the VM fleet 2.0 module will be live on the GitHub repo. Uh, so if for some reason you still want to use VM fleet 1.0, it's still right there for you or if you want to take a look at the 2.0 scripts, you can also do so as well. So I'd say the main physical change to VM Fleet is that it's now a PowerShell module, so you no longer need to manually download the scripts, and the deployment process is much, and I mean much faster. And I also want to assure you that this speed is still backwards compatible from HCI v2 all the way to Windows Server 2008 R2. So on that note, in the past, there were quite a few steps to deploy. Um, first, you need to create a collect volume and then a cluster share volume per node. And then you need to obtain a server core image, navigate to GitHub, download the repository, download the executable separately, a bunch of manual steps. In addition, you also need to move the executable into the right folder, move the VSDX into the, a selected folder, and turn off the CSV cache, create a fleet of VMs using a script, and set the appropriate VM characteristics like memory. And then at this point, you can finally begin running the scripts. But there are multiple entry points, and it seems to be like there's multiple ways to do this. So for example, you can start modifying the run.ps1 script directly and uh, run the clear pause script to get started, or you can start running the start sweep script uh, with parameters. And as you can see, there's multiple ways to run this and quite a few steps. So what changed? Well, the PowerShell module automates a few things. First, uh, you, do, you still do need to perform a few of the same prerequisite steps. So this is like creating a collect volume, creating a CSV per node, installing a server core VHDX image, et cetera. But now all you need to do is install and import the VM fleet module. And then you can run install fleet to install the or create the familiar folder directory structure and you're pretty much done. And this also does a few other things like pre installing the disk speed executable, turning the CSV cache off, etc. And the last step is simply running new fleet in order to create your virtual machines and this will by default create the number of VMs equal to the number of physical cores unless specified otherwise. And then you can start running your other commandments to begin your testing experience, like start sweep. And as you can see, it's uh, much simpler and it really is just running a series of commandlets. So next, I want to introduce some of the more new features and commands that lets you simulate workloads with more control. To improve VM fleet, we also wanted to improve disk speed. And we're also fully aware that disk speed uh, is lacking in certain aspects compared to other tools out in the world. But with this most recent update, I think that this speed in VM fleet takes a leap forward by offering more functionality and granular control. So first, we can now simulate a hot cold working set 
So previously, 100% of the I.O. generated by this speed was uniformly dis distributed across the target file, which results in a performance boost to more compared to more realistic workloads where data might be split between hot and cold working sets. So in order to offer this more flexibility and simulate these real realistic workloads, this speed now allows you to specify a non-uniform distribution for random I.O. in the target file. And this can be specified in two ways, either a percentage-based distribution or an absolute-based distribution, as denoted here by RDPCT and RDABS. So for example, if you wanted to, if you want a percentage-based specification, then you can specify that you want to send 50% of the IO to only 20% of the target file. Or if you want an absolute size-based specification, then you can specify that you want to send 50% of the IO to only two gigabytes of the 10 gigabyte target file. Also, if you specify an IO distribution percentage of zero, that indicates a whole, or meaning that no IO will be issued to that range of the target file. Second, you can mix random and sequential workloads in one test run. So previously, this speed could only run 100% random or 100% sequential workloads. Now you can specify a percentage of IO requests that can be issued randomly with respect to the last issued IO. And this is denoted by RS. Third, this speed has a new parameter called RP, and that lets you provide your desired parameters and create an XML profile without running your display load. This way you can save your profile and use it later or use this to automate certain workloads. Next, we heard a lot of feedback regarding the only, that the only way to throttle IOPS was to use the G flag, which is unfortunately a throughput specification. And this means that you need to calculate and reason about the relationship between throughput, which is in bytes per millisecond, and IOPS in order to thr throttle the IOPS to a desired value. But those days are long gone, as you can use a new flag called GI, and that lets you directly control the IOPS limit. And last but not least, if you decide to create an XML profile with two target files, you can use the star number as a generic placeholder for each target. Later, if you decide to run the XML profile but want to overwrite and replace the two target files to something else that you want, then you can do so. So there's a lot of new changes, and I'm sure there's many questions, but uh, once you have a chance to test it, uh, I promise it'll make a lot more sense. But in the meantime, uh, we can go through a couple examples. So first, uh, the first thing, the first example is using this set of parameters. And the first thing we need to look at is where we have a 30% write ratio and we're using the random distribution based on absolute terms. And we also have a 40% random workload against a 10 gigabyte target file. So the first thing we will look at in this case would be the random distribution in terms of absolute value. And that means that 30% of the IO goes to five gigabytes of the target file and 70% of the IO goes to the other five gigabyte of the target file. And then within those distributions, the IO is further categorized. Because of our W30 parameter, it specifies that within the hot cold data split, 70% of the IO is read, 30% of the IO is write. And then because of our RS40 parameter, it specifies that within the read write IO, 40% of the IO is random and 60% of the IO is sequential. And I just want to quickly note that if the RS parameter is used in conjunction with the write ratio parameter, then the IO will be uh, homogeneous, the sequential IO will be homogeneous in the sense that uh, whenever it is sequential IO, it'll be all writes or all writes or all uh, reads. So in general, as you can see, these parameters, uh, you can view these parameters as kind of categorizing IO to a nested structure. So we have a couple more examples for other new flags as well, and it's a bit more simpler, um, but so bear with me. Uh, the next example is for creating parameter profiles. So if you want to create a new parameter profile, you can do so by simply specifying your normal flags plus the RP XML flag and pipe it into a new XML file. The resulting profile should look something like these two images, 
And there's really nothing new here, um, as this also existed in the previous disk speed and VM fleet versions, and it really does serve as the backbone for disk speed. The only thing new is that you can easily save this profile via command line, as opposed to manually opening them, opening the XML files and copying the profile tag section. So the next example is for the direct IOPS limiter. And this one is as simple as it sounds. Let's say you want to limit IOPS to 1000 per thread, then previously you needed to use the G flag and specify 4100 bytes per millisecond for a 4K block size. But now you don't need to really figure out that you know 1000 IOPS is 4100 bytes per millisecond. You can just simply use the GI flag and simply write 1000 and that's it. So the next example is for replacing target files in the XML profile. So let's say that I want to send IO to two target files in the future. Then I can initially create the profile with two target templates by specifying star one and star two. Later, when I run the profile, all I need to do is specify the new target files such as io.dat and io2.dat. And I'll note here that you will run into an error for three types of scenarios. If number one, you don't you provide too many target files as opposed to what you define. So if the target profile targets two test files, but when you're rerunning the test, you only provide one, then you'll run into an error. And the same thing will occur if you provide none. And third, it'll you'll also run into an error if you provide too many target files. So if we define two here, but you decide to provide three target files, then you will run into an error. So, we just covered a few disk speed updates. Next up, I want to cover a few VM fleet updates. The first new feature I'd like to introduce is the ability to specify a percentage of VMs that can now be misaligned from the owner node. In other words, VMs will be rotated to other nodes. And this is denoted by the move fleet command. Previously, VM fleet denoted and deployed an even number of VMs per node, which are by default co-located with the owner node. And this would inevitably slightly increase the performance. Uh, the problem here is that in a more realistic world scenario, there may have been cases where the VMs are slightly misaligned from the owner node, which does affect performance. So you can now specify a percentage of VMs that can be rotated to be misaligned. The second uh, new feature is that VM Fleet now lets you create an additional data disk on a virtual machine in addition to the default OS disk. This is this is just a new flag that is called data disk size uh, inside the set fleet command, which originally allows you to change the virtual machine characteristics like memory and the CPU, etc. So third, we have a new set of commandlets that actually allows you to check the virtual machine's health status. And one of the more notable ones is repair fleet, which automatically restarts the virtual machines that are not responding to any pause and go actions. And finally, we have the get fleet volume estimate, which actually helps you estimate and calculate a cluster shared volume size that you should create before running a VM fleet test. Um, and this command will estimate the CSV size for each resiliency type depending on your your environment. So whether you have two nodes or three nodes, etc. In regards to estimating the CSV size, it should look something like this. And for context, this is on a four node cluster. So running this command will automatically generate these calculations and mirror will refer to three way mirrored here because uh, your system is a four node count and map will refer to the mirror accelerated parity. Now, if this was a two node system, then it would show different values such as a two-way mirrored and a nested two-way mirrored and a nested map resiliency type. So it really is dynamic in the sense uh, that it depends, the output depends on what environment that you have. So if you're curious about how these calculations are done, uh, we'll be releasing more detailed blogs and articles, etc. But what we're essentially just doing is First, uh, we calculate the reserve size by Microsoft's guidance, which is just one capacity drive per node up until four total drives. And then we calculate the raw available size, and that depends on the raw size of the pool 
minusing the cluster proof history, reserve size, and collect volume if you have it. And then we calculate the raw CSV size per node, which is just the raw size divided by node count, and then eventually calculate the logical CSV size per node, which is the raw CSV size per node times the storage efficiency percentage. So in addition to these updates, there's actually one more update uh, that I believe deserves its own stage. And this is the measure fleet core, core workload commandlet. So previously, VMfleet provided relatively little guidance as to which parameters or flags that one should use to mimic certain workloads, which is why uh, I want to introduce this new command, measure fleet core workload, and this command runs four predefined workloads, a general, a peak, VDI, and SQL workload. And these workloads are defined using disk speed flags and stored as an XML profile. So for general peak and VDI workloads, we deploy one VM per physical core, each containing one vCPU, and SQL uses one fourth of that VM count that the others use, but each VM contains four vCPUs. And after the test completes running, it generates a zip file that contains the IOPS results for each workload. So if you start running the command, you should see something like this. And then after the load completes, you should see a zip file that contains the following files. Now, all the gibberish names on the top uh, is called a run label. And each of these admittedly cryptically named folders represents a single workload sweep or test. So within each folder actually contains the XML and perfmon output files for each VM in your environment. So if you have 10 VMs, then you will have 10 output files. The file named uh, core workload is a log file that records what occurs during the measure fleet core, work, fleet core workload run. So you can refer to this if any issues occur during the run. And then the file that starts with help test. That's the output from actually another commandlet called get SDC diagnostic info, uh, which isn't really part of VM fleet, but gets your health information about your environment. So we collect this just in case that you need to refer to these for any issues that might pop up or for any triaging issues. And if you were ever wondering how could you ever match these cryptic run labels to a workload type. So for example, how do you know the first one, 9FF6, et cetera, refers to, let's say, a VDI workload? Well, don't worry, because there's a file called result log that contains the nomenclature mapping between the run label and the workload type. And finally, we have the result.csv file, and this is the aggregated VM fleet data set that you should mainly be interested in. It contains the IOP, CPU, latency, and all of those relationships across all the virtual machines aggregated into one place. So let's quickly take a look inside some of the result files. Uh, so inside the result log file, as I've mentioned, it should contain the mapping between the run label and the workload type. It also contains some of the other characteristics like the Azure VM compute template used, the data disk size, memory and VM alignment percentage. And you'll also notice that while measure fleet core workload mainly runs the four workloads, in reality, it's more than just four. It actually runs different variations for each of them. So for example, a VDI and SQL workload is ran twice, once with the VMs fully aligned and once with the VMs slightly misaligned. And in this case, it's 70% of the VMs are aligned. And the general workload actually undergoes even more than that, where we measure a general workload for different write ratios for 0, 10, and 30. So inside the result.tsv file, you should see a ton of data. There are multiple columns. There are multiple columns that VMfleet captures, such as the run label, the workload type, memory per VM, IOPS, etc. But what you're likely interested in is probably probably going to be the IOPS workload type, CPU, and latency usage. And if you take a closer look at the IOPS column, you will notice that the values are quite large. And this is because it denotes the total IOPS values 
across all the virtual machines in the cluster for that workload test. So basically, IOPS column equals the quality of service per VM times the VM count. Regardless, there's a ton of data here for you to parse and play with, and there will be separate blog articles and documentations that go that really go into the detail of what each of these columns capture. So you can definitely look forward to that. So running Measure Fleet Core, work, core Workload for all four workloads is really a good way to get insights into your environment and how your environment behaves for different workload types, or if you're just looking for some soft guidance on where to begin. However, I do want to note that this command does take a while to finish on the line of a few hours. So if you are interested in running only one workload type like SQL, then you can extract the XML profile for an SQL workload and run that separately on your own, uh, which will definitely be a lot faster than this. And for the purpose of this presentation, I am going to display the following workload definitions. And these are also inside the PowerShell module scripts, so you'll also have access to these. So to give a little bit of context here, the first workload is the general workload. And this is a single threaded high queue depth and an unbuffered write through workload against a single target template. The, the second workload is peak, and the goal of this workload is to simply max out the IOPS values without any regards to latency, CPU, or any other limitations. This will serve as your hero number. And the third workload is the VDI, um, and many folks are probably familiar here. Um, this workload seeks to simulate a traditional virtual desktop infrastructure uh, where you might be hosting desktop environments. And this workload is defined by running IO against two targets, which happen in sequential order. The last workload is SQL. And this workload seeks to simulate data processing that is focused on transaction oriented tasks where the database receives both requests for data and changes to the data from multiple users. And this workload is defined by running IO against two targets again, which happens in sequential order. So I won't go into every single one of these, but uh, let's take VDI workload for an example. So it involves two targets. The right target is defined by um, a duration of five minutes. Uh, the, it has one thread count, um, a queue depth of eight, and a block size of 32. Um, and the first target, of course, is 100% write, whereas the second target is 100% read. And we actually limited this uh, to six IOPS per thread, as usually there's not much activity going on for a, VIA, uh, for a VDI workload. And then the workload consists of 20% uh, random and 80% sequential, at least for the write component. And you'll see that we're using the RDPCT uh, parameter here, where it means that 95% of the IO will be sent to 5% of the target file, 4% of the IO will be sent to 10% of the target file, and the 1% of IO will be sent to 85% of the target file. And that last portion is actually implied if you don't, I guess, if you don't explicitly specify. And of course, the Z parameter is just a way to make sure that we actually nerf the benefits that we get from compression dedupe um, in order to more fairly compare SSD, SSDs across companies as some do come in with built-in compression. And the last F is to determine that we only use the first 10 gigabytes of the target file. And for the read component, it's pretty much the same thing, uh, same parameters, except the values are slightly different. So for example, RS is 80, so 80% 80 random, 20% sequential, et cetera. Now I'm sure there's multiple opinions and perspectives on how these workloads can be defined. And we fully realize that it's incredibly difficult to actually categorize these workloads like this, um, as it really does depend on your use case and your environment. And the way that we came to define these parameters really just stems from what we observe in customer environments and how other performance tools categorize their workloads. Which is why we are looking for feedback and so definitely go try it and feel free to let us know your feedback as it will shape the future of these workloads. And I think one way to think about this is that we fully realize that these workload definitions are still very flimsy, meaning that they definitely don't represent an actual SQL or VDI workload, but with this, we did take a step closer at mimicking a more realistic workload. And if this was depicted on a spectrum, you can imagine that VMFleet 2.0 being smack in the middle with a measured fleet core workload. 
And the spectrum of measuring performance data seems to go from one, looking at a previous environment and guessing in your head that an SQL workload runs about X IOPS at Y latency, et cetera, um, not very rigorous. And two, using a benchmarking tool like Dispeed and inputting your own parameters, which in reality won't be a real workload. And third, it's uh, similar to the second point, which is just running a predefined workload like VM Fleet 2.0, which is by no means perfect, but offers some guidance and a baseline for you to observe data. And four, using a workload specific tool like HammerDB for SQL workloads as they are likely optimized for that scenario. Lastly, you have running an actual real life workload. And currently it's near impossible to get to the far right side as nothing can really beat a real workload, a real production level workload. And with this, I think, but with this, I think we did take a step closer. Um, so I do want to just acknowledge and not dismiss the fact that this is by no means perfect and it is definitely not the one all be all. So now let's actually get to the actual demos. But as a quick caveat, we won't be covering all the different individual updates in these demos as there are quite a ton of new minor feature updates as well. But there are a few major ones that uh, we should focus on. But um, you know, don't worry as we'll be releasing a lot of articles and documentations that detail each of them. So for the Dispeed demo, we'll be running this set of parameters and most of these are the same flags that were available before. Um, the only new ones that we should focus on are highlighted in blue, which is really the RDABS, the RS, and the GI. So the first demo that we have prepared is for DSP, and most of these should be familiar. Um, so, the, you know, um, again, focus on the last three parameters. Um, so as we begin, I will first show you an example of using the old G parameter to throttle IOPS and how cumbersome it was. Um, so we'll try to throttle it to 1000 IOPS. And you'll notice that I have something open on my left. And this is just a quick calculator script that uh, converts the throughput values in bytes per millisecond to IO per second. And then afterwards, I will show you an example with our new parameters. So as you can see, I'm running through a bunch of throughput values to find my 1000 IOPS. First, I try 4500, 4400, and eventually find that 4100 bytes per millisecond results in 1000 IOPS. So using this value, we'll run this speed. And you'll notice that um, we have throttled IOPS to 1000, but that required a bit of effort, not to mention you can't even mix random sequential workloads or hot cold data. Now let's run this speed with our new parameters, including the GI throttle parameter. And this time, no need for a calculator, just input 1000. And you'll notice that we again successfully throttled IOPS to around 1000. And if you look at the input profile, you'll notice that we ran the test with mixed random and sequential workloads. The block size is also displayed in kilobytes, not plain bytes any, anymore for readability. And then you'll also see the IO distribution, which determines our hot cold data. And you can also see the effective IO distribution, but in this case, it's the same as the previous. So the next demo that we have is for the PowerShell version of the Fleet. And this demo will assume you already installed the module. And working under that assumption, you can begin by importing the module. And you can also check what functions you have. And then you can create one CSV per node as usual. And you can't forget creating the collect CSV. And then you can go ahead and install the VMFleet directory and mount point by running install fleet. And then as usual, you do need a VHDX. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move it into the tools folder. And if we check the tools directory, you'll notice that the VHDX is there, but also that the disk speed executable is there as well, which was installed when you ran install fleet. And then you can create your VMs with new fleet. And by default, again, it just creates the number of VMs equal to the number of physical cores. Um, so uh, in, in this case, I'm doing the same. And this step does take a bit of time, um, so I will eventually speed up the demo in a bit. But in the meantime, 
I'll also take a look inside the folder structure to ensure that we still have the familiarity. So the control contains the master script automatically pushed when you install the fleet. Flag contains the pause and go flag sent to the VMs, and the result is where your result files will land. And the tools is what we saw before with the speed and the VHDX. And now I'm going to speed up the demo a bit. And then now this is the optional step. You can run set fleet to again change your memory or vCPU count, et cetera, as you wish. And of course, you can't forget running watch cluster as that will allow us to see the IOPS. And then you can start the VM fleet. And at this point, you're essentially pretty much done. Um, and you can run other commandlet functionalities as you wish or explore some of the other functionalities there, uh, but you'll see the VMs coming alive and you'll see the IOPS briefly going up for a moment as the VMs are coming online. So we covered a lot today from disk speed updates to VM fleet, and we really only scratched the surface as there are uh, many, many more uh, minor features in VM fleet 2.0. So let's just recap some of the things that we talked about today. VMFleet 2.0 is one of the biggest updates in three years, and it still maintains your familiar structure, still fully open source, um, but now it's in a PowerShell module form. In addition, we made it so that it's much easier to deploy with automated installation steps and predefined workloads as a way to give some guidance as well. And finally, we touched upon all the new ways to simulate more realistic workloads, such as mixing random and sequential workloads. But remember, this isn't all, and there will be, there actually is a blog article that was launched uh, yesterday, and there will be future articles and documentations that highlights each of these uh, new features. So with that in mind, what's next? VMFleet 2.0 is open for the public to use for your benchmarking needs, but you might also be wondering if we, Microsoft, is doing anything with the new VMFleet tool. Well, I'll give you a quick, quick or a slight glimpse or tease into what we're trying to do with the new VMFleet tool. As you might know, many customers struggle to size an HCI solution for IOPS performance. Therefore, based on feedback, we're planning and currently actually using this tool to gather some data and eventually build a pre predictive model and incorporate that into our new sizer that is coming later this fall. However, IOPS sizing will be coming a little bit later than the first iteration. Um, so in the first iteration, it will mainly be for storage, memory, and compute. And in the end, we'll be using this newly improved VMFleet data to build a model and be able to eventually size for IOPS performance and help customers during their HCI purchasing journey. So that's a quick glimpse at what's coming in the future. And with that, it pretty much wraps up my session for today. Um, all that I ask is if you are interested in performance benchmarking, then please go to this link and try VMFleet 2.0 and let us know if you have any feedback by emailing us at this email address. And I think that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. And uh, thank you again, Karsten and everyone else for organizing this event. And I will pass it back to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jason. That was a very, very good presentation, and I like I liked a lot what I have seen. I have one question. Um, uh, you know, I do VM fleet in every cluster installation we do, and even if I when I train people, we we do the old one. I will do the new one, of course. Um, but with the old one, if you have a stretch cluster in Azure Azure Stack HCI. It also deploys VMs on the lock CSV. So I wonder if you know that and if it's maybe prevented in the VM fleet 2.0. Yeah, so there's even in the old version, to my knowledge, there is no limitations on stretch clusters. Um, so I, I actually personally am not aware of this fact. However, the VM fleet 2.0 actually uses the same uh, underlying infrastructure as it, it simply adds more uh, commands and functionalities. So I'm assuming that it would actually have the same effect and which is actually great to hear this feedback since we should definitely look into uh, making sure that it's guaranteed for stretch clusters. 
Yeah, it's it's not really a huge problem, but it's uh, the the volumes have the same name. They start with a with a host name minus lock, and uh, VMfleet also deploys VMs there, and you have to clean it up, of course, and uh, remove them. It would be great if it finds a volume minus lock not using it. Uh, uh, only only asking for that. Otherwise, it works fine with a stretch cluster, and I I use it to even simulate some workload or so on. That's a great tool. Yeah. Okay, we haven't had any questions from the audience, so you were uh, or oh yeah, that there is, is one. There's one. Ben is asking: Are there any plans to add CSV creation as an optional switch to install v fleet? Yeah, that's actually a good question because it is something that we actually were considering during this VMfleet 2.0. Um, so I'm assuming the question is specifying uh, kind of pre-creating a CSV volume before running VMfleet. Um, and if that is correct, uh, we actually have a new commandlet that lets you, uh, I believe it's called get fleet estimate uh, volume estimate, and it lets you estimate the uh, CSV volume size. And so you can use that direct. You can use that specific volume size that appears on the output, and use that to create your uh, cluster shared volume before running VMfleet. In regards to actually making that pipeline even more seamless and actually um, pre-defining it and actually creating the CSV even before running VMfleet, we that is actually within our backlog of things to do right now. Um, but in the meantime, you can definitely use the get fleet volume estimate, and it'll tell you the CSV size that you should create. And all you need to do is run the new volume commandlet with that size. Very cool. So, um, uh, so here is uh, here is um, how you call it, loop. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we have a very great feedback for you. Sage. Yeah, Jason, this was the best presentation so far. Excellent work on the new VM fleet. Thank you. Yeah, um, and definitely encourage everyone to try it out and provide feedback at the uh, email address right here, and we'll definitely take the feedback into account. Yeah, there's another one from Ben. Now, now the question starts. If it would be great if VMfleet dynamically creates the volumes as as part of the test rather than a manual step. Okay, another input about the volumes. <laughs> another okay. right. I, I can also add to this, right? Uh, I I wrote a script for the MS Labs that will prepare everything for you. It's like a helper script. It's in the tools. If you go to MS Lab site, there's a folder tools and there's like a prepare VM fleet or something like that. It will basically, if you run it, it will ask you for the S2D cluster. It will point you to the cluster and it will create the volumes. Um, it will also ask you for the file with your server core. If you don't have any, you will just put it ISO file and it will create your uh, your uh, VHD that has uh, the things, you know, like the answer file included. So you can specify the password for the machine and it will also create the folders. So you don't have to manually go and prep your machine, right? And Carsten, by the way, you don't have to uh, have the VDISC names like that if you don't create it with a, with, uh, <laughs> with a Windows Admin Center. If you do it with the PowerShell, you can specify whatever log disk name you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know that, but uh, OK. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think I'll also add that I, I think eventually um, the roadmap for VM fleet is to, the, I, I believe I showed a prerequisite step in the beginning for VM fleet 2.0. I think the final goal is to really automate all of that process into just one command line, for example, where it creates the collect volume for you, creates the CSV per node, and it maybe even helps you install and get the server core image as well. Uh, so that that's definitely good feedback, and it's definitely something we want to aim towards. Yeah. But, so actually, uh, Yaromir, you have something yeah, to add? Yeah, I have also one question. Right? Is it possible to run the 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 watch cluster with the parameter cluster name, so you can watch cluster remotely, like a remote cluster, or is it possible to run VM fleet against the cluster, so you don't have to run for actually from the VM fleet machine, from the cluster machine, but from some kind of management machine? So in terms of watch cluster, um, there's no explicit limitation in doing so, and I believe um, that's possible as long as you can no. access remotely into the other node as well. Um, but there's no explicit limitation in preventing us and <laughs> preventing anyone from doing so. 
Um, and then I, I assume the second question is related to also remotely kind of running VM fleet from a, let's say, a management node. And I, I again, I don't think there's any, um, there is definitely not an explicit uh, limitation there. Um, and it should work as is, um, as long as you have access to it um, from uh, your management or other remote node. Jeremy, there is a minus cluster parameter in VM fleet, so you can right. run and the, it new, and the new one, right? Because the old one. If the no, no, in the old one. one, it was already in the old one. Oh, really? They okay. updated it, so you can uh, use watch cluster on another node. Oh, you have to specify okay. minus cluster, and it will get because the. Because I did create pull request like three years ago. <laughs> and it yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's there. Your your request was successful, even in the old one. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so Manfred has a question. Yeah. So at uh, several points in these two days, we had the discussion that it's helpful for uh, many customers that are new to, to Azure Stack HCI and Storage Spaces Direct and these things to find functionalities and tools in Windows Admin Center, because if something is not there and the partner or the customer is not familiar with PowerShell, he maybe will never use these features. We had this discussion with software defined networking where we have seen that there are great new things and so on. Are there any um, yeah, plans to bring uh, VM fleet to Windows Admin Center with a uh, thing like um, uh, test my cluster with uh, VM fleet or something like this to have this uh, absolute easiness of uh, the graphical interface? Yeah, thank you for that question. That is a good question because that is definitely something on the roadmap as well. Um, so I'd, I'd answer this in two parts. Number one, I think um, I briefly alluded to it, but we're also trying to help customers during their initial um, ATI purchasing journey with a new sizing tool that will eventually um, be able to size IOPS performance as well. So if they're looking at a certain um, Azure Stack ATI solution, it will be able to inform them, hey, like based on your workload inputs like will this solution will be able to satisfy your needs or it won't um, but at least in the very first iteration it will be sizing for storage memory and compute and then the second part about uh, adding the vm fleet into the, the windows admin center is something that we're also considering later down the road as uh, we fully realize that vm fleet um, given that it's at least initially it was a bunch of scripts and using powershell um, there's a bit of a learning curve it, the, as you mentioned, the customer is not familiar with uh, PowerShell or any of these tools. And admittedly, we were lacking a couple of documentations as well of kind of how to get quickly get started. Um, and so with VMFleet 2.0, we also included more documentation and guidelines to quickly get started uh, with the PowerShell module. And then eventually in the future, we do want to um, convert this into a graphical user interface and Windows Admin Center is looking to be uh, one of the viable candidates to include into. Uh, great to great. hear. So I have I have another question or, or maybe a clar clarification. So VM fleet, the new VM fleet is not only for Azure Stack HCI, it will also run on storage basis direct, right? Correct. And I, I think at least for disk speed, it is backwards compatible until Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, and for VM fleet, it should work on Windows Server 2019 as well. Yeah, but it has to has an HCI uh, an HCI setup, not a converge setup, you know, because the VMs have to run on the hosts that are on the storage. Um, right. Okay, we have a question from the audience, uh, or more an um, a wish. It would be nice if there was an SDN version of VM that could stress test network config with VM to VM communication. Yeah, that's good feedback. Um, I, I think there's a couple other things that VM fleet is really lacking in addition to network, right? Um, first of all, we're using virtual machines. We aren't using containers. And so containers could be another option there as well. And mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of other things that um, VM fleet can be expanded to do in the future. And so this is good feedback. Thank you. Great. So uh, if there are more questions from uh, Helmut or Didier or Yaru may maybe have another one. Otherwise, we are done with the session and we have still 14 minutes to the next one. I still have some questions, right? So, of course, I, I, was, I was thinking about like uh, destroy or not the destroy, but the torture test that will, you know, you will run for, you know, multiple days to validate if everything is going 
well uh, somehow if the, if the machine will, uh, if the cluster will survive everything something like uh, PCS or, or was what was the name of the tool cloud cloud, cloud platform simulator CPS CPS tool right ah. so uh, and like a new version and it would be you know using VM fleet and inside of VM fleet, VM fleet it would be also running you know some tests to torture the network as was mentioned here and um, then there would be another script that would, you know, be running like pulling disk or something like that. So I can have a certificate for the customer when I when I'm handing over uh, the solution that this solution is proved. It will run as the same way as it worked in the lab uh, in the Microsoft or in Dell or Lenovo or HP uh, where they were torturing it too, just to, as a proof that yes, this this is well deployed. Because of yeah, PCS, I heard the PCS is just you know uh, hard to you know deploy. With the VM fleet, it also leaves some traces of the VM fleet. You are need to create volumes. It will also configure uh, the policy for uh, uh, yeah for the volumes that it will not you know move between the hosts. So uh, something like uh, production ready before you hand it over to customer, something like that. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I, I think the PCS is currently mainly accessible only to uh, hardware vendors as that is used as a validation test into our uh, eventual catalog. Uh, but it definitely is a good call out that maybe it's something that's useful for uh, future customers as well as a kind of, as you mentioned, quote unquote, torture test. <laughs> but I think maybe one step closer to that is our new measure fleet core workload as it goes through all the different workload types at different config uh, at different combinations uh, of characteristics. So let's say different VM alignment percentage, et cetera. And it actually performs a warm up before the run as well. Um, and um, the only downside is it does take quite a while um, along the lines of a few hours. It's still great. I mean, to have a, a Excel spreadsheet for manager so that he can walk through and see how the machines are performing. That's the thing that you would like to hand over to customer when you finish your job and to have, see a happy faces of the managers that they will just show it to everyone that, hey, I have these million apps on my my new cluster and it was well deployed because I can see these million apps or something like that. But this is, yeah. this is well, really good, I think. Yeah, definitely. And really, you can use that. Uh, I the result spreadsheet from the measure fleet core workload to really plot out your own relationships that you're interested in as well. So if you're interested in the relationship between IOPS and latency or IOPS and CPU usage, it's a good way to see whether it's behaving as you're expecting it to behave. Cool. Uh, as part of setting up the VM fleet, I saw that you were using a script that will you know, that was counting uh, number of cores or logical processors per node divided by two. Uh, will this be as part of the documentation? Because I think this is very useful because, uh, you know, to have a, the same starting point for everyone, like assuming that you have this amount of the, uh, uh, this amount of uh, CPUs and then run this command to create VMs and run this and this and this, and it will probably, you know, we'll be able to compare with us because we were running this setup on, I don't know, all NVMe cluster and you got this cluster, so you should probably see the same numbers just to be able to compare it right against the some against something. So if if this would be a part of the documentation, like assume that you have this number of processor or it just you calculate it with the script, run this command uh, to create VMs, the number of VMs you should and you should see around this number of, you know, IOPS or you can compare with us because this is the number for all NVMe cluster, something like that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, we uh, we also realized that in the past, uh, VM fleet kind of lacked a lot of documentation, um, at least for Microsoft. Um, and so within within VM fleet 2.0, we actually released um, some additional documentations on the GitHub wiki page. Event in the past, it was just about disk speed, but there are some things about VM fleet now with example commands and also like a quick setup guide that allows you to go through a couple quick PowerShell commands to help set up the VM fleet um, deployment process for you. And within there, the default um, behavior for the number of cores for each VM is, uh, or sorry, the number of VMs for your VM fleet deployment is that the number of VMs will equal the number of physical cores that um, you have on your environment. Okay, any more questions?
I think uh, we are happy now. So Jason, thanks again for the nice presentation. And uh, yeah, we will now uh, wait for another session, the last session of the day, the kernel soft reboot session. Um, so up to that, uh, we need a filler for nine minutes. Uh, Manfred, any ideas? I think we have one last question in the chat from Ben, uh, if it's OK. for Of Jay course, yeah. if, it's, if there were yeah, one. Of He's course. asking any thoughts on using VM fleet with clusterware updating to test performance and impact of patching a cluster as an out of the box scenario. You can you can run VM fleet and patch the cluster. That works. Yeah, done it. I even I, turn I, off some nodes and use VM fleet. I it. think the the idea is more in the direction what uh, Yaromir was asking to to have an automated process. Yes, you're right. You can do this and then see what 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 the impact is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you uh, for that question. I, I don't think there was anything specific on the roadmap in regards to uh, clusterware updating and incorporating VM fleet into that. Um, however, um, that is a good feedback, and I think it really comes into play of eventually VM fleet getting to the point of categorizing different scenarios, um, especially once it is once we decide to incorporate it into a, a graphical user interface. So um, maybe the future can be once you have a graphical user interface, you can then select. Uh, from different scenarios, right? Number one being just running through various workloads um, as we defined here for like SQL, VDI, general, peak, etc. And then uh, maybe as you mentioned for cluster aware updating um, as well, and then also a torture <laughs> method as well for the VM fleet. Um, so I think that's good feedback to eventually incorporate into our uh, roadmap, but you know, we're definitely not against doing that, but um, it'll it, it was also not um, directly on our roadmap, but something to consider. Thank you. This would be also really awesome to include it in the calculation. Uh, like what's the impact of the patching? So how the IOPS mm -hmm. will go down? What's the impact of the uh, of the bit locker, for example, or maybe spectrum meltdown mit mitigations? So all of this were discussed in the Slack. I, I remember it like one year ago, there was a huge discussion, or maybe it was even more huge discussion around the Spectre Meltdown, but I know it's evolving, right? All of these uh, uh, patches for the Spectre Meltdown are increasing the performance over and over. So, but what is the real impact if you want to, for example, secure your environment with BitLocker and all of these lockdowns versus the vanilla environment without anything, without encryption of the SMB, without anything? OK, OK. I think we uh, we have talked about everything. We have 0.2.0, 0, not 0 0.2. I'm a little bit tired now. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, so we uh, I think we can prepare for our next session. We have the next presenter, C Christina online. So Jason, again, thanks so much and uh, uh, if someone else has to add something, still four minutes, five minutes to the next session, and I want to start on the hour, because if someone is waiting. No, that's okay. Yeah, Rob is also here. I see Rob is here. Maybe you can ask uh, Rob, uh, a Rob a question. Rob a question offline or, or, or online already. Because we had some questions about the uh, rolling cluster update. Maybe you remember, and I, yeah. uh, Rob was the PM for that, or is it is it maybe still? Hi, Rob. Hey guys, how's it going? Fine, Hi. tired. <laughs> I, I wonder Hi, why. Rob. Welcome. Hey, it's our. I think it's our tenth hour. We have finished uh, nearly our tenth hour of uh, the show today, and another hour to go. So uh, quite happy to have you and uh, Christina. So Rob, um, if I may ask you, um, we had some questions about cluster, uh, rolling cluster update. One was, if I remember correctly, and Manfred maybe uh, remember other ones, uh, if you can upgrade from a Windows Server 2016 cluster to a Windows Server 2022 cluster. Um, the answer is um, yes, but not in, uh, not in a single step. Um, mm -hmm. If you would like, I can share a slide with you. Yes, of course. We have still three minutes uh, to your real session, 
So this is just a filler and uh, we are interested in it. So if okay. you want to share a slide, take it. Um, OK. Um, and nice books in the background, by the way. Thank you. Um, OK, so uh, Christina, I'm going to take the screen and just share that slide that's in actually the deck, our deck. Can you guys see my screen? Sounds good. Yeah. Yes. One, once you're done sharing this, then I can uh, share the main presentation in a couple minutes. All right, cool. Um, OK, so Kostin, this is to answer your question. You can see here, this is the upgrade path for for clusters, right? So starting in 2012 R2, you can upgrade it to 2016. Then you can upgrade it from 2016 to 2019 and 2019 to 2022. Cool. So this was already part of your presentation. We we only we should only wait for it. Well, I was warned that you guys were going to ask me this question. So oh, okay, <laughs> who warned you? <laughs> is it possible? Hey Rob, this is Jaromir. Uh, is it possible to you know make it offline from let's say 2016 to 2022? So you will make your cluster offline, replace operating system, you know, and import all the metadata and uh, upgrade uh, the upgrade the uh, pool and the VMs and everything. Just to skip one version, but make it everything offline, just importing the pool is probably not tested, right? It's not tested. That's the problem, right? It, so Got we it. don't know for sure if it works, but what you what you could do, like if you're willing to destroy everything, I'm going to show another slide. So this slide is for like this is for standalone server. Oh, I see. So standalone server it supports uh, N minus two upgrade. Got it. So, Got it. so you can technically you could take a Windows Server 2016 cluster. Um, as long as you have all the data, you could destroy the cluster itself, upgrade the individual machines uh, two versions to 2022, and then reform the cluster and restore all the data. Right, but it's still it's still jumping uh, over one version with a with a pool, spaces pool. So right. yeah, probably it's not a good idea, right? I don't recommend it. So we have this strange story to tell where we say, OK, well, if you're doing server standalone servers in place, upgrade works, you know, for two versions back. Right, fully supported. Um, now for 2022, we have this interesting edge case where there are actually some roles like IIS that will upgrade from three versions back. But for simplicity's sake, just two versions back. Right. Then we have the next story is about cluster rolling upgrades and cluster rolling upgrades go from two one version back only. Right. So one one version at a time. Um, and then finally, when we come to the Azure Stack HCI, it looks something like this, where you can see the time frames are much more compressed. Right. And it's it's you know, we're again, it's it's actually a variation of a cluster OS rolling upgrade. Right, it's only one version at a time. The idea is that the media, you don't need the media, it should come from Windows Update itself. As a feature update, right? Oh, uh, but you are able to block it, right? Because uh, from the colleagues, I heard that they will not be ready with the release of the just the KCI 21H2 to allow it on the systems. So if the customer will say that I want to have 21H2 right away in, you know, December, for example, it will not be yet supported from Dell, right? Because Dell will support it, you know, later. So right. So so will there be an feature, the feature, up, the feature update is always it's always optional. Right. Right. Our position is we just want to we want to encourage it at some point. Like we we want we don't want someone to stay on like 20 H2 forever. Right. right. We want we want to like end support for it and like basically, you know, we don't want to tell you when to upgrade. It's one year to be supported, right? So when it's released, you have one year to update, right? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah let's stop. We have to discussion. start the session. We can ask questions afterwards. Uh, Rob, maybe you can stay around a bit, uh, but uh, uh, in respect of, uh, of uh, the time and uh, also our other presenter, Christina, <laughs> If I don't stop the guys, they are talking 15 minutes about uh, rolling cluster. Manfred here is also very keen to ask questions. Yeah, so first, 
first the session and then you can ask Rob if he still have time about this topic. Is that okay? It's okay. <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> stepping in. So hi, hi, Christina. Uh, very nice to have you here in the show and uh, you can start the presentation if you want to and yeah, we we see this. Do we see the screen? Yes. Or yeah, we will share the screen. Yeah, I had it already. You don't see the attendee. Ah, OK. Just a moment. Teams is tired too. So now the presentation is ready. So Christina, if you want to start. The can, stage everyone, is can everyone see my uh, see my screen? Yes, and we can hear you. OK, great. Uh, let me let me see here. I'm trying to get teams to display while also. Presenting, which is. Uh, sometimes a bit challenging. Good point here. Christina, you are fine. We see the, the presentation and we see you. Everything is nice on our side. Yeah, I can see the content. OK, great. I'll go ahead and, and get started then. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thanks all for joining here. I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Christina. I'm a PM on the Azure Host OS team here at Microsoft, and I'm co-presenting here with Rob. Uh, on kernel soft reboot or KSR uh, and KSR is basically a feature that enables uh, faster OS updates. Um, KSR is a premium feature which is available on Azure Stack HCI v2 and future versions. Also quick shout out to uh, Kavya who used to be the PM for KSR and who helped contribute to these slides. So just a quick run through of KSR and what it is, uh, how it works. So KSR, uh, as mentioned, is a feature in Azure that reduces the time it takes to update the Windows OS. Uh, it was first introduced back in the Windows 8.1 timeframe for Azure, and it's used broadly in the Azure fleet today. Uh, it helps reduce downtime for customer VMs by making these updates a lot faster. The way it does this is by bypassing the traditional BIOS and firmware initialization step. So because of that, it can't be used for reboots or updates that do require firmware initialization. Effectively, this means that for updates to the firmware or to the BIOS. You can't use KSR, but you can use KSR for OS feature updates as well as most driver updates, which don't require a cold reboot. In terms of KSR uh, for HCI, KSR is a mandatory requirement for uh, HCI v2 integrated systems to your products. So there are kind of two tiers. Um, the more basic tier is validated nodes, and the more premium tier is uh, integrated systems. And uh, KSR is uh, required for a system to become an integrated system. Uh, this enforcement is done through the HLK or the hardware lab kit, which is a test suite that OEMs and IHVs run to make sure that their drivers and that their full systems are working correctly with KSR and uh, you know correctly execute and uh, come back from a KSR as they should. So kind of as mentioned, uh, KSR on HCI is is hardware and driver dependent. That's where these HLK tests come in uh, to help validate that it's working correctly. It comes pre-installed, uh, so it can be used with uh, Cow or the Clusterware update tool. It's not the default type of reboot, uh, but it can be uh, invoked and enabled using Clusterware updates, which we'll go over in the next couple of slides.
So while the default reboot is a cold reboot, uh, there are various ways to utilize KSR through Cal. Uh, so there is the Cal PowerShell plugin in Windows Admin Center, and this enables you to either run a specific update using KSR, uh, always use KSR on a particular cluster, as well as to exclude particular nodes. So if you want to run KSR uh, for a specific update, you can set this attempt soft reboot parameter for that update in particular. Uh, if you want to always invoke KSR on a cluster, you can set a cluster parameter, which sets uh, basically sets it to always attempt soft reboot. And if there is a particular node or nodes in the cluster that you want to exclude from KSR, there is a reg key which can be set so that those nodes will continue using a traditional cold reboot instead of KSR for updates. Now we get into the exciting part, the, the demo. Uh, so this is a quick demo, basically comparing the performance side by side of a normal reboot versus a KSR. And this, um, just for a bit of context, this was tested on, on a Dell server that was not running any workloads. And we have our KSR on the right and normal reboot on the left. So you'll see the KSR already completed. Now we're speeding up through the normal reboot as several minutes pass. And so around the four minute mark, the normal reboot completes. Well, we have 19 seconds there on the timer on the right for KSR. So why use KSR? Well, I think that demo gives a, a good illustration, right? It's uh, It was 12 times faster. Uh, as mentioned, this was on a single server with no workloads. Um, but yeah, we had 20 seconds for the KSR versus four minutes for a cold reboot. So this is way less downtime for customers, uh, a huge advantage over uh, traditional reboot. So this is something special and really a great feature that you are able to use with HCI. Uh, also worth mentioning is the amount of time saved will be proportional to the memory uh, to the memory size and uh, to the disk size. So as basically as your memory and disk resources increase, uh, the savings becomes even more pronounced. Now we also have some results here to share on the speed ups on a fully loaded cluster and I'll hand it over to Rob to walk through the next couple of slides. Thanks, Christina. So you might be wondering what's the savings, what savings does KSR give you on a fully loaded cluster? And the answer is we've measured it um, on one cluster that was fully loaded. Um, we measured this last night and the number we got was 22.5% savings on a fully loaded cluster. So this was on a four node Dell R730 XD uh, cluster. Um, it, was, uh, it was running uh, with IO going on. So, uh, so what we basically, um, we ran, we did two runs. One was clocked in at 94 minutes. The next run clocked in at 73 minutes uh, with KSR. Um, yes, Kostin. 
<laughs> so um, I got the impression KSR, you need support in the servers, but the Dell R7030 XT, I have the same notes, they are nearly five years old. So uh, it's also possible with older hardware? Well, technically you should be doing this measurement on um, systems that are classified as integrated systems in the HCI catalog, right? So yeah. it, to be fully supported, it needs to be an integrated system in the HCI catalog. Um, like, so we, I sort of had to, you know, buy a lot of coffee to uh, get this uh, cluster. Um, and so, you know, I didn't buy enough coffee to get like a 740 cluster. So I got just the 730. And, you know, it's a, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, so I, I have I, the same. <laughs> so like, so we're gonna, this actually starts an interesting conversation around what's like, what will, what will KSR work on, right? Um, but the, the answer is it's supported on the integrated systems that are in the catalog. So, um, which is kind of a strange answer, but so you guys can see how I did the math, right? So 93 minus 73, over 94 um, times 100. So the so this exactly like Christina's slides, right? This in this average uh, total time reduction of around 3.25 minutes on this particular system, right? On these on these four nodes, right? So now this savings is actually right. What we've done with this end-to-end -end test is it we the timing includes node drain, right? And then the S2D storage job, um, mirror rebuild, and then resume. So it includes the entire life migration for all of the 49, uh, 49 um, VMs that were running on that machine, on that cluster, right? So that's, that's clear, right? Yeah. Um, just, 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 okay. just a question, Rob. So that's twenty-two point five percent end-to-end for the entire four-node cluster time savings overall. Yes, yes, that's correct. So I happen to run those seven thirties uh, and seven forties, and I've noticed that there is a big speed up in generations uh, that servers boot nowadays. So I'm wondering how well this will hold up with, let's say, the latest of the greatest hardware. Right. Because it and seems, it seems because the feature was delayed a bit in history that you might have this uh, diminishing returns on the investment, so to speak, because the hardware itself is uh, significantly faster. Right, right. And so, and yeah, we, so there's all kinds of, um, there's all kinds of races going on here, right? Um, Didier, you're, you're totally correct. You know, with respect to like, you know, the savings you get on, on modern hardware, right? You, you might not save as much. Um, yeah, and, and you can see that there are many variables here, like sure. what, what exactly the, is the hardware? What exactly is the workload, right? Um, What's your live migration speed like? Yeah, exactly, you know, and so it's so dependent on your, on your networking as well, right? Yes, Kostin. Yeah, I, I was thinking uh, well, you showed a 90, 19 second patch cycle. So maybe it's even possible to pause the VMs and save the memory and restart the node and rerun the VMs. So maybe uh, if you get the time down a bit more, um, we just maybe don't have to move the VMs around and uh, that would make it faster. Not for every VMs maybe, but uh, for the medium and uh, low uh, category. Now I'm missing the word, the medium right. and low VMs. Right, Priority sure. VM. Right. Yeah, because sa saving the, the the big ones tends to take quite a while. Right. Another, so, I mean, another way. It's a little bit like politically incorrect to talk about like how do you you further improve the speed. But another way to do it is you just you wait until three in the morning when no one's using the VMs, right? And you sort of like you know stop your VMs, back them up, right? And then you know install your patches yeah. like in other words you take take a maintenance window right um you, yeah. you don't have to do that but if you do it you're it's gonna you know it's extra steps but it, it will like be faster yeah. Right. yeah um okay so in any case um yeah just a quick note like 
on the next screen, you'll see that we've used the invoke cow run commandlet, right? Um, so go ahead. And so what this, these are screenshots of one of the nodes that's in this four node cluster. Um, and so what's, un, what's interesting about this is we've used invoke cow run um, directly on one of the cluster nodes. And so this is a DCR improvement that's coming in October um, where you can use invoke cow run directly on one of the cluster nodes. You don't need to use it um, only remotely. So yeah, so it's a it's a small thing, but just to note that. Um, so what, what that also means is you don't need an extra machine to upgrade your cluster. Um, so and it will create a cluster role on demand, like for just one run, or how does it work? Exactly, that's what it does. It that's just, awesome. Right, so yeah, so um, we had a lot of feedback of, on that and we were very fortunate to get that, that feature through um, as a DCR. So that comes in, that's the 11, that's in the 10C package um, for the HCIV1. Um, okay, um, okay, so really there's a lot of text here. I don't really, you know, expect anyone to read it. I just, for full disclosure, just so you can see that I'm just not making numbers up. Um, you know, these are the actual measurements we took last night. Um, yeah, and so, and you can see the commands that we that we used right there. So, um, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is really just for full disclosure. Um, uh, yeah, and so then I think it's back to you, Christina. I think I just had these two slides. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, so just to, to recap uh, something that that has been mentioned before, that uh, in terms of systems that fully support KSR, this is going to be all of the HCI integrated systems. Currently, this validation is, is ongoing. So OEMs are, are testing right now uh, for the HCI V2 validation cycle and you can keep an eye on the HCI catalog for a full list of systems that will be having the support. Uh, validated nodes may also support KSR, however, it's it's not required or guaranteed. Uh, if they want to go off and, and validate KSR, they are uh, welcome to do so. One such example of a, of a system that has actually completed the KSR validation today is the HP ProLiant uh, DL360. This is a, is a validated node, however, it has completed the KSR validation. So this is running with uh, an Intel Xeon pro processor, uh, all flash NVMe, and uh, it has been validated for KSR, which is great. So this is an example of, you know, what kind of hardware we will have that uh, is offering uh, KSR support. And that's yes. all we had. Any, any questions? Yes, actually, I have one or two. So I wonder why not require KSR for every validated nodes uh, and only for the uh, for the integrated system because it's a feature people are looking forward to and uh, you can have new new Azure Stack HCI deployments where it, where it will not work. And give, can you give us some insight which kind of devices will not work? Or where's the problem? I think the answer there is probably just around the the burden of validation and not jumping into requiring a, something like this to be to be validated across the board, especially as we just have started to introduce this feature in uh, HCI that there is a significant burden on uh, driver developers and OEMs to do this level of validation. And uh, I don't know if Rob has anything to add there. So yeah, not not really, just to say 
Um, yeah, we, we welcome the MVP community to, you know, try KSR and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to your feedback. Um, that, that would be just really awesome. Um, so, yeah, so. We have two more two more guys who want to, to ask questions. For, for, uh, Jaromir, you had a fair share already. So first Helmut and then Jaromir. Yeah, just want to ask if in the KSR validation in the meantime also uh, the driver update extensions are tested because KSR is nice if you do it by hand, but if you do it automatically, it can terribly fail with the oh, with the plugins into class they were updating because uh, KSR delivers a bit different flags and uh, the software doesn't think that the update was successful and reduce the update. And my question is if this is in the validation run in the meantime. So I think I think the general rule is like with KSR we have to be a little bit careful, right? We um, KSR does not apply to every single update, right? Um, that's so one problem is we have to be very careful, right? So as mm -hmm. Christine said, it's not for like BIOS or UFI. Um, it's not really for firmware, right? Because that requires a, a hard reboot, a full reboot. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is that we have some vendors that will say things like, well, like, you know, first you install the firmware and then you install the driver, right? One after the other and a reboot is required, right? Um, so it, we have a situation where it depends on what you're installing and also it depends on the, um, yeah, it depends on what you're installing and also it depends on the vendor. Yeah. Okay, Jaromir. Yeah, Okay, so what will happen if I'll try attempt KSR on non-validated system? It will just fail KSR and successfully reboot and apply updates, but the reboot will be normal or it will be some blue screen or what we will see. If you'll just enable it, you know, everywhere and just, you know, let it, okay, decide if the KSR will be done or not. So, okay, Jaromir, um, I had a network problem um, in the first part of your question, but I think you're asking, can you ask it again just to? Yeah, if you uh, if you will attempt KSR all the time, even on the non-validated systems, like you have your XD730 and you will reboot the machine, what will happen? It will, you know, attempt to do, and if it will fail, it will just normally reboot or it will just go blue screen or something. Okay, so. Is it safe? The, okay, so we think, that it's relatively safe, right? Um, so we don't expect that KSR will do any like violent damage to your clusters, right? We, okay. We expect the same. Right, <laughs> but, right, so if, you know, if you instruct it to, if you instruct Cal to do a KSR reboot, a soft reboot, Cal will try, right, to do a soft reboot. Right, Cal will try to work with the KSR component to do that. Um, however, um, if there's a if it if it if there's a failure, right, then we think that it will go for a full reboot as a fallback condition, right. So the worst case we think is a is a full reboot, right. It can't. So you say you do do a KSR, save me those four minutes, but Cal for some reason can't do it or the node can't do it. Okay, then you do go into a full reboot. Okay, now, um, so we don't really think there's any harm. It's just that it's extra time for you and extra hassle, right? We don't think, we absolutely do not think there's a data loss possibility or a data corruption possibility. However, we do know that there are occasions when the node might blue screen, right? A blue screen is a possibility, right? And if it happens, then, you know, it you, it, it's just normal, right? It's it's part of it's a function of a reboot. Um, you just handle it like you do any other blue screen situation. But the machine uh, is suspended uh, anyway, so who cares, right? It should be fully drained, right? You shouldn't be doing anything. You should be okay, right? So um, if in the case of a blue screen, but this is also an area where we're very sensitive, right? It turns out that KSR is hard to debug, like because 
we're trying to save time during the reboot, and there it's difficult to do all the correct logging when the operating system's not running. So we have this we have this interesting situation where actually it's hard to diagnose KSR, right? So that's why we want to restrict KSR to the integrated systems, right? So it's really it's a little bit selfish right we, we want to say oh, it's like predictive oh. right so you know how it will behave right right we it's much better predictable right but their ksr is going to this feature is going to raise a lot of questions like so like helmet was asking like we i expect all the time for people to say hey rob i want to i want to install this can i use ksr or not the answer is going to be like okay well you know is it bios is it ufi right is it firmware then the answer is no right you know, then the next question is like, OK, what machine are you using? Are you using an integrated system? And then if the answer is yes, you are, then the answer is like, OK, well, you can try KSR, right? But in the end, you are not blocking any non-certified hardware from even trying. No, there's not. Can, there's can not test and play at our heart's content at our own there's, risk. And, yeah. There's not there's not like a green list of like approved hardware like in in the software, right? It will try. Um, have you considered um, that or um <laughs> well yes um we have considered that but you know um <laughs> people people don't always listen to like what what i want um, shocking shocking well shocking. i know it's crazy right um look carlston i think you might have a question yes i have <laughs> thank you um so is there a possibility to recognize on the update if it's car ksr uh, uh appro approved or if K ksr would uh, uh would not uh, do the hard uh, boot because it's depending on the update i understood so is there a flag somewhere or you will integrate a flag in the update so we know if we install these updates K ksr would usually happen and not a full reboot or is this just oh we need a full reboot and it happens or we don't need a full reboot and will not happen so this is Okay, so this is an area of intense discussion on the team. Right? Okay, you don't fix we, it yet. We right. So we want to put we want to basically put a reboot hint or tag, right? Um, we want to put some we want to associate some metadata with the update itself, right? So wherever the update is coming from, if it's coming from Windows Update or if it's coming from like the hardware vendor. Right, wherever it's coming from, we want to really associate and put a tag on this and say, yeah, you know what, you can you can do use a KSR with this. Um, you know, here's here's how we should behave. Here's your reboot behavior for this, you know, for this um, particular uh, package, right? So um, that's what we want. The problem is it's expensive, right? Um, and we couldn't get it. We couldn't do that. We couldn't add the metadata um, approach. Um, in time for this release. So we chose to go ahead and uh, use it uh, without the metadata hint. Okay. Um, so everything is, we have to use sort of like documentation and communication to, to determine when we can use KSR. Mm. But we're, hope, okay, we're cool. hoping that we still get enough good feedback on this feature. Mm -hmm. Manfred, you had a question, right? He's coming. He's coming. I have to switch between two uh, two uh, setups because uh, Teams uh, is struggling with the length of our session. We we uh, with the length uh, of our presentation yeah. is is too much for Teams. So there there are some problems ah, coming up switch. after ten hours. <laughs> oh, I will switch. Yeah, my question is regarding the um, the update path we discussed before your. Uh, session, Rob, uh, where you mentioned that for Windows Server we have an N minus um, two, but for some services N minus three might work, but it's not tested and so it's not fully supported. Uh, it, did I get this right? Um, so let's go to slide. Christina, could you advance to slide 16? Or is it 15? Yes, here it is, 15. Slide 15, sorry, one up. Yeah, perfect, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so um, so the answer is like, okay, it's we support N minus two. We have this interesting case for server 2022 where some roles can upgrade from 2012 R2 directly to 2022. 
So it's technically three versions, but mm -hmm. we're still writing the documentation for that. And um, we're still trying to figure that out exactly. Um, like what, you know, um, so yeah. So we, we like, so for example, we don't IIS um, will upgrade perfectly, right? We know, you know, that, you know, there are, there are other roles that upgrade no problem with right? three versions, but we, since we're still writing the documentation, I don't have the list of all the rules. Okay. Is it is it because IIS didn't change from 2012 or two? <laughs> Just teasing you. Sorry. <laughs> but, but, but Rob, this means it's definitely not N minus four. So we know server 2012 is out. Is this correct? Because the reason why I'm asking, uh, there are several slides that were sh shared by Microsoft Germany, so public slides that say n minus four and they're wrong um <laughs> those were seems... er, right those were early slides I, i'm very familiar with those slides yeah um, that was our early proposition like we were trying to uh we were trying to think of everything we possibly could to think to like get customers onto the latest version of windows server mainly for security reasons, right? We want the, them to be running on the most secure, best platform ever. And so, you know, we had all kinds of ideas. Let's support N minus four. Let's, um, you know, let's let's really heavily test the major applications, right? And, and do compatibility testing. Um, but a lot of, there are a lot of other priorities that come up and some of these plans um, have to change. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because the interesting thing is based on this uh, information I, I got here in, in Germany, I started testing and I was, let's say, very successful. So there things worked. I never expected they would work, but I started to test it because uh, somebody said, uh, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is in there, <laughs> but uh, we should ensure to have the correct information there because uh, I told these uh, guys at Microsoft Germany, um, as far as I know, it's N minus two. And they asked some other persons and then the feedback was, no, it's N minus four. And so I said, okay, I tested a little bit and uh, I had a lot of roles that I could successfully migrate, um, but it's not supported. This is important. That's yeah. where you have to, right. We have to be very careful with what's supported versus what might yeah. work. Right. Also, um, be very careful, Manfred, because um, a lot of times the final changes are made only in the GA build, right? And so it's the yep. GA build that's supported, and that's where the final changes are. So it's possible that you can do an N minus four um, upgrade on an early build, but then you get the GA build, and guess what? They've removed they've removed the transition from the transition table, okay. right? So. It's, it be very, we just have to be very careful here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to get to a meeting with um, our, our, any of our colleagues. Um, yeah, we can, we can discuss it, right? Yeah. If, especially yeah. if it's a problem. Great. Uh, I, have, I have something uh, uh, cluster aware update related. If you, so it's very nice in uh, Windows Admin Center when you have a uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster, you have this nice update button uh, uh, down there. And I recognized, and I, I was really surprised, if you do that, the cow roll is installed, of course, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, it schedules an update for every uh, third Tuesday of the month at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, and if you don't know that as a customer, you have you have suddenly uh, an automatically running patch uh, one week after the updates came out. So it would be nice uh, if we had something in Windows Admin Center when you install the cow roll that it asks you uh, which time do you want to have this automatically run or uh, or even that the customers are aware where you write though it's installing an automatically task because a lot of customers are not comfortably uh, patching the cluster a week after the patches came out yeah it's understandable and you're correct um, we have 
We're working with the Windows Admin Center team to change the the behavior. Um, That's cool. So Windows Admin Center, the way it works with Cal today, it uses two commandlets and it, it basically sets up this um, this reoccurring task, right, for the update, right? Now we're asking them to change that and use invoke Cal run, um, yeah. which will work w more smoothly and it won't leave this dangling uh, scheduled task. Right, so we're so we're working with them. We've implemented the DCR in the HCI v1 10c. Um, it's also there in. It's going to be there in also in H, the HCI uh, v2. Um, so, uh, but yes, we're that work to change WAC to change the the PowerShell commandlet that it uses. That is still forthcoming. So, but okay, at, least you, at least you know it and you are thinking uh, that's great because I was really surprised and I uh, we killed the class. We killed the volume at a customer uh, during the update process <laughs> and okay. we were left with the cluster. Two nodes were updated and the others were not. So uh, uh, was surprising uh, in a stretch cluster. OK, other questions from our audience or from our uh, speakers. I'll just tell you, Carson, the IIS 10 has changed in 2022. Can now serve <laughs> websites over quick. <laughs> okay. Just so saying, I have, just saying, something has changed. Something has changed, okay. Will, so I have a question from the audience. Will KSA, KSR come to Windows 11 or later versions? You always can hope, right? Windows 11, like in what like form? The client, like the client. client. Of course, people people like to dream. They see something in server or in Azure Stack. It will also not come to Windows Server, I presume. So it's it's an Azure Stack HCI feature alone, right? Correct. That's correct. We don't have plans at this time to and Azure. expand it beyond that. So like, right, so Christina's right. So we don't have any plans yet. If clearly if it goes well, if there's demand for this feature, um, then there's a strong case for bringing KSR to Windows Server more generally. But, you know, on the other hand, like if we if we get a lot of negative feedback, you know, then there, there's a case against bringing it into a more, more mainstream. Yeah. Actually, oh, actually, have you have you tried doing it with virtual machines just for fun to see if that makes a huge difference there, or did you not even try? Yeah, because they only need twenty seconds, and now you would have three. Or seconds. What? Yeah, why not? <laughs> reboot, reboot a VM at the speed of a container, just just for fun. Uh, but it's, <laughs> uh, it's reboot is really fast anyway, so yeah, I know, I know, I know, but still, so. still. it's going to always yeah, yeah, be faster. <laughs> if you if you can knock off. 90% of the reboot time of VM. Why not? Yeah. I have another question from the audience. Um, is this the same technology in Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition for fast reboots? I think it's not fast reboots in Windows in, in the Azure Edition. It's uh, it's patching without reboots, right? It's a completely different right, piece. Right. So don't. Right. So this is this feature is KSR, right? And the questionnaire, the questionnaire is probably asking a question about hot patching. Yeah, right? it's, they're different technologies. Yeah. Right? They're, they're they're related in that, like you know, in what we're trying to do is we're trying to like m minimize the total downtime for, you know, for a server or for a cluster node. But so they're they're sort of related in that respect. But they are they're different teams, and they're um, yeah different. Different ways of go, of going about it. Right. So just to be clear, like like um, as Christina said, KSR is a synthetic driver that allows a faster reboot. Hot patching, it's basically they've rewritten the updates, and they've they've they're using um, a, they're they're very, being very clever about the way that you replace binaries during an upgrade to prevent a reboot. So there was another question. Um, I, I messed it up already. Where is it? 
it was uh, someone asked, uh, are there any other new uh, features in Cow? So cluster we're updating. So the feature update the, is the new feature, isn't it? But you are able to run a feature update in 20H2 and it was enabled in one of the cumulative updates. I think right. August cumulative updates or something like that, right? right? We, have, we have multiple, um, yeah, we have multiple ways to do this. Um, yeah, so there, are, there, are, those are the main um, updates. Uh, the 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 fact that you can do a feature update that's that's huge, and um, yeah, the you know the that's the main thing, right? So um, let's see. Uh, Christina, um, on your deck, can you advance to um, slide 18? OK, so thank you. So basically, we on the Cal team, we've been very focused on how to upgrade your cluster, right? And so we've been, you know, We've been very, very focused on on making sure that customers can be successful in going from the HCI 20H2 to the 21H2. And you might have seen this slide before. Um, we presented this at the partner forum. Um, this, so essentially, what we want is we want customers to be able to use the Windows Admin Center and be successful with WAC and Cal together. But the next scenario down, if that doesn't work or if they're more comfortable with PowerShell, we have PowerShell and we have improvements to the Cal PowerShell. Later um, this year or early next year, we'll ship a special um, executable um, with our partners in the fundamentals team called the Aura tool. And the Aura tool will allow a partially connected um, system to work. So um, if you if you have a an HCI system that's not connected to the internet, but you need to shuttle the files back and forth um, with like a thumb drive, then then the Aura tool you can use that to shuttle the updates back and forth. So you can say, hey cluster, what do you need? Then you take that information, the metadata, um, you take it over to your laptop, and you say, hey Aura tool, go fetch what I need, and you put it on the thumb drive, and then you put it back right to the HCI system, right? And so that's line three there. Um, then there are other scenarios where if you have the media, um, so scenario four and five here in this table, if you have the media, then you can use the media as well. Like you can basically have cal call setup.exe. Um, the only difference between four and five is four, it's using a little bit fancier um, algorithm. Um, five is is using like, like no no algorithm, right? It's it's really very brutal. Um, finally, there's a new option in sconfig in the HCI. Um, so option six um, comma three, and this also allows you to do a feature update, right? So now in this case, the you have an administrator who you essentially have to manually drain the nodes, right? Just doing everything that Cow does. Right, you have to drain the node, but then you can use sconfig to upgrade the node, and then you can just resume the node, right? So, but that's so, yeah. So essentially, these are this is our these are pathways or mechanisms for uh, customers to upgrade to HCI. And I have a feedback for you on the step six. I tried to extract the way the sconfig does it. He's, you know. I'm not sure now how he's doing it exactly, but I try to invoke it remotely from the remote machine. Imagine you have a cluster, you would like to uh, install a feature update to one of the nodes and you don't want to log in into the node itself. Yep. You would like to invoke it with the invoke command. I, I was trying credit SSP, I was trying virtual account, nothing worked. You have to really log in and say, I want to do this. Right. So, so for, the, for the future, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I just to let you know that this this is something I faced. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge for us. So I mean, I understand. Right, cool. So I'll let you guys. Uh, <laughs> so I, I tried the third time. So uh, 
So this was also a very informative and great session. I really appreciate it. And Manfred does it too. He, he gave his sum up and that's very rare. So thank you, Christina and Rob for the session. Um, it's really late here in Germany and it was nice to Rob to see you again. I hope that is maybe possible sometime in the next year again in Redmond. I would really like that, but you know that already. Um, so we will now do the closing of the uh, cloud uh, cloud <laughs> the Azure Stack HCI days uh, 2021. I was thinking about my conference, the Cloud and Data Center conference, but uh, maybe that will happen in 2023 uh, again. I would I would uh, uh, like to uh, to thank all the speakers. We had really great sessions. It was amazing. I learned a lot. Uh, I, I was watching, I think, 22 sessions, hour sessions with a lot of questions. Again, today we had uh, over 100 uh, questions in the in the Q&A. Um, uh, I, uh, I would like to thank the speakers. I did that already. The, um, the viewers who were here and were very engaged, uh, all the sessions, uh, if Teams doesn't fail, the, we have the recordings of the first day. Yes. Uh, the second day, uh, I think it will come through too, and I will publish all the sessions and I will send a mail to the speakers uh, about where their session is. And if you want to have an MP4 of your session, of course, I will I will uh, give it to you so you don't have to refer to YouTube or whatever. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors because without the sponsors, uh, such an event is, is not possible, uh, especially free for all your, for all our viewers. So thanks a lot again, uh, Dell Technology, uh, Fujitsu and Lenovo. And I think they are alphabetically, so it's not um, and not uh, how I like them. I like them all and I work with all of them. So uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, this will conclude the uh, Azure Stack HCI days 20, 2021. And the raffle, I will do the raffle tomorrow or on Saturday. So everybody who has uh, who has um, who has assign, signed up that we can uh, give the information to the sponsors. Uh, they will participate in the raffle. We have again three Amazon uh, 500 euro uh, gift cards and uh, one free Azure Stack HCI uh, course. Uh, Jaromir, do you want to say something? You're yeah, muted. You we muted. muted you. Yeah, Jaromir. <laughs> Jaromir, we cannot hear you. You are muted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm muted. Ah, okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask about storage maintenance mode, right? That we didn't cover it. With, uh, I think there were some changes, right, between 2019. Yeah, you can you can take it offline with uh, with yeah uh, with uh, Rob because I want to close. I have to drive <laughs> three and a half hours through the night to get home. Oh. So, Jeremia, uh, ask Rob uh, offline. He's still in the in the chat. So thanks yeah. uh, so okay, much, thank and you uh, see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. 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 So I will leave now. Have a good night. <laughs> we will. <laughs>